theories of why crimes are committed. Presented in the hope that these factual cases will help you, the citizens, to understand the forces that motivate crime and to aid in its prevention. This is the story of violence. Practically every modern law enforcement agency today employs the services of a consultant whose job it is to discover the true motives behind the prisoner's act against society. One of these consultants is Dr. Richard Morley. This is his report on the case of Arthur Bowman, who committed murder. May 5th. The district attorney presented to me details of the murder and subsequent confession by the prisoner, Arthur Bowman. It was a particularly brutal crime, strangulation and beating. The accused man was highly emotional during police questioning. He freely admitted to the crime but denied a motive. Bowman had no previous record and neighbors testified to his excellent character. I had my first interview with the murderer that afternoon in the prison. Hello, Mr. Bowman. I'm Dr. Morley. I've come here to help you find out why this happened. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I, I've told them. And that's all right. Cigarette? No. You sure? It's all right if you want to. Thanks. I'd like to ask you one or two things. I don't know. I don't know. How old are you, Mr. Bowman? Forty-four. I understand you have a couple of children. Yes. Boys? Boy, a girl. Look, I don't want to answer any more questions. Why don't you go away? Tell me about them. I love them. Sure I do. They're good kids. What's going to happen to them? I, I must have been crazy. I, I, I must... I must... <laughs> what about your wife? Were you happy before this happened? I don't know. I, I don't... Listen, you're a doctor. I I know why you're here. Will you help me? Please. We'll see. So that you can put me in an electric chair. That's why you're here, isn't it? No. That's not the reason. I'd tell you why, if I could. I just... I know. Tell me, Mr. Bowman, what about when you were a kid? Big family? Four. I was the oldest. Jack was the baby and the two girls. Mm -hmm. Did you have fun? I guess so, sometimes. My mother was pretty strict. I had to help her take care of the others. It was rough on my mother. She had the baby when I was ten. You, you know how it is. Yes. I, I didn't want it to be that way with my kids. I wanted them to have fun. I guess she couldn't understand the way I felt. Your wife, May? Yeah, May. Like the time I wanted to take them all on a boat ride up, up the river for a day. I, I I planned it for a surprise on Sunday. I, I told her about it Saturday night after the kids were... Get another dishcloth, Arthur. That one's getting wet. Sure. May. What? I got an idea. Uh, are we doing anything tomorrow? No. Good. Oh, what do you say if we take the kids up the river tomorrow? You know, a, a picnic. They'd have a fine time on the boat. The, the Henrys are going. Oh, fine. That's just fine. I suppose you made the date just like that. You didn't ask me, of course. You don't stop to think that I got the kids every day, day in and day no, out. No, I, I didn't say... You don't think maybe I'd like to go out on Sunday? Do something that I want to do? I thought you'd like it. Oh, yeah. Wouldn't that be nice? You and Doug Henry go off and talk about fishing. I'm stuck with the kids and Nancy. That would be fun for me, wouldn't I wouldn't it? go with Doug. I bet you wouldn't. Like the last time you went bowling. What time was it you got in? Do we have to go through that again? That's just the way you are. Just nothing but selfish. You're not thinking of me or the kids. It's just you. 
Well, I'm tired, too. You can think of me for once. I think of you. Oh, get out of my kitchen. I'm sick of it. Did you go on the boat? Yeah, we went. Guess she wanted to show me what a great sacrifice she was making. What about this fellow, Henry? Doug, you said? A friend? Yeah. Doug, Doug's all right. We, we go bowling together every week. We used to. You said something about coming home late one night. Yeah. We got through bowling early and Doug wanted a beer. I, I don't drink much. I guess I never liked it. But I said, okay, we could... Anything all right, sir? Oh, everything's great, honey. Great. Another beer for me and my friend. No more for me, Don't Duncan. listen to him, honey. He thinks he's getting old. Two beers. Sure, right away. Uh, <laughs> Artie, Artie, I saw you. <laughs> nice looking kid, huh? <laughs> um, uh, Doug, Doug, do, do, do you have any fun at home? Huh? You, you know what I mean. How, how do you get along with Nancy? Boy, she gets along with me. That's the way it is in my house. She gets along with me or else. Uh, but, but do you have any fun? Sure we do. I'm Tom Rover, the fun-loving Rover boy. <laughs> I guess I, I guess it would be nice. Huh? Oh, um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that beer's kind of strong, you know, and I'm... I, I'm, I'm not used to it. Yeah. Makes a man of you. A couple of more and you don't feel any pain, you know <laughs> what I mean? <laughs> yeah, that's it. Uh... Oh, hello, May. Do you know what time it is? No. It's after one. Nearly two. Where have you been? With Doug. Gee, I didn't realize it was so late. You've been waiting up? You're drunk. Oh, I had a couple of beers with Doug, that's all. Doug? Sure, we got through bowling early. Did you? Oh, May, I'm sorry. Listen. No, you listen. I'm fed up. Coming home in the middle of the night, drunk. Disgusting. I'm ashamed for the neighbors. The kids. Oh, May, don't. I, I'm, I'm just sorry. I didn't do anything. Get away from me. But I only want to kiss you. Kiss you? I wish you were... What? You wish I was what? Keep your voice down. Maybe I wish sometimes, too. Huh? Maybe I do. Stop it. You'll wake up the kids. Well, let them wake up. Do them good. Dirty little spoiled brats. Let them yeah. wake. May. May, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't mean what I said. May, please. I'm sorry. May. That was the conclusion of the first questioning of Arthur Bowman. There was no doubt that he was aware of the magnitude of his crime. He'd shown a marked hostility to his wife in his statements. There'd been no attempt to hide that, or his feeling of guilt concerning the night when he'd arrived home from his bowling party with Douglas Henry. On May 7th, Bowman spoke of his job, his employer and the employer's secretary. His position with the company was minor, and he felt a great frustration in that fact. Other younger men came into the business and were promoted. He was not. Here, Bowman returned to his feeling of remorse over his wife and children. He wanted to talk about the puppy, which was brought into the home two weeks before the murder. She brought it for the kids. They all made a big fuss about it. I, I never liked dogs much. One night I came home, I was... He tied it under his chin. That's my fishing hat. Give me that. 
didn't do anything, Pa. Why did you hit him? He didn't do anything. Come on, Pinky. It's all right. Come on. What's the matter? Oh. Hello, Arthur. Look what that dog did to my hat. Look. You've had it ever since I can remember. Now you can get a new one. It was filthy anyway. Daddy hit Pinky, Mama. He's under the couch and he won't come out. We've got to get rid of that dog. I won't have my things destroyed. We've got to get rid of it. You're acting like a child. Hitting a baby puppy. It's all right, Pinky. It's all right. Let me hold him. He's mine. All right, children. Take him in the kitchen. It's time for his supper. Come on, come on. You better get washed up, Arthur. As soon as the puppy's fed, we'll eat. Do you know why you didn't like the dog, Mr. Bowman? Oh, I, I don't know. My, my mother had one when I was a kid. It was a big dog. I remember it bit me and I was scared of it, but she kept it anyway. Did you get rid of him? I mean, your children's puppy. Well, I wanted to, but they wouldn't let me. Always babying, and it made me sick. Then one morning, I was on my way to work. I was a couple of minutes late. And Mr. Heston, he, he's my boss, like I told you. He's always giving me a funny look when I'm late. Well, the car was parked in the driveway. I hadn't put it away the night. Arthur! Yes? Have you seen Pinky? No. I haven't got time. I'm late. Tell Terry to. All right, but look under the car, though, before you drive out. He might be there. Okay, okay. Boy, well, I hope there isn't much traffic. I'm going to be late. Oh! Oh, I forgot to look. I didn't look. At... I did it. I killed it. Heart disease is one of America's first causes of disability and death. Your gifts have greatly helped our scientists and doctors in gaining new knowledge about this disease. Let's keep on helping them until every heart in America is protected. Please mail a generous gift to Heart, care of your local post office. And now, back to violence. The motive behind Arthur Bowman's act of murder was becoming increasingly evident. The effect upon him by the domineering and strict mother was aggravated in later life by his unhappy and frustrated wife. The killing of the dog functioned only as a detonator. The total explosion was yet to come. On May the 9th, we held our fourth interview. I've been thinking about what we were talking of la last time. The, the dog. Yes. Well... Why didn't I look under the car when May told me to? I, I was late, but I, I didn't want to run over it. I, I never do a thing like that. Do you think it's possible that you did want to get rid of it? And not looking was an easy way? Your excuse? No, oh, no, no. I I didn't even know it was there uh, under the car. You didn't look. It might have been. What happened at home after the dog was run over? Well, they wouldn't talk to me. May, the kids, they, they thought it was my fault. I felt like I did when I was a kid. And, and one day I hit the baby and my mother made a big fuss about it. She didn't talk to me for a week. Did you feel that May was behaving the way your mother did? I guess so. Did you resent it? Well, I was sorry about the dog, but it was only a dog. They, they didn't have any right to treat me like that. Did you feel that they'd given to the dog the affection that you wanted? Sure, sure, that's what they did. Man comes home tired from work, and all he hears is what the dog did. Nobody cared what I did. You were telling me a little about your job the other day, Mr. Bowman. Now, your employer's name is Heston, isn't it? Yeah, I've been, I've been there for nine years. You said you were in the accounting department? Yeah. I, I should have been the head of it a long time ago, but it's all politics. Was Mr. Heston unfair to you? Oh, I don't know. He didn't like me much, always making cracks. Like the time I was getting ready to quit for the day a couple of weeks ago. Was that before the dog was run over? No, after seven or eight days. It was... All through, 
Arthur? Just about. Boss wants to see you before you go. Oh? <laughs> Take it easy, Arthur. I'll see you in the morning. Yes? Oh. Hello, Arthur. Say, uh, I wonder if you'd like to take on some extra work. Shouldn't take you more than a week or so. You can do it at home. Well, I don't know, Mr. Heston. Couldn't one of the other boys... Well, yes, they could. But I thought it might be a good thing for you. It's an important account. We want it done right. You're our best man, you know, Arthur. I guess I could try it, Mr. Heston, if you think it's all right. I, I mean, if it's that important, maybe the chief ought to handle it. Oh, you know, Arthur, the trouble with you is you're afraid of yourself. You ought to do something about that. Well, sh sure, Mr. Heston, if you think oh, no. that I... It's all right. I'll give it to the chief. See you in the morning, Arthur. Thanks for dropping in. Potatoes, Ma? Ellen, pass your brother the potatoes. He'll get fat if he eats too many, won't he? Oh, you shut up. Don't say shut up to your sister, Terry. May. Yes? Boss wanted me to do some extra work this week. Oh? You know what I told him? I said, no, Mr. Heston. That's what I said. Can you imagine? Now he's trying to get me to do everybody else's job as well. Not good enough for promotion. Maybe it would have been smart to take it. For what? I know Heston. He's waiting for me to make a mistake so he can ease me out. Well, I'm smart. I'm not making any mistakes. Oh, you're smart. All right. Get your hand out of the butter, Terry. Oh, yes, you're so smart. Everybody's wrong, and you're right. Don't stay on the right side of the boss. You tell him how smart you are. You know everything. You think I should have done it? All I know is you've had the same job for nine years, four raises. I noticed Doug Henry's the head of his department at the store. You're siding with Heston, too, huh? Everything I do stinks. Everything anybody else Don't does... You use that language in front of the children. Shut up! Shut up! <laughs> and that dog... I play... Arthur Bullman's pressures were reaching a highly dangerous stage. Had there been an outlet, a release from his frustrations and fears, had he been able to voice these thoughts, a murder might never have taken place. But the boiling point had been reached. Having killed once, it was only a question of time before he lost complete control of his hostile feelings. On the 10th of May, he began to tell me about the day which ended in death. I guess I didn't eat much for breakfast that morning. What were you thinking about when you left home to go to work? I don't know. Well, what was your attitude toward your wife then? I mean, did you want to make up? No. No, I didn't. Had your children annoyed you that morning or the night before? Uh, they were siding with her. It, it, it was like with the dog, only maybe worse. I, I had a lot of work to do that afternoon. It must have been about five when Mr. Heston came out. Arthur, mm -hmm. would you take a look at this for a minute? Well, sure, Mr. Heston. There seems to be a discrepancy in the figures for the Southern Metals April accounts. You took care of these, didn't you? Y yes, sir. Well, they've been checked twice now. There, boys, and the chief. I'm afraid you made a slip. I'm sorry, Mr. Heston. No, no, it's, it's all right. Just be more careful, will you? We can't fool around with $50,000 that belongs to someone else, you know. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Heston. It, it won't happen oh, again. Right, sure, sure. It's okay. You all right, Arthur? Huh? Huh? Oh, sure. You don't let it get you. You're entitled to one mistake. Oh, yes. That reminds me. Could you do me a favor? Oh, I guess so. My car's in the garage. Won't be ready until tomorrow. Would you drop me off on your way home? Unless you're... Oh, no. That's okay. Sure, be, be glad to. Thanks. <laughs> for your thoughts, Arthur. Hmm? Uh, they're, not, no, they're not worth it, really. 
You're not unhappy about Mr. Heston calling you down this afternoon, are you? No, no. He likes you. He does. The trouble with you, Arthur, is you don't let people like you, you know? Uh, I guess so. Listen, I want to talk to you. I've been meaning to for quite a while. There's a bar on the next block. I usually stop by for a drink on the way. I'll let you buy me a martini. How's that? Well... Come on, I won't tell your wife. You're safe with me. All right. I, I don't drink, though. Well, uh, maybe a beer. <laughs> oh, I would have bet it was a beer. You can park in the back over there. Here's to you, Arthur. Don't you ever drink anything except beer? No, I, I don't drink much. Oh, I can see that. This is my second. You're still nursing your first. I'm sorry. Oh, for heaven's sake. Stop being sorry. That's the first thing. Why are you always sorry? I don't know. I'll tell you something. You know what Mr. Heston thinks about you? No. Well, I'm going to tell you, and it's for your own good. Sure, I understand. He thinks you're wishy-washy. He thinks you've got what it takes, but you're wishy-washy. I don't... You know Heston. He's a nice guy, but he wants a man to say what he thinks. Well, you've been sitting behind that adding machine for nine years. You could have been head of the department by now, even Heston's assistant, but you're wishy-washy. I guess that's the way I am. There you go again. You don't even fight. Don't you ever fight? I'm telling you this for your own good, Arthur. I know, I know. What does your wife say? Well, she says the same thing, I suppose. There you are. Don't you ever get mad? Don't you want to hit somebody, make them listen to you? No, I, I don't get mad. That's the trouble. You're a good-looking man, Arthur. You're not so old. You could do big things. But you've got to stop being wishy-washy. If I hadn't got married when I did, I, I was very young then, you know. Maybe I'd be different. Maybe, maybe that's it. Don't you love your wife? I don't know. I, I think so. I don't know. You ought to go out on a binge. That's what you need. And I'm the girl who can take care of it. Call the waiter, Arthur. A nice, loud voice now. You call him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Waiter. <laughs> I'm 33, Arthur. Next month, I'll be 34. You don't see me worrying, do you? No, you're you're all right, Ellen. Yeah. Listen, my drinking alone, what's the matter with you? That's still your first. I'll, I'll have another in a while. No, like that puppy dog you were telling me about. You should have told him it's too bad. I did it. We'll get another. Forget it. You shouldn't brew. I know. You're, you're right. Yeah, I guess it's tough. And you got a wife like me. But you don't you don't know her, Eileen. You you might think differently. Yeah, I'll bet. Nag, nag, nag. No wonder. Oh, I feel sorry for you. Oh, well, I guess we better be going, huh? What's the time? Eleven. Hey, we better. You're gonna get it. Come on. <laughs> You turn right at the block after next. That's my street, Arthur. Yes. You mad because of the way I talk tonight? No. It's for your own good. I hate to see you sitting in the office like you do, a nice-looking fellow like you. It's all right. Listen, you can come up for a nightcap if you want. I haven't got any beer, but I'd be glad to... I'd like to, Eileen, but... Well, then, if you'd like to, come on up. Well... It's on the right, beyond the empty lot there. All right. You know, if I was a man, you, next time your wife made any kind of a crack, stand up for yourself. Tell her what you think. Oh, this is it, Arthur. <sighs> home, sweet home. You coming up? I, I, I don't think I'd better. Thanks, anyway. Arthur. <laughs> Arthur. Arthur. Oh, you kill me. You really do. You're even afraid of me. You're afraid of yourself. You're afraid of your wife. I know what's the matter with you. It's late, Eileen. I, I, You're wishy-washy. 
That's what you are. Please, please don't say that anymore. Just a little thing like having a nightcap in a girl's apartment and you act like a scared kid. Oh, boy, what a husband you'd make. Please don't say anymore. Maybe I'm wrong about your wife. Maybe she's the one I should feel sorry Shut for. Shut up. She's got to put up with you every day. Shut oh, up. Stop it. Arthur, you're wishy-washy. That's what you are. Wishy-washy. Stop it. Stop well, it. Well, you are. You're afraid of me and you're I'll afraid kill of... You. I'll oh. kill you. I'll kill you. What did you do after that? I knew she was dead. I just opened the door. She fell out on the sidewalk. I went home. Do you know that it was wrong to kill her? Yes. Yes, I know. How did you feel toward your wife then? I was sorry, I guess. I mean, the, the trouble it's going to mean. But why, doctor? Why did I kill? Why did I kill Eileen? Why? Why did Arthur Bullman kill a comparative stranger? It might have been any woman, any stranger. It happened to be Eileen. She had treated him as had all the others in his life who had dominated and frustrated him. And although his semi-conscious resentment was directed toward his wife, he could no more kill her than he could have killed his own mother. His repressed angers had reached the point of explosion. Had he, throughout his life, been able to voice these emotions, he would not have resorted to violence. Arthur Bowman was brought to trial in August. More than two dozen witnesses, including his employer, John Heston, appeared in his behalf. The defense based their case on the fact that the defendant was not conscious of the wrongful nature of the act at the time he committed the crime. In a moment, we will tell you the outcome of this case. Science is now undertaking one of the most intensive research programs in history as it battles the menace of cancer. To continue this vital research, we must all join the cancer crusade of the American Cancer Society. Strike back at cancer. Give generously to your unit of the American Cancer Society. Now for the outcome of the trial of Arthur Bowman. The attempt on the part of the defense to prove Bowman legally insane was unsuccessful, and the jury found him guilty. He was convicted of murder. <laughs> Violence. The story of a true crime is written by Anthony Ellis. Harry Bartell is Dr. Richard Morley. Supporting Mr. Bartell were Ted Osborne as Arthur Bowman, Jeanette Nolan as May, and Virginia Gregg as Eileen. Featured in the cast were Lou Merrow, Bill Boucher, Richard Beals, Janine Ann Roos, and John Stevenson and David Light. Violence is directed by Norman MacDonald. The special music is composed and conducted by Marlon Skiles. Clarence Cassell speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network. Calling all detectives. A face appears on a television screen. One face among thousands. As you watch the television screen... That face suddenly assumes the mask of death. That is the situation on this page from my casebook. The casebook of Jerry Browning, private detective. A private detective like me, Jerry Browning, learns to be a close observer, even of things happening 20 miles away. When I'm very busy, I generally grab a bite to eat at whatever place is handiest, which generally turns out to be a bar and grill. 
These days, one thing that every bar and grill seems to have is... And here they come out for the third round. The bruiser looks weak. Look at him swaying there. Yeah? Television. That evening, I was watching what looked like a one-sided massacre with the bruiser on the receiving end. At the end of that round, the camera swung around on the fans at ringside. Right in front, there was a heavy-set, red-faced character who promptly made faces at the camera and waggled his fingers. I saw him only for a moment because the camera returned to the ring. One minute later, the bruiser suddenly came back to life and knocked his opponent kicking. The next night, in another bar and grill, I watched some harness races coming from a different station. Between races, the camera picked up the crowd. And there, right in front, was the same red-faced character, still making faces and waggling his fingers. But as I watched, his eyes glazed over and his mouth sagged open. In that moment, I was seeing a man who had been shot to death at a track 20 miles away. Two nights running, I saw the picture of a man mugging into a television camera. And on the second night, for a brief instant, I saw death slip over his face. At police headquarters, Lieutenant Dawson told me, Frankie Cosgrove was his name, Jerry, one of those sporting characters. Nobody knows how to make a living. What's your interest in the case? I saw him die. Dawson looked shocked. You were there? Saw a man killed and kept quiet about it until now? I shook my head. Don't get excited, Dawson. I saw it on a television screen. The camera was on Cosgrove at the moment he was killed. What's more, I saw him on a different television screen the night before. Dawson stared at me. Jerry, let's talk to the people who work those television cameras. We talked to the television cameramen and to other people higher up who ran the television stations. Mr. Browning, some people are inveterate shorts. When they see a camera turned on them, they act for it. Remarkable coincidence that this murdered man got his face into the picture on two successive evenings, but believe me, only a coincidence. I haven't made a living as a private detective for ten years by taking anybody's word for it that what he can't explain is just a coincidence. Laughing Boy is one of my best sources of information for a price. What do you want, Browning? Hurry it up. There was a character killed at the track the other night, Frankie Cosgrove. Laughing boy barely moved his lips. I don't know who killed him. I didn't think you would. What I want to know is, how did Frankie get by? What was his racket? Twenty bucks buys that. I held the money cupped in my hand. Laughing boy's fingers closed avidly over the twenty. Gambling. Cosgrove was a percentage boy. Never with his own money. At 6.30 in the morning, clocking horses as they worked out around the track, sad Sam Soper looked even sadder than usual. What a life, Jerry, what a life. <laughs> Sam, as a handicapper, I, uh, I thought you'd know most of the sporting characters around. I am looking for a line on a small-time gambler. Frankie Cosgrove made his living betting other people's money. Sad Sam's eyes were remote as he gazed across the track. Jerry, if a man's job is to bet money with bookies for big-time gamblers who don't want to be seen doing their own betting, that's what you might call approximately legitimate. But if he figures out an angle on how to give the boys he's working for an extra point or two, then you understand the bookies might get very, very annoyed with him. And the biggest bookie in town is Joe Peckham. Joe Peckham's bookie parlor was one of the best equipped in town. It served free drinks to customers. Anybody could enter the place except... You're a private pick, Browning. Keep out. There was plenty of steam behind my wallet, but it didn't even rock the muscle man at the door. And he didn't raise a hand to return the blow. I said, I'll just keep slugging until you lose your temper. We stage a battle royal and the cops show up. Or you let me in. The muscle man smiled thinly. Come on in. The 
doorman was right behind me as I entered the big room. When he saw us, Joe Peckham walked out of the cashier's booth. This sham has slugged this way in. Peckham nodded, whispered, This way, Browning. Peckham sat down at a small desk, waved a negligent hand at me. Talk to me, Browning. Give me one reason why Tommy shouldn't kick your teeth in. I grinned at him. Well, I know who killed Frankie Cosgrove and why. How's that for a reason? Peckham was amused. Why should I want to kill a mosquito like Cosgrove? Because he had a system. Because he went to fights and to the track and picked up information that would change betting odds. And then he worked his way up to where he'd get picked up by a television camera and wigwag his information to somebody on the outside. It didn't work for him every night, most likely, but if it worked just once in a while, what a shellacking a big-time bookie like you would take. And did take. Peckham wasn't amused anymore. You jump to come here with stuff like that and expect to get out alive. I glanced around the room. The muscle man. He didn't look happy. Then I turned back to Peckham. Something's bothering your boy, Mr. Peckham. Maybe he's even thinking. As, for example, how did I find out? They made a film from that telecast. It showed Cosgrove getting killed, and it showed who killed him. If your mug here starts anything with me, he'll wind up where you're going, which is a chair wired for voltage. Peckham whispered, Take him, Tommy. Nothing happened. The guy just stood there. After a moment, I got up. Come on, Peckham. Let's go. Huh? Peckham was the killer. He'd done his own dirty work. The stuff about a film of the telecast was nonsense, of course. But it was real enough to Peckham so that he started talking and talked himself into a life sentence. Like I said, a murderer always has plenty to worry about. And these days, he's even got to be careful about television. Listen next time to Calling All Detectives. Mystery drama, mystery quiz, and a chance for you to match wits with yours truly, Jerry Browning, Private Detective. Hello? Yes, this is the Falcon speaking. Oh, Peggy. I'm glad you called. I'll have to ask for a rain check, Angel. I'm all tied up. Mm Mm-hmm. An actor friend of mine just bought himself a gun, and the way it looks now, he figures to make a big hit. The Adventures of the Falcon, starring Les Damon. Now join him on the air when the Falcon solves... The Case of the Disappearing Doll. It's Wednesday evening in New York, and in a small furnished room on Manhattan's east side, a gentleman named Carl Hoffman glares at an old clock as if commanding it to stop. And when it continues to ignore Mr. Hoffman's wishes, he holds off and makes known his displeasure. Hey, take it easy, Carl. Don't tell me to take it easy, Sheppy. You went and busted the clock. That's not all I'm going to bust either. Where's Janet? Give her a chance, Carl. She'll show. When? She was due here an hour ago. Well, maybe she gets tired up with a jerk, Harry Jensen. That's still no excuse. I told her it doesn't... Get that. Yeah, I'll get it. Just a second. Hello, Sheppy. Oh, you're just in time, Janet. What's the matter? Carl, he's blowing his top. Don't worry about it. It'll do him good. That you, Janet? Yeah. Where the devil have you been? Working. You were due here at eight. There were what they call extenuating circumstances. You out with Harry Jensen? Uh Uh-huh. How'd you make out? Well, he's loosening up a little. But? He still wouldn't kick through with the information. That's a nice how do you do. Well, if you think you can do better... Maybe I can. Take it easy, Carl. You too, Janet. Where does he get off bawling me out? How long have I had to work on Harry? Look, we know it's only been a week, but time is getting short. Vince Dario will be here tomorrow. Who? Vince Dario. Carl's bringing him in from Toledo for this. Why? Because he's the best man in the business, that's why. And Vince isn't the kind of a guy who'll hang around if we can't promise him action. Well, I'm doing everything I can. Yeah, sure she is, Carl. Now, why don't you two just kiss and make up? Oh, all right. I'm sorry, Janet. Forget it, honey. Come here, baby. (laughs) Uh, Don't mind me, folks. Uh, grab yourself a walk, Shepard. Come on, fellas, break it up. Now we got work to do. He's right, sweetheart. 
When do you think you'll have something to report from that Harry Jensen character? Well, they wanted to see me later tonight. Well, maybe tonight's the night. Maybe. How about it, Janet? You know, I think if you got him good and plastered, he might start talking. That's never been a problem with Harry. The tough thing is to make him quit. Well, get him started in the right direction, baby. And when he stops, we'll be on easy street. <laughs> No more for me, Janet. I, I love... Oh, don't be such a sissy. Who's a sissy? You are. Yeah? Now, let me show you something. Give me that bottle. Now, Harry, do you think you should? Watch. Well, well, well. No. <coughs> How's that? Oh, darling, you're terrific. Hey, you want to know something, Janet? What? Hey, you're pretty terrific, too. I'm, I'm crazy about you, baby. Crazy enough to marry me? Say the word and we'll do it like that. Don't tempt me, Harry. <laughs> I mean it. So do I. What did we live on? What will we live on? What's the matter with me? I make good dough. Eighty bucks a week. <laughs> Is that anything to sneeze at? Oh, no, that's wonderful, darling. Yeah, I'm top man with the outfit. Who do you think makes all the important deliveries? Who? Me, that's it. Go on. Don't believe me, huh? Ever hear of the McGill Company? Yeah. Well, they got a payroll of 80,000 bucks a week, and I'm the guy who brings it to them. When? Huh? When do you bring it to them? Oh, I'm sorry, honey. We're not supposed to tell. And you claim you love me. I do, then sweetheart. Then tell me. Tell me when you're going to deliver the McGill payroll. Now, what difference does that make? Think I could marry a man who didn't trust me? <laughs> Say, Janet. What? Well, ain't, ain't, it, ain't it kind of stuffy in here? No. I, I feel awful warm. You know, I, I, I bet I could go to sleep. I, don't you pass out on me. <laughs> oh, no, don't, Janet. I, I, I'm not too bad. Harry. Yeah. Harry. <laughs> the McGill payroll. When do you deliver? Yeah. Friday. Friday at two. What do you want? I'm looking for Carl Hoffman. Well, who are you? It's all right, Sheppy. Let him in. Hi, Vince. Hello, Hoffman. Sheppy, Vince Dario. Glad to know you. Thanks. When'd you get in, Vince? About 20 minutes ago. You couldn't have timed it better. Got something hot? Mm-hmm. Sheppy, here are the McGill Company. And... The people who make all those plumbing fixtures? That's right. Don't tell me you're figuring on knocking them off. That's what I'm figuring on. I wish you would have told me that in your letter. Why? Because I wouldn't have wasted my time coming to New York. Let him go, Carl. Shut up, Sheppy. Now, before you make up your mind, Vince, maybe you ought to hear the deal. There's no deal where you have to walk into a plant like McGill's. We don't have to walk in. We grab on the outside. Come again? The messenger who delivers the payroll is a character named Harry Jensen. We know to the minute what time he'll get to the factory. Now, are you interested? I'm still here. They're tearing up the street in front of the police, so he has to park his bus a block away. Now, he'll come down Remsen Street. That's where you and I take over. Sheppy will be covering the street with a Thompson from a vacant room across the way. Sounds all right. It gets better as it goes along. Now, we give the dough to Janet. Wait a second. Who's Janet? A girlfriend of mine. I don't like it, Hoffman. What's the matter now? I don't like any cable where a babe is involved. You don't know this babe. How do you think we find out when they're going to deliver the payroll? She's a real stylish kid. What's her last name? Halsey. Wait till you meet her. I liked her very much. It's all up to you, Vince. What do you say? We got the time, the place, and the girl. What more can a fella ask? How does she handle, Janet? All right, I guess. You guess? Well, I never did like driving in this kind of weather. Don't be silly, baby. It's going to make things a lot easier all around. Right, Vince? Sure, the rain will keep them off the streets. Whoa, sweetheart, wait a minute. Right here will be fine. Did I shut her off? I'll keep her running. And remember... When you start off again, go right into second and don't feed her too much gas. Yeah, I got it. What time is it, Vince? Uh, make it a couple of minutes to two. Mm-hmm. You see Sheppy across the street? I think so. Well, that does it. Are you sure you know what to do, Janet? Yeah, as soon as I get the bag, I head straight for my apartment. That's hmm? right. Don't hang around no matter what. We'll all be over to your place by nine to divvy up. Supposing you aren't. Don't give it a thought, sweetheart. It'll take me to... What? Is that our friend of Harry? Well, on the corner. Yeah, that's him. All right, Vince. Here's where we go to work. Lots of luck, honey. Thanks, baby. Give me a cigarette. Yeah. Where's that lighter you're so proud of? 
<laughs> oh, what do you know? It works. Here he comes. Hey, buddy. Me? Yeah. Can you tell us what Tremont Avenue is? Oh, uh, we're on the wrong side of town, mister. i tell you what you better do. No, I'll tell you what you better do. Don't make a move, bud. Not even a teeny one. Hey, what is this? Just what it looks like. Pass that grip to my friend. Go on. Now, we tell you know how it is. No hard feelings, I hope. Oh, that's all right, mister. I got a good memory for faces. I won't forget you. In that case, let me give you something else to remember me, boss. <laughs> Les Damon returns as the Falcon right after these messages. Dimension. <laughs> George Burns and Gracie Allen. Hopalong Cassidy. Edgar Bergen. The Shadow. John and Blanche Bickerson. The Whistler. Choose from among thousands of downloadable old time radio shows and spoken word titles at MediaBay.com. <laughs> The best voice on the net. Yeah. <laughs> and now, let's return to Les Damon as the Falcon in the case of the disappearing doll. Who is it? That should be open up. Hello, Carl. Vince. Hi. Oh. Rough like clockwork, didn't it? Yeah. Where's Janet? She ain't here. Huh? What? No, no, no. I was the first one in. Lucky I had a key to her place, huh? And you're lucky I don't have a suspicious mind. Well, I have. Did she phone in? Uh-uh. You told her to come straight here, didn't you, Carl? Yeah. Well, you don't think she had an accident, do you? No, no, no. We would have heard about it. I had the radio in the car tuned to the police calls. But if the cops snapped her... You kidding? There was nobody within miles of her. After you chucked the bag into her car, she took off. She'll show up, Vince. She better. She's got all the dough. Just what are you getting at? You told me yourself she's a very smart girl. Women who are beautiful shouldn't be brainy. Meaning? I think we got a double cross. You're nuts. I'll leave it to Sheppy. No, no, no. Janet wouldn't do that, Vince. Why not? Well, because well, she never did it before. Did she ever have 80 grand before? Look, what are you worried about? It isn't even 9 o'clock. Well, suppose she has a show by 9. Then I'll start looking for her. And if she isn't dead when I find her, she'll wish to heaven she was. <laughs> Hey, you guys got a butt. I'm fresh out. There's a pack in my coat pocket, Sheppy. Thanks. Carl, you wouldn't have anything else in that pocket. Like what, Vince? Like 80 grand. Pardon me for pointing, but it's 20 after 9. Your girlfriend hasn't shown up yet. So? So I think we ought to start looking for her. Suppose she comes back in the meantime. You can always leave a note. No, no. I think one of us ought to hang around here. Who, for instance? Why, do you want to? Maybe I better. Okay, you wait here. Sheppy, you cover the east side. You know the places Janet likes. Yeah, I got you. What are you going to do, Hoffman? I got an angle I want to try. Like what? Never mind. But if Janet's tossing us a curve, I think I know the one guy who can throw her out at home. I'll let you know how I make out. Yeah? I'd like to see Mike Waring, the Falcon, please. You are now. Oh, well, uh, my name's Carl Huffman. Yeah? Uh, can I come in? Oh, sorry. Thanks. Sit down. Much obliged. Now, what's on your mind? Well, I'm looking for a girl. Aren't we all? No, I mean, this is a special one. Her name is Janet Halsey. Janet Halsey? Yeah. She's my girlfriend. Well, maybe we'd better take this from the beginning. Well... Janet and I were supposed to be married next Sunday. So I opened up a joint account for us at the bank. How big? $2,000. And she skipped? Mm-hmm. This morning. She lived at the Brighton Towers. How do you know she didn't meet with an accident? Well, she's done the same thing before. Oh, she has? Yeah. She served three years in the women's penitentiary under the name of Lois Hart. She got out in 48. Well, how come you trusted her with your money? Well, you know how it is, Waring. You always hope that this time it's going to be different. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll see what I can do, Hoffman. As you say, the first problem is to locate the girl. Yeah, and the moment you do, will you give me a call? I'll be waiting at the Brighton. Brighton? Didn't you say that's where your girlfriend lives? Yeah. I'm using her apartment to operate from. Uh-huh. You see, I wouldn't want to miss her if she came back. Well, I guess that does it, Falcon. I'll be waiting for your call. An hour has 
has passed since Carl Hoffman recruited Mike Waring in his search for Janet Halsey. And now as we find Mike, he is making a tour of some of the shadier spots on New York's 3rd Avenue. You're looking for someone, mister? As a matter of fact, I am. Falcon. Hello, Joey. A long time no see, pal. What can I do for you, Mike? Well, you're a man who knows all the wrong people. Ever hear of a girl named Janet Halsey? Huh? Huh? We seem to have an audience. Yeah, and I like your act, mister. Only I missed the last line. Would you mind repeating it? Now, cut it out, Sheppy. This is Mike Warren. I don't give a rap who he is. What do you want with Janet Halsey? I don't think that's any of your business. All right. Suppose we take a little walk outside. No, thanks. It's too hot. That's all right. I got something in my pocket to chill you off. Now, take it easy, Sheppy. keep out of this, Joe. What do you say, Waring? I don't seem to have much choice in the matter. No. So start walking. I'm sorry, Mike. It's all right, Joey. All in a day's work. Quit gabbing. Come on, I haven't got all day. Look, if you'd like to put this off, I'll be a wise guy. Okay, where do we go from here? Let's try that alley. Now, look, you heard me. All right, hold it. This is fine. Now, let's pick up where we left off. What do you want with Janet? It's a long story, Sheppy. It's okay. You're not going anywhere. Oh, I might surprise you. Here, let go. Get, get a hand out of your pocket. Let go or I'll what? All right, punk, on your feet. Let me alone. I said on your feet. Why are you so interested in Janet Halsey? Maybe I'm looking for her, too. Maybe. And then again, maybe you know where she is. No. Where can I find her? I got no idea. Well, get one. Let me go. Come on, Sheppy. I can keep this up all night. <laughs> Have you been to the Brighton Towers? No, but someone else has, and she wasn't there. Well, you might... You might try the Riverdale. Apartment 4E. Well, thanks a lot, fella. You've been a great help. Let's do it again sometime. Ship event. Out looking. Did he phone in? No, I guess he had nothing to report. How did you make out? Not so hot. I guess that leaves me up the well known creek. What are you griping about? We're all in the same boat. Yeah, but I didn't bring Janet into the act. You did, Hoffman. Okay, and I'll find her. I don't see him making any progress. Maybe not, but I hired somebody who will. Who? A fellow named Mike Waring. A private dick? That's right. What's the idea? You going off your trolley? Relax, will you, Vince? I gave him a song and dance about wanting to find Janet. This guy wearing has plenty of contact. Well, I don't like it. And you're the boy with belly aching that I wasn't doing anything. You didn't have to go that far. Oh, how far would you go for 80 grand? Yeah, I guess you're right. Thanks. That must be Sheppy. I'll take it. Yeah, what do you want? I beg your pardon. I must have the wrong number. Wait a minute. Is that you, Janet? Hello. Hello. What's the trouble? I think that was Janet. You're imagining things. Don't tell me. I'd recognize her voice anywhere. What made her call and then hang up? You know something, Vince? That's just what I was wondering. I'll be back in an hour. Hello? Hello, is it Janet Halsey's apartment? Yeah. It's Carl Hoffman there. Who's calling? Mike Waring. We just stepped out for a while. Want to leave a message? Who's this? Okay, I'm a friend of his. My name is Vince Dario. Well, tell Hoffman I've got a lead on his girlfriend. He's supposed to be at Riverdale Arms. If you'll meet me at the 86 Club, we'll go over together. Thanks a lot, Mr. Waring. I know Carl will be glad to hear that. Waring. Waring, over here. Uh, it's about time, Hoffman. Sorry, I'm late, but I just got your message. Where'd you get your dope from? A punk named Sheppy Oliver. What? Yeah, he pulled a gun on me. That's the funniest thing I've heard yet. Is it? <laughs> yeah. Sheppy's a friend of mine. Oh, that's so. Sure. When he heard you asking for Janet, he must have gotten suspicious. Why? Well, he's not very bright. What was that address he gave you again? Riverdale Arms. That's what I thought. It's a bump steer. How do you know? That's where Sheppy lives himself. Why would he give me his own address? Probably rattled him so badly. It was the only thing he could think of. Well, that's one possibility. Can you think of any other? Yeah, maybe Janet had a partner. You mean Sheppy? Why not? He's my best friend. Uh-huh. Janet was your best girl. Let's go see who's playing on whose team. one down the hall, Waring. You know, there's one thing that throws me. Only one? After I left your office, 
I went back to Janet's apartment. I was talking with Vince Dario when the phone rang. So? A girl got on. I would have sworn it was Janet, but she claimed it was the wrong number. Well, maybe she's trying to get in touch with Sheppy, and she got frightened when she heard your voice. Could be, but I never thought Sheppy was her type. This is the place. I just can't believe that he... Hmm. What's the matter? Unlock? Yeah. Yeah. Just as I figured. Well, I guess I better call the police, huh? Well, what's the matter? Take a good look. Holy smoke. It's Sheppy. Yeah, and with that slug in his head, I don't think he's in any position to call the cops himself. Where's the phone? Come on, Vince, open up. What took you so long? I was busy. Who's your friend? No, it's right. You boys haven't met. Mike, this is Vince Dario. How do you do? Hi. How did that lead pan out? Not too bad. You find Janet there? No, we found Sheppy. I don't get it. He was murdered. Murdered? By who, Janet? That's one way to look at it. Still running out of Yeah, I suppose Janet was working with a man. If you mean Sheppy, I don't see it. That's just what I said. Look, Carl, suppose we forget the whole thing. What do you mean? We gambled and lost. Oh, you surprised me, Vince. A couple hours ago, you were balling me up and not doing anything. Now you're willing to write the whole thing off. There's no use crying over spilt milk. Sure. With 80 grand in your pocket, you can always buy yourself another quart. Oh? You say something, Waring? Just oh. Look, Carl, you've been hinting at something all along. What is it? I think you know where Janet is. You're crazy. I was a sucker not to see it before. Don't be a fool, Carl. Can't you see what Janet's doing? She murdered Sheppy. Now she's turning us against each other. But somebody put her up to it, and I got a feeling it. Shoot! Quit it, quit it you stupid! Cut it out, Hoffman. Where this, Mike? Where is she, Vince? Come on, Hoffman, break it up. Mike, let go. I said break it up. Okay. Dario. What was the idea, Hoffman? I don't like double crosses. Get the keys out of his pocket. What for? I got a hunch Janet is holed up in his apartment, and I'm going to play it to the hilt. <laughs> Only a few minutes have passed since Carl Hoffman decided that Janet might be hiding in Vince Dario's apartment. Now he and Mike are at Dario's, but so far there's been no sign of Janet. Well, looks like your hunch was worthless, Hoffman. Did you try the kitchen? I've been all over the place. There's no one here. I still believe that Janet was... Uh, wait a minute. Open that drawer again. Hmm? I thought I saw an envelope in there. Hey, you're right. It's a Vince Dario. 2719 Bolton Avenue, Detroit. Look at the postmark. Bedford Hills, March 16th, 1948. Now look at the return address on the other side. Janet Halsey, State Penitentiary for Women. Uh Uh-huh. You get it? And I was right. Vince knew Janet all along. Well, you could build up a convincing case on the face of it. Yeah, but where is she now? Can't you think of somewhere she might go? Oh, we've covered every possible hideout. No, we haven't. There's one place you're forgetting, Hoffman. Who's? Yours. What are you talking about? You're the man who put Janet up to this. You planned to double-cross your mom from the beginning. Yeah? Yeah, and I thought you did pretty well. You murdered Sheppy and framed Vince Dario, and that only left Janet to be taken care of. What about you? I don't think you're man enough. That just goes to... <laughs> What's the matter, Hoffman? You lose something? That's what you're looking for? Where'd you get that gun? I lifted it off you when you were shoving Dario around. Just say the word, friend, and I'll give it back to you. A slug at a time. Well, what happened after that, Mike? You know the rest, Janet. As soon as the police picked up Carl, I went to his apartment. And picked me up. And not a bad day's work at that. Thanks. No, no, I'm talking about the little bag you had with you containing 80 grand belonging to the McGill Company. Oh. Now, what gets me is how you people knew exactly what time the payroll was to be delivered. Oh, I had inside information. From the boy who delivered it? How did you guess? We figured. What did you do? Use your feminine wiles? It didn't take much. He wanted to prove what a great, big man he was. Mm-hmm. Well, you have that effect on the opposite sex. Do I? Yeah, it's just too bad you had all your work for nothing. Yeah, I guess when you come down to it, I was pretty lucky at that. You sure were, Angel. There's no doubt that with Sheppy and Vince Dario disposed of, you were next on Carl's list. 
dirty double-crosser. No, no, no. There's no reason to be angry. After all, you were in on 99% of the plot. He just neglected to tell you the big finish he planned for you. Oh, incidentally, when you called your apartment and got Hoffman on the phone, why did you pretend it was the wrong number? We had it arranged. When Carl picked up the phone and said, yes, what do you want, I knew he wasn't alone, and that was my cue to hang up. Mm, pretty cute. <laughs> that was the second way he convinced Dario he was acting above board. What was the first, Mike? Hiring me. He had to go through with the motions of trying to find you, and what would make him look more innocent than hiring a private detective? I still don't see what proved you he was guilty. Well, the return address on the envelope I found in Dario's room gave your name as Janet Halsey. And Carl told me when you were up at the women's pen, you served time under the name of Lois Hart. So, obviously, the letter was a frame. And Carl was the only one who could have planted it. That's right. You know, you're pretty wonderful, honey. I mean, uh, Mr. Waring. Oh, I don't mind you getting affectionate. After all, we're going to be seeing lots of each other, Janet. Are we? Mm-hmm. Oop. Almost past our destination. Is this where you live? <laughs> What's the matter with you, Janet? Don't you recognize the building? It's police headquarters. That's right. Why, you no good double Now, now, now. What are you complaining about, Angel? I promised you we'd be seeing a lot of each other. Can I help it if for the next ten years it'll have to be through bars? <laughs> Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Bartell. Drop your usual chair. Thank you. Ah, uh, that's it. Well, did you enjoy the Christmas holidays? <laughs> well, I've, I've had a whale of a time, thank you, but I don't think I can face a turkey or a mince pie for at least another year. <laughs> uh, how about you, Doctor? Oh, I had a very pleasant week, too, my boy. Parties, visitors, and a flattering number of Christmas messages to be answered. Oh, say, you got a new pipe. Is that a Christmas present? Yes, new pipe, new tobacco pouch, and a pound of my favorite tobacco. All of them sent to me from London by an old client and a friend of mine, Sir Ian Dunbar. An old client, huh? Well, do you mean he was one of your patients, or was he someone that you and the great Sherlock Holmes helped? The latter, Mr. Bartell. As a matter of fact, it was receiving this gift that reminded me of the story I've decided to tell you tonight. A story in which Sir Ian Dunbar played a prominent part. And how did it begin? The day before New Year's Eve in 1899, Sherlock Holmes and I sat in opposite corners of a first-class railway carriage as we sped towards Edinburgh in the Flying Scotsman. What took you and Sherlock Holmes up there, Doctor? It started off as a holiday visit, Mr. Bartell. My old friend Sir Walter Dunbar had asked Holmes and me to spend a few days with him at Dunbar Castle, about 20 miles outside Edinburgh. After we left King's Cross Station, Holmes... His sharp, eager face framed in his deer stocking cap dipped into the bundle of fresh papers which he'd brought with him. We'd left Bedford far behind us before he thrust the last one of them under the seat, leaned across, and offered me his cigar. Care for cigar, Watson? No, 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 thanks, awful. I'll, I'll stick to my pipe. Flying Scotsman's living up to its name. We're going splendidly. Our present rate is 53 and a half miles an hour. Oh, I haven't noticed the quarter-mile post. Nor have I, but the telegraph posts on this line are 60 yards apart. With the aid of a watch, the calculation is a simple one. Watson, my dear fellow, we have several hours ahead of us. Now, tell me more about Sir Walter Dunbar. I have a feeling that he's in some kind of trouble, or that you haven't wanted to talk about it. Well, it's not exactly trouble, Holmes, but there's a strange problem that confronts the Dunbar. There's a problem that will be settled at midnight tomorrow. Oh, indeed. Night of New Year's Eve, eh? Yes, exactly. But uh, to really appreciate the story, I have to begin by telling you of the death of old Sir Thomas Dunbar. The father of the present baronet, I suppose. Yes, he was severely wounded at Waterloo, though he managed to last out long enough to get back to Dunbar Castle. The story goes that as he lay there on his deathbed, he told his wife of his plans for their unborn child. Uh, dinner grave, lass. <laughs> I fetched the baronet's here home from Waterloo. What if I fetch the mortal wound as well? Oh, hush, lass. I'm not afraid to die. All that niggles me is that I shall never see the child you bear. Is Sir Wattle Scott no coming yet? Eh, can he visit the deathbed of his old friend? Oh, who's there? Is that you, Sandy Murdoch? Aye, right, Thomas. It's me. Aye. I'm leaving an unborn son behind me when I die. Now, I don't trust women or children or banks, for that matter. Put the best part of my wealth and gold in the big iron box you'll find under the bed. The money's there. 
Uh, I am something else for a rainy day. You have to keep that box in trust for me, Sandy. You can turn it over to my boy on the New Year's Eve before his 21st birthday. And he'll be a man and wise enough to know how to use it. You understand, Sandy? All right, Thomas. But supposing your bairn's a girl. A girl? I tell you, it'll be a boy. <laughs> and we'll name him Walter after my good friend, Sir Walter Scott. <laughs> Very interesting story, Watson. And that child, of course, is the gentleman we are going to see now, Sir Walter Dunbar. Exactly. And the first baronet was a friend of Sir Walter Scott, while his son can boast of your acquaintance. Why, it's a, it's a family singularly rich in literary friendships. That's not very funny, Holmes. Uh, to continue, I suppose you can guess what happened. Sir Thomas carefully drew up a document to specify. The New Year's Eve before the baronet's 21st birthday. And the poor child was born on February the 29th. <laughs> The leap year. Oh, so poor Sir Walter is still waiting for his iron box full of gold. Yes, he'll be 84 next year, and yet legally, with only one birthday every four years in the eyes of the law, he'll at last be 21. A most amusing situation, <laughs> though I'm afraid Sir Walter finds it far from entertaining. Hmm? <laughs> the lawyers must have been extremely scrupulous in abiding by the letter of the document. Yes, old Sandy Murdoch is dead now, of course, but he too is a great grandson, William Murdoch, who still handles the Dunbar estate. He'll be at the castle tonight to formally hand over the iron box. I'm delighted you accepted the holiday invitation of Sir Walter. My dear fellow, I've needed a rest, but uh, I've always loathed too strict a one. This situation may pose a nice little problem for me. Problem? Yes, I'm reasonably certain that the aged Sir Walter Dunbar will not get his iron box full of gold on this New Year's Eve either. But we shall see, old fellow. We shall see. <laughs> Dr. Watson, I'm glad to see you and Mr. Holmes here at the castle. Thank you, my boy. Holmes, this is Ian Dunbar, Sir Walter's grandson. How do you do, Mr. Dunbar? I'm very proud to meet you, Mr. Holmes. I've heard a lot about you. A grandfather will be down in a few moments. Let's go into the library, shall we? Well, I imagine Sir Walter's quite excited about tonight's ceremony, isn't he? <laughs> Wouldn't you be? If you'd waited 63 years too long for an inheritance. <laughs> Thank the Lord I had the foresight to be born on the prosaic date of August the 21st. <laughs> Even if your grandfather's death, you would be the next baronet, I take it. Yes, Mr. Holmes. You see, my father was killed two months ago at Mafeking. Yes, yes, I read about it in the papers, my boy. I'm, I'm very sorry. Thank you, Doctor. The opening of the box isn't going to be the only ceremony at midnight. Dorothy and I are announcing our engagement. Uh, Dorothy? Uh, Dorothy Small. She and her father are staying here, too. My congratulations. Yes, yes, indeed, Ian. Indeed, mine, too. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's been quite a battle with her father, though. He's a businessman and isn't impressed with titles when they aren't accompanied by a suitable income. But when we told him about the inheritance, he relented and gave his consent. Ah, here's Dorothy now. Dorothy, darling, I want you to meet two friends of mine, Mr. Sherlock Holmes and uh, Dr. Watson. How do you do? Now, how do you do, Miss Moore? Uh, how are you, my dear? From what this young man's been telling us, I... I gather that congratulations are in order. Thank you. <laughs> I finally persuaded Father that Ian would make a worthy son-in-law. For a while, I was afraid we'd have to elope to Gretna Green, oh, live in a cottage on bread and cheese and love and brave the parental wrath, just as they do in the storybooks. Oh, Sir Walter, there you are. Uh, Watson, my dear boy, uh, how are you? And this must be your friend Sherlock Holmes. How do you do, Sir Walter? <laughs> Vera will for a young nipper who'll be 21 at midnight. <laughs> oh, uh, gentlemen, may I introduce Mr. Herbert Small? How do you do, sir? Do, sir? I believe that we have to congratulate you on the engagement of your daughter. Hmm. That was supposed to remain a secret until midnight. Mm -hmm. The Dunbar box was finally opened. Oh. Didn't be grouchy, Herbert. The children are in love, and I'm going to settle money on Ian. And it's New Year's Eve. Let's enter into the spirit of the occasion. Bring out the glasses, Ian. I've had some bottles of my special pride put out. <laughs> it's the <laughs> finest port in Scotland. The cream of Dunbar. <laughs> My father laid the first bottle down the year before I was born. And a drink of the brew will surely warm the cockles of your heart. Well, my mouth's watering already, Sir Walter. Hey, when is this uh, lawyer fellow, young Murdoch, getting here? Oh, any moment, Herbert. 
As soon as he arrives, we'll have dinner, and then we'll be ready for the evening ceremony. He's bringing the famous iron box with him, Sir Walter? If he doesn't, they won't get any dinner, Holmes. Ian, pass the glasses around, my boy. Ah, here you are, Murdoch. Good evening, Sir Walter. Oh, you've got the box with you, I see. Now the party's complete. Oh, let me introduce you. Miss Small, her father, Mr. Small, my grandson, Ian, you know. Mr. Sherlock Holmes... Dr. Watson. How do you do, sir? Mm-hmm. I'm sorry I'm late, Sir Walter. My train was delayed. Oh, that's all right, my doc. You're here, and you brought the box. That's all that matters. Ian, give our young lawyer a drink. Here, I'll help you pour it. I nice must time. say that this is rather exciting, Holmes. The famous iron box with its inheritance of gold. Yes, and from the size of the box, at a rough guess, I should estimate its cubic content in gold at around 5,000 pounds. Not a vast sum, perhaps, to a businessman like Mr. Small, but a windfall to an impecunious Scottish baronet. Yes, that's what it is. A strong young man, Mr. Murdoch. How do you mean strong, Holmes? A box that size, full of golden sovereigns, would weigh a considerable amount. And yet the lawyer carried it single-handed. And now that we're all assembled, I'm going to propose a toast. Though it's still some hours off yet, let's drink to the new year. It means a lot to some of us. To 1900! 1900. We should toast more than just 1900, Sir Walter. We should drink to the new century that's about to begin. Good idea, Dorothy. Well, I'm afraid that wouldn't be quite appropriate, Miss Small. To be accurate, the 20th century won't begin until January the 1st, 1901, and not 1900. Of course. That's it. Dorothy, I'm afraid your wedding can't take place for some time yet. Father, what are you talking about? I read an article in The Guardian the other day that said just the same thing as you, Dr. Watson. And what's more, it said something even more important. It said that 1900 is not a leap year. Oh, rubbish. Leap year comes every four years. There was one in 1896, then obviously 1900 is one. I think Mr. Small may be right. What do you say, Mr. Holmes? Do you know? Well, I hope no one would bring up this point, but <laughs> it's the a little problem I referred to on the train, my dear Watson. Yes, Holmes, for heaven's sake, answer. Is 1900 a leap year or no? I'm afraid it's not, Sir Walter. No? no. Because of a slight imbalance that would otherwise be produced in the calendar. Of the even century years, only those divisible by 400 are leap years. In other words, 1600 was a leap year, and the year 2000 will be a leap year, but uh, 1800 and 1900 are not leap years. Then you have no birthday next year, Sir Walter, and I'm afraid I can't open the box tonight. And the Dunbars won't get their inheritance. And you, my dear, don't marry for a few more years. I won't allow you to marry a pauper. Mr. Holmes, are you sure of your fact? I'm very much afraid that I am, young man. Oh, this is terrible. I can't stand anymore. No, no, no. Don't take it too bad, Mr. Walter. Here, here, sir. Here, drink this. Uh, yeah. That's it. After all, you only have to wait another four years. Another four years? At my age, young man. At my age. Oh, no. I shall never live that long. Hey, what is it, Angus? Dinner is prepared, Sir Walter. You can serve it as soon as you're ready, sir. <laughs> Walter's gone to his room, the young lovers are nearly in tears, and Small and the lawyer Murdoch seem to be positively gloating. Yes, a most depressing atmosphere in which to welcome the new year. But let us at least make the best of it. I think I'll go and have a talk with Sir Walter. And you, my dear chap, why not try and cheer up the young folks? Mm. Some of your experiences in India may make them take their minds off their troubles. Yes, quite no, dear. I'll join you in the library. Call me if you if you want me, Holmes. Ah... There you are, my dears. Hello, Dr. Watson. All alone in front of the fire, eh? <laughs> I'm afraid we're not in very good spirits. Sir. Oh, nevertheless, I'll sit down here and join you, if you don't mind. Misery loves company, you know. <laughs> you're, you're very kind, Doctor. Oh, I was just trying to persuade Ian to elope with me. But he's being most ungallant. He won't even consider it. How can I, darling? I've got under 200 pounds a year in my own right. How could we live on that? I was counting on the money the grandfather was going to give us to get me started. Now, 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 Miss Small, a little earlier, you talked of Gretna Green and bread and cheese and oh, love in a cottage. Yes, <laughs> there's a lot to be said for it, you know. Well, to be said for it, yes, Doctor. But have you ever tried it? Not literally, my boy, but uh, I may tell you that when Mary, my wife, and I were first married, I had very little money. In fact, my income was just about the sum that you mentioned. And uh, we were very happy. Ah, but you have a profession, Doctor. Look at me. 
I've been trained for nothing except to be lad of Dunbar Castle. I can't support a wife on tradition. But you're young, Ian. You can get some kind of position. I'm sure you yes, can. Yes, of course, of course. As a matter of fact, I think that... Holmes, what is it? What's wrong? There's devil's work afoot, Watson. Come with me, old fellow. And you, Mr. Dunbar. Mr. Holmes, what's happened? It's Sir Walter. I went to his room. It was in darkness. But in the moonlight, I saw two figures struggling by the open casement. One of them was Sir Walter. As I entered, he disappeared from sight. His attacker had pushed him out of the window into the moat. How dreadful. The other man got away in the darkness. We must get lanterns and go out to the moat at once. Though I'm very much afraid, Mr. Dunbar, that your grandfather is beyond our help. Dr. Watson will be back in just a second, so I'd just like to remind you that if you want to serve a wine over the holidays that you're sure the ladies will enjoy, serve Petri California Muscatel. Petri Muscatel is a golden wine with a wonderful flavor. The flavor of big, plump Muscat grapes. And you know what a flavor that is. I'm sure you'll find that Petri Muscatel is the favorite wine of all women, just as Petri Port is the favorite wine with men. And incidentally, if you're not sure which to get, Petri Muscatel or Petri Port, don't buy one, buy two. Get them both, and you'll be sure to please everyone. Now, to get back to our story... Someone had pushed poor old Sir Walter out of his bedroom window and into the moat below. Isn't that right, Dr. Watson? Yes, Mr. Bartell, of course. We grabbed lanterns as fast as we could and rushed outside, but it was a hopeless task. The water was eight or ten feet deep, and it seemed obvious that the elderly Sir Walter wouldn't have a chance of saving himself. But we searched on the thicker, bobbing lanterns and the scurrying figures in the frosty moonlight, forming a weird, fantastic... Angus, bring a lantern over here. Aye, sir. Can you see anything, Holmes? Not a thing. And I don't see why your friend doesn't call the police, Dr. Watson. He's accomplishing nothing. He thought there might be a chance of finding the old man alive, Mr. Small. He wants to avoid a scandal, if possible, for your sake, sir, as well as the Dunbar's. The scandal can't touch me or Dorothy over this. Her engagement was never announced. Thank heaven. That's a great pity, sir. I should think some new blood in your family would be a great improvement. You're being confoundedly impertinent, and Doctor. And you'll be confoundedly heartless, sir. Well, Holmes, have, have you given up hope? I'm afraid we'll never find him without dragnets and grappling hooks. I have to call the police. What time is it? Sir Ian, you know the time? What did you call me, Mr. Holmes? Sir Ian. My curious. It does seem a bit premature, Holmes, but of course you're right. If your poor grandfather's dead, Mr. Dunbar, you're the baronet now. And the time, Sir Ian? It's, it's a quarter to twelve, Mr. Holmes. A quarter of an hour to the new year, Sir Ian. Doesn't that fact suggest something to you? Yes. Yes, it does. So I'm the new baronet, am I? Very well, then. There'll be no more talk of the police for 15 minutes. I want all of you to come back to the castle with me. As the last chime of midnight rings out, I shall have a statement to make. A statement that I want you all to hear. He brought us all back here for home. There's something very funny going on. I tell you, I don't like the look of it. And I, Watson, like the look of it very much. I wish you wouldn't be so dashed mysterious. What are you up to? You haven't taken a step yet towards finding the murderer? Haven't I? And I wonder what causes the beads of perspiration on Mr. Small's brow. Small? You mean that Small... Yes, and I wonder the... what causes the singular look of apprehension on the face of Murdoch, the young lawyer. You remember, of course, on my remarking how easily he carried the large iron box. Chris Scott, yes. And it took a strong man to throw Sir Walter out of the window. Watson, huh? the new year is approaching. Ladies and gentlemen, in view of our recent tragedy, this is one New Year's Eve when none of us feels like song and jollity. But there still remains a ritual duty for me to perform. Mr. Murdoch, open the iron box, please. But, but, but I can't do that. It was only to be opened for your grandfather. No, Mr. Murdoch. The phrase was that it was to be opened on the New Year's Eve before the baronet's 21st birthday. I am now the baronet, and I shall be 21 next year on August 21st. Open the box, please, Mr. Murdoch. Ian, darling, how frightfully clever of you. Good I? lad, I hoped you'd think of it. But, Sir Ian. Murdoch. Open that box. Very well, Sir Ian. But I'm afraid you're in for something of a shock. Great, Scott, the, the box is empty. Except for a sheet of note paper in the bottom. What's the meaning of this, Murdoch? Read that paper, Sir Ian, and you'll understand. 
I owe you 4,000 sovereigns. And it's signed Alexander Murdoch on behalf of Murdoch and Murdoch, lawyers. You'd better explain this. It's the family skeleton, Sir Ian. That note is signed by my great-grandfather, the one that witnessed the original deed concern in the box. As soon as Sir Walter was born on that February the 29th, my great-grandfather realized the money wouldn't have to be produced for 84 years. And so he stole it. He borrowed it. He always intended to pay it back, but he was never able to. When he died, he told my father of his secret, and my father in turn told me. We've always planned to put back the money, Sir Ian, but we've never been able to. This is daylight robbery. You should prosecute the me and the firm still in business. You can ruin them. You can sue them for every penny they have. Mr. Small, you've already shown a marked aversion to my family. I suggest you allow me to handle their affairs. Bravo, Ian. How dare you, Dorothy? Go to your room. No one's going to their room. No one's leaving here until the police arrive. I'm convinced that one of you murdered my grandfather tonight. And if you ask me, it's obvious who that someone is. Who, Dr. Watson? You, Mr. Murdoch. You came here planning to kill poor old Sir Walter because you never intended to open that box. You thought that your secret would die with him. That's a lie. I was going to tell him everything and then ask for time to pay the money. I didn't kill of him. Of course he didn't. There's your murderer. You yourself, Ian. Father, what are you saying? I'm saying that Ian's the murderer. He saw that the box wasn't going to be open for another four years. He realized that the money couldn't marry Dorothy, so he killed his grandfather and then ordered the box open. You're trying to cover yourself. You pushed grandfather out of that window tonight. You thought that if he died, the box would never be opened. So Dorothy couldn't marry me. You, you... You don't gentlemen, up. gentlemen, please. Well, upon my soul, Holmes, you seem remarkably calm. Do I, my dear Watson? I must say I'm absolutely fascinated by listening to three people accusing each other of murder and each of them producing perfectly sound motives. It's a remarkable example of the dangers of reasoning from motive alone. We should profit by experience, Watson. Mr. Holmes, how can you be so calm? There's a murderer in this I room. I suppose this mm-hmm. game of charades is getting a little out of hand, Miss Small. Let's conclude it. You'd better come out now. That tapestry, it's moving. A happy new year to you all. Grandfather. Sir Walter, how am I seeing a ghost? Oh, Sir Walter, you're all right. Well, what kind of a game have you been playing? It's a bunny game that Holmes and I invented. You might call it forcing the issue. I was determined to have the box open before the next four years were out, whilst I was still alive to look inside it. But the trickery of your family, Murdoch, has made me a very unhappy man. Sir Walter, I shall pay back the money in a few years. I swear I will. It'll be too late to do me any good, but I'll take care that Ian gets it. I've half a mind to prosecute you. Grandfather, the money isn't important now that you're all right. Uh, you were counting on it just the same, my boy. So that you could marry Dorothy. I know that. Uh, she'll never marry a pauper. I won't allow it. When I'm 21, you can't stop me, Father. And I am going to marry Ian. Be quiet. Sir Walter, this is a very unsavory business. Uh, I think that you owe us an explanation of your behavior tonight. You tell him, Holmes. I fancy a wee drop of cream of Dunbar. Watching you all search for my body in the moat has made me thirsty. <laughs> The explanation is a very simple one, ladies and gentlemen. When you arrived here tonight, Mr. Murdoch, I knew from the way you handled the box that it could not contain the sum of gold it was supposed to. And so you, you suspected fraud and devised a plan to force the opening of the box, Yes, huh? and Sir Walter was an eager conspirator. Of course I was. Ian is 21 next August. Supposing, supposing I had died after he came of age and before my next birthday, four years hence, the box would never have been opened. And so we invented the fake murder story. By the way, Ian... I must congratulate you for grasping the possibilities of the situation so speedily. If you hadn't demanded the opening of the box, the Murdoch secret might still be a secret. It was a clever plan, Holmes. It's too bad that it had to have such a miserable ending. I'm not sure that we have finished with the matter. Uh, Mr. Murdoch. Yes, Mr. Holmes. You say that your family took 4,000 pounds from that box? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Curious. I would have sworn from its size that it would hold closer to 5,000. And in your account of the legend, Watson, you told me that Sir Thomas Dunbar... Stated on his deathbed that he had put something else in the box. <laughs> something for a rainy day, is that yeah. it? Mm-hmm. Did the Murdochs find that extra something? No, Mr. Holmes. They found nothing but the gold. Oh, that's very odd. I think I'll take a closer look at that box, if you don't mind. Since this seems to be a night of telling secrets, I think you might as well know, Father, that if you don't give your consent, I shall elope with him. Oh, bravo, my oh, dear, bravo. No such thing. <laughs> I admire your resolution, young lady, but I hardly think it will be necessary. What do you mean, Holmes? Permit me to show you all the treasure of the Dunbars. What are you found, Holmes? The something for a rainy day that old Sir Thomas spoke of. You see, since the cubic contents of the box obviously differed from my calculations, I deduced the existence of a false bottom. I was correct. And in that space, I found this. Oh, it's, it's a manuscript. Quite so, the manuscript of a book. Look at the title page and see the author's name. A history of the Dunbar family. 
by Sir Walter Scott. Scott? I think, Sir Walter, that an original and unpublished manuscript by your distinguished namesake will prove worth several times the gold that is missing from that box. You've saved the day for us, Holmes, my boy. God bless you. Oh, oh, this has been as strange a new year as ever I knew. But it's turned out to be a bonny one, thanks to you, Holmes. Well, fill up your glasses. We're going to drink a toast to the New Year. Ah, Joe, yes, Sir Walter. This is really a happy occasion. (laughs) Then let's complete it by singing the traditional song of the season, Old Lang Syne. And in this case, when we sing, Should Old Acquaintance Be Forgot, I feel that in our hearts we should be thinking of Sir Walter Scott. He died over 60 years ago. He's made us all very happy here tonight. Uh... Should old acquaintance be forgot and never Doctor, that turned out to be a very happy new year for all concerned. Yes, that's one new year that I'll never forget. Well, I sure hope you'll always remember this one, too. Oh, just a second, my boy. That calls for a glass of port. Fine. Uh, well, to a, to a happy new year, my boy, for you and for our many friends listening in. And to you, Doctor. <laughs> oh, thanks, boy. <laughs> ah, that's good. Doctor, this has indeed been a pleasant association for me. Oh, I'm glad to hear it. You're the best storyteller I've ever known, and the Petri family makes the best wine I've ever tasted. <laughs> I hope that just as they've been making wine for generations in the past, the Petri family will continue to make fine wine in the future. Oh, uh, and Mr. Bartell, I know that you'll always be here to tell us just how good that Petri wine is. <laughs> well, I hope so, Doctor. <laughs> and I hope you'll always be right here beside me to... Tell another swell story about oh, Mr. Holmes. So too, my boy. <laughs> oh, and incidentally, Doctor, what new adventure are you planning to tell us next week? Next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you a weird story. It starts with a series of murders on Hampstead Heath and ends with a battle to the death in a burning waxworks. I call it the strange case of the murderer in wax. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Silver Blades. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studio. This is Harry Bartell saying good night for the Petri family. For a solid hour of exciting mystery dramas, listen every Monday on most of these same stations at 8 o'clock to Michael Shane, followed immediately by Sherlock Holmes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. I would like to thank Phyllis White for taking the time to tell us about her husband, Anthony Boucher, and also about Dennis Green, and those wonderful times, not so long ago, when Holmes and Watson were played by Rathbone and Bruce. The two episodes you have just heard are part of the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, Starring Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce, and are a 1988 copyrighted production of 221A Baker Street Associates. The Sherlock Holmes stories, and the characters of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. John H. Watson, were created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and are used with the kind permission of Dame Jean Conan Doyle. This is Ben Wright. Won't you join me again sometime soon? two more new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Thank you for listening. Night, the 
Street. Hi, this is Randy Stone. I cover the night beat for the Chicago Star. Stories start in many different ways. This one began when I bumped into a little old man who claimed he was dead and proved it. Night Beats, starring Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. My job is to prowl Chicago at night looking for that ever-loving story that's always out there in the darkness waiting for me. But, like most working stiffs, one day a week, I'm a free man. And this was that day. It was one of those hot spring days that come at you out of nowhere. Hot like only Chicago and one other place can get. I woke up late in the afternoon and went outside for a breath of humidity. I opened my collar and rolled up my sleeves. Man, it was sizzling. There was a little park ahead. I was just going to stretch out on the grass when I saw him. My first thought was, pass the salt tablets quick. The sun's got me and I'm seeing things. But no, he was real, all right. Sitting on a park bench on this boiling day, a fat old guy in a heavy overcoat with muffler, galoshes, and gloves. I went over to him. He looked up and smiled. Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. Sit down. Sit down. You look tired. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Nothing is worth getting tired for. Man is here for such a little while. Yeah. Now, look, uh, forgive me for bringing this up, but I, I think it's only fair to tell you, at this moment, the temperature in this city is pretty close to 100 degrees. Oh, is that so? Yeah. <laughs> the two cents I trade everything I'm wearing for one heart shafter in Mark's fig leaf. You are lucky, young man. To feel the good sun, yes, that is something fine. As for me, I am chilled to the bone. In that overcoat and that muffler? Yes. <laughs> How could any living thing be cold on a day like this? Mm, I suppose that is just it. What? I'm not a living thing. No, I'm afraid I'm quite dead. I think I'll walk around a bit. Goodbye. Uh, I say, say. Huh? I, uh... I suppose I'm just inquisitive, but uh, you see, that's my business. I'm a newspaper man. Oh, yes. An honorable profession. Oh, thank you. Mm. Uh, just uh, why do you think you're dead? Think? So you don't believe me either. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's silly, isn't it? Uh, when did you die? Uh, the funeral was last week. A very nice funeral. I regret only that there were no plumed horses. Plumed horses? Uh -huh. In the old country, that was a requirement for the head of a family. But in America, of course, such customs seem foolish. Uh, yeah, yeah, foolish. Mm -hmm. yeah, you still don't believe me? Well, let's say that I'm just an old skeptic. All right, young man. To doubt everything in this life is to miss so much of life's true magnificence. You need a lesson. Uh, come with me. So I went with him, this strange man so comfortable in an overcoat on this oppressive day. We stopped at the first large office building and went into the lobby. The old man took me to the directory on the wall. Can you find the name of a doctor? A doctor? Why do you want a doctor? Oh, you will see. Uh-huh. Oh, uh, yes, yes, there's a Dr. E.M. Herrick, suite 706. Is he good? I don't know. He's the only one listed. Uh-huh. He doesn't have to be too good. Come on. The receptionist in the doctor's suite eyed us quite distastefully, but in a reasonable time, we were ushered into Dr. Herrick's presence. He was a nice little fella, but the sight of the old man seemed to confuse him. Now, uh, just what seems to be the trouble, Mr. Uh, uh... Henry Kazarian. Yes. Well? I want you to examine me and tell the newspaper man what you find. Newspaper man? Well, I'm afraid I don't understand. And I'm afraid I can't help you, Doc. Why not uh, examine him and let it go, then? Yes. Please do. 
But uh, what seems to be the trouble with you? Uh, what are your symptoms? Uh, my symptoms were discovering the world no longer needed me. That can be very painful. Oh, but this isn't anything for... Oh, wor- come on, Doc, will you? It's my day off. Let's get it over with, hmm? All right. Now, Mr. Kazarian, uh, take off your overcoat and shirt. The old guy undressed to the waist. His skin looked yellow and faded, but I figured that could happen to anyone his age. The doctor smiled, fastened his stethoscope to his ears, and began his examination. I put a cigarette in my mouth, but... I never lit that cigarette. I was watching the doctor. I was watching the color drain from his face. I was watching his fingers start shaking like he was trying to make nine the hard way. The doctor touched the stethoscope to a dozen parts of the old man's chest. Now he looked up, and it seemed to me, in those few seconds, he'd aged ten years. Mr. Kazarian, I... I want you to wait in the next room. Uh Now, what did you find, doctor? I'm sure the newspaper men would be most interested. I told... I told you to wait in the next room. Take your coat and shirt. I'll be right with you. Yes, all right. Thank you very much. Goodbye. I can't believe it. It's impossible. It's a trick, a hypnotic trick. No. No, no, that's not true. Oh, you're not going to tell me that that old man is really... Not the slightest heartbeat. What? No cardiovascular reaction whatsoever. That man is... He... Oh, no, this is crazy. Maybe it's your stethoscope. Maybe it's on the bum or something. No, no, that's not the answer. Then what is the answer? Are you trying to tell me that that guy is really dead? Let's get him back in here. Let's talk to him. Yes, yes, by all means. He's gone. But how? This door leads into the hall. He's not in the hall. You're not going to print this in the paper, are you? Print it? How could I? The city editor would fire me so fast my head would spin. He'd say I was dead drunk. But if you were to confirm... No. What? Never. If you or your editor or anyone else ever calls me about this, I'll swear I never saw you or the old man before in all my life. I have to protect my reputation. Uh, You can understand that, can't you? Understand? At this point, I understand very little, Herr Doctor. After I left the doctor's office, I looked around the building for the old man. He was gone, all right, but his memory lingered on. Who was fooling who? I went into a phone booth and called the medical association to ask about the professional standing of Dr. Herrick. A nasal-voiced young woman informed me that Dr. Herrick was one of the most able physicians in the city. And her manner indicated that I should have had my mouth washed out with soap for even asking. After that, I looked up the name Kazarian in the phone book. It was there, Henry Kazarian, 612 Post Street. I telephoned, but the line was busy, so I hopped into a cab and took a ride out. It was a neat little white bungalow, but all the shades were down. I rang the bell for a long time before the door opened. Yes? What is... I'd like to talk to Henry Kazarian. Who? Henry Kazarian. Henry. Oh, what's wrong? You have... You have not heard about my Henry. Hmm? He is dead. But, lady... We buried him. Two days ago. But that can't be. Oh, I can't believe it myself. It seemed like I suddenly wake up and there would be Henry saying, All right, Mama, get up. Get up, you're lazy enough for three wives. Uh, he was buried two days ago? Yeah, from Carell's Temple of Rest. A very wonderful service. All that was lacking was the plumed horses. The plumed horses. Oh, yes. mm, Papa, you would have been so mad if he knew there was no plumed horses. Uh, yes, he certainly was. Yeah. I mean that, uh... Mrs. Kazarian, I'd like to talk to you. May we go inside? No, or... but... We are in mourning. If you want to know about the funeral, talk to Mr. Carell. <laughs> Yes, I buried Mr. Kazarian. Why do you ask? I, uh, for the very trivial reason, Mr. Carell, that I spent the afternoon with him. Uh, 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 I'm a very busy man, Mr. Stone, very busy. You think I'm crazy, huh? 
Well, I never saw Kazarian in my life, but here's how he looked to me this afternoon. A short, fat guy, about 65. Looks like he ate too much good food all his life. A mustache that just about drooped down to his chin. You look a little pale, Mr. Carell. You uh, saw his picture somewhere? No! I tell you, he's alive. I even went with him to a doctor. Oh, really? Well, my goodness. And what did the doctor say? He, uh... Yes, <sighs> Mr. Stone? All right. Where is he buried? At a cemetery at the edge of the city. Uh, I've got to go there on, uh, well, another matter if you care to come along. Yes, indeed I would, Mr. Carell. Indeed I would. Uh, right here, Mr. Stone, this mound. You see, the earth is very fresh and the flowers have hardly wilted. But listen, Mr. Carell, it can't be him. Mr. Stone, the only reason I'm doing this is to avoid any stupid sensational publicity. Carell's Temple of Rest is one of the most highly respected... Yes, yes, and Dr. Herrick is one of the most highly respected doctors, and Mrs. Kazarian is a grieving widow. There's got to be a logical answer to this. There's just got to be. You are listening to Nightbeat. Starring Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. When the undertaker brought me back to town, I called an insurance clearinghouse to find out if anyone had cashed in a policy on Mr. Kazarian. No, Mr. Kazarian didn't carry any insurance, so that wasn't the answer. I was beginning to get a little panicky. It was after six o'clock and I wasn't a bit hungry. I started walking home to see if I could figure out one thing in all that happened that made even a little sense. <laughs> Best I could come up with was that everybody was right, that Kazarian really was dead. I was too, and I didn't know it yet. I, uh, as I laughed a great deal at that. But just the same, I weighed myself on the first penny scale I passed, and I looked at my tongue in the little mirror. I was just a couple of blocks away from home, and I felt somebody tugging at my sleeve. Mister, mm -hmm. what's the matter? You hot or something? What are you talking about? Somebody's following you. Following me? An old guy wearing an overcoat? No, a young fella. What? Don't look back yet, but he's wearing a blue sport jacket and he's built like an aircraft carrier. How long has he been following me? For the last few blocks. All right. Here. Uh, take this and then get lost. Sure. Thanks, mister. I figured yeah. you ought to know. I kept walking along. And after a while, I spotted his reflection. If only one quarter of those shoulders and that blue sport jacket were really his, I was in trouble. I stopped to light a cigarette. He stopped to tie his shoelace. I wiped the perspiration off my face. He smiled. No, he wasn't following me. It's just my imagination. I turned down a quiet street a few blocks from my rooming house. I looked back. Nobody. I found it was much easier to breathe. And then up ahead of me, somebody was waiting at the corner. Yup, shoulders. He'd circled around the other side of the block. Oh, great. I started walking past him like he wasn't even there. Mister. I'm. Let me say it just once. Uh, sure. Lay off. Fine. Goodbye now. I mean it. Lay off. Uh-uh. Now you've said it twice. Leave it alone. It's none of your business. I presume we're both talking about the same thing. The little man who wasn't there, Kazarian. What's the story on this guy? What's the gimmick? How can he be dead and buried? Mister, I ask you real nice and polite. Yeah, I know. Emily Post couldn't have done it better. But still, I'm going to find You're out. You're not going to find anything. <laughs> You're not going to find a thing. After a while, I started climbing out of the fog. And the way I felt, I wanted to climb right back in. All I had to worry about was history's most promising headache. It was after 9 o'clock when I got to my room... I took a couple of aspirins, flopped across the bed, and tried to relax. Only the street lamp kept shining in my eyes. I got up to pull down the shade. Then I saw the gray sedan parked across the street. Three guys piled out, and they started toward the rooming house. And leading the way was my old pal Shoulders, back for an encore. I headed for the back stairs. I went across a couple of backyards, came out on the side street, and now I was starting to get sore. I found a taxi and headed back for Kazarian's house. Taxi let me out about half a block down the street. Kazarian's house was all dark except for a tiny window in back. I went around to the window and looked in. And there was the old man. 
was sitting in a leather chair, smoking a pipe. I tapped on the window. He turned, recognized me, and smiled. And someone out in front of the house spotted me. There he is! Where? Where? I started running toward the backyard. They were right on my tail. I came to a fence. I found the gate. It was locked. Shoulders, who was heading the pack, was the first to reach me. You just won't stop, will you, Mr. Snoop? No, I just not. I tore away from him. I ran down the length of the backyard fence, tried to find an opening. The others were coming up fast. I told myself I could never jump over that fence, but with those guys closing in, I was a hard man to convince. And the next thing I knew, I was crouching behind a couple of garbage cans in the alley. And I thought, what a fine way to die, behind a garbage can, my lifeblood draining out on some old melon rhymes. You couldn't have gotten away. You must have. I told you to stop him. And then the footsteps passed me. My heart decided it was okay to start beating again. And then I went back to the house, and I found the old man's window. It was dark now, like the rest of the house, but the window was open a few inches. I started pushing it up some more. Who is that? It's me, Randy Stone. I'm coming in. I would not advise that young man. Really, it is quite foolish. Yeah, nobody knows that better than I. I'd appreciate it if you didn't call for help. Why should I? Mm -hmm. Where's the light switch? Oh, yeah. I see you're not wearing your overcoat now, nor your gloves. You're not so cold now, huh? No. Isn't that strange here in the house? I, I do not feel it nearly so much. Yeah, that is funny. Why, why are you coming toward me like that? I want to shake your hand, Mr. Kazarian, just a gesture of friendliness. Uh, but somehow you do not look at all friendly. Your hand. Surely. I thought so. It's as warm as mine. Very nice pulse, too. What's the story, Mr. Kazarian? Oh, you are mistaken, young man. I am dead. How were you able to fool that doctor? Why did the undertaker swear he buried you? Why is your wife in mourning? Why was I slugged? But these are questions I cannot answer. I, I'm an old man and I'm very tired. Would you say I was impolite if I asked you to leave? Sure, I'll leave. Would you say I was impolite if I asked you where I could find the nearest police station? Because that's where I'm going. You're not going anywhere, Stone. Pop, I told you to holler for us if he bought it. I knew there would be trouble. I just knew it. Dr. Herrick... <laughs> Life is full of trouble. Death is endless peace. If this gets in the paper, it'll be the end of everything. Oh, and Mr. Carell of the Temple of Rest, what a spot for a chorus of all Lang Syne. You keep real quiet, Stone. Oh, that's a deal, Shoulders. Well, I wish you would all leave. In my lifetime, I saw none of you. Now that I am dead, you crowd around me like vultures. Yes, Papa, we leave just so you shouldn't get excited. Come, boys. Well, Come leave boys. me in peace, huh? Leave me in peace. <laughs> Papa likes to sit by himself sometimes. George, you stop looking so tough. Nobody's afraid of you. Peter, why you just stand here and haul? Go to the kitchen, put up hot water for tea. Yes, Mama. Mama? Carell, you call her Mama? Of course, sir. Uh... Go to the kitchen, Peter, all of you. Go. I, I will explain to the young man. Perhaps I should do it, Mama. Mama again, you too, Dr. Herrick? Yes, No, I... no, I, I explain. Anna, you only use big doctor words. Nobody understands. Now, all of you, go. I said go to the kitchen. Uh, and, uh, George, the bread box is some baklava you serve with the tea. Yes, Mama. Mama, Mama, Mama. And you, young man, you come in here, in the parlor. Uh, yes, Mama. And we will close the door. Now I... I will tell you everything. So they're your sons? Yeah. Well, fine, boy. So Papa and I, we would have liked at least one girl. The doctor and the undertaker. Now it begins to make sense, but, but their names. For their work, they said they need American names. The old country, the name Caseria. Uh, young man, young man, that was a name. It meant something. But here it's got to be Carell and Herrick, hmm? Tell me about Papa. Uh, yeah, excuse me. 1910, Papa, me and the kids... We come to America. Even though an old country papa's head of whole Kassarian clan, we come. So kids go to school. Become more than gold herders, rug merchants. And they do. Uh, 
and boys too. But they married and drift away. Soon Papa and I are alone. And if the kids come over once every two months to see Papa, we think we are lucky. Imagine that Papa Kassarian head of whole family. And then last week, it started with Papa. I heard alarm clock go off. And I got up like I always do, sleepy thinking. All country exists for so many thousand years without alarm clocks. Why we need, huh? Why I shut alarm clock all Papa, Papa. Papa, where are you? I hurried to the house, and I found him in the kitchen, sitting at table in overcoat. Papa, so here you are. You feel all right. Mm -hmm. For dead men, I feel all right. For a dead man, you should not talk like that, Papa. You got many years Mm -hmm. ahead of you. I got eternity ahead of me. I call my son. I tell them. Papa is dead. You feel sick? Huh? I call him and he's a fine doctor. No, oh, woman, listen to me. I am not sick. No. I am dead. Do not call Armand the fine doctor. I call my son Peter, the fine undertaker. Mm-hmm. You do as I say. Tell them Papa is dead. <laughs> Papa, this is nonsense. I've given you a complete examination. You're not dead. You're in perfect health. You I do not need any more. Peter, you give me a good funeral. I want plumed horses. Papa, don't talk like that. You don't need any funeral. What am I to do? Just sit here? A dead man? Oh, you see, boys, you see how it is. Eh? Sometimes happens in a man of his age. Might be only temporary. I think we should put him in a sanitarium. No! Huh? Are you forgetting who Papa is, the head of whole family? But Mama, in his present condition... Also, the old country here in America, everywhere, the Cassarians, he's the head. Oh, just think what happened if they heard Papa had, had, had gone crazy. But we could keep it quiet, Mama. No, 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 news get out somewhere. It would be the end of everything. But Mama... Oh, wait, I, I'm on, uh, Mama's right. I've been thinking of something else. Yes? What about us, you and me? We've got our careers to think of. But I told you, these things are only temporary. All the more reason for not putting Papa away. If it's only temporary, then why can't we care for him here? Well, I... I suppose we could. Papa? Where are you going? Where can the dead man go? To walk the streets? Uh, don't let him out. Uh, humor him. Do, do something, Mama. Papa, I, I don't think you'd better go out. After all, maybe... Maybe you really are dead, like you say. And in that case... Uh, Papa, I- I'll give you a wonderful funeral. Uh, You'll see the best in town. With plumed horses? Yes, Papa, plumed horses, if you'll only do what we tell you. And stay in the house. Mama Kazarian didn't have to tell me anymore. They humored Papa so that he'd stay in the house, hoping his madness would pass, and his family and the rest of the clan would not be disgraced. But one morning he escaped, and that's when I met him. When he took me to his son, Dr. Herrick, and told him I was a newspaper man, the doc thought everything was about to fall apart, so he went along with Papa's madness. And so did Carell and the others. That's why I was followed. That's why shoulders slugged me. That's why they all came to my room later to try to talk to me. I promised to keep their confidence... Ate some of Mama's cookies, shook hands all around, and left. But as I was walking through the yard toward the street, a window opened. Young man. Hmm? Come over here, over to the window. Oh, Mr. Kazarian. Okay, sure. If you keep your voice down, I don't want them to hear. Hmm? Hmm? But you are a nice young man. I feel in you uh, an understanding. That is why I talked to you in the park. That is why I talk to you now. What do you mean? They tell you now, huh? How you say I am uh, cracked in the head, hmm? Insane. Because I say I am dead. Uh, Maybe, but let me tell you this. For 22 years, while I was not dead, and while I was sane, 
I worked 12, 14 hours a day. I never saw the sun. I never had time to think to remember the old days. Only work and work, work. Then, then my boys left me. And even my name they don't want. The name Kazarian. And then Mama and me was, was left alone. Yeah, that, that was the way it was when I was sane and alive. So? So? One morning I wake up and I say, Okay, if that is how it is when I'm alive, I no longer wish to be alive. I am dead. Now my sons come fast, I tell you. They say, No, no, he is not dead. He is insane. All right, I am too old to argue. Hmm? But now that I am insane, I no longer lift even this little finger. No work. <laughs> no worry. And my boys stay with us constantly, like like the old days. <laughs> I, I, I snap my fingers and they shiver. Now, today, I think maybe Armand is getting too smart again, so I bring you to his office. Did you see what happens? <laughs> Did you see what happens? <laughs> well, you old faker. <laughs> so, uh, what do you say I should do? <laughs> should I call the bin and say, Okay, I am not dead. I am alive. And give up everything I got now? So they can say I am sane again? Well, should I, young man? Eh? Hmm? Should I? <laughs> oh, Papa, if you did that... Uh... Would only prove one thing. Hmm. And what is that? Well, if you called them in and told them the truth, you'd be the craziest man alive. All this and a moral, too, huh? All right, I'll give you a moral. All Papa Kazarian wanted was not to be left out in the cold. I guess maybe that's just about what all of us want. To be needed by somebody, to be loved by somebody. And why not? Is that such a big deal? In all this cockeyed, crazy world, what else do any of us ever really have? Except each other. Copy boy... Oh, no, what am I saying? Copy boy. This was my day off, Remember? Night Beat, a new dramatic series stars Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. Night Beat is written and edited by Larry Marcus and directed by Warren Lewis. Music is by Frank Worth. Papa was played by Ben Wright. Betty Lou Gerson played Mama. Others in tonight's cast were Jeff Corey, Lou Krugman, and Paul Duboff. Frank Lovejoy will next be seen in Milton Sperling's production, Rock Bottom, released by Warner Brothers. Listen next week at this same time and every week as Randy Stone searches through the city for the strange stories waiting for him in the darkness. The stories that come out of the shadows to find their way into Night Beat. March is Red Cross Month. One of the most important of the many services performed by the Red Cross is its aid to our armed forces. In this country and overseas, in military hospitals, Red Cross workers, aided by thousands of volunteers, play an increasingly vital part in meeting the needs of the patient. Remember, your contribution to the Cross will help the men in whose hands our nation's security may rest. So... Lincoln Airport. Joe? 
Yeah, Emily? Uh, did you just call me, darling? No, I didn't, hon. Oh, the phone rang a minute ago, but whoever it was hung up before I could answer it. Oh, well, it wasn't me. Probably one of your boyfriends. <laughs> now, is that a nice way for a husband to talk to his wife? Oh, hon, can't you take a joke? <laughs> sure, darling. I was only kidding, too. Uh, look, I'm going down to the grocers. Anything special you want me to get? No, anything you get's okay. All right. I'll get something I know you like. Swell. Bye, darling. Bye, hon. See you at dinner. Well, howdy, Joe. Oh, uh, hello, Tex. Say, hey, I've got look, something... Hello, Joe. What's the Uronk out number two runway for? You taking a little private trip? No, Tex. I was just about to tell you. I, I took that offer. Lenny Powell made us. I'm going to fly it to Blanchville. Well, boy, howdy. That's all right, son. <laughs> Did you tell Bill we're getting $5,000 for the hole? No, I didn't, but I'm going to as soon as I see him. Which maybe won't be till I get back. But Powell's here now. Oh, he is? Where? Over in the administration building, making a phone call, I guess. Uh, he's going to be right back. Hey, why is Mike taking the Aronk out? What kind of a freight line are we running? Howdy, Bill. I'm glad you Howdy. showed up, Bill. I wanted to tell you. I'm taking the Aronka out today, and it's going to save our airline for us. Yeah? What are you going to do, Joe? Sell the thing? No, I'm flying Lenny Powell to Branchville, and we're, we're going to get 5000 for the job. We're going to get five Gs? Just to haul a guy to Branchville? What, this guy Powell must be nuts. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care what he is. We can use a few more like him. Is oh, but look. Don't tell anybody Powell's here or that we're taking him anyplace. I, I promised him nobody but the three of us would know this. But he's carrying 25000 in cash with him. Wow. $25,000 with him, huh? Yeah. Mm. We sure could use money like that. Yeah, Tex, we sure could. What'd you say he is, Joe? Over at the administration building? Yeah, Bill, making a phone call. Mm-hmm. Well, give him a good trip to Branchville, Joe, and yeah. get that 5000 from him. We need it. See you later. Yeah, bye. I gotta run a little errand. Long, Bill. Uh, oh, Tex, you hold down things at the office, will you? I gotta get something over at the hangar. Why, sure, son. Uh, you won't be running off now, will you, Tex? No, no, stay right here, chum. Okay, see you before I take off. Sure, see you. Well, boy, howdy. <laughs> Those two aren't leaving old Tex here to answer the telephone. Not when he's got something more important to do. And now, on to Dick Calmer as Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy. Friend to those who have no friends. Shh. Emily. I'm over here, Tex, darling. Behind the garage. Well, boy, howdy. You sure know the good hiding places around this airport. Are you, honey? Oh, baby. Nobody saw you come here, did they, honey? No. As a matter of fact, I called Joe from across the road. Told him I was at the apartment, just leaving for the grocery store. <laughs> he thinks I'm still in town. Boy, how do you sure can give that husband of yours a first-class runaround, can't you? You aren't objecting, are you, Tex? <laughs> I'm doing it for you. I'm mighty glad you are, sugar. Oh, I'm all for you. Hey, look, look, I only got a couple of minutes. Oh. I'm supposed to be in the office to answer the telephone. But, uh, I wanted to tell you, we got a big job, so the airline's going to keep running all right. Well, that's good, but it doesn't help us any, Tex. Now, I'm not going to give Joe the air until we have some money of our own. Don't you worry, sweetheart. We're going to have money, and a lot of it, and sooner than you think... Avery, this is Powell, Lenny Powell. Oh, uh, hello, Powell. Where are you? Still in the city, Avery. Been trying to phone you for 15 minutes. I'm just about to leave for Branchville. Oh, uh, that's fine, Lenny, as long as you get here with that money in two hours. Look, I'll be there in less than two hours, Avery. I'm flying up. I've chartered a private plane. Fine. Now, don't forget to bring the money with you. Yeah, $25,000. Right here in my briefcase. Well, you put it right here in my hands. Inside of two hours, Lenny, the deal's closed. Don't worry. You'll have it. See you in Branchville, Avery. I'll be looking for you, Lenny. Bye. Bye. Oh, hello there. Just about time to take off? Hey, what are you doing? No. No. No, don't. Don't. Sit down. I said sit down, Joe. I don't have to push, Tex. I got to do something. Boy, howdy, somebody's got to do something. We're in a jam, the three of us. 
We thought things were tough when we didn't have money enough to keep this airline going. They're really tough now. We've got a murder on our hands. All right, that's what I'm trying to clear up. Now, looky here, you two guys. All three of us are in this thing up to our sombreros. We got to cover it up somehow. That's no good, Tex, no good. It's like I've been trying to tell you. Sure, that Powell guy was killed out here. Sure, the 25 Gs he was carrying is missing, but we've got to turn this over to the cops. You left out one sure, Joe. You forgot to say sure, only the three of us knew he was here and carrying that dough. That makes it look like one of us killed him. I say no cops. Sure, you say that. Why shouldn't you say that? You probably knocked them off. That's why you don't want the cops in on it. I said before for you to shut up. Maybe this will help convince you. I meant it. Hey, cut it, fellas. All right. Okay, Tex. This has been cooking for a long while. You want to play, I'll play like this. All right, that suits me if that's the way you want it. Stop it. Break it up, will you, Tex? Go. Cut it out. Cut it out. I'll cut his heart out. That's what I'll cut out. Why not? One murder, more or less. Why, you kidding? Stop. Both of you. Quit it now. Got enough trouble without fighting among ourselves. Trouble? We don't know what trouble is yet. Bill, look at the facts. Only Tex and you and I knew about Powell. Powell's dead, okay. But if we don't go to the cops, what happens to us? They'll find out he was killed. They'll find out he was here, and we'll all go to the chair. They gotta find out first. They'll find out, Tex. The police always do. I go along with Joe. That's good, Bill. That makes it pretty clear who must have killed Powell, the one that doesn't want the police in. You know you're just about asking for something, Joe. I'm asking for plenty. I'm asking for the police to be let in on this so that nobody slips me a bum rap. I had nothing to do with Powell's death. I got nothing to worry about if the cops show up here at the airport. None of us has. Except the one that killed Powell. Okay. This kind of looks like a showdown, don't it, boys? All right, it's a showdown. I'm saying go ahead. Bring the cops in if that's what you want to do. Call them, bring them in. They won't prove nothing against me. You're too sure of yourself, Tex. We'll call the cops, all right. But I'm going to do something else, too. I'm going to see Boston Blackie. If the cops don't find out anything, I got news for you. Blackie will. That's the way it was, Blackie. Bill went on an errand somewhere, and Tex didn't stay in the office the way he promised. You sure of that, Joe? Yeah, Blackie. He was going to stay in the office while Bill and I were out, but he wasn't there when I got back. And he wouldn't say where he'd been? No, in fact, he got kind of excited when I asked him. Sort of sore about it. Mm Mm-hmm. I see. So do I, Blackie. And you got to help me. Either Bill or Tex killed Powell, and I've got to know which one it is. You will help me, won't you, Blackie? Don't you think you should go to the police for help? We called the cops, but we didn't tell them all the details. I knew you'd find the murderer before any cops. Thanks for the confidence. You say we found the body. Who's we? Bill, Tex, and me. We went to the administration building to get Powell, and... Boom, there he was. With the $25,000 gone. Yeah, it was gone. Then Powell was slugged and killed by someone who knew he was carrying that money. Now, who besides you, Tex and Bill, knew Powell had $25,000? Nobody him. else. That's why I know it's Tex or Bill who killed him. It's got to be one of those two. Yes, that's right, Joe. It has to be Tex or Bill. That is, if it isn't you. <laughs> Tex, Bill, and Joe, all three found the body, Faraday. That's definite. All three of these guys found it, huh, Blackie? Well, according to what Joe here told me. And I guess Joe said it was me, huh, Blackie? Yes, I did. I said it was either Tex or you. Try and depend this on me, are you? I don't have the daylights out of you, you... Well, boy, how do you better work on them soon, Bill? Because I'm going to take a crack at them, too. Nobody's taking any cracks at anybody, kids. Right now, all of you listen. Nobody but you three fellas, Tex, Bill, and Joe, knew Powell had that $25,000 with him. That's right. So it's one of these three who killed Powell. Marvelous deduction, Inspector. Even they admit that. You mean Joe here admits either Tex or I killed him? Okay, Bill, relax, relax. The point is that none of the three of you can prove where you were when Powell was killed. Anybody mind if I butt in a minute? Who are you? Well, may I just work here? That's what I want to do, work. Oh, this is Mike, Inspector Faraday, head of our ground crew. Just stand by, Mike. Okay, see you later. Well, Mike, how's your dad feeling? Oh, not good, Tex. Got another wire this morning. Old man's pretty sick. Sorry about that, Mike. Thanks, Bill. I wouldn't worry so much, except he's stuck way up there in Kansas. The doc has to drive 50 miles to get to him. No hospital in the town, Mike? Hospital, Blackie? No town. Ever hear of a thing called Plainsville, Kansas? Can't say I did. Nobody else has either, except my dad and about 30 other landowners. Oh, well, I'll just sit tight till I get more orders, huh? Yeah, yeah, Mike, sit tight. This thing will be cleared up pretty soon. Don't you think so, Inspector Faraday? I sure do, Joe. Now, tell you what else I think. 
Maybe you're all guilty. So I'm going to arrest all three of you. You can't do that. No, Faraday, don't do that. Confine them to the field, if you like. But don't make any arrests. What? I'll tell you which of these three killed Powell, and I'll tell you soon. Yes. Mrs. Emily Carrington? Yes. Joe Carrington's wife? Uh Uh-huh. I'm Boston Blackie. You probably know your husband's involved in a murder out of this airfield. Yes, yes, I know. He called me a little while ago and told me. You want to talk to me about it, don't you? Yes, about it and about Joe. Oh, well, come in then. Thanks. Your husband needed money rather badly, didn't he, Mrs. Carrington? Yes, he did. To keep his airline or to keep you happy? I don't think I like that implication. And I don't like murder, Mrs. Carrington. Now, suppose you... Excuse me while I answer the phone. Go ahead. Thank you. Hello? Hello, Emily, honey. This is Tex. Sorry, Joe. I I can't talk to you now. Emily, I said this was Tex, not Joe. And I said I couldn't talk to you. Here, let me talk to him. Let go of that phone. You you let go of that phone. Too late. Hello, Joe. Boy, howdy. What's the matter up there? This is... Uh Uh-oh. Uh-oh is right, Tex. When a man answers in a spot like this, you ought to hang up. Especially if I'm the man. Hello? Hello? <laughs> well, I got what I wanted anyhow. Well, satisfied now, Blackie? Satisfied and surprised, Mrs. Carrington. Naughty, naughty. Married to Joan and in love with Tex. Uh, tell me, did Tex kill Powell for the $25,000 by himself, or did you go out and help him this afternoon? Look, I, I never go out to the airport. No, that's funny. What is? That run on your shoes. That's a peculiar colored mud, Mrs. Carrington. There's only one spot around here where it's found. Oh? Okay, I was there today. I went to meet Tex. But I didn't have anything to do with killing that Mr. Powell, and I don't know who did. That's your story. Thanks for telling me that you were at the airport. You see, I don't really know what color mud there is out there. I never bothered to notice. Besides, I'm not very interested in mud. It's the dirty work of this case I want to figure out. Blackie, for the last time, I'm telling you, get out of my office. Better still, get out of my life. What life? You don't call that thing you're living a life, do you, Faraday? Uh, Nothing doing, pal. But there's plenty doing between Tex and Joe Carrington's wife, Emily. You said that. So what? So I know this much. Emily Carrington either killed Powell herself, or Tex killed him, and she knows it. You think so, huh? I certainly do. She's the key to the whole thing. Get her to talk, and your troubles are over. If I ever get you to shut up, they'll be over. Oh, Inspector Faraday. Yeah, Burke, what do you want? Uh, Nothing, Inspector, but uh, here's something I think you'll want. When is it? A report just came in over the teletype. There's been a murder up in Northside. Well, who got it this time? As if I don't have enough trouble with the Powell murder. This has some connection with it, Inspector. Victim's name was Emily Carrington. And now, back to Boston Blackie. Tex, Joe, and Bill, pilot owners of a small freight-carrying airline, are chief suspects in the robbery murder of the wealthy Lenny Powell. Each thinks one of the other two is guilty of the crime. Investigating the murder, Blackie sees Joe's wife, finds she is in love with Tex, and was at the airport at the time of the crime. But later, Joe's wife is a murder victim, too. So, as we return to our story, Blackie and his girlfriend, Mary Wesley, walk into the airport hangar in search of further clues. Blackie. Blackie, is that the fellow Joe you were looking for? I... No, I don't think so, Mary. Oh. Looks like Mike, the mechanic. Hey, Mike! Uh, Oh, hi, Blackie. What are you doing, Mike? Hammering that plane apart? Me? No, I'm trying to hammer it back together. <laughs> uh, where's Joe? Uh, in one of the rooms in back. He'll be out in a minute. Good. Oh, look, before he comes out, uh, why don't you tell me what you know about Powell's murder? And about Emily Carrington's murder, too, Blackie. Don't forget that. I'll settle for finding out who killed Powell first, Mary. What do you know about it, Mike? For me, nothing, Blackie. 
You didn't see Tex or Joe or Bill come out of the administration building about the time of Powell's death? No, how could I? Well, if you were here in the hangar, you could look out well, the Well, what do- makes you think I was here in the hangar? I didn't say you were, Mike. I said if you were. And that's a big if. And you're a little girl, Mary, and little girls. Should be seen and not heard. I know I'll be quiet. Especially if Mike will talk. Well, me, I ain't got nothing to talk about. Why not, Mike? You're the most talkative guy on the field. Oh, hello, Joe. I want to talk to you. Well, if it's about Powell's murder and Emily's death, you'll be wasting your time. I've already told you all I know. Well, maybe I haven't told you all I know. Oh, yeah? You know something? Uh Uh-huh. Your wife was planning to divorce you and marry Tex. Oh, is that supposed to be news? Well, it was to me until Tex told me. Well, it was to me, too, when I figured it out a couple of months ago. Tex killed Powell to get money for Emily, huh? Or you killed Powell to get money for Emily. Uh Uh-uh, Blackie. I'm no killer. She deserved what she got, but I didn't do it. Oh, I see. Then you're not sorry Emily was killed. I'm not glad, but I guess she had it coming to her. Who killed her? Tex? Or you? What about Bill? I think it's a toss-up between you and Tex. Why? Because of Emily? That could be the reason. Well, Bill needs money as much as Tex and me. Maybe so, but Bill didn't have the incentive to get it. But don't go away. I'll answer this. You just take over no matter where you are, don't you, Blackie? I have to sometimes. Hmm, funny the phone only rang once. In the airline office with you, Inspector Faraday? No, he isn't. Now, who's this? Hey, wait a minute. What's going on here? Is that you, Faraday? Yeah, this is Faraday. Who's that, Blackie? Oh, yes. Well, where are you, Faraday? Up here in the airline's office. Where are you? Over here in the hangar. How did you happen to answer the phone? It rang here, that's why. Why did you answer? Because it rang here, too. Who's on the other end of the line? I am, Blackie. This is Tex. Oh, Tex, huh? Oh, where are you calling from? Lunch wagon across the road from the field. Oh, thanks. Thanks a lot, Tex. Thanks? What for, Blackie? What for, Tex? Well, unless my hunch is wrong, when I answered this phone, I found the answer to who killed Lenny Powell and Emily Carrington. Look, Blackie, will you quit questioning the three of us blue in the face and find out which one of us did it? That's really what I'm trying to do, Joe. Now, I want to ask you each just one more question. You first, Tex. Where are you from? Well, boy, howdy, you can't tell that. I'm from Texas. Orangeboro, Texas. Uh Uh-huh, and you, Bill, where are you from? I'm from Halpern, Maine. You know, I have ways of checking this. Go ahead, check. Halpern's a small town. Everybody in the county knows me. All right, I'll take your word for it for now. Joe, where are you from? Right here. Local boy, huh? Yeah, and I figure on making good as soon as you tell me which one of these two guys killed Powell and my wife, and I can get back to work. Anxious to get in one of your planes and fly away, huh, Joe? You think I did it, huh? I've stopped thinking, Joe. I know who's guilty now. Yeah? How do you know, Blackie? The evidence is graphic, Bill. Geographic. Look, Blanky, I got other things to do besides hang around out here on a flying field. What other things, Faraday? You haven't had anything to do since I came on this case, and you know it. I don't know anything. You're not kidding, pal. No. Faraday, my friend, you ought to do something constructive with that badge of yours. Use it to pin your suspenders together or something. It certainly doesn't mean anything where it is. Oh, yeah? That's what I like, snappy answers. Now, if you'll be quiet just one second, I'll tell you what we're waiting for. Well, it's about time. Hey, here comes that mechanic, Mike. What you have to say is going to have to wait, Blanky. At least it gives you something to look forward to, Inspector. Inspector. Inspector Faraday. Well, what is it, Mike? What is it? This telegram I just got, Inspector. Here, read it. I'll take it, Mike. You'll take nothing, Blanky. Give it to me, Mike. Yeah. Thanks. What's it all about, Mike? It's from my old man, Blanky. He's pretty sick out in Plainsville. Plainsville? Where's that? If you could read, Blanky, you'd know where it is. It says here on the telegram. It's well, in Kansas. You're, you're reading the telegram, Faraday. I'm not. Oh. Okay, never mind. What's the matter with your father, Mike? Well, I don't know. He's been sick a long time, and... Well, he's getting old. I, I gotta go see him, Inspector Faraday. I ain't seen my old man in nine years. Okay, you can go, Mike. But keep in touch with us, and make sure you come back. Oh, don't worry, Inspector. I'll be back, I promise. Uh, be sure you do keep that promise, Mike. But I'll tell you a little secret, something even Inspector Faraday doesn't know. Yeah, what? I don't have to worry about you coming back. I already know who killed Lenny Powell and Emily Carrington. <laughs> Is that 
Hey, look, Blanky. You forced me to tell those three partners they could come and go as they please. All right. Why wouldn't they fly out of town instead of taking a train? This is a rather odd case, Faraday, so expect a rather odd finish to it. Uh, it's odd, all right. I don't even see the connection between the murder of Powell and the death of Emily Carrington. It's just a hunch, Faraday, but I think it's a good one. Emily was at the field when Powell was murdered. Yeah. She saw the killer. She tried to blackmail the killer for part of the robbery money. The killer wouldn't pay. So Mrs. Carrington paid, huh? Yes, with her life. Blackmail's a dangerous business. And so standing in a railroad station when we ought to be watching that airport. Oh, no. Hey, there goes our killer, Faraday. Huh? Where? There, getting into car 409. Come on. Hey, that's Mike. Mike, what a memory for faces. And names, too. But, Blackie, you said... Never mind what I said. Listen to what I say now. Hey, Mike. Huh? Wait a minute. Oh, Blackie, hello. Hello, Mike. Traveling rather light for a trip all the way out to Kansas, aren't you? Well, me, yeah, but I, I don't expect to stay in Kansas very long. You're not even going to Kansas, Mike. You're going to jail. Me? Jail? What for? Murder, Mike. The murder of Lenny Powell and Emily Carrington. Are you kidding? No, I'm not kidding, Mike. This guy committed those murders. You're nuts, Blanky. Yeah, tell him, Faraday. Let me have that suitcase, Mike. Uh, let go. Grab that... him, Faraday, while I take let this go. suitcase away from you. Uh, uh, I get him, but I don't know why. Uh, there's nothing in there but my clothes. No. Let go. Well... Yeah, now, wait till I open it. You won't find anything. Hey, relax. Well, look what the well-dressed murderer is wearing this season. Folding money. Rather expensive material, isn't it, Mike? Hey, how much is in there, Blackie? I don't even have to count it. I think you'll find $25,000 in here, Faraday. The money he took from Lenny Powell. Well, Faraday, I close this suitcase in your case at the same time. <laughs> Blackie, why are we taking a plane to Branchville? To close that deal for Lenny Powell's company with this $25,000. And for the ride, too. But why did the Powell's company ask you to go to Branchville for them? Well, I closed a tough case of Faraday. They think I can close a tough deal for them. Ooh, my, aren't you modest. <laughs> no, just lucky. <laughs> I had no idea Mike was the guilty one until Tex made that phone call and I answered it in the hangar at the same time Faraday answered it in the office. Well, what did that prove? Proved the hangar phone was an extension phone. And any telephone conversation from the office could be overheard by Mike at the hangar. Oh, so Mike could have heard Lenny Powell making arrangements with the partners to be flown to Branchville, and so he could have known about the $25,000. Smart girl. Yes, cleverness must be catching. Thank you. <laughs> yes, Mary, up until that one little break, I thought only Tex, Bill, and Joe knew about Powell and his money. And if only those three knew about it, one of those three had to be guilty. Catch on? That I do. Hey, hey, look who's coming across the field. It's Faraday. And running, too. Wonder what he's excited about. Hey, Blackie! Blackie! I want to talk to you. What's the matter, old pal? You need me to solve another case for you? No. I want to know something. Well, if I tell you, it'll be one thing you know. Oh, look, you. I called Plainsville, Kansas, where Mike's father was supposed to be sick. He didn't send Mike any telegram today. Oh, that's right, Faraday. I forgot to tell you about that. I figured Mike killed Powell and Mrs. Carrington, who saw him do it, so I sent that telegram myself. You sent it? But why, Blackie? For a very simple reason, Mary. I had to be sure. And one way was to find out whether or not Mike had stolen the money. I knew he was too smart to hide it here at the field or at his home, and I knew he wouldn't spend any of it here. Oh, I get it. All Mike needed was an opportunity to get out of town naturally. You knew that his father was sick and had wired him once, and you knew that even Mike wouldn't suspect it was a trick if he heard from his father again. That's right, Mary. So when Faraday here gave Mike permission to leave town, Mike felt it was safe to pick up the money and beat it out of town. Well, I'll be. So you tripped Mike with that wire, huh? Yes, Faraday, and because of that wire, you got a confession from him with no strings attached. <laughs>
Out of the fog, out of the night, and into his American adventures comes Bulldog Drummond. to tell us about our newest adventure, here is Bulldog Drummond. I call this story The Case of the Double Death. So far as we knew at the time, it began one evening when Denny and I were dining in a restaurant. Well, Denny, uh, have you finished? Uh, All but this cup of coffee, sir. You know, I must say it doesn't taste very good, but I'll finish it from force of habit. Well, suit yourself, Denny. Uh, waiter. Right with you, sir. Yes, sir. Will there be anything more? Uh, the check, please. And quickly, if you don't mind, I'm catching a train. Right away. I must say, Captain Drummond, you didn't eat heartily this evening. Not that I blame you, considering that you're going to witness an electrocution. Well, Denny, there, there'll have to be the required number of witnesses. I tried to refuse, but the warden insisted. Well, after all, you helped the state prove that the man was guilty of murder. Your check, sir. Thank you. Uh, there you are. Thank you very much. Come along now, Denny. We haven't too much time. Uh, we, sir? But I wasn't invited, thank goodness. Well, ride out on the train with me. Wait for me in the warden's office. Yes, if you insist, sir. Oh, I say. Now, where in the world are my bowler and my umbrella? I left them here on this hook. Oh, Denny. A uh, waiter? Yes, sir. We're missing a, a derby and an umbrella. Yes, a silk umbrella. It can't be replaced, you know. That's too bad. Maybe somebody took them by mistake. They did? They'll bring them back. Can you stop in tomorrow? Yes, of course I can, but how can I go out of here without a hat? Denny, that train won't wait for us, you know. Let's be on our way. Well, if you don't mind, sir, I'll go home and get another hat. I'll catch the next train and meet you in the warden's office. All right, Denny. But wearing a hat is just a habit, like drinking coffee. One of these days, you may pay a horrible price for all your habits. Please, sir, I'm sorry I'm so late. Denny, I've been waiting three hours here in the warden's office. You might at least have telephoned me. Where were you? Well, I I really don't know, sir. That is, uh, I've been asleep. What? I fell asleep on the subway going home and slept to the end of the line. Well, where's your hat? Well, I never reached home. When I woke up and saw what time it was, I caught the last train out here. I I just made it. You must have slept for some time. And where did you get that scratch on your knuckles? Well, I, I can't say, sir. Well, that's probably the police. I called them trying to find you. Yes? This is Captain Drummond. Yes, thanks, Taylor. Denny's here now. What's that? Well, yes, certainly. The last train's gone, but I have a car waiting outside. Very well, we'll be there as soon as we can. Was it the police, sir? Yes, Detective Taylor. He wants to see us at once at our house. At this hour of the morning? Something has happened, Denny. Taylor wouldn't tell me what it was, but he said it's important. A matter of life and death. Well, Drummond, it's about time you two got here. Come on in. Thank you, Taylor, for the invitation to enter our own house. Come in, Denny. Yes, sir. Now then, what's the trouble? On the phone, you sounded as though the place were full of murderers. Well, maybe it is. Take it easy now, both of you. Frisk him, Tony. Well, I must say, I resent this. You know, we've been... All right, Denny, Denny, never mind. Yes, sir. You won't find anything, Tony. Neither Denny nor I are armed tonight. Taylor, do you mind telling us the reason for this reception? It's a pleasure, Drummond. Tony, show Denny that derby. Recognize it, Denny? Why, that's my bowler. And you've got my umbrella, too. My word, I didn't even report losing them. And here you police chaps have brought them back. Yes. 
We found the umbrella in the back of the hall coat closet out there. Never mind where we found the hat. How about this knife? Did you ever see it before? Why, not to my knowledge, but really, I'm a most obliging sort. If you'd tell me what you want to know... Okay, Tony. Denny says he's obliging, so I guess he'll oblige us with his fingerprints. Why, why, certainly. Which hand? The right. Just roll your fingers on that ink pad and then put them on the paper. No smudges now. You know how to make good, clean prints. Why, of course I do. (sighs) There. How's that? I'll tell you in a minute. Oh, Tony... Give me the photo of the prints the boys took off the uh, knife handle. Thanks. Uh, Taylor, I don't know what you're trying to prove, but will you tell us if you think the prints are the same? Yes, Drummond. I'll tell you. And I know. They're identical. Why, they can't be. I never saw that knife before. It's a weird-looking thing anyway. Imagine a short German silver handle and an eight-inch steel blade. Talk if you want to, Denny, but I'm warning you, you're under arrest. You're arresting, Denny? On what charge? The charge, Drummond... Is murder. Our story continues in just a moment. And now, back to Bodog Drummond and the story he calls The Case of the Double Death. Denny has been arrested on suspicion of murder due to a derby hat, an umbrella, and a strange knife whose handle bears his fingerprints. In Drummond's house, Detective Taylor is ready to take Denny to police headquarters. All right, Denny. Come along now and take it easy. Now, just a moment, Taylor. If you don't mind, I'd like to know the details of this ridiculous situation. Well, seeing it's you, Drummond, I'll tell you. A man was murdered on the street, not far away, knifed. This derby was found alongside of him. But that's my hat. Sure, Danny, we found that out. We woke up the dealer who sold it to you. He knew the initials inside. Said you're an old customer. Well, I've bought my hats there for years. We also found a small bit of umbrella silk in the the body's hand. Must have been torn off during a struggle. And I found this umbrella minus the missing piece in your coat closet. But I lost that hat and umbrella this evening. Hmm. Drummond, can you tell us where Denny was between the hours of nine and midnight? I'm very sorry, I can't. Uh, Of course you can't, sir. I was alone in the subway during those hours, sleeping. That's pretty thin. Got any witnesses? Well, uh, none that I know of. Look, Taylor, may I examine the body? Yeah, sure you can. Tony, I'll take Drummond to see the body. You take Denny to see his cell. Welcome, sir, to my humble quarters. I'm trying to get you released on bail, Denny. Of course, it isn't customary in the case of a murder suspect, but I may be able to bring it off. No, I certainly hope you can, sir. The evidence against you isn't airtight. You were framed, all right. I'm beginning to understand how it was done. I'm sure that your fingerprints were on the knife handle because you used it last night in that restaurant. But, sir, I certainly didn't use a knife with an eight-inch blade for eating. No, Denny. But you remarked yourself that the murder knife had a short German silver handle. And the handle of the knife you used for eating might have been switched to the murder blade. You mean that someone stole my table knife as well as my hat and umbrella? Exactly. Well, I must say, sir, I feel better now. I was beginning to imagine myself in Pee Wee Lido's position. Lido? The murderer whose execution you witnessed last night. Denny, that's a thought. Rather a gruesome one to me, sir. You and I helped send Leto to the chair. And this frame-up might be revenge on the part of the Leto gang. Perhaps they're planning to frame me for murder, too. Yes, Denny, we have plenty to do. And the first thing is to get you out of here. There's the restaurant where we dined last night. I'd be just as happy if we found it burned to the ground, sir. The proprietor told me over the telephone that the waiter who serves us comes on, served us last night comes on duty at six o'clock. His name is Dan Morris. Well, it's uh, 
Yes, it's quarter to six now. He should be along in any minute. Yes, here he comes now. I recognize him. Uh, hello there. Uh, Dan Morris? You talking to me? Yes, you waited on us last night in this restaurant. Oh, yeah, yeah, I didn't recognize you gents with your hats on. Yes, I don't wonder. We want to talk to you about the missing hat and the umbrella. Sure, if uh, they're returned, you'll get them. Well, they've been returned. We also want to ask you about a knife. Uh, look, mister, I'm late now. Some other time. If you'd rather talk to the police, we can arrange it. Cops? Uh, no. Where do we go? Where do you live? Not far away. Very well, we'll go there. Get in our car. Morris, keep on talking. You were paid $2,000 to take the knife Denny used in the restaurant and wrap it up in a napkin. Look, I, I never did anything like this before, but I needed the money. Tell us or the police. What else did you do for the money? Well, I, I dropped a couple of pills in your friend's coffee. Not poison, just something to make him sleep. Yes, I see. And what did you do with the knife? I put it inside your umbrella and pointed out your hat and umbrella to, to someone. We're waiting. What was his name? I don't know. I was... Denny, those shots came through the open window. Yes, I know, sir. There's a fire escape outside, but there's no sign of anyone here now. No one is running down. Is he dead, sir? Yes, two bullets through his chest. Thirty-eight caliber from the sound. Let's get out on the fire escape and go up. We're only one story below the roof. Whoever fired those shots must have come this way. Well, I'm sure he didn't go down, sir. I say there's someone going through that door. It leads down into the house. Quick, Denny. Yes, sir. Now, too late. The door's bolted on the inside. We can't break it down in time. Well, we can get back into the house through the waiter's room. By the time we get downstairs, we won't find anyone. Uh, turn on your flashlight, Denny. Yes, sir. Hold it close to the roof over here. Denny, you see this? Why, yes. There are deep impressions in the roof. This coat of tar is new. These impressions are a woman's heel prints. They were made very recently. There's no dust inside them. Woman? Dear me, what a complication. Mm. Let's get back down the fire escape. Uh, please, sir, I, I don't understand this at all. What could a woman have to do with this case? You said she was a complication, Denny. But she might be a simplification. Well, here's the waiter's room. Uh, look inside. Oh, dear. The body, sir. It's disappeared. It's too bad the waiter was killed before he told us some more facts. Mm. My word, whoever these people are, they're certainly thorough. And completely cold-blooded. Imagine stabbing some innocent passerby to get a corpse to frame you. And the business about that knife, sir, the murder weapon. It was carefully selected so that the handle of the restaurant knife could be substituted for the original handle. Why, we are home. I, I wasn't noticing. Well, perhaps in the quiet of our own place, we can come to some sort of conclusion about this case and about your predicament. Yes, I certainly hope so, sir. If you believe the Lido gang is behind this, we should be able to get to them in some way. I think we can be more specific than that, Denny. The prints of a woman's heels on that roof suggest Lido's widow. She was obviously his partner in the former murder, but she was never indicted. Well, I remember her at Lido's trial. She impressed me as a, as a package of evil, if I may say so, sir. This might be her revenge. Yes, I have my key. Turn on the lights, please, Denny. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh... Good heavens. Look, sir, in the living room. Yes, I see. The body of Dan Morris, the waiter, in the middle of our floor. Well, how in the world can it be? We just left him in his own room. Well, we stopped for a bite to eat on our way here, and someone worked faster than we did, that's all. You see, Denny, they're trying to frame me now. But what can they prove by moving the body here? The restaurant owner knew that I was determined to meet the waiter. He might have told some member of the Lido gang... Apparently, they're following our movements. Well, sir, what do we do now? Well, 
The gang's next move will probably be a call to the police by someone posing as a neighbor of ours. He or she will say that shots and screams were heard in our house. Then we're trapped. The police will be here in a short time and they'll find the body. Not if we move quickly. Now, look, we'll carry the body out the back door. I'll stay with it while you get the car. I know of a much better place for it than here in our living room. All right, sir. The body's quite safe in the back seat, covered with a rug. Get in, Denny. We'll drive on past the house. Now, I'll stop here for a moment. My word, sir. The police didn't lose much time. The car's pulling up in front of our house. All right, men, this is the place. Come on, Tony. Take two men around in the back. We'll go in the front. Make it fast now. Well, Denny, I think you and I should be on our way. Yes, sir. But where are we going? To the waiter's room. And the quicker we get there, the better. Seat him carefully in this overstuffed chair by the window. Yes, sir. There. How's that? Yeah, that's about right. Oh, this is creepy. He actually looks alive. Uh, drag over that table with the telephone on it. Yes, directly. That's right. Oh, dear. If there's anything that really chills me, it's a dead man with his eyes open. Wait, I'll just put his hands on the table like this. Now, Denny, turn on that floor lamp. It's far enough away. We don't want too much light. Yes, sir. Now, I hope I can imitate his voice successfully. Uh, listen a moment and tell me how it sounds. Yes, go ahead. This is Dan Morris, the waiter. Well, that's excellent, sir. All right, next in order is a telephone call. I'm calling the bar that used to be Lido's headquarters. If this scheme doesn't work, Denny, we'll need a very good lawyer. Well, sir, there's always David Miller. Mm. Hello? I want to speak to Mrs. Lido. Yeah. She'll talk to me, all right. You tell her Dan Morris, the waiter's calling. Unless I'm wrong, she's right there. Hello? Yeah, you double-crosser. You thought I was dead, didn't you? That's the way you left me. What was the idea of your boys dragging me off to some strange house? Tell her plenty, sir. Yeah. Yeah, that's where I came to. I'm home now. Listen, I like money. And this is going to cost you 20 grand. That's right, 20,000 bucks. And if I don't get it, I'll go to the cops and tell them plenty. Oh, that's splendid. Okay. We'll start with what you got. Three grand tonight. And listen, Mrs. Lido, no tricks. Get here in a hurry. How did she sound, sir? Frightened, Denny. She'll be here soon. I hope she really swallowed your story. I'm sure she did. Denny, go up to the roof and open that door that she bolted in our faces. Then we'll be ready for the payoff. There's a car stopping in front of the house, sir, and a woman is getting out. All right, one more phone call. Yeah, the woman's coming into the house. Hello, operator. Connect me with the police. Hurry, please. This is an emergency. Two men got out of the car, but they're not coming inside. Police headquarters. Someone's been murdered at 592 Hickory Street, top floor. All right, Denny. Climb out in the fire escape. Directly, sir. There's just one more thing to do. Take the telephone receiver off the hook. Leave it in front of our friend on the table. Wait, wait. I'll dial one number to get rid of the dial tone. Uh, come on out, sir. I'm quite comfortable on the fire escape. Dan Morris looks alive in this dim light. Now, you crouch down out of sight, Denny. I'm staying here behind this chair. The door's opening. Come right in, Mrs. Lido. Keep your hands where I can see them. That's better. You can trust me, Dan Morris. Ah, once was enough. You see that phone? Hmm? The receiver's off the hook. I just called the cops and told them to listen for gunshots. They can't hear us talk, but be careful of any noise. 
How do I know you can be trusted? I'm no double-crosser. Now, look, Morris, you mustn't mind the boys. They got jittery and let you have it, that's all. You better get some new boys. Boys don't know how to shoot. My shoulder's burning up, but I'm alive. And I'm in this for the money, you understand? Sure. Sure, it won't happen again. You did all right for us. And now you can do all right for me. The first payment is three grand in cash. Just put it on the table there. Sure, okay. Get away from that phone. Too late, smart boy. It's hung up. And this time the slugs go home. Back to the climax of our story in just a moment. Now, back to Bulldog Drummond. When we left them, Denny was crouched on the fire escape outside a window, and Drummond was concealed behind a high-backed chair. Mrs. Lido, widow of a gunman, has just fired two shots into the corpse in the chair and rushed from the room. Denny, she's out the door. Uh, please, sir, a police car has just pulled up below answering your call. All right, up to the roof, quick. Do you think she started for the roof, sir? No, no, she went downstairs. Over to the door, Denny, come on. Here we are, sir. I'll open the door. There she goes, man. That woman with the gun, get after her. The police saw her on the stairway. She's coming back upstairs now. Get back then. She's coming out here. Hold up, Mrs. Lito. This is the end of the line. Get out of my way. Of course. Ow, my arm. Let go. Let go. You're breaking it. I'll just hold your gun for you. What goes on here? We've got her, Taylor. The murderess. What are you doing here, Drummond? We've been trailing Mrs. Lito. I had an idea that she was the one who framed Denny for murder. Let's go downstairs. Sure. Come along, lady. Take it easy, will you? I'm coming. I'll make it snappy then. Is this the place, Drummond? Yes. A room occupied by a waiter named Dan Morris. Okay, lady, get inside. Well, you did a nice job on that guy, didn't you? Oh, uh, here's her gun, Taylor. Thanks, Drummond. Let's see. Four exploded shells. And it looks like four holes in the corpse. You don't miss, do you, lady? I'm not talking. Suit yourself. Tony, call the wagon for those two guys we picked up out in front. Run them down to headquarters. I'll bring the lady down in my car. Oh, Drummond, will you stay here with the body until I get back with the homicide crew? Yes, of course, Taylor. Denny and I are glad to help you. All right, lady, let's go. And don't try any stunts like falling downstairs. Please, sir, I'm out on bail, you know, and here I am tangled up in another murder case. Well, Denny, now that Mrs. Lido and two of her gunmen are in custody, we'll be able to prove to the police that you were the victim of a frame-up. Yes, sir. Of course, Denny... It's our secret that this man was already dead when Mrs. Leto killed him the second time. Yes, naturally. I beg your pardon, sir, but how did four exploded shells get into Mrs. Leto's gun? She only fired two shots into the corpse. I had to account for the two previous bullet holes in the body. I was sure they were thirty-eight caliber. So when Mrs. Leto fired her two shots... I also fired two out the window from my own thirty-eight. They were perfectly synchronized with hers. I only heard the two shots. On my way to the roof, I removed the exploded shells from my gun, and when I took Mrs. Leto's gun from her, I found she'd reloaded her gun since the actual killing. So I substituted my two empty shells for the two live ones. So there were four empty shells in her gun to correspond with the four bullets in the corpse. Please, sir, did you know what was going to happen? Yes, Denny. I trapped her into killing the same man twice. One way to fight a frame-up is with a counter frame-up.
And now, here is Bulldog Drummond to tell us about next week's story. A testimonial dinner is being given to a noted crime reporter who specializes in exposing rackets. Denny and I meet him and almost immediately become involved in a maze of murder. One man is poisoned, another hanged, and a third is shot. Denny and I are also marked for killing when we stalk the murderer. I call the story Dinner of Death. Be sure to listen, won't you? And so into the night walks Bulldog Drummond, seeking new adventure and excitement. The next adventure with Bulldog Drummond will be heard over most of these same stations next week at the same time. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. The Case Book of Gregory Hood. Presented by the American Broadcasting Company. His office is high in the tower of a skyscraper overlooking San Francisco Bay. His name is Gregory Hood. By day, president of the Hood Importing Company. By night, criminologist and man about town. Tonight's story from out of his casebook, The Carnival of Death. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Gregory Hood. Let's understand this from the start. I'm not a playboy. But when a hot blonde who's due to inherit a cool million suddenly writes me, be sociable, Greg, drop around for a drink, <laughs> it's three to one, I'll drop around. That's how I got involved with Leora Thorne. I was in my office with Sanderson Taylor, my attorney, nose to the grindstone, sticking to business, when along came Leora's invitation. Uh, excuse me, Sandy, but this letter's been lying on my desk all day. Ah, perfume. Mm -hmm. Dear Greg, just because an old flame has got herself happily married, that's no reason to cross her off your books. How's about dropping her on for a drink tomorrow afternoon? I want you to meet Bradley, my new husband. You'll like him. From uh, <laughs> quite a lady, Greg, judging by your smile. Remember Leora Littleton? She's now Leora Thorne. Oh, the one who's coming into old Colonel Littleton's money? One million dollars next year. She wants me to drop over this afternoon. What for? Just for old Lang Syne, I guess. Probably giving a big cocktail party. Has she still got that big estate on Shore Drive? Mm-hmm. Swimming pool and all the trimmings. Oh, uh, take my advice and you'll stay put. I'm sort of curious to see Leora again. It's been a whole year. Now, Greg, don't get involved. Oh, oh nonsense. The gal's happily married. She says so. <laughs> Haven't you ever noticed, Greg, that your ex-girlfriends never invite you to their homes unless there's trouble brewing? <laughs> mm. Oh, Sanderson, you're a cynic. <laughs> I'll be back later to finish those contracts with you. Greg, I'm warning you. My attorney, Sanderson Taylor, is heap smart engine. I should have avoided that perfumed billy bill like rat poison. Because when I got to Leora's, there wasn't any party. There wasn't so much as a friendly Greg. How have you been instead? Greg... You're just in time. Hey, what gives? This is Brad, my husband. I'm glad to know you, Mr. Hood. I've been meaning to drop around ever since I read about you two getting married. Never mind but... the chit-chat. Go into that small room over there. And listen. Listen to everything that's said. Wait a minute. All I came for was a nice sociable visit. Greg, I need you. I'm desperate. That's right, Mr. Hood. We're both desperate. Before I could say, I'm booked for this waltz, thank you, and walk out, they'd pushed me into a small powder room. I watched them go into the library right alongside. I watched the butler usher in a little runt who wore a face like a dachshund plus a twitch. An unsavory type. I listened to Docko Face talking to Leora and Brad. My boss says to tell you an old Chinese proverb. Confucius say, 
A Welsher gets it in the neck. I'm not Welshing. Three grand worth. I don't owe him a penny. What about the IOU? The game was crooked. I only signed it to get out of the place. Better pay it, girly, to stay out of a coffin. Say, look, whoever you are, have a heart. That crap game was rigged. My wife was cheated into losing all that money. Please, I need time. Tell your boss to give me time. A week from today, my boss says. What? What about a week from today? That's how long you get. Or else. Girlie, that chassis of yours won't look so pretty with a bullet in the upholstery. <laughs> Brad, Brad, what am I going to do? Oh, precious lamb, you've simply got to pay off. I can't, I can't. Now we'll sell your jewelry, rent this house, anything. Just so your life isn't in danger. Oh, please, please, precious lamb. Now, look, you two. You've roped me into this, so you'd better give me the lowdown. Greg, you heard that little man. Mm Mm-hmm. Where have you been gambling, Leora? Out at Pacific Playland. Pacific Playland? That's an amusement park. I begged Leora to stay away. You didn't drop 3,000 on ping pong and darts, did you? There's a floating crap game out there. People never tell me these things. Who runs it? I don't know his name. They just call him the boss. A rigged dice game at a honky-tonk carnival. Leora, have you lost your senses? I... I can't explain it, Greg. Every now and then I get this itch to gamble. It just grabs hold of me and... Well, this time I got in too deep. I tried to stop her, Mr. Hood. Mm. Well, my advice is square up. I didn't like the looks of Jojo, the dog-faced messenger boy. I can't pay, Greg. What? I haven't the money. Leora Littleton, NG on the credit? I don't come into the bulk of Grandfather's estate for another year. You know that. Right now I'm in debt all over town. Darling, we'll sell things off. It's the only way. You're right, Thorne. Take that wristwatch you're wearing, for instance. What about it? I handle lots of fine Swiss watches at the Hood Importing Company, but nothing that unusual. I've never seen a heart-shaped design like that. I had it made like a heart because I gave it to Brad. As a wedding present. Well, that watch alone at some high-class hawk shop. Oh, no, I can't let Brad part with it. Oh, but precious lamb, for your own safety and for my peace of mind. Your husband's very sensible. Don't risk your life, Leora. Well, then help me, Greg. Find out who's after me. Well... I'll think it over. Oh, you were the one person, Greg, I knew I could turn to. If you help us, Mr. Hood, you'll never find two people more grateful. Well, I have to go now, but you'll be hearing from me, Leora. I'll show you to the door, Mr. Hood. This way. I'm so worried about her, Mr. Hood. Naturally. Oh, sometimes I wish Leora didn't have, well, all this. She's a swell kid. She just needs taking care of. I'm doing my best. You know, I think you are. I think you have a pretty level head in your shoulders. Oh, thanks. Well, I'm so crazy about her. A lot of folks probably think I just married her for the money. Well, anybody can see that isn't the case. Well, chin up. Don't let Leora get too upset. Well, I'll try not. Good meeting you, Thorne. It was grand meeting you. And please, help us out of this mess. <laughs> Well, Greg, uh, how was Leora's cocktail party? What cocktail party? Ah, oh. I thought so. She only got you out there to rope you into something. Put your hat on, Mr. Taylor. We're going places. What What? What about these business contracts? They'll keep. We're going to Pacific Playland. The amusement park? What goes on out there, it seems, isn't so amusing. <laughs> What did you find out, Greg? I've been pumping some of the concession owners. Do they know anything about a floating gambling game? They do. They're keeping mum. Uh, what about the man they call the boss? Couldn't learn a thing. Oh? Uh, what about the little man who threatened Leora? Dockleface? Yes, he works out here. They recognized my description of him. Who is he? Name's Benny Baker, known as Hot Licks Baker. <laughs> Hot Licks? Used to be a trap drummer until he found an easier pitch. Well, he sounds like a charming character. They tell me he works at one of the concessions, some daredevil trapeze act, the incomparable florette, whatever that yes, is. Yes, it's over there. You see that neon sign? Well, hanging over that big tent. Well, come on, let's go visiting. Precision, the little lady will defy gravity. 
Perimeter. Buy two tickets, Sandy. Uh, Greg, uh, hurry, hurry, hurry. Uh, that Barker. What about him? I have a feeling he's looking at us. No law against giving his customers the once over. No, it's just that, well, he kind of nodded when he spotted you. As if, look out, Greg, that's the unsigned. It's coming loose. Greg, get out of the way. Are you all right, Greg? Me? Sure, Sandy. Oh, you. Lucky thing you pushed oh, me. Oh, I, I had heart failure. You were standing right under it. You had heart failure. Yeah. Brother, I could feel the breeze as that sign went past me. Oh. Everybody okay out there? Oh, boy. Uh, accidents will happen. We'll have the debris cleaned up in a jiffy. In the meantime, just step up, ladies and gents. See, Florette. Florette being comfortable. Florette, the wonder girl. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Hey, Greg. That was not an accident. Sure it was, Sandy. The sign just tore loose. When you were directly under it, I think somebody wanted to kill you. Oh, nonsense. He's right, Mr. Hood. Huh? I said your friend is right. Two hundred percent. She was dressed in a kind of spangled costume, a carnival performer. She'd inched her way to us through the crowd. She pulled Sandy and me over onto one side and talked in quick whispers, as if there wasn't much time. He knows you're after him. Who does? The boss, the man I work for. Who is he? What's he look like? Where does he hang out? What's it worth to you, Mr. Hood? To find out who's threatening the Lord Thorn. Suppose you tell us first who you are. What's a diff who I am? Make with the cash you offer and you'll get what you really want to know. Fifty. Oh, chicken feed, Mr. Hood. A hundred. Come again. Double or nothing. Step in, folks. Big show's about to commence. You will see Florette being comfortable. Well, that's my cue. i got to go in the tent. You're Florette. You yeah, yeah, for a crummy 65 carry. a week. All right, you win, Florette. $200. Let's have it. Where can I find this man they call the boss? Well, he's always at the same place. You'll find... Oh, look, I, I ain't got time to talk now. Why not? Wait. Come back here. After my act. Meet me back at the tent in my dressing room. We bought our tickets, Sandy and I, and followed the crowd into the big tent. Pretty soon, the girl appeared and climbed a rope ladder, a hundred feet up at least. Four times a day she did this stunt. She must have had nerves of iron. Don't get it, Greg. Get what? Well, uh, a trapeze artist, a honky tonk character. What possible connection can she have with a girl like Leora Thorne? That is what we're going to pay her two hundred dollars to find out. Are you ready, Miss Florette? All ready. Ah! Greg, she missed. They're taking her to the dressing room. She'll never live after that fall. Wait, let's get out of here, Sandy. Keep your seats, ladies and gentlemen. Please keep your seats. It was an accident. An accident. Please keep your seats. Excuse us, please. We have to get through. Keep going, Greg. I'm right behind you. This time, I'll bet my most sincere necktie on it, Sandy. That was deliberate. What? Did you notice the fellow who was beating the temple for her? Oh, the little fellow with the drum? Uh-huh. Yes, what about him? He took a powder as soon as she missed that second trapeze. Well? He was Benny Baker. The man who went to see Leora Thorne? That's right. And this was murder, pal. Deliberate murder. In her dressing room, the incomparable Florette was dying a death I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. We pushed our way through before anybody could stop us. An ambulance intern was already there, shaking his head. 
The policeman was there, too, making duck tracks in his notebook. I could see what was in the wind when I heard the copper say, Open and shut case, looks like. Just an accident. We may as well get out of here, Greg. Not yet, Sandy. But it's too late. The girl won't be able to talk to us. Maybe she will. Look at her eyes. Her eyes? She's staring at us. I think she wants us to come closer. Can you speak, Florette? Try. Try hard. Who is he? This boss person. The man who made them do this to you. Oh, Greg, it's no use. Wait, wait. She's moving her lips. The, the death. The death right. What's she saying? Something about death. Something about a death ride. Shh, listen. Last boat. Last boat. On the death ride. Come on, Greg. She's dead. didn't get very far, did we? Not yet, but you may quote me as saying I'm hopeful. Oh, Greg, for Pete's sake. What? Call the Orathorn. Tell her you're washing your hands of this. Not a chance. But we have, we have work to do back at the office. But this is ridiculous, traipsing around an amusement park. I'm going to find out who the gentleman known as the boss is. He's responsible for Florette's murder. What makes you so sure that Florette was murdered? You'll see. Right now, I'm wondering what she meant by that death ride, death ride stuff. She may have been referring to Leora. It could be. But on the other hand, hey. What, Greg? Down there on the midway in colored lights a mile high. The death ride. Twenty-five cents. An amusement concession. Well, things are adding up. Come on. We ran down the midway, past the bingo joints and frozen custard stands. For only two bits, the death ride looked entertaining enough. It was a long tunnel filled with water. Flat-bottomed boats chained together took you on a dark and dismal voyage. But we didn't go on it. Not yet we didn't. Because just as we got there... What's the matter? Did you see what I saw? Where? Over there, the ticket booth. He was buying a ticket on the death ride. Then he spotted us and ducked. Who? Benny Baker. There he goes up that alley. Quick, Sandy, we can corner him. Hit him off, Greg. I'm trying to. All right, slow up, Baker. End of the line. Okay, okay, okay. You're out of training, Hotlicks. It's the life you lead. What do you want? Hold him, Sandy. Got him. Get, get me alone. Quite a trick, Hot Lakes. Who put you up to it? Up to what? Florette's belly flop. That was an accident. Slight correction, a murder. You're wacky. Listen, Benny, I know how trapeze artists work. They practice a certain beat till every muscle is adjusted to it. And when that beat is changed, even by a split second... So that's how he did it. That's how he did it, by changing the drum beat. A couple of Weissenheimers, sir. Well, try and pin something on me. We both heard that drum. So did a hundred other people in that audience. You're cooked, Benny, unless you talk. Who put you up to it? Sup- Suppose I sing. What then? The deal? Yeah. I don't do business with rats, Benny. Here's what I do. Hey, cut it out. I'm sick, I tell you, I'm sick. Who's the man that hires you? Start singing. All right, all right, only stop. I figure he's a middle-aged guy, maybe. Kind of fat, maybe, judging by his voice. I, I never actually seen him. But he paid you to threaten Mr. and Mrs. Thorne and to take care of Florette. Yeah, yeah. Only I never actually seen him. Well, where is his gambling place located? He ain't the gambler. He ain't the guy Leora lost the money to. No? He's only using that, see? To pull some other racket on Mr. and Mrs. Thorne. Some other racket? What kind? Don't ask me. I just follow orders. Well, how if you've never seen the man? The boss gives me orders on the phone. How does he pay you off? Well, he meets me now and then. But always in the darkness. In the darkness? Oh, Greg, he's lying to us. I ain't. I ain't. I swear I ain't. Look, over there, where I'm pointing... That's where he meets me. On the death ride? Yeah, the last boat. You believe him, Greg? Hmm. Could be. Remember the girl's dying words to us? Yeah. I think he's telling the truth. What uh, What? What are you going to do to me, mister? Until the police take over, I'm leaving you in the capable hands of Mr. Taylor here. Uh, uh, Greg, uh, where are you off to? A sudden yen has come over me, Sanderson. 
I haven't tried one of those amusement rides since I was a small boy. You're, you're going on the death ride? If anybody wants me, I'll be in the last boat, keeping a date in the darkness of the tunnel. <laughs> I strayed over to the ticket booth and put down my quarter. It was past midnight now, and I was the only customer. I waited by the entrance gates. The string of tiny boats emerged from the tunnel, slowed up, and disgorged a load of giggling bobby soxers. Then it was my turn. I asked the old geezer who was in charge... Mind if I ride in the last one? Ride anywhere as you please, mister. The death ride got underway, with yours truly as the only passenger. Suddenly, I felt lonely, as if I didn't have a friend in the world. The boats headed into the long, black tunnel. I couldn't see my hand two inches in front of my face. In the inky blackness, I lost all sense of direction. I felt stifled, beads of perspiration collected on my forehead. But, so far, no fellow passenger. You know that feeling you get in a dark room? That a stranger is right alongside you? Well, suddenly I knew. I could sense him sitting behind me in that last boat for him to speak. But all I could hear was the water in that tunnel and his watch. The ticking of his watch... I remember how it echoed. Finally, when he talked, his voice was muffled. When I answered, I tried to sound like Mr. Benny Hotlick's dockle-faced baker. That you, Benny? Yeah. Take care of Florette? Yeah. Good boy. Got another job for you, Benny. Okay. Up near Tahoe. Going to be an accident up there. Tomorrow morning. What kind of accident? Falling rocks. Automobiles going to get out of control. Will someone get killed? A girl. Suddenly a shaft of light. There must have been a torn place in the canvas that lined the tunnel. Suddenly he must have seen that I wasn't Benny because... Okay, what? Oh. I couldn't turn around. His hands were on my throat. I still couldn't see who he was, and the hands kept gripping tighter. Tighter! And then Roman candles started shooting off in my brain. Bonfires danced before my eyes, and then I blacked out. So long, Hood. Here's where you get off. Only two feet of water, but enough to drown you. Take it easy, old man. Oh, my throat. Just lie on that bench for a while. Where'd you find me, Sandy? On the death ride. Floating face down. You deserve a Carnegie Medal for life-saving. How come such perfect timing? Well, uh, he got away. Baker? I was running after him. Just as we passed the death ride, I saw a passenger climbing out of the last boat. It wasn't you, and I got worried. That passenger... What did he look like? I didn't wait to see. I grabbed a flashlight from the old man and went sloshing into the tunnel to find you. I never saw that other passenger either. Too dark. That was the boss. Yes. Any idea of his identity? None. His hands suddenly... Sandy. Yes? I just remembered that fellow's hands, his left wrist. What? Never mind, it'll keep. We'd better get after Benny Baker. I've learned he's a professional killer with another job on tap for tomorrow morning. Oh, and I let him get away. Come on, we've got to stop him. What are you stopping for, Greg? We won't have to look any further for Mr. Benny Hotlicks Baker. Where? I don't see him. Look. Now do you see him? Where you're pointing? Yes. That concession over there. Hilbert's Waxworks Museum. Those figures on display outside. Look at those wax figures. Oh. Oh. Greg... How fantastic. Fantastic was the word, all right. 
three of them standing upright and motionless. Napoleon, Mary, Queen of Scots, holding her head in her hands, and Jack the Ripper, all built of wax. Alongside, slumped over and equally motionless, was Benny Baker. They made a lovely foursome. Oh, that, that green spotlight on them, you'd, you'd almost swear that Benny was a wax figure, too. Yeah, except for the bullet hole and the blood. Sandy, let's get back to the car. Yeah, Greg, where are you driving to? You'll see. This isn't the direction to my house. I'm not taking you home, pal. Oh, now, see here, Greg, enough is enough. I've got a home and a comfy rest mattress waiting for me. Yes, and a wife who's probably ready to divorce me for staying out all night. Here we are, Leora Thorne's house. I agree. I know it's late, Leora, but I've got to see you. This is Sandy Taylor, my attorney. How do you do? How do you do? Come into the library, Leora. I want to talk to you. I'll wait out here in the hall. Yes, Greg? Are you, by any chance, planning an auto trip? Well, how did you know? A little birdie told me. In the morning, Brad and I are driving out of town for the weekend. Up to Lake Tahoe? Well, who told you? You're not going, Leora. But, Greg, Brad and I were the counting The trip is on... off for a very simple reason. If you value your life... If I... Greg, what are you talking about? Why, hello, Mr. Hood. Oh, Brad, darling. You better come in and listen to this. Well, I woke up as I heard you going downstairs, precious. Greg insists that we call off our trip to Tahoe. Oh? Well, why is that, Mr. Hood? Falling rocks. What? There's to be an accident on that mountain road to Leora's lodge. Leora is scheduled to be a corpse. Greg! What? You mean they actually kill her because of that gambling debt? That petty crap game operator hasn't been threatening Leora at all. Well, then who... Somebody who figures this is a perfect time to put you in a nice marble mausoleum while he can use that gambling debt as a cover-up. But who? I haven't any enemies. But you're absolutely sure of this, Mr. Hood. I've met the gentleman in question. You've seen him? I didn't say I'd seen him. We met in the darkness. He tried to kill me. What? Oh, he's a bad boy. He had two Confederates working with him. When they talked too much, he put them both out of the way. It, it all sounds so, so fantastic. I... Mrs. Laura's right, Mr. Hood. It's like a bad movie. You don't care for melodramatic doings, eh, Thorne? Well, I guess I'm just not used to them. You like things to be calm and serene, eh? Well, yes, I guess you'd call me the matter-of-fact type. Mm -hmm. Uh, tell me something, Thorne. Yes? Don't you ever get tired? I'm tired of what? Of playing cat and mouse, you filthy Greg, swine. you're out of your mind. He knows you love him now, Leora. He knows he's mentioned in your will. He also knows how changeable you are, and he'd rather be a rich widower than a poor ex-husband. What? Get out! I'm not listening, Brad. I'm just not listening. You used to work in carnivals in the old days, didn't you, Thorne? With Florette and Benny, you knew they could be hired for a price. Brad, don't let him say these things. That's right, Thorne. Don't let me say them. Okay, Hook. This is how you want it. Stand up. Brad, that gun. You too, precious lamb. What? You once told me you'd die for me. Here's your big chance. Oh, no. You see, he's right. You are too changeable, precious. You'd be getting tired of me one of these fine days, and we mustn't have that. What, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Finish up what I started. Okay, Sandy, you can come in now. Watch out, Sandy! Ah! I'm okay. He shot with wire. Drop that gun, Thorne. Drop it. You dirty... Drop it. Drop it. Grab him, Sandy. I've got him. All right, Thorne. Uh... You come in quietly to the police and we play more patty cake. How come? Quietly. I knew it was you ever since that excursion on the death ride. You knew? How? Say goodbye to your wife. Goodbye, precious lamb. Now take off the wristwatch and give it to her. I don't want it. But your love gift to him is what put me onto him. What? Uh, in the darkness, Thorn, it was like an engraved calling card. A wristwatch? Heart shaped. Extremely unusual. And you forgot all about the luminous dial. You have heard The Car.
Carnival of Death, an adventure from the casebook of Gregory Hood, written this week by Jerome D. Ross, directed by Martin Andrews and produced by Frank Cooper Associates. Listen again next week at the same time over this ABC station for the story of the Mutton Jade Buddha, another adventure from the casebook of Gregory Hood. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. WBBM-FM, Chicago. And now, in cooperation with police and federal law enforcement departments throughout the United States, Wrigley's Spearmint Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, Gangbusters! For chewing enjoyment plus long-lasting refreshment, treat yourself to Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The lively, full-bodied flavor cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The pleasant chewing helps keep your throat moist and adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. So always keep a package of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. Enjoy it often, every day, as millions do. Now, gangbusters! Good evening, gangbusters listeners. Detective story fiction usually features an insignificant, unexpected clue. Tonight's factual report on a singularly brutal murder is stranger than fiction by far, for the clue was only half a lemon. To bring you tonight's report, gangbusters has asked W.W. Luttrell, Commissioner of Safety, State of Tennessee, to narrate by proxy the case of a half lemon. Please continue, Commissioner Luttrell. It came up rain, as the saying goes, on the night of March 21st, 1950, in eastern Tennessee. The cold and the damp penetrated even into the warm farmhouse occupied by Robert N. Grant on Highway 70, six miles east of Kingston. But as it turned out, wind and weather weren't the only enemies Bob Grant had to contend with that night. He just finished dinner and was listening to the radio while reading a farm weekly. Wonder who's out in this weather. Good evening. Hi. Say, I hate to bust in on you like this, mister, but I've just had a blowout. I wondered if I could borrow a jack. I know it's a lot of trouble. Oh, not at all. I think I've got a jack in the trunk of my car. Give me a minute to get into some boots, and I'll come out and lend you a hand. Oh, you will, mister. Thanks a lot. I'll wait in my car. Huh? Okay. Robert Grant remembered to do two things, gangbusters listeners, as he drew on his boots. To leave his wallet containing over $4,000 in cash in the house, and, though he hardly knew why, to slip a loaded thirty-two caliber revolver into his belt. Then he walked to the door... And out into the storm. Mister? Where are you, mister? So dark out here, I can't see my hand in front of my face. Here I am, over here, next to your car. Okay, be right with you. All right, to keep you waiting. It's all right, mister. Sure, we have lots of time. Oh, didn't know there were two of you. That'll speed up the job. Yeah, let's get with it, huh? As soon as I get the jack out of the trunk of this car... Can't seem to find the lock. Either of you fellas got a match? Nope, not me. Sorry, neither have I. Never mind. Yeah, I have one. Here, now hold it for me till I get my keys out. Uh, you hold it, mister, and get your hands up. What? Get your hands up fast. All right, if that's the way you want it. Look out, Lou! Look out, he... God. Mister, I want you. Brother, you really drilled him. He asked for it. Yeah. Ed, you'll have to give me a hand into the car. He yeah. got me in the stomach. Yeah, as soon as I go through him. You said he always carried a whole lot of loot with him. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, yeah. shut up. That's funny. There's no wallet. He must have left it inside. Ed, we better get out of here. I'm starting to go. But we can't pull out now. Ed, Not we got her. We got it. Okay, Lou, okay. Here, let me get your arm over my shoulder. Easy, easy. There. Please. Oh, please. Oh. I'll get the door open. 
That's it. In you go. Yeah. Now, lean back. Okay, thanks. All set? Yeah, yeah, get moving. Huh? All right. Robert Grant was not firing at the car as it pulled away, gangbusters listeners. Those shots were a long-established signal between the neighbors of that remote community. One neighbor heard the signal and came running. In a few minutes, a phone call was put through to the sheriff's office. Soon after, Sheriff Robert Tedburn arrived at the scene of the crime with his chief deputy, J.F. Yately. They divided forces. The sheriff went to interview the neighbors. His deputy went to work with the evidence experts of the local police departments. Later, they met and compared notes. Well, Jack, what do you got? Doesn't make too much sense, Sheriff. Not so far. Well, maybe it will. We put it all together. Let's have it. Well, first thing, the coroner's counted five wounds in the dead man already, and he's still working. That checks. The neighbor said the shot sounded so close together they thought it was a machine gun. I doubt it, Sheriff. More like an automatic fired at almost point-blank range. The coroner found powder burns on the face and upper chest. One bullet went through the inside breast pocket of Grant's jacket, by the way, where he must have kept his wallet. Of course, they lifted the wallet before they cut him down. No, they didn't. What do you mean? They left the wallet in the house. 4000 in cash in it. Say, maybe that's why the killer shot him. You know, blew his top because he expected Grant to be loaded. And when he wasn't? Then why didn't the killer go inside and look for the money? Search me. I never yet ran across a gunman who thought in a straight line. Yeah, neither did I. If I get a hunch, these boys had a good reason for the way they acted. They? Yeah, there were two of them at least, probably more. Well, that's some kind of a lead. Here's another. Just before that so-called machine gun went off, there was a single shot. Sounded like Mr. Grant's 32. You think maybe Grant shot one of them? Yeah. I think that's why they killed him, Jack. Why they gave up on the money. Sheriff, I'm just thinking out loud, but if Grant did manage to hit one of them... You'll have to get to a doctor pretty fast? Yeah. Good idea, Jack. Tom, get on down to the prowl car. Notify every hospital within 50 miles to report gunshot wounds at once. Direct to our office. thought this old office would look this good to me. Oh, boy, am I glad to get indoors again. Same here. It was cold out there at that farm, cold and wet. Yeah. It'll take the wife a week to get the mud out of these clothes. What we both need is some hot coffee. Won't do any harm, that's for sure. I'll make some. Hold it. Right. Sheriff Tedburn. Evening, Sheriff. This is Jim Rodden, Knoxville Police Department. Yes, Rodden. Uh, we have your bulletin here on the Grant slaying. Yeah? It was just possible that we have one of the men you're looking for, an ex-con named Leon Llewellyn. Oh? He was uh, brought into the general hospital here at 9.50 p.m. with a critical bullet wound in his abdomen. Yeah? Well, the Grant slaying took place about 7.45, near as we can put it. Well, that's about a two-hour drive, Sheriff, from Kingston to Knoxville. What's this Llewellyn story? We don't know yet. Pretty bad shape, the doc says, so we uh, figured we'd better hold off questioning him till you got here. Well, thanks, Rodden. We'll be with you just as soon as we can. Detective Rodden? Yeah, that's right, Sheriff. Glad to meet you. This is Jack Yateley, my chief deputy. Uh, how do you do? do? How is Llewellyn now? Uh, not so good. You've been able to recover the slug? No, the doctor says his condition is too poor to stand an operation now. Mm. Can I go in and try to talk to him? Sure, sure. Jack, you hold it out here. You might check with the office from time to time. Right. Uh, this way, Sheriff. Thanks. Now, uh, Llewellyn knows me from scrapes he's been in. You better let me start the questioning. Anything you say. Ellen. Lou, it's Jim Robin. Remember me? Oh. 
Oh, oh Jill. Who shot you, Lou? Can't tell you. We'll find out sooner or later, Lou. Why not give it to us now? Lou, who is in on this deal with you? Lou? Jim, I'd like to help you. You've always been square with me, but it's different. I got a key. Got a key. Lou? Lou? That's all for now, I think. Think he'll die? Ah, uh, he'll probably pull through. I've got his clothes down the hall, Sheriff. You want to give them the once over? Yeah. By the way, Rodden, you didn't tell me. How did Lou Allen get here? Ambulance. He was found lying face down in the front yard of his home. Nobody seems to know how he got there. What do you think? Well, with the wound he has, it's a cinch. He didn't walk very far. Most likely he was dumped from a car. A getaway car. Probably. Uh, here are the clothes. Oh. Hey, what's this in the pocket? Half a lemon. Yeah, bitten almost in two. I've heard that some people bite into lemons to keep them crying out when they're hurt. I've heard that too. You mind if I take this along? No, of course not. Well, why do you want it? <laughs> Just a hunch. One of these days we might find the other half of this lemon. Sure. Yeah, Jack. I think we have a line on the getaway car. Tom Swanson at the office says the boys found three witnesses who claim they saw a big black sedan pulling away from Grant's place about 7.45 tonight. Big black sedan? Yeah, an old Cadillac, they say. Uh, Jack, did Tom give you anything else? Yeah, but it may not hold up. One witness says the right headlight was awfully bright, but the left one looked as if it might play out any minute. It'd be an easy thing to fix. Would Jack, for a sensible man, a crook might not think of it. Rodden. Yes, sir. Pass the word on about this cat like, will you? Jack and I'll head back to Kingston and put out a bulletin on it, but uh, maybe you could save us some time. One of your traffic control boys may have spotted that defective headlight. It's some time before tonight, I mean. That could be. I'll get on it and let you know. Friends, next time you chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Notice how cool and fresh it makes your mouth feel. That's because Wrigley's Spearmint Gum has lots of lively, refreshing flavor in every stick. The minute you sink your teeth in, that cooling flavor begins to freshen your taste and relieve that hot, dry feeling in your throat. It sweetens the breath, too. Millions of people carry Wrigley's Spearmint Gum with them wherever they go for quick, long-lasting refreshment and for real chewing enjoyment. Next time you're at the store, get some Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Enjoy its refreshing flavor and good, pleasant chewing often, every day. Remember, that's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Now, back to Gangbusters. And Tennessee State Safety Commissioner, W.W. Luttrell. Detective Browden did get on to that Cadillac, Gangbusters listeners the one with the defective headlight. It belonged to a Knoxville resident named Buford Roberts. Rowden and Sheriff Tedburn paid him an official call. Mind turning your radio down a little, Mr. Roberts? Oh, sure. Oh, I'll turn you again, Sheriff. Right here in the house all last night. Uh, you never set foot outside, Mr. Roberts? Not for a minute. So you didn't use the car? That's right. The car just sat there in the garage all night? As far as I know. Uh, I didn't take it out. Mr. Roberts, uh, you ever hear of a fellow named Leon Allen? Mm, yes, uh, I've heard of him. Friend of yours, isn't he? Oh, I wouldn't say that. Uh, look, fellas, I have a lot of things I promised I'd do this morning. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, when are you going to be uh, through with it? We are now, just about. All we have to do is check through the car. Thoroughly this time. Come on, Mr. Roberts, let's go out to the garage. Garage uh, door makes a lot of noise, doesn't it, Mr. Roberts? Yes, I've been meaning to tend to it, but you know how it is. Yeah. Did you have the radio on uh, loud last night? Hmm, not especially. Uh, why? Well, then you would have heard this door opening if anybody had taken the car out last night. Uh, sure. 
Only nobody took it out. I told you that. Yeah, I know. Sheriff, I'm in the back. Something I want to show you in the car. Okay, Jack. Excuse me a minute. Where you got, Jack? You were right, Sheriff. You said crooks weren't sensible. Look. See it? Well, I'll... Rodden, bring Roberts over here. Okay, Sheriff. Roberts, you said his car wasn't out of the garage last night. That's right. You also said you didn't know Leon Llewellyn very well. That's what I said. Llewellyn was in this car last night. Well, let's see you prove that, mister. All right, look on the floor. There, under the edge of the seat. Are you kidding, Sheriff? There's nothing there. Look again. I see half a lemon. Oh, that? Well, that's nothing. Nothing. Maybe enough to hang you. Well, gangbusters listeners, Detective Rowden brought Buford Roberts down to headquarters while the evidence experts processed Roberts' Cadillac and proved that its tires matched perfectly the marks left by the getaway car and that the mud on the underbody checked with the mud samples taken from the front yard of the farmhouse. With these facts in hand, Sheriff Tedburn and his deputy returned to Kingston. When they got there... Deputy Tom Swanson handed them a report, but it, which had just been phoned in from the Knoxville General Hospital. Well, Jack, Llewellyn's going to pull through. They got that slug out of him, and it checks with a bullet that Detective Rowden test-fired from Grant's gun. I'd say this wraps it up, wouldn't you? I mean, it definitely puts Llewellyn at the scene of the crime. Yeah, it does that. You're more interested in putting Buford Roberts there, right? Maybe we can get Lowell and do that for us. Well, the doctor says he's strong enough to talk. That could be any day now. Yeah, any day. <laughs> Brother, there's an awful lot of waiting in this business. Sometimes. Sheriff Tedburn? Yeah, Tom. What? Left a note for me. We'll be right out here. Come on, Jack. Let me have that note, Tom. Woman's handwriting signed a friend. I have to... Jack, listen to this. I have tried to get Buford Roberts to tell you what he knows about this Lou Allen thing, but he won't. He's protecting his friends. I heard Buford talking to Leon Lou Allen several days ago about borrowing the car. Leon said he'd get a good driver, Eddie Rudder. Talk to Eddie Rudder. With the help of Detective Rowden, Sheriff Tedburn located Eddie Rudder in Knoxville. It wasn't easy. Rudder had no previous police record. But when they began quizzing him... Come on, Rudder, let's have the story. Well, this Leon Llewellyn came to me and told me that he thought I was a good kid and wanted to give me a chance to make some easy money. Mm -hmm. well, I, I asked him how, and he said all I had to do was drive a car. Buford Roberts' Cadillac. Lou said he'd handle all the rest of it. He did. Let's have the details. Well, after Grant came out of the house and came up to his car to get the jack out of his trunk, Lou told him to put up his hands. Yeah. Well, Grant started to, but then he made a dive for his gun and he had it out before Lou could stop him. I don't think Lou really wanted to kill Grant. Honest, I don't. He put six slugs into him. Yeah, I know, but Grant started it. Go on, Eddie. Well, after the shooting... I got scared, and I, I wanted to get out of there fast. I wanted to take Lou straight to the Knoxville Hospital, but he said no, take him home. So I drove him to his house, and well, I let him out. After that, I drove the car to Robert's place, and I left it. Roberts didn't have anything to do with it, then. No, he didn't. Not a thing. Sure, then? Absolutely. Buford Roberts didn't have a thing to do with it. I want that on the record. All right, it's on the record for what it's worth. Not a bit more. Now remember, Eddie, if you change your mind, I'm on your side. Lou Allen isn't. Leon Llewellyn and Eddie Rudder came up for trial promptly, gangbusters listeners, with Rudder acting as witness for the state. The trial dragged on for days in the Kingston courthouse, while Sheriff Tedburn watched and waited. Finally, on the night of June 13th, the phone rang in the sheriff's office with the message that Rudder wanted to see the sheriff in his cell. Hello. 
Hello, Sheriff. Still on my side? Only if you're planning to tell the truth, are you? I... I don't know. Sheriff, I'm scared. I'm scared to death. Of Lou Allen? He said they'd get me for turning state's witness. Not much he can do about it, is he? No. But they can? That's right. Who are they? Sheriff, if I tell you, will you see to it that they... They can't get at me? I'll do my best. Now, that's a promise. All right. It wasn't true what I said before. There was somebody else in it with Llewellyn and me. Roberts, wasn't it? He planned the whole thing. Mm -hmm. He brought Llewellyn and me to my place the night before we pulled the job. He said he found out that Grant always carried thousands of dollars with him and it would be a cinch to knock him over. Roberts gave us the car and he... Well, you can take it from there. Yeah, Eddie, we will. All the way. Buford Roberts was indicted as an accessory before the fact of Robert Grant's murder, gangbusters listeners. A jury found him guilty, and he was sentenced to 20 years in the state penitentiary. A similar sentence was imposed on Eddie Rudder. The actual killer, Leon Llewellyn, was sentenced to 99 years in the same institution. Thank you, Tennessee State Safety Commissioner W.W. Luttrell. In just a moment, Gangbusters Nationwide Clues. Friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum is a refreshing, delicious treat you can enjoy even while you're working, driving your car, or busy doing other things. Just slip a stick into your mouth and chew it as long as you like. The pleasant chewing will make the time pass more pleasantly for you. And you'll enjoy that cooling, refreshing flavor. It'll help keep your mouth and throat moist. A real help on warm summer days. Keep a package or two of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy all the time. Chew and enjoy it often, as millions do. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. And now, Gangbusters Nationwide Clues, broadcast every week to assist American police in their war against the underworld. Attention all citizens. Watch for Peter Kenzick. Wanted by the FBI for unlawful flight to avoid prosecution for murder. His official description. Peter Edward Kenzig, age 46, 5 feet 7, about 155 pounds, medium build, light brown hair, blue eyes, sometimes wears rimless glasses, medium complexion, may be employed as tailor or fireman. This man has a scar across bridge of nose, burn scars on left forearm and right elbow. Blue tattoo of tombstone with wording in memory of mother on right forearm. Upper left front tooth may be missing. Caution, Kenzick may be armed and should be considered extremely dangerous. He's being sought for stabbing two people. Attention all citizens and police officers. Maintain vigilance for Don Carlos Eastwood. Wanted by the FBI for unlawful flight to avoid confinement for the crime of robbery. Listen carefully to his official description. Don Carlos Eastwood, age 26, 5 feet 10, about 170 pounds, medium build, brown hair, brown eyes, ruddy complexion, may seek work as telephone lineman, fireman, or television antenna installer. This man has a pit scar on right cheek, mole on left shoulder, and small pit scars on right knee and right leg. He may have hair dyed red and grew cut. Possesses a private airplane pilot's license. Caution. Eastwood may be armed and should be considered dangerous. If you have any information concerning these clues, notify your local police, the nearest office of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, or gangbusters at once. Tonight's gangbusters case was dramatized by Stanley Silverman and directed by John Dietz with Scott Tennyson and Jackson Beck in leading roles. The entire production was supervised for CBS Radio by John Ives. Gaylord Avery speaking. <laughs> Gangbusters, a production of CBS Radio in cooperation with Phillips H. Lord is brought to you each week, same time, same station, by Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum.
the refreshing, delicious treat you can enjoy even while you're busy. This is the CBS Radio Network. Hearthstone of the Death Squad in the terrifying letter, Murder Case. Tonight we again present the famous Hearthstone of the Death Squad, implacable manhunter of the Metropolitan Police in one of his greatest investigations entitled The Terrifying Letter, Murder Case, with Ethel Wilson as Lizzie Ackers and James Meehan as Jonas Caswell. And now, Inspector Hearthstone, in The Terrifying Letter, murder case. The scene opens in a large office building as a strange-looking man stops before a door marked Jesse Caswell, public stenographer. The man opens the door and we hear him saying, You Jesse Caswell? Yes, I'm Miss Caswell. I got something I want you to type for me. I'm sorry, but it's after eight and I can't accept any work tonight. Listen, Miss Caswell. How much do you usually get for typing out just a few lines? Fifty cents is my minimum charge, but I don't see... Well, suppose I put this $50 bill on your desk and said it's yours, ma'am, for doing this little job. Fifty dollars? Well, that's a different thing. I'll put a piece of paper in my typewriter. All right. What is it you want me to type? Start it off, to whom it may concern. Go on. What next? I've grown tired of life... And I've decided to end it all tonight. I hope my friends will understand and forgive. Oh, now type that kind of thing. I, I won't. Do you see this gun, lady? You type what I say or else. Type it. Don't point that revolver at me. Type what I told you. Get going. And quit your squawking or I'll slap you in the mouth. Here it is. I'm not touching that letter. Put it on the desk. But... Now sign your name to it. No, no. Here's a pen. Sign it. And you won't get hurt. What is this? What are you trying to do? I've signed this. Now, stay where you are. Take that gun away. Oh, thank heaven you've come. Help me. You. What are you doing here? No. No, don't kill me. Don't. Don't. What? You're going to kill me, too. No. No, no. And 30 minutes later, we see Inspector Hearthstone of the Death Squad on the murder scene with his assistant, Detective Sam Cook, as the hysterical scrubwoman who found the two bodies is saying, No, Inspector Hearthstone, I didn't hear no shots. I was on another floor cleaning. You say your name is Lizzie Atters? Yes, sir. I saw the lights on in Miss Caswell's office, so I opened the door. And I saw... I saw them two bodies. It's terrible, sir. His hair makes me sick. I understand, Lizzie. I'll go into the next room for a while. We'll talk to you later. Uh, I'll be right in here. Close the door, Sam. Okay. Why'd you stop questioning her so suddenly, Inspector? Because I think the silent evidence of these two dead bodies is more important at the moment. Looks like the woman killed herself after writing a suicide now. See the gun? Still in her hand. The woman didn't kill herself, Sam. She was murdered. That's a phony suicide note. And that gun was put in her hand after the killing. You mean this dead man killed her? Now, how could a dead man murder her, Sam? What happened is that both these people were murdered by a third person. The question is, who? It's a fantastic situation. I think that scrub woman, Lizzie Actors, could have done it, do you? Get her back in here, Sam. Come in, Lizzie. Yes, yes, sir. Lizzie, are you certain you didn't hear any shots? I told you before I didn't, Inspector. Oh, sorry, Lizzie, I forgot what I meant was, did you see anyone leaving this office before you found the bodies? If I had, I'd have told you. Say, I don't like the way you're sizing me up. If you're getting any idea about me, or you forgetting I called the cops myself? Tell me, uh, what do you know about this dead woman? All I know is that her name is Jessie Caswell, and that she was a public stenographer. 
With all kinds of people coming in and out of her office. And the sign on the door tells us that much. Well, you asked me, didn't you? Never hear her quarreling with anyone? I never heard Jessica Caswell fighting with no one. Only thing was... Yes? She told me some nut was trying to get money out of her by claiming she was one of them missing heirs to a big fortune. Like you read about in the papers, Inspector Hearthstone. But I never seen him or heard his name. Missing heir. Hmm. Sam, turn that murdered man's body over. There you are, Inspector. Now, Lizzie, look at this murdered man's face carefully. You know him? No. No, I... I don't know him from Adam. That's odd. What you getting at now? His name is Adam Ackers. A known trigger man, just out from a ten-year stretch in prison. And your name is Lizzie Ackers. What's the connection? Quick, tell me. Oh. He's my own stepson. But I swear I ain't seen him since before he went to prison. And I never had nothing to do with him before then, either. That's another one for the Marines, Inspector Hearthstone. Come along with me, Lizzie. Uh, she may be telling the truth, Sam. Go and get on with your work, Lizzie. I, I wouldn't have thought this of any cop, Inspector, believing a poor woman like me. Protecting the poor is the duty of the police, Lizzie. Get along now. Yes, Sam, get headquarters on the phone while I go through this desk drawer. Police headquarters. Hello, Smith. Inspector Hartstone wants to talk to you. Hello, Smith. Phone every radio station at once. Right, Inspector. Have them announce that a pretty blonde woman about 35 named Jessie Caswell, public stenographer... Believed to be the heiress of long-dead Ezekiel Caswell, Canadian copper mine king, was found murdered in her office along with Adam Ackers, notorious gang killer, tonight. I got her down, Inspector Hearthstone. What else? Ask any relative or acquaintance of the murdered woman to communicate immediately with Hearthstone of the death squad. That all? Send a detail of men to Jesse Caswell's apartment to search for any letters or papers relating to the murder. Owen Smith. Yes, Inspector Hearthstone? Get a complete file together of the murdered woman's past life. Thank you. Goodbye. Hey, what a bean you got for remembering things, Inspector. <laughs> you knew straight off that dame was a missing heiress to all the copper mines in the world. Oh, not at all, Sam. I found a carbon of a letter she wrote to a lawyer in her desk drawer. A man named Fielding. What do you know? Jesse foolishly thought the lawyer Fielding was trying to take her in when he wrote he believed she was the Caswell heiress. Fact is, Fielding is a top man in his profession. So look up his address, Inspector. I know his address, Sam, and it's not far from here. Come along. Uh, what about the scrub woman, Lizzie? I haven't marked her off my list yet. Why, Inspector Hearthstone, come in. It's nice to see you. And to see you, Mr. Fielding. Oh. Uh, what brought Detective Cook and me, Fielding, is an amazing murder. A pretty blonde woman named Jessie Caswell. Yes, I just heard a news flash on the radio. She was a queer character. We found a carbon copy of a letter to you in her desk. You know, Inspector Hartson, <clears throat> I'm certain that woman is the heiress to the Ezekiel Caswell fortune. But when I sent one of my men to see her about it, she practically threw him out of the office. Said we were trying to play some sort of phony missing heiress game to get money out of her. When you were really trying to put a great fortune in her hands. Exactly. Then I wrote her and she accused me of being a confident swindler. I guess that's the copy of her letter to me that you found. How positive are you feeling that Jessie Caswell was the heiress to that big fortune? Just about 99%. One of the soundest legal firms in Canada sent the case to me. Old Ezekiel Caswell died about 25 years ago. He was 80 years old then. Mm hmm well, in all these years, nobody has turned up to claim the estate. So the time came to do something. Did they advertise in the American papers for the missing heirs? Yes, but with no results. That's when they engaged my help. And as I said, we concluded Jesse was the missing heiress. But she'd have no part of us. Well, I guess that's all I need now, Fielding. I wish I could help you more, Inspector. You've supplied me with a magnificent motive for Jesse Caswell's murder. That is, if I can find the murderer... And in this case, it's not easy. Well, Sam, let, let's run along. Uh, good night, Fielding. Well, good night, Inspector. Uh, if you don't mind my cutting in, Mr. Fielding. Not at all, Detective Cook. I'm wondering why you didn't ask the Inspector how Jesse Caswell was murdered. 
Why, I... I... It may be because Mr. Fielding is devoid of curiosity, Sam. Uh, Good night again, Fielding. Good night. I hope I didn't put my foot in, Inspector Hearthstone. But it just ain't natural for a guy not to ask how somebody was pumped off. Unless he already knows. Fielding is a man of good reputation, Sam. So are plenty of others who got the chair, Inspector. Let's get back to headquarters. Our radio appeal may have brought results. Well, Inspector, you were on the beam. Yes? There are two parties waiting outside asking for you. Say they got all the answers about the murdered public stenographer, Jesse Caswell. Ask them in, Sam. Come in, Mr. Barnes. Uh, I am Angus Barnes, Inspector Hostel. Meet my wife, Sarah Caswell Barnes. Sarah Caswell Barnes? Uh, Caswell was her maiden name, Inspector. We just flew in from Canada, Inspector, and we heard your radio call by accident at the airport terminal. Uh, You've got the wrong slant on that murdered woman. Jesse Caswell is not old Ezekiel Caswell's heiress. What makes you so sure of that, Mr. Barnes? Because my wife, Sarah, here is the heiress. She is Ezekiel Caswell's granddaughter. Then why didn't you claim the fortune before this? Because we didn't know there was one, Inspector. The first we heard of it was a week ago, Inspector Hearthstone. A friend in Canada told us he'd seen an ad in the newspaper looking for Grandfather Ezekiel's heir. So we hustled on to New York right away to find out about it. The lady, the public stenographer who was murdered, was only the old man's niece. And your wife, being the granddaughter, would naturally be the real heiress, first in line. That's it. Just to make sure of things, I brought my birth certificate with me. Here it is, Inspector. I was born in Ottawa, Canada, 1921. Strange the Canadians would come to New York to claim the fortune of the Canadian-born Ezekiel Caswell. What? Uh, well, we uh, we thought this the place to come. May I have your birth certificate for a few days, Mrs. Barnes? Oh, couldn't you take a picture of it instead, Inspector? I don't like to leave it out of my hands. My mother always kept it in the family Bible. Sam, here's an order. Have this birth certificate photographed and return the original to Mrs. Barnes. Okay, Chief. If that uh, birth certificate is legitimate, Mr. Barnes, your wife probably is the heiress to a great copper fortune. Since Jesse Caswell is dead. What do you mean by that, Inspector Hostel? I mean you and your wife have a motive for murder. Motive for murder? And I mean, too, I have no proof you two just arrived here from Canada by plane. But we did. Of course we did. We'll have you completely checked, Mr. and Mrs. Barnes. I'll tell you frankly, your story doesn't ring true. Here's your birth certificate, Mrs. Barnes. Give it to me, not her, Detective Cook. Sam, please have Mr. and Mrs. Barnes taken to the Elton Hotel and made comfortable there. Listen here, you can't arrest us. You can't do this to us. I'm merely detaining you. Good night. Come on, Mr. and Mrs. Barnes. I'll have Officer Smith take him over, Inspector. Hello, Operator. Give me Officer Smith, quick. Smith, Detective Sam Cook is turning a couple named Barnes over to you. When you get them outside, have the boys snap a few good pictures of them and send them to the chief of police at Ottawa, Canada. The Barnes are on their way, Inspector. What's the idea of taking pictures of the birth certificate and holding Barnes and his wife? One of the signatures on Sarah Barnes' birth certificate was written with green ink. Oh. The same color Jesse Caswell's phony suicide note was signed with. And the same color, Sam, that was in the murdered gangster's fountain pen when he was shot to death beside Jesse Caswell. Wow. I guess that's beginning to tie things together nice. Uh, Come in. Telegram for Inspector Hearthstone. Thanks. To Inspector Hearthstone of the death squad. Regarding radio broadcast for relatives or friends of murdered Jesse Caswell. I am dead woman's brother... Arrive your office tomorrow a.m. Signed, Jonas Caswell. Your brother? Where does it come from, Inspector? Montreal, Canada, Sam. And I have an idea it will give us the line that leads to our killer. Hearthstone of the Death Squad... And the terrifying letter, murder case, continues in just a moment. America is really strong for CBS Radio's two-hour parade of music. Every Friday night on most of these same stations. Hits from the big shows. Music from Vaudeville's best days. Tin Pan Alley's best numbers, new and old. That's what you have waiting for you tomorrow night. The orchestras of Alfredo Antonini, Ray Block, and Paul Weston play the tunes. Earl Wrightson, Jimmy Carroll, and Georgie Price 
had three great singing casts. Robert Q. Lewis throws open his waxworks, all bringing you two solid hours of pleasure tomorrow night on CBS Radio. Don't miss a minute. And now, back to Hearthstone of the Death Squad and the terrifying letter, Murder Case. Inspector Hearthstone's investigation of the incredible double murder of Jesse Caswell, public stenographer, and Adam Acker's gangster in her office has revealed this. Jesse was apparently heiress to the vast mining fortune left by her uncle in Canada. But Sarah Bonds and her husband appear in Hearthstone's office declaring Sarah is the heiress, which makes them highly suspect. Just as Inspector Hearthstone ordered the Barnes held, he received a wire stating that the murdered woman has a brother, Jonas, and he is coming to see Hearthstone. It is now the following morning, and while awaiting Jonas Caswell's arrival, the inspector is called on one of the greatest sources of information known to the police, a stool pigeon. Detective Sam Cook is ushering one in now, saying... Here's Bozo Sparks, Inspector. Morning, Bozo. I suppose Detective Cook told you what I wanted to see you about? Yes, yeah, sure, about Jesse Caswell's murder. Got any ideas, Bozo, on how Adam Ackles, the trigger man, got into her office and was killed beside her? Funny, ain't it? After bumping so many off himself with so much ahead, Ackie got himself bumped off. Huh? Well, somebody paid him to put the heat on Jesse Caswell to make her type and sign a suicide note in her office. And then that person killed him to eliminate all evidence. Well, I'm not saying I know anything personal, Inspector Hearthstone, but the grapevine talk is, uh, well... Get on with it, Bozo. Remember, the only reason you're walking the streets free is that you're useful to us. Okay, okay. Well, as I was saying, the talk is some guy from Canada offered Ackers $5,000 to bump off the Jesse Caswell dame, forgetting his price for a trigger job was only 100 bucks, And Ackie naturally took the guy up. What was the Canadian man's name, Bozo? If it was a choice between telling you and a chair, Inspector, I couldn't answer that. I don't know. Thank you, Bozo. That'll be all. I'll be seeing you, Inspector. Why? Well, it wasn't much, Sam, but it helps. And... Hearthstone speaking. All right, send the man in. Sam, the murdered woman's brother is here. Let him in. Okay, this way, mister. I'm Detective Cook. I'd like to see Inspector Hearthstone, please. I am Inspector Hearthstone, and you're Jonas Caswell. How do you do, Inspector? How do you do? You got my wire? Who killed my sister, Jesse? Well, we're not quite ready to make an arrest yet, Mr. Caswell. We got a couple of pretty hot suspects. That's encouraging, Detective Cook. The thing I can't understand is why anybody would want to murder Jessie. She was just a public stenographer. Why would they want to kill her? The enormous Ezekiel Caswell fortune. Why else? Jessie was the heiress, wasn't she? My sister Jessie wasn't heiress to anything, Inspector Hostel. What's that? Our uncle, old Ezekiel Caswell, died years ago. I always understood he'd left most of his great copper fortune to a lot of charities. When did you last see your murdered sister, Mr. Caswell? Mm, matter of ten years, I'd say. Back when she left Canada and came to New York to open up a public stenographer's office. But take my word for it. She was no heiress, Inspector. You're her brother and ought to know. I suppose you want to claim your sister's body. Yes. That's why I really came here. Uh, would it be asking too much if Detective Cook helped me make arrangements... I don't know too much about New York. Oh, gladly, Mr. Caswell. Well on me, sir. Well, before you leave, Mr. Caswell, you asked who killed your sister. I understand you're not sure yet. We have a man and wife under arrest this minute. What? A Mr. and Mrs. Angus Barnes. The wife, Sarah, claims she's the granddaughter of Ezekiel Caswell and heiress to his millions. Angus Barnes? And Sarah Barnes? Well, that's ridiculous. They're imposters. They have to be. <laughs> People like that often turn up, Mr. Caswell... When the lure of a missing heiress to a fabulous fortune is broadcast, I'm glad to have met you. Goodbye. Goodbye, Inspector. Detective Cook. Remember, I'll depend on you as you promised. Well, Inspector, I guess he's got something about Barnes and his wife being imposters. The Ottawa police just reported that their whole story, including that press certificate, looks strictly phony so far. Sam, our next move is to get back to our first suspect in this case. You mean that scrub woman, Lizzie Ackers? The stepmother of the gangster was killed along with Jesse Caswell? This report from Officer Smith reveals definitely 
that far from not seeing her gangster stepson, Adam Ackers, for years, he was actually seen walking up to that same office building with Lizzie every night. We'll hop into the car and go and talk to Lizzie now. Don't tell me again you ain't lying, Lizzie. Well, suppose my stepson, Adam Ackers, was walking into the office building with me. What difference does that make, Inspector? You are going to tell me the truth or be jailed this minute. Oh, if I... If I didn't tell you everything, it was because I was scared. Oh, what do you want to know, Inspector Hearthstone? I want a description of the man or woman who paid your stepson $5,000 to force the murdered Jesse Caswell to type a suicide note just before she was killed. And you are going to tell me. All right, Inspector. I'll tell you. Now, with all his evidence assembled, Inspector Hearthstone is ready to close in on the murderer of Jesse Caswell, a pretty blonde public stenographer and missing heiress, and the trigger man, Adam Ackers. The scene is police headquarters, and we hear Inspector Hearthstone saying to Detective Sam Cook, Now, Sam, watch this. Right, Inspector. Take this folder. It contains the death chair evidence we wanted. Yes, sir. And hand me each piece instantly I ask you for it. Gotcha. You've got all these people outside? Every suspect, Inspector. Each one in a separate room. Good. Bring in Angus Barnes and his wife, Sarah. Mr. and Mrs. Barnes, come in. What do you want with us, Inspector Hostel? Yes, what? You'll soon find out. Our first police report from Ottawa, Canada, implied you were both imposters. Then we sent your pictures there. Our, our pictures? Sam, bring in Mr. Jonas Caswell. Jonas Caswell, come in now. What's that? Jonas Caswell? Well, whoever said we were imposters lied. Slow down, Mrs. Barnes. Here's Jonas Caswell, Inspector. You. Angus and Sarah, here. I thought you were dead. You thought they were dead, Jonas? That's why I told you anybody claiming to be Angus and Sarah Barnes were imposters, Inspector. They were supposed to be lost at sea. And good riddance. Then you think, Jonas, that they killed your sister, Jesse Caswell? You're a better judge of that than I, Inspector. Why, you, you... Quiet, Angus. Now, Jonas, why do you say the death of these two people, Angus and Sarah Barnes, would have been a good riddance? Look up their record in Canada, Inspector. One dirty business after another. Terrible reputation. You're a liar! Quiet, Mrs. Barnes. Now, Sam? Yeah, Inspector. Give me the second police report from Ottawa on Angus and Sarah Barnes. Hey, yes, sir. It shows both you, Angus, and you, Sarah, to be people of uh, uncertain character. Then the cops in Ottawa are liars. Show sure, they're liars. Give me that report. This is the last time I'll tell you and your wife to shut up, Barnes. Now give me that letter found in the murdered woman's flat. Thanks, Sam. That's the letter Jonas Caswell sent his sister, right, Inspector? Jonas, this letter advises your sister, Jessie, that a man named Fielding, a lawyer, who approached her about being the heiress of Ezekiel Caswell's fortune was trying to take advantage of her. In short, to stay clear of him. That's correct. Fielding was trying to swindle her. My sister Jessie was only a public stenographer. She wasn't any too smart. A proper protection for a brother to give his sister, Jonas. But now... Sam, bring in the office scrubwoman Lizzie Ackers. Who's she, Inspector? One moment, please, Jonas. You want me now, Inspector? Lizzie, there are two men in this room. Look at them carefully. I am. Was this man, Angus Barnes, the one who paid your trigger man's stepson $5,000 to force a suicide note from the public stenographer, Jesse Caswell, before she was murdered? No, Inspector, I told you that before. It's this guy over here. Ah, I wanted to be sure, Lizzie. Well, Jonas? Know what, Hearthstone? You're more clever than I gave you credit for. Hands up, Jonas Caswell. Don't be dramatic, Detective Cook. I know the game is up. Yes, I killed my sister, Jessie. Took a plane from Montreal. Did the job, flew back, and then wired you, Hearthstone. Telling you, Inspector, this guy's the coolest murderer we ever took in. When a $50 million fortune is at stake, you've got to be cool. The electric chair isn't, Jonas Caswell. I arrest you for the murder of your sister, Jessie Caswell. And I'll give you credit for supplying me with one of the nastiest murders in my career. Take him, Sam, and charge him. Who gets the 50 million bucks, Inspector? Old Ezekiel Caswell's fortune. Well, that's not our affair, Sam. But poor Jessie Caswell was never the missing heiress. 
She was murdered because her brother mistakenly thought she was. Right again, Hearthstone. My mistake. I wanted to get the fortune instead of letting my sister get it. I, as nephew, was next in line. I didn't know Sarah Barnes, the old man's granddaughter here, was still alive. Ha! <laughs> so she gets the money. Would have gotten it whether I killed Jesse or not. Yes. It looks like Sarah Caswell Barnes gets the fortune whether she deserves it or not. And you, Jonas, get the electric chair. And thus, Hearthstone of the Death Squad writes solved. In the files of the terrifying letter, Murder Case. The part of Inspector Hearthstone was played by Alfred Shirley. Written by Frank Hummert. Directed by Henry Howard. And as a presentation of CBS Radio. Here is a special announcement. Beginning this coming Sunday, Hearthstone of the Death Squad will be heard every Sunday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Listen this Sunday for Hearthstone of the Death Squad in The Fabulous Engagement Ring Murder. Now, Autolite and its 60,000 dealers and service stations present... Suspense! Tonight, Autolite brings you the Academy Award nominee, Miss Jane Wyman, in a dramatization of the outstanding mystery novel, Catch Me If You Can. A suspense play produced and directed by Anton M. Leder. Friends, have you actually tried them? Those dandies, those dillies, down the dales and up the hillies, wide gap auto light resistor spark plugs? Well, buy Cornelius do. Prove to yourself that wide gap auto light resistor spark plugs actually make your car idle smoother, give you better performance with leaner gas mixtures, save you gas dollars, and cut down interference with radio and television reception. My, oh, my, if you want to see a satisfied, smiling guy, switch to auto light resistor spark plugs. Only the Autolite Company offers car and truck owners everywhere their sensational advantages. So head for your nearest Autolite dealer and replace old narrow gap spark plugs with wide gap Autolite resistor spark plugs. Remember, be right with Autolite. And now, Autolite presents Jane Wyman in a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Let me tell you. Let me talk as long as I can. It's my last chance to explain about Phil and all the trouble I had afterwards. Phil got me into this mess. The night he died, I sat near his bed waiting for him to fall asleep, and he said, Margot, was there anything in that milk you gave me tonight? Well, of course, darling. Dr. Landers prescribed it, a sedative. Oh? You're a beautiful woman, Margot. Very beautiful. Yes. He was taking so long to fall asleep. It was already after three in the morning. I listened to the wind. Phil and I were all alone, stuck in that godforsaken mountain inn, ever since he fell ill just before Labor Day. There we were, 10,000 feet above sea level, not a soul for miles. The fall season was over and all the other guests were gone, and even Joe, who owns the inn, had gone down to Leadfield to get his winter supplies. I shivered, thinking of the dark, ragged, lonesome mountains outside, and Phil opened his eyes again. You're a good actress, Margot. Better off the stage than you are on, I expect. But I know you're fed up with our marriage. Have been ever since I became ill. I haven't complained, Phil. No, it wouldn't fit the part. But you feel trapped out here in Colorado, don't you? You'd rather be in New York. I wonder, Margot, those pills you put on my lunch tray last week, they weren't my regular vitamin pills. Maybe you want your freedom and my money enough to poison me. Don't be ridiculous, Phil. 
Well, anyway, I didn't take them. I hid them <gasps> with a note saying that you tried to give them to me. Then I called a friend of mine, long distance, an old friend. Who? A detective named Rocky Rhodes. Rocky and I both stayed at this inn one summer. And what did you tell this Rocky? Never mind what I told him. Just remember, he's due here tonight or in the morning. A detective. Phil, you're a fool. I want a divorce, Margot. You do? Yes, without any strings. Those pills are Exhibit A, if they're poison. Blackmail. Phil, darling, if you want a divorce, you can have it without threatening me. You'll sign the papers tomorrow? Of course, darling. I only want to make you happy. But now go to sleep, Phil. You need a good rest. Go to sleep. I stroked his forehead and the sedatives finally took effect. His breathing became very heavy and even. I looked at him and thought he was smart not to take those pills. Ah, but not smart enough. He shouldn't have told me about that detective. He thought he was protecting himself and that I wouldn't dare do anything now. Ah, oh, but he was wrong because I had to now. I couldn't afford to wait and lose everything when he divorced me. And besides, I'd find those pills in the letter before the detective got here. There was practically no risk the way I'd planned it this time. Outside, it had started to rain. A heavy downpour. And the only other sound in the world was Phil's breathing. I picked up the extra pillow and put it down carefully. Carefully over his face. He didn't move. I pressed the pillow down on the side so that no air could get in. No air at all. And held it there a long time. Once the pillow shook a little when Phil's head moved. And once there was a gurgling sound. And that was all. When I lifted the pillow and took it back in its place, the job was done. Everything I ever wanted, money and freedom, was right in my hands. Phil was dead. Dead of a heart attack, Dr. Landers would say. Oh, but wait a minute. Unless someone found those pills with the note from Phil. Phil hadn't died of poison, so I was safe. But there would be questions. Questions I didn't want to have asked. I had to find those pills myself. I started to search. First the pillow under Phil's head. Mm, no. Then the nightstand beside his bed. And the desk under the window. Mm, no. Where could he have hidden it? After all, the bell. Could it be Phil's detective already? Rocky? Rocky Rhodes? Oh, I'll have to be very careful. Just a minute. I'm coming. Just a minute. Yes? Well, don't stand there. It's raining in. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh... I think I'm lost. I'm looking for Pine View Lodge. Well, you are lost. This is Fisherman's Net. Yes, I know. I saw the sign. It's, uh, it's closed for the winter. Well, could you put me up? The manager's away. There's only me and my husband. Well, the luck of the Irish. I meet a beautiful blonde and she's married every time. You wouldn't turn me out in this storm. I'm soaking wet. I'm afraid well, I... please, just tonight. In the morning, I'll get my bearings. Well, if it's, if it's only for one night... Yes, that's all. Thank you. Oh. What a vacation. Where are you from? Chicago, newspaper man. My name is Mike Sheldon. How do you do, Mr. Sheldon? I'm Mrs. Weatherby. How do you do? Uh, where do I bunk? Upstairs? Yes, you can take the trout room. Every room is named for a different kind of fish. It's the second room on the right from the top of the stairs. Thank you. It's great of you to let me stay. Would you like some hot coffee? Fine, it's no trouble. Oh, not at all. I was going to make some for myself. I can use some, all right. No! No, wait! What? No, not that room. No. What's wrong, Mrs. Weatherby? Oh, well, I, I said I said the second door on the right. The salmon room, not the trout room. I made a mistake. Forgive me, but this is my husband's room and he's not well. I was afraid you'd wake him up. Oh, that was bad, very bad. Making a slip like that in front of Phil's detective, Rocky Rhodes. Because, of course, Mike Sheldon was Rocky Rhodes. Who else could he be? And I had to find those pills before he did and started making trouble. Before I could get back to the search, two more unexpected guests popped in at Fisherman's Net. 
A small, dapper man with a black mustache and slick black hair. But I'm Charlie Miller. I got a reservation here, and I'm staying, sister. But the manager is away. He didn't mention any reservations. Well, he must have forgot then. I made it by telephone from KC. That is, I mean, I asked a friend of mine to make it. A friend of his? Was it Phil? Was Charlie Miller Rocky Rhodes? Oh, he couldn't be a detective. He was too stupid. No, no, Mike Sheldon was Rocky Rhodes. There was a girl with Charlie Miller. I thought she was Mrs. Miller. No, I'm Susan Quinn. Mr. Miller and I met on the bus. Yeah, and we were great pals right off. I, I call her Susie Q. You get it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but the initials on your suitcase are SR, Miss Quinn. Oh, well, I borrowed my sister Sheila's suitcase. Sheila Riley. She's married. Sheila and I always borrow each other's things. Was it true? Or was her name Susan Rhodes, nicknamed Rocky Rhodes? Things are getting more complicated every minute. Two men had arrived, and Sheldon seemed the most like a detective. Oh, it was too late for me then to go on hunting for the pills. It was morning. In case questions were asked later, I had to be able to say I had done what a wife with a sick husband ought to do. I had to take Phil his breakfast on a tray. Well, Mrs. W., hey, you're an early bird. Here, let me help you. Oh, thank you, Mr. Miller. This is my husband's breakfast. If you'll open the door. Sure thing. There you are. Thank you. Phil. Phil, dear, I brought you... <gasps> Something wrong, Mrs. W? My husband. He looks... He looks... Uh, uh, anything I can do? Say. Oh. Uh, he does oh. look pretty green at that. <laughs> Mr. Weatherby. Hey, Mr. We... Oh. Oh. You... You better sit down, Mrs. Weatherby. It uh, <laughs> looks to me like your husband has passed away. Oh, no. No, no, no. Here, now. Just sit down. <laughs> All right, now, you just cry on Uncle Charlie's shoulder. It'll do you good. You're, you're very kind. Well, good morning. Oh, say, uh, Sheldon, uh, got a little trouble here. Trouble? Mrs. Weatherby? Well, her husband's passed away in his sleep, it looks like. I brought his breakfast. I thought he was asleep, and... Will you... Will somebody phone Phil's doctor? Dr. Landers in Salisbury Gap. Well, of course, but... Uh... Ex excuse me, I'm, a, I'm afraid I better go to my room. <laughs> Mrs. Weatherby. Oh, Miss Quinn. What happened? Have I been asleep? Well, when you got to your room, you fainted. I still feel rather faint. I brought you some brandy. Could you drink a little? Not now. I couldn't. Where's Mr. Miller and Mr. Sheldon? They're moving your husband's body. No, they mustn't. Well, Dr. Landers told Mike to on the phone. The rain turned to snow during the night, and he won't be able to get here because of the storm. Not until the snowplow gets through. So he thought it best we put Mr. Weatherby... Not outdoors. No. There's a hillside cellar out back. Oh, yes. What else did Dr. Landis say about Phil? He said it must have been a heart attack. Oh. And that you have nothing in the world with which to reproach yourself. He's sure you did everything you could. For suspense, Autolite is bringing you Miss Jane Wyman in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Look at that stack of valentines. Yeah, quite a pile, child. In fact, flocks will go. No, oh, they're not for me. They're valentines to Autolite resistor spark plugs. Oh. Listen to this one. You've won my heart with your kisses and your hugses and a set of Autolite resistor spark plugses. How's that, Hap? Ah, uh, the spark of love. Why, sure. Everybody loves Autolite wide gap resistor spark plugs. Replace your narrow gap plugs with these beauties to make your car idle smoother. Give better performance with leaner gas mixtures. Actually save gas dollars. Now, here's a valentine that's right in line. Oh, valentine, will you be mine, and will you make me happy? Put Autolite resistor spark plugs in my car, help make it smooth and snappy. Boy, that's hitting on all six. Well, naturally. Here's another valentine that touches this old heart of mine. Oh, Autolite resistor spark plugs. 
With me, you are a fixture. You help my car run smoother far and go on lean gas mixture. <laughs> Say, Arlo, that's the best yet. Uh, but uh, right now, here's suspense. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Miss Jane Wyman as Margot in Catch Me If You Can, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I kept up my act all that day, and I didn't overplay it. I'm not the type for floods of tears, so I adopted a wan, gentle sadness, which made the others think me very brave. But all the time, there were two things on my mind, driving me crazy. Who was Rocky Rhodes? And where had Phil hidden the pills? And I couldn't hunt for them. Somebody was always in my room fussing over me. Finally, in the late afternoon, I managed to get away. I just started to look through Phil's clothes when... Oh, here you are. I was looking for you. No snowplow will get through here today. I'll just have to put up with Charlie Miller's jokes another evening. Are his jokes that bad? Well, you heard him ragging Susan, calling her Susie Q. Oh, nicknames. Lots of people have the nickname habit. My husband had a friend named Rhodes. He nicknamed Rocky Rhodes. It's a change from Dusty Rhodes, at any rate. By the way, where are you from? Boston. Why do you ask? Oh, just idle curiosity. You know what they say about curiosity. Would you excuse me, please? I was going over my husband's things. Yeah, go right ahead. I'll just uh, keep you company. Looking for something? Uh, no. I want to pack so I can leave as soon as possible. I want to get back to New York. I don't blame you. Need any help? No, thank you. As a matter of fact, I... Would you mind? I'd rather be alone. No, no, it's not good for you to be alone. I'll just stay here and keep you company. Nosy. Did you say something? No, I... Here's a book of Oscar Wilde's. Uh, why don't I read to you while you work? Let me see. Did your husband own all these shoes? He did. Wealthy man, apparently. How nice for you. Now, how about some poetry? <sighs> let's, uh, let's try this one. The poor dead woman whom he loved and murdered in her bed. Shall I go on, Mrs. Weatherby? But I couldn't let Sheldon unnerve me. I had to keep cool. I went on packing and he went on reading on and on endlessly about blood and prisons and hangings while I tried not to miss anything of Phil's. I had to have those pills. An hour later in my room, I knew I didn't have them. But Rocky Rhodes didn't have them yet either. Otherwise, he would have said something. But the pills didn't have to be in Phil's room. Which one was Rhodes? Miller or Sheldon? I would have to find out by elimination. After dinner that night, I went into the main parlor. And Charlie Miller grabbed me and danced me over to the fire. Ah, here you are, Mrs. W. Now, you just sit right here and have a highball, see? And we'll have a nice little cozy chat with little old Charlie. Oh, you're so formal, Charlie. Call me Margo. Margo? I'll bet your mother called you Maggie. You thought up Margo to use on the stage. On the stage? How did you know I was an actress? This was the clue I've been looking for. Oh, a guy with my experience can always tell. You can? Sure. And I know how you actresses operate. You all take different monikers. I'll bet you were great, baby. Oh, I wasn't very good. There was only one way that Miller could have known about my being on the stage, from Phil. You weren't very good. <laughs> I know different, baby. So what if you only played Tank Towns? I sure wish I'd seen you. You didn't miss much, really. Tank Towns? That was Phil's story, all right. Miller was Rocky Rhodes, and he was just drunk enough to handle. Hey, look, how about you and me going up to my room where we can be alone, huh? Oh, that wouldn't look right, Charlie. <laughs> we could go out and sit in my car. It's in the garage. Got a heater? And a radio. The hotel radio's broken. We can say that's why we're going, to listen to the music. Wonderful. Hey, you're a wonderful little woman, Maggie. Full of ideas. little wagon, baby, but this front seat is so full of steering wheel. Oh, let's get in the back. Oh, it doesn't heat as well in the back. How about a drink? You first. Okay, right out of the bottle. 
Oh, boy, this is what I call living. Music, plenty of bourbon, and a beautiful blonde. Never saw such a beautiful blonde. Gonna give Charlie a kiss? Oh, wow. Sweet as molasses. It's get warm enough now, baby. Plenty warm. Could turn off that heater. I'm still a little cold, Charlie. Huh? Just stay close to me. <sighs> In a minute, we'll turn it off. <sighs> then slowly, he sagged against me, and his head fell on my shoulder, and when I pushed him away, he fell forward against the steering wheel. <gasps> Nobody heard that. Oh, oh I, I gotta get out of here before it gets me too. Oh, I kept on my feet, going around the car. I, I was dizzy, getting numb. Then a few feet from the garage door, I keeled over. For a minute or more, I could move. And then I crawled toward the door. It took forever to get there. I opened the door somehow, pushed it shut, and half fell out and lay in the snow. Breathing. Thanking my lucky stars, I've been smart enough not to drink. That's why it got Charlie sooner, because he was drunk. I looked at my watch and decided to wait 15 minutes. What a wonderful thing that carbon monoxide is. No smell, no nothing. It just creeps up on you. In 15 minutes, Charlie Miller, alias Rocky Rhodes, would be good and dead. <laughs> He was dead, all right. When they found us, they carried me into the house and gave me a drink and put me to bed. I went right to sleep knowing Rocky Rhodes was dead. When I woke up, I remembered the car key. I had said Charlie started the car, but somebody might think to check the key for fingerprints and find mine. Oh, I put on a fur coat over my nightgown and ran all the way to the garage. I got in the car, reached for the keys, and they weren't there. Why? Why would anybody take my keys? And who would take them? Rocky Rhodes? No, he was dead. But was he? Had I killed the wrong man? I don't know how I ever got through breakfast. That's too bad about Charlie, Margot. Stop worrying about it, it wasn't your fault. You look tired, you want to take a walk? Get some fresh air? I, I don't feel up to it. I was planning to go up to that lookout cabin on the peak. No, no, no. I'm too lazy for that. I mean a short walk. Is it a long climb, Mrs. Weatherby? Long and steep, believe me. I only made it up there once. But my husband used to go there often. I guess a good climb will do me good. I think I'll try it alone. Bye. I'll be back before dark. Bye. Be careful, Susan. I didn't even hear her leave. I was thinking about Phil's walk to the lookout cabin. There was where he'd hidden the pills. I knew it. I knew it in my bones. Why hadn't I thought of it before? Oh, I'd have to hurry. I couldn't let anyone find those pills except me. I managed to get away from the men and slipped out by the back door without being seen. A ladder goes up from the trail to the lookout door. The door of the cabin stood open. I climbed the ladder quietly and stepped in and saw Susan on the other side of the room near the door to the balcony. She was holding an envelope attached to a card, and she was reading the card. And suddenly, definitely, I knew. Miss Rocky Rhodes, I presume. Oh, oh, you scared me, Mrs. Weatherby. I see you found what you're looking for. The pills my husband hid. You want to know if they're really poisonous? Oh, I, I read this card. Is it some kind of a joke? Oh, no, it's no joke. One of them would kill a man. But that's not what killed Phil. I smothered him with a pillow. You didn't know that, did you? Oh, you shouldn't be telling me this. Phil told me you were coming, but I was expecting a man. I never dreamed Rocky Rhodes was a woman. Oh, you've mistaken me for someone else, really. Oh, come off it. You're already responsible for Charlie Miller's death, coming here under an assumed name. 
I killed him because I thought he was Rocky Rhodes. You killed him? Oh, no, you didn't. Oh, you're ill, Mrs. Weatherby. You're imagining... Stay where you are! You think you'll get out of here alive? I wouldn't go out that door if I were you. You'd step right off into blank space. But you can't do these things. They'll catch you. Who? How? Those pills are the only evidence against me, and I'll destroy them as soon as you're gone. Will you? Stop! Stay where you are! You fool! What good does that do you, throwing them out? Watch where they fall. There, right on the path. They'll stay there until I go down. But you've played your last card. I'm not going to waste any more time. Let go, Mrs. Weatherby! Let go! You're going over the edge, Susie! No. You're going to be another tragic accident! No. Let go of that table, you fool! remember falling, falling, then, then a sharp pain. Then I don't remember anymore until I woke up here in the snow and found you bending over me. Who are you? Where did you come from? I just came up from the village, Mrs. Weatherby. We know the whole story. The whole story? Now just take it easy, Mrs. Weatherby. Oh, I, I know. You must be a doctor. But doctor... They'll never hang me. No, Mrs. Weatherby. They'll never hang you. You're dying now. No. No, I, I can't die. After all I've had to do to, to live. Where did Mike go? I'm right here, Mrs. Weatherby. Like a vulture waiting for me to die. You're Rocky Rhodes, aren't you, Mike? No, Mrs. Weatherby. You're lying. It has to be you. I killed Charlie, and he wasn't Rocky Rhodes. And Susan wasn't. You have to be. I, I have to know. I have to kill Rocky, or I've done it all for nothing. Rocky Rhodes mustn't find those poison pills. Your husband didn't die from poison, Mrs. Weatherby. So you would have been safe even if the pills were found. But, but, Ro Rocky Rhodes... None of those people was Rocky Rhodes. Your own guilt made you suspicious of everything they did. But there must be a Rocky Rhodes. Phil said there was. There has to be a rookie. Oh. Is she dead, Doctor? I'm afraid she is. And there I was being sorry for her, her husband being dead. Just think, she killed her husband and one of us, and none of us would ever have known it if she hadn't told Susan all about it in the cabin. It was good of you to get here so fast, Doctor. Well, I'd have gotten here sooner if it hadn't been for the blizzard. and Maybe none of this would have happened. By the way, I'm not a doctor, Mr. Sheldon. My name is Rhodes. Rocky Rhodes. Thank you, Jane Wyman, for a splendid performance. Miss Wyman, would you do me a favor? I'd be glad to, Mr. Wilcox. Would you autograph my script? <laughs> why, certainly. What shall I write? Well, why not just write to A-L-R-S-P Wilcox from Jane Wyman. A-L-R-S-P? What does that stand for? Autolite resistor spark plugs. Oh, of course. I should have known. <laughs> a plug for plugs. Why, sure. <laughs> well, A-L-R-S-P it is. There. How's that? Thank you. And did you know, Miss Wyman, that besides Autolite resistor spark plugs, Autolite makes over 400 other products for cars, trucks, airplanes, and boats in 28 Autolite plants from coast to coast. Autolite makes complete electrical systems for many makes of America's finest cars, batteries, generators, starting motors, coils, distributors, all ignition engineered to meet the highest standards of leading automotive engineers. So, folks, tomorrow, treat your car to an expert motor tune-up. 
Visit your local Autolite service station listed in your classified telephone directory or the dealer who sells your make of car. And be sure to specify original factory parts. You're right with Autolite. And now, in introducing again our star, Miss Jane Wyman, I wish also to extend to her, on behalf of our sponsor and all of us here on Suspense, our sincere congratulations on her nomination for the Academy Award for her splendid performance in the current Warner Brothers picture, Johnny Belinda, and to wish her the best of luck in balloting. Thank you very much. And may I congratulate Suspense for being one of the top radio programs on the air. Truly radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Thank you, Miss Wyman. And I'll be listening next week when James Mason and his lovely wife, Pamela Kalino appear in the Agatha Christie story, Where There's a Will, another gripping study in... Suspense! Tonight's suspense play was adapted by Sylvia Richards from the current best-selling mystery by Pat McGear. Music was composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Bluskin. The entire production was under the direction of Anton M. Leder. Autolite resistor spark plugs have been adopted as original factory equipment by six leading makes of cars and trucks. So switch to Autolite. Good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. A minor case of murder, another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice, danger is my stock and trade. If you're on a spot nailed there tight, you need my kind of help, George Valentine. Write full details. Dear Mr. Valentine, Esquire... One of the members of our Bearcat Social Club suddenly finds himself in a very embarrassing predicament. With more exactitude, he is in the can for murder. Now, knowing this fellow Bearcat as we do, we are convinced that he is innocent. Therefore, we are hiring you to prove same. As a starter, there is a hundred bucks in it for you. If that isn't enough, there's more where that came from. The address of our headquarters, of our headquarters is 19 and a half Duane Street. And it's signed Chuck Wilson, acting captain. Well, George, this sounds like a letter a kid wrote. But to quote from this provocative communique, a fellow bear cat is in the can for murder. That's not kid stuff, Brooksy. That depends on just how old this fellow bear cat is. Oh, uh, they get old early down there around Duane Street. Well, we haven't had a social evening in a long time, darling. Would you suggest we drop in at the club? Uh, with great exactitude, I answer. Yes. <laughs> Golly, I hate to think where they dug up that money for your fee. Oh, stop sounding like a policewoman, Angel. All the bear cats just got together and raided their piggy banks. Nice place you got around here, Chuck. Uh, it's just an empty store we fixed up. Yeah, but look at that furniture we got. See that red plush chair? Right out of the lobby of the Piccadilly apartment. Oh, shut up, Bonnie, will you? Valentine, I believe in getting right to the point. And that's the way I like to do business, too, Chuck. What's on your mind? Now, look, Dan Corey is the real captain of the Bearcats. Uh -huh. The cops got him jugged for shiving his stepfather. For what? Uh, shiving him, lady. You know, pushing a knife in him. Oh. Yeah, but he didn't do it, Valentine, even if he said he did. Oh, he admits he did, huh? And just what kind of a miracle do you expect from me, fellas? Uh, just to believe what I'm saying and find out what really happened. Well, I'm here to listen. Well, the Bearcats have our own special rules, see? And we don't go back on them. Yeah, that's right. L let me read them to you, Valentine. Uh, yeah, okay, Barney. <clears throat> uh, the guy that goes looking for trouble, unless it comes your way, is going to get their tails kicked in. Well, there's nothing wrong with that rule. Uh, try never to cop anything unless it's from an enemy gang. The fine for violating this rule is one buck. Now, there might be some question about that rate. Well, get to the one we're talking about, will you, Barney? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, lead pipe, baseball bats, and other harmless things is okay. 
But don't carry dangerous weapons. You might be tempted to use them and give the club a bad name. Oh, yeah. Nothing like trying to stay out of trouble. Uh, violate this rule and you get thrown right out. Yeah, now, Danny made that up himself, see? And he'd rather let you break his arm than break one of his own rules. Okay, Chuck, let's say I believe you. And Danny confessed to the police for reasons of his own. Yeah, that's right. Now, can you think of anyone in the neighborhood who'd want to kill Danny's stepfather? <laughs> Just about everybody. His stepfather was nothing but a phony. Always pushing people around, even Danny's mother. Yeah, but who oh, did the babes go for him? Look, why don't you drop dead? Don't you see we got a lady present? Huh? Oh, don't let me cramp your style. What else about Corey? Well, he was in some kind of a racket with Leo Sudan, see? They worked out of the Swedes' pool room on uh, Malone Street. Uh-huh. Well, well you going to take it on, Valentin? Um, what would you say, Brooksy? Well, George, I'd say if so many of the other guys are so sure about Danny being innocent, they may have something there. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking something like that myself. Brooksy? Yeah? You drop in and see Danny's mother. Uh, she lives just down the block, number 33. And while you do that, Angel, I'll get out of the jail and have a talk with Danny. Just what did happen that night, Danny? The story's the same every time they make me tell it. Uh, I came home that night from the club. The key was in the door, so I just walked in. Yeah? Well, my... I mean, the man who married my mother was leaving. He had his bags all packed. I knew right then he was throwing her over. So yeah, I... I know. But how is it the police didn't find the knife? Well, I threw it in the river. Yeah? Why'd you go to all that trouble, Danny? And then walk up to the cop on the beat and confess? I don't know. I... Guess I was just half crazier. Oh, I see. So now you know. I don't think I know anything about you yet, Danny. I think you're holding out on me. All right, never mind about me. But do you think you're playing fair with Chuck, Barney, and the others? <laughs> think of those guys. Getting up all that dough and then hiring you. Well? Oh, they're nuts, all of them. And don't think I'm sorry for what I did. Corey had it coming to him. You don't treat any woman the way he treated my mother. I ought to know. After the swell way my real father always acted, before he... All right, Danny, all right, take it easy. You're just wasting your time, Mr. Valentine. Forget it. Uh-uh, Danny. I can be just as tough as you. I'll be seeing you, kid. I know Danny admitted he killed Phil. But if anybody's to blame, it's me. Oh, mothers have a habit of blaming themselves, Mrs. Corey. Yeah, but I knew how he worshipped his own father. And yet I married a man like Phil. A man who lived his days in a pool parlor. He wasn't the father I should have picked for my boy. But you had the right to make your own choice. Oh, Danny and his stepfather fought right from the beginning. There was no peace in the house. That's when Danny became an altogether different boy. Started that gang of his. Oh, I suppose I should have known something like this was going to happen. Why do you say that, Mrs. Corey? A few weeks after we were married, Phil was coming upstairs from that pool parlor. Danny was waiting for him. He pushed Phil down the stairs. I opened the door just in time to see him. All Danny did was look at me and walk out. Well, that's just going to make it look all the worse for Danny when he comes up for trial. Oh, I know. I know. Everybody thinks he did it, but I can't believe it. Oh, oh I didn't know you had company, Mrs. Corey. Sorry. Oh, well, that's all right, Mrs. Ravel. Come in. Uh, this is Miss Brooks, a good friend. <laughs> How do you do? Hello. Oh, I do hope you've been able to talk some sense into Mrs. Corey. She can't just sit around moping all day. Well, you've been very kind. Kind, my foot. I know what it means to feel you're all alone in the world. You forget I spent half my life in hall rooms in the strange towns when I was in the chorus line. I, uh, I think I'd better be running along. And you don't have to worry about Mrs. Corey, not a bit, dearie. Uh, like I told her, as long as I own this rooming house, there'll always be a place for her here. And I, I own it outright. Best kind of security for someone in show business. 
Like my late well, husband used to say. Everybody tries to be so kind. Oh, now, now. All you need is a good sleep, and I'm going to see that you get it. That's good advice, Mrs. Corey. You want to look your best when you see your son. See him? Well, Dan won't talk to me. He won't let me visit him in jail. Well, sometimes things change awfully fast, Mrs. Corey. So suppose we just wait and see. Sudan? Yeah. Who are you? Let's go somewhere and talk. Don't you see I'm in the middle of a fool game? What you trying to do, jinx me? Hey, wait a minute. How'd you know my name? I've never seen you before. Yeah, 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 I'll be right with you. I asked you a question, friend. And what gives? I thought we might have a little talk about what happened to Phil. You know, your business partner. You a dick? No. But I'm not just the inquiring reporter, either. Okay, whoever you are, scram. I got five bucks on this game. What was the deal between you and Corey? The numbers, rackets, slot machines? What was it? I said beat it. Wouldn't you be at all curious if I told you maybe it wasn't Corey's kid who knifed him? Me? <laughs> I ain't got a curious bone in my body. Okay. Have it your way, Sudan. But I think you can tell me a lot outside. I got one thing to tell you. This looks like the only way. Wait, hold it. Get the pool cue down, Leo. <laughs> now tell me what to do, sweetheart. Give please. me that cue. That's better. <laughs> I try to run a respectable place. Yeah, talking about that, you better put the pool ball back on the table, too, Mac. Mm. Oh, this. Yeah. I'm glad you reminded me. Leo almost got it between his teeth. Swede, this guy's been asking me about Phil Corey. You don't say. Hey, look, be a nice fellow, Mr. Run Along. Leo wants to finish his game. You and him got a beef, see him later. Somewhere else. Okay, you win. I know when I'm not wanted. Don't get me wrong, pal. Nothing against you personal. Just that I pride myself on running a nice, peaceable recreation parlor. You know, Swede, you're a man with ideals. I like that. But I got a few broken down ideals, too. What's that supposed to mean? I never get kicked out of the same place twice. I mean, and still leave it nice and peaceable. <laughs> Hi, Valentine. Huh? Oh, Barney. Hey. Where'd you come from? Oh, I was in that alley there all the time. Oh? Yeah, I was waiting for you to come out of the Swedes' place. Now, what do you call this? Bear cat protection? Oh, no, no, no. I just thought you liked some company, that's all. <laughs> hey, what are you carrying there, anyway? It's, it's a camera. Yeah, you ought to see some of the pictures I took with it. Hey, that's a pretty expensive deal. Where'd you get it? Oh, don't worry, Valentine. It's mine, all right. Yeah, I can imagine now, what's the real gag, Barney? Huh? One of your club members going to be on my tail all the time? Oh, no, nothing like that. We, we know you can take care of yourself. I just happen to uh, be loitering in the alley, that's so. all. Uh, be quick, Valentine. Huh? Get this doorway. Hey, Barney, what is it? Don't ask me no questions. Come on. Hey, what the devil is this, Barney? Oh, you mean all that noise? Yeah. You're dragging me in this doorway. Boy, look at that car turn around. It's getting the works. I wish I could take a picture of it. Hey, what works, Barney? What's going on, Gib? Well, 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 Chuck figured you might be followed when you left the Swedes, see? So the bear cats were ready on the roofs up and down the street. They must have seen that car was trailing you. How do you like that? But all that stuff out there on the street. Oh, the street cleaning department will clean that all up in the morning. Nothing but ash cans, bricks, cans of garbage, things like that. <laughs> I suppose I should say thanks. <laughs> we wasn't going to let anybody wake you over. And you notice we didn't use no guns or knives. Oh, yeah. Perfect little gentleman. Yeah, that's right. But what did you find out about Danny, huh? Nothing much, kid. Except now there are at least two characters who do anything to keep me from finding out what really happened to Phil Corey. We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. But first, a word to the wise motorist. If you have an oil filter on your car, remember it needs a little attention now and then. In fact, the filter element should be replaced every 6,000 miles. 
For after you've had that much service from your oil filter, you'll find the element is bulging with two or three pounds of dirt, most of it carbon and metal particles. And then it can no longer clean the engine oil. So to keep the engine oil in your car cleaner for longer periods, just make sure the oil filter element is replaced every 6,000 miles. It's another speedy service they're glad to do for you at standard stations and independent Chevron gas stations where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. And now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. Well, you find yourself working with a gang of rough kids called the Bearcats, just about as tough as they come. They won't believe that one of their members, Dan Corey, is guilty of murdering his stepfather. You play along because you don't believe young Danny did it either. And that's why, like George Valentine, you find yourself with Brooksy in the one-room headquarters of the Bearcats right now, addressing the membership. All right, all right now, all you guys, clam up. Come on, stop yapping, will you? I mean, the meeting will come to order. Well, we got some official business to discuss. Okay, Mr. Valentine, the floor is yours. Oh, yeah, thanks a lot, Chuck. Well, fellas, before I get started, uh, what do you say about unloading some of those uh, harmless weapons your Constitution allows you to carry? Okay, I'm waiting, fellas. Come on now, put them on the table. Well, come on, fellas. You're not afraid to walk down the streets like everybody else without all that stuff. Or are you? Well, okay, okay, you heard what the lady said. Come on, get clean, will you? That's good. Thank you, Angel. Hey, did you hear that? He called her Angel. <laughs> all right, all right, forget it. <laughs> all right, Valentine, what about Danny? I'm coming to that right now. I don't have anything like real proof to clear him. Huh? What? Hey, look, look, we're paying you a hundred bucks. You're supposed to have all the answers. Yeah, that's right, like you said in that ad you had in the paper. Please, boys, let Mr. Valentine finish. You see, fellas, it isn't as easy as you think. Before I can help Danny, you've got to have absolute proof of his innocence. Well, after you left the Swedes and talked to Sudan, somebody tried to get you. That ought to be enough for you to work on. It'd be a lot easier if I were sure we were telling each other all we know about this thing. The truth is, unless I'm sure of that, I'm pretty much of a blind alley. Now, somebody here knows what I mean. Uh, you win, Valentine. Here. No, no, no. no. Got the shit. Mm, that's an ugly-looking knife. Uh, you see, Danny's old man brought it back with him when he came home to the Pacific. He got it off a Jap. Now, where did you get it, Chuck? Well, uh, I may as well tell you the whole thing. See, I was standing on a corner that night right next to the candy store, and Danny went upstairs for something, and the next thing I know, he was giving this to me. He said, to. Uh, Make sure you ditch it, Chuck. Then he goes right over and gives himself up to a cop. Well, weren't you afraid that if this knife were found with Danny's fingerprints on it, it'd make the case really open and shut? Yeah, yeah, I thought of that, Angel. I, I mean, Miss Brooks. Then why were you so careful to preserve the fingerprints, Chuck? I see you got it all wrapped up in a handkerchief. Look, I got more than half a brain, Valentine. If they convicted Danny and he didn't have a chance, I was going to come up with this. Maybe there'd be some other fingerprints on it besides his. Uh-huh. Smart thinking, Chuck. Hey, uh, Brooksy, take this knife down to Lieutenant Riley and ask him to check the prints. Oh, George, you know he's bound to ask questions. Tell him I'll talk to him later. Right now, I gotta get to work. But first, Barney. Yeah? All these harmless weapons. Get rid of them, will you? Throw them in the river. Throw them in the river? What's, what's the idea? Now, look, it's up to you guys. Either get rid of this stuff or I forget I ever heard of Danny. Uh, wait a minute. He's right. Come on, he's right. Good, that's the idea. Now, with what you told me about the knife, Chuck... Maybe I can really start getting places. I told Chuck to get rid of that knife. What's he trying to do to me? Danny, wasn't that the knife your father brought back from the Pacific just for you? Oh, he brought back all kinds of other souvenirs, too. It was hanging over the mantelpiece in the front room. You were very proud of it, weren't you? I saw it hanging there, so when I got mad at my... I mean, at him, I... I grabbed it, and I let him have it. You're lying through your teeth, Danny. The police believe You're me. trying to protect somebody. You went right out and gave yourself up. But first, you made very sure you got rid of the knife. Now, why? You asked me that before. Yeah, but this time, I don't need the answer. So long, Danny. I'll still be seeing you. <laughs> Sit 
Swede. You and Sudan had me followed last night because you were afraid I might find out you were making book on the races in back of this joint. What are you talking about? I told you, Valentine, I run a peaceable pool party. Or on the other hand, I don't think you would have gone to all that trouble just for that. Maybe it was because the police didn't find just a railroad ticket, the key to his place, and things like that on Corey. They also found quite a wad of tow. The police never overlook anything, do they? Was he trying to get out of town with your cash, boys? Listen, Valentine, I never like to oh, get one more tough, thing. but... Now stop shoving me with that oversized bay window of yours. Speak your piece and get out. Okay. I found a murder weapon, the knife. Now, that ought to tell us who the murderer is. You don't say. Ah, excuse me. I got to get back to my pool game. You, my friend, you're getting out of here. Go on, you heard me? Go on out. Not before I give way to an impulse I've had since I first saw that big beer belly of yours. <laughs> Well, Brooksy, there's nothing we can do but wait here in the hall till Danny's mother gets back. Uh, may as well sit here on the stairs and make ourselves comfortable. Uh-huh. You don't know the job I had persuading Lieutenant Riley to let me bring this knife back with me. Why'd you want it anyway, George? Oh, just a hunch, Angel. May come in handy. Mm. About Danny. When they arrested him, all they found was a key to the door and a couple of dollars in change. But those fingerprints, I don't wait see a how... Hold they... it, Angel. Oh, hello, Mrs. Corey. Oh, Miss Brooks. This is Mr. Valentine. Remember, I was telling you about him. Oh, how do you do, how do, you do? Mr. Valentine? Now, look, Mrs. Corey, there's no time to waste. Dan's trial begins tomorrow. Oh, I know. I know that's why I've been out walking and walking, trying to think what to do next. Mrs. Corey, your son thinks you killed your husband. Are you sure, George? What are you saying, Mr. Valentine? When he came in that night, your husband was already dead on the floor. Dan saw the knife. He was sure you did it. Oh, no. He knew the police had reasoned that only two people could be inside here along with Corey, you and he. So he took the blame. That's why it was so important to Dan to get rid of the knife. He didn't want any suspicion to point to his mother. Oh, but what am I going to do? I didn't kill Phil, and neither did Danny. Where were you that night, Mrs. Corey? A good, tight alibi had helped. Oh, I don't know where I was. Just like today, I left the house and started walking. Didn't matter where. Phil told me he was going to leave me. I'd lost my son and my husband. I'll get it. Oh, oh, sorry, Miss Corey. Seems I keep walking in when you have company. Oh, hello, Mrs. Ravel. Hello. Uh, George, this is Mrs. Corey's landlady. Oh, well, I'm glad somebody's with you. I wanted you to have this nice hot soup. Oh, thank you. I didn't want to knock on the door and disturb you, but I didn't have my key. Now, just sit down and have some of this. Oh, uh, Mrs. Ravel. Yes? I'd like to talk to you a minute. Could we go in the other room? Oh, I'll take that tray for Mrs. Corey. Uh, talk to me about what, Mr. Valentine? Just a minute. Yes? Mrs. Ravel, I'm doing all I can to help Mrs. Corey and Danny. And I know you are, too. Well, I've done my best. Well, maybe you can do me a favor. You know we found the murder weapon. Oh, you did? Well, I hope it means something. Something good. Yeah, I hope so, too. Now, here's what I'd like you to do. The knife is wrapped in a handkerchief. You'll find it in the desk of the store at 19 and a half Dwayne Street, the Bearcat Social Club. What? I want you to go over there and get it and bring it back here. But why me, Mr. Valentine? Well, because I can't leave here and neither can Miss Brooks. You see, we're expecting Lieutenant Riley of the police and a couple of other people. Now, if you'll do this little thing for me, you'll be saving me an awful lot of trouble. Oh, sure. But it'll take me a few minutes to make myself presentable. Well, take your time, Mrs. Ravel. The important thing is, what happens after you come back with that knife? Brooksy, you know what to do. Now get on it. i got to use that hall phone here. I suppose it would be impolite if I asked what was going on. No time, Angel. I have to call Lieutenant Riley, ask him to have a squad car, pick up Sudan and the Swede, and bring him over here. Oh, that's all very enlightening. Now get going. Mrs. Ravel is not going to take forever to make herself presentable. Now, if I can only get Barney on the phone. So be sure you got it straight, Barney. Remember, I'm depending on you. You're the only one who can do this thing for me. And get over here as soon as you can. So long. All right. 
right, Swede, Sudan, you may as well sit down. Yeah. Why'd the cops pick us up and bring us here? Oh, we'll get to that. Oh, Mrs. Corey, you didn't have any of that soup. She'll have it some other time, Mrs. Ravel. Valentine, nobody's got anything against us. You can't hold us here. Uh-huh. Gentlemen, I told you about the murder weapon. Well, here it is. What are we supposed to do? Faint? Oh, Mr. Valentine, what is it? I can't stand it much longer. I hope you won't have to, Mrs. Corey, and I... Oh, there you are, Mr. Valentine. Took me a little time to get that picture developed. Hey, what picture, George? Hey, let me see that, Bonnie. Here you are. Huh? Hey, it's your first time I took a picture from inside a closet. <laughs> Turned out good, huh? Yeah, very good, very good. Picture of you, Mrs. Ravel, taking the knife out of the desk. What? Well, you told me to do that. You sent me there. I didn't tell you to wipe off the fingerprints as you're doing here in this picture. And that's what she is doing, George. You were afraid your fingerprints would be found on the knife, weren't you, Mrs. Ravel? I never saw that knife before. Sorry, but that won't explain away what you were doing in this picture. Besides, the fingerprints were already taken off the handle down at headquarters. Mrs. Ravel, I can't believe that you'd... Don't be a fool. (laughs) Imagine me calling you a fool. There wasn't a good-looking woman in the whole neighborhood Phil didn't try to make time with. I thought he was going to leave you for me. Then when he told me he was going away, alone, I killed him. And if you didn't, sister, we might have. Corey was taking it on the land with our dough. But, George, Lieutenant Roddy found only one set of fingerprints. Just Danny's, I know, yeah. He wiped off what he thought were his mother's fingerprints. Then my fingerprints weren't... No, no. You were quite safe, Mrs. Ravel. Although I suspected you, I had to have proof. And you supplied it. All right, all right now, all you mugs. Clam up, will you? Hey, stop yapping. I, I mean, the banquet will now come to order. <laughs> hey, listen, before we get started, Chuck, I got something to say to Mr. Valentine, and I want the rest of you guys to listen, too, will you? Okay, okay, okay. Uh, I already told you, Mr. Valentine, how I feel after what you did for me, but there's something else. Nobody but you would have gone along with a gang like us. You, you believed everything Chuck told you. You trusted Barney and all of us. You stuck by us. I guess the Bearcats have been a little off the beam. But you can take my word for it. After this, we're going to straighten up and fly ride. We're going to start a baseball team and use those bats the way they were meant to be used. <laughs> well, I, uh... Well, fellas, after that, I I don't think there's anything to add. Except, uh... Well, let's see. Sure. And don't worry about the food, Mr. Valentine. We paid for it with our own money. <laughs> sure. Oh, yeah, uh, Mr. Valentine... How did you suspect that Mrs. Ravel, anyway? Well, it was all a matter of keys, Barney. Whoever killed Corey had to be inside the apartment. Yeah? When Danny came upstairs that night, he found a key in the door. The police took it as evidence. Mrs. Corey had her key. Phil Corey's key was found on him. And you, Danny, they found your key on you and you were arrested. Now, the only person who didn't have a key, had to knock to get in, was, of all people, the landlady. The landlady? How do you like it? Order, order. Come on, everybody. Wait a minute. I I got a motion, hey. What this club needs is an honorary captain. We already decided who it's going to be, huh, fellas? Oh, no. Now, wait a minute, fellas. Wait a minute, fellas. You don't... You don't have to do that after all. Uh, Sorry, Mr. Valentine. We was really thinking about Angel. I I mean, Miss Brooks. What really makes your car go? The big three factors, of course, are ignition, air, and fuel. And that last one, fuel, is mighty important. Most any gasoline mixed with air and then ignited will furnish enough power to make your car go. But to get the most out of your car, try Chevron Supreme gasoline, the premium fuel that's tailored to each different climate and altitude zone. Chevron Supreme has special blending agents that make your car start with a snap. These blending agents also give your car speedy pickup in stop-and-go traffic and smooth, steady power on the open highway. Next time you start out, get peak performance from your car by using Chevron Supreme gasoline. It's available at every standard station and independent Chevron gas station where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. (laughs) 
Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll hear... George, the woman's asleep. Maybe it'd be better if we came back in the morning. Look, see, even when people sleep, they manage to breathe. Huh? Oh. Oh. Look, George, maybe this empty bottle on the bed table means something. I don't know, but this note does. When you will find me, I am dead. I could not tell you the secret of the Montoyas and go on living in peace and honor. Forgive me, Maria. Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Irene Tedrow as Mrs. Corey, Gloria Blondell as Mrs. Ravel, Tommy Cook as Danny, Tony Barrett as Chuck, Sidney Miller as Barney, Herb Litton as Sudan, and Jack Crucian as Swede. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter, your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Hastings Manufacturing Company and the Kayside Corporation present Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. If you were to ask Michael Shane, he'd tell you that Phyllis Knight is the perfect secretary. First of all, she's very attractive. That's definitely first of all with Shane. She's intelligent, conscientious, an excellent typist, and good at dictation. There's only one catch. She's just as likely to give dictation as to take it. For instance, Shane is at his desk, feet upon it, and Phyllis is saying... Now, Michael, remember you're the guest of honor tonight, so please try to act like a gentleman. Oh, don't worry, sweetheart. I'll be on my best behavior. That's what I'm afraid of. Huh? What do you mean? I've seen your best. <laughs> oh, baby, you wrong me. I'm a perfect gentleman. <laughs> Why, I never struck a dame in my life. Unless she asked for it. And I always tip my hat. You might try taking it off sometime, especially indoors. Oh, I do, I do. You do? Mm, always. Mm -hmm. How about now? Huh? Oh. <laughs> <coughs> well, honey, this is the office. It makes me look more businesslike. The executive touch. Okay, J.P. Now, don't worry, Phil. You'll be proud of me. I swear it on a stack of Emily Post. I hope so, Michael, because I understand the professor and his wife are very, very proper. And Amy does so want to impress them. Well, I still don't see why she picked me, honey. I'm just an ordinary dick. Well, you've built up a reputation, Mr. Shane. And Amy's been thrilled to death ever since she met you. Wants to show you off to all her friends. She thinks you're glamorous. Ah, if I could play the piano or do card tricks She'll or... be satisfied if you just tell them how you outwit desperate criminals. Outwit them? All I do is hang around until they pull a boner and then I pull a gun. Oh, well, you can make it sound glamorous for Amy's sake. Okay. Okay, shall I recount in some detail how I deduced that a man was six feet tall, blonde, and blue-eyed simply by looking at his footprints? Oh, now, you don't have to overdo it, Mr. Mastermind. Well, that's a fact. You mean you could tell all that just by looking at his footprints? Mm-hmm. He was standing in them. <gasps> Marvelous. <laughs> Here we are. Ring the bell, George. Okay. Oh, Mr. Shane, it's so wonderful that you could come with us tonight. Positively a feather in my cap, believe me. Yes, yeah, Shane. Amy couldn't be more impressed with you if you had two heads. <laughs> Everywhere we go, it's my dear. Who do you think I met the other night? Michael Shane. There, you see, Michael, you're a celebrity. Yeah. First thing you know, Phil, people are going to be wanting my autograph. Mm -hmm. You better learn to write. Hello. Oh, oh, how do you do, young man? Professor and Mrs. Watkins are expecting me. Oh, you must be... I'm Amy Vickers, and this is my husband, George. And these are our friends, Miss Knight and Mr. Shane. How do you do? Michael Shane, the detective. Oh, yes. Mr. I... Shane is the man who single-handedly captured the six murderous Holloway killers. Is that a fact? Yeah. 
I surrounded them. Michael. And then there was the time... Jamie he... Pitt, this young man is trying to tell us something. Oh. Thank you, sir. Yeah. I uh, just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Herschel Tolliver, a friend of the professor. Herschel Tolliver? Well, of course. I've heard oodles about you, but oodles, just believe me. The professor tells me you're, um, you're practically a, 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 a protege or something. Uh, yes. Now, won't you come in and I'll tell Mrs. Watkins you're here. Oh, yes, yes, thank you. Go on in the living room. I'll be right back. Oh, okay. isn't he a nice boy? The professor says he's here most of the time. Practically lives here. They're that fond of him. One of the professor's uh, students, I think. Well, what does this professor teach, anyway? Oh, didn't I tell you? Mm -mm. Oh, criminology. That's why I especially wanted you to meet him. You'll have so much in common. And besides, you... <gasps> oh. oh, good heavens. Michael... That was a shot. Yeah, stay here. I'll go see. Him. Michael, I want to Stay come. here, all of you. I'll go see what's wrong. Well, it's okay by me when people are playing with fire. What's going on in there? Oh, Mr. Shane, just a minute. I'm sorry. When I hear a gun, I don't wait. Now, what's going on here? I tell you, I'll kill her. I'll kill her, the little busybody. Stop it, for heaven's sake. What's she talking about? Who will she kill? Nobody. She... It's nothing. Get out of here, you detective. I won't have you spying on me. I'm not spying on anybody. I, uh, I don't like gunplay anyway, that's all. Say, you better put that revolver away, Mr. Tolliver. Yeah, sure. It, it went off by accident. No harm done. The bullet just went in the floor. See? Yeah, I see. Oh, you see, do you? He was trying to get the gun away from me because I was going to kill that little busybody. Helen, please. What little busybody? No, really, Mr. Shane, don't play innocent. Huh? I know why you're here. I know why she had you come... She wants you to spy on me and Herschel. Helen. Well, it's none of her business what I do. And it's none of yours. So if you... Shut up. What? I said shut up. You're right. It's none of my business what you do. But the way you're yapping, you're making it everybody's business. If you have any sense, you'll keep your mouth shut. Why, well, you can't... I came here as a guest. I'm not spying on anybody. I'm not interested in your private affairs, and I don't want to know anything about them. They don't sound appetizing. Then you didn't come here to... No, I didn't. Now, come on. Let's go in with the others. We'll tell them there was just a little accident. And if you're smart, you'll play the perfect hostess you're supposed to be. Yes, I... I guess you're right. I'm sorry, Mr. Shane. Forget it. And I mean forget it. If I was rude, I apologize. But you were getting ready to do and say things you'd be sorry for later. Now, come on. Let's go. <laughs> I ate too much. Oh, good dinner. <laughs> that was a delicious dinner, Mrs. Watkins. Thank you, Miss Knight. Now, if you'll all just go in the living room, I'll serve coffee in there. Oh, fine, certainly. Just Tell make Michael. yourselves comfortable. I'll be right here. Oh, Mr. Shane, tell the professor how you broke up the Stilson gang. <laughs> well, I didn't do it alone, Amy. Oh, practically alone. Except for a little help from that. Uh, uh, who was it? Uh, the San Francisco Police Department. <laughs> <laughs> sit down, sit down. Uh, now, Mr. Shane, uh, you've had some very interesting exploits in tracking down criminals, but uh, did you ever consider the reverse problem? What do you mean, Professor? Uh, the aspect of crime I find most fascinating is the problem confronting the would-be criminal. Oh, the perfect crime, huh? <laughs> Precisely. Well, there's no such thing. There's always some little slip, you know. Uh, I wonder... If someone with your or my knowledge and experience for the subject were to apply himself... No, he'd uh, trip up somewhere, Professor. Oh, good. Here comes Helen with the most tempting-smelling coffee. Would you care for some coffee, Miss Knight? Oh, yes, thank you. No sugar or cream, thank you. I always take it black. Here you are, Thanks. Miss Knight. Well, Mr. Shane, uh, let's see. Now, uh, just for the sake of argument, uh, let's concoct a perfect crime. You and I. And I, Professor. All right, Herschel. Uh, now, uh, first of all, we ought to consider the choice of weapon. Well, I disagree, Professor. I should think the first consideration should be uh, choice of victim. <laughs> Quite right, Mr. Shane. I accept the correction. Victim? Well, how about me? I think that would be jolly. <laughs> Coffee, Amy? <laughs> oh, thank you, Helen. I'll take three lumps, thank you. Well, Mr. Shane, how about it? How would you go about killing me? <laughs> oh, must I? I'm rather fond of you, Amy. Oh, you're a dear. But really, how would you? Well, uh, cyanide in your coffee would do the trick. But how would you get it in the coffee without anyone knowing? Well, that, of course, would be the problem. An insurmountable one, I hope. 
Because I simply adore a good cup of coffee, believe me. And so saying, she downs her cup of him now. <laughs> oh. oh! Amy, what is it? Oh. She's just acting the part. She doesn't look like she's acting. <laughs> she fell on the floor. Amy, <laughs> what is it, Jane? What's the matter with her? Just a second. Well, the matter with her is she's dead. <laughs> And now, for a moment, let's not worry about our detective friend. After all, there are too many worried people these days, anxious about their automobiles. New cars are still hard to get, and some of the old ones are in a sorry state. Many, for example, burn up oil almost as fast as it's poured in the crankcase. Now, you've seen them going down the street, laying a smoke screen from curb to curb. Well, this oil pumping usually means worn-out piston rings. And your serviceman, your motor specialist, has the remedy for that. In just a short time, and at a nominal cost, he can install a set of Hastings piston rings that will stop oil pumping, check cylinder wear, and restore your engine's pep and power. When you need new rings, it will pay you to get Hastings piston rings. They're tough, but oh so gentle. Tough on oil pumping, gentle on cylinder walls. Now remember that name, Hastings piston rings. The best money you can spend on your car. Let's pause for a moment. We'll return with Wally Mayer as Michael Shane, detective, right after these messages. Stan Freeberg here. The Radio Spirits catalog features thousands of cassettes and CDs of old-time radio. Call right now and Radio Spirits will send you their latest catalog absolutely free. Call Radio Spirits right now at 1-800-RADIO-48. That's 1-800-723-4648. Now let's rejoin Wally Mayer, starring as Michael Shane, detective. The guests at Professor Watkins were discussing murder. Michael Shane offered poisoned coffee as a possible method. A moment later, Amy Vickers dropped dead. She had just taken a drink of coffee. Now Shane is at the phone talking to the inspector of the homicide squad. Okay, Inspector. Send a man right over here, will you? I don't like the setup. What? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, a couple of angles. Right. So long. The police will be right over. Mr. Shane, you shouldn't have talked about poisoning coffee just when she was about to drink some. You know, an idea planted in the mind. That's right. Scared her into a, a heart attack. This was no heart attack, Mr. Tolliver. What do you mean? Good Lord, you're not suggesting that... Yes, I am. Oh, I'm no doctor, but I've seen poison deaths before. Poison? What? You mean there actually was poison in that coffee, Michael? Looks like it. But who could have done it? I don't know. Yet. Surely you couldn't have gone to such lengths simply to illustrate your point. Oh, don't be ridiculous, Professor. Mr. Shane. Yes, Mr. Tolliver? Will you come in the other room, please? I want to tell you something. Tell me here. I can't. Please. Uh, what's going on? Please, Mr. Shane. Oh, uh, okay. Come on. Phil? Phil, keep those big blue eyes open while I'm gone. See that nobody touches anything. Yes, yes, I will, Michael. Uh, right in here, Mr. Shane. All right, Mr. Tolliver, now what is it? Mr. Shane, how much will it cost for you to forget what you heard Helen say earlier this evening? Oh. Sorry, no sale. I can make it worthwhile. Not interested. But you said you didn't care about our private lives. Murder makes them public. But good Lord, neither Helen nor I committed the murder. We'll let the police decide that. But you know what they'll think. I have a rough idea. I won't let you submit her to it. I won't. Now listen, Sir Galahad, we aren't playing patty cake. This is murder. There are rules about that. And I'm asking what you'll take to break the rules. Now listen, punk. Amy was a friend of mine. All right, she was kind of a screwball, but she was harmless. She meant well, and I liked her. Oh, well, if that's the way it is... That's the way it is. Now I'm going back to the others. All right, Mr. Shane. Looks like you win. Yeah. Except for this! Ooh! <laughs> Mr. 
Mr. Shane. You're coming out of it? Oh, hello, Tolliver. What happened to you when the roof fell in? That was no roof. That was a candlestick. Oh. Bright boy, this Shane. Brilliant detective. Letting you get behind me. Well, you wouldn't listen to reason. I had to do something. So you dent my skull with a candelabra and tie me up. I had to do something. And so you said. Well, the way you got me tied, Fossil Post would accept me. I'm not taking any chances on your getting away. Where are you taking me? My apartment. The others are going to be missing us. I'll go back and tell them I gave you a lead and you're following it up. How long do you think that's going to satisfy them? Long enough to give me time to crack the case, I hope. <laughs> You've been reading too many stories. I've got to clear Helen. Even if she's guilty? Don't say that. If she didn't do it, I know it. Who else could? What do you mean? Murderers don't just kill anybody. Whoever killed Amy must have intended to kill her. It wasn't an accident that she got the poison coffee. Okay, but that doesn't mean... Well, who gave her the coffee? Your dear Helen. Maybe she didn't get the poison in the coffee. Maybe it was in something she ate earlier that just started to take effect when she drank the coffee. No, no, I don't think so. It hit too suddenly. Looked to me like a fast-acting poison. Well, oh, capsules then. She could have been given a capsule of poison. The poison wouldn't work until the capsule dissolved. Yeah, I was right. You do read books. So, you see, it didn't have to be Helen. And I'm going to find out who really committed the murder before you get the chance to put the police on her. I know what they do to her. I know their methods. Now, look, just because the nice young man always beats the police to the killer in store... I'm not a child, Mr. Shane. I'm not basing my plans on fiction. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. You took a course in criminology with the professor, and you probably have a junior G-man badge, too. <laughs> but while you're playing mastermind, do you expect everyone else to just sit back and wait? Well, of course not. And among other things... Phyllis is going to be wondering about me, and sooner or later, they'll find me. Oh. Are you suggesting that I kill you so it doesn't matter if they do find you? Hey, maybe I talk too much. Maybe you do. What are they doing out there? They've been gone a long time. I don't know. Mr. Tolliver told Mike he had something to tell him, but they've been gone so long. Yes. Good Lord, what do you suppose has happened? Well, there's one way to find out, Mr. Vickers. Let's go see. All right, Professor. You don't suppose... That... I don't know. But whatever it is, Mrs. Watkins, I don't like it. Now, look here, Tolliver. You're only making things harder for yourself and Mrs. Watkins by kidnapping me. Why don't you take me back and... I we'll... told you. I've got to crack this case. Oh, youth. Youth in love. You don't need to make fun of me. Yeah, in love with a married woman at that. Listen, mister. Another crack like that? Yeah. Now? Well, anyhow, I can see where we stand. From here on out, we play rough. Not you, Mr. Shane. You won't do much with your arms and legs tied. And as a further precaution, I made a point of taking Helen's gun with me when I left. Oh, good for you. You like the idea? Yeah. Because even though my hands and feet are tied, I can still do this. Hey! Hey, what are you doing? Take your feet off that accelerator. Oh, no. We'll hit something. Yeah, it could be. Shane! Shane, for the love of heaven. Well, I'll get it out of gear. There. Yeah, that won't help coasting down this hill. Hey, hey, you're stepping on my foot. Yeah. I can't get it on the brake. Shane, stop it. We'll be killed. That could be in the cards for me anyway. Just watch where you're going and steer. Shane! Shane, please! Okay. Okay, you can stop now, pal. Oh. Oh. Oh, thank heaven. Yeah. What was the idea, Shane? Did you figure to attract the attention of a traffic cop? No, but while you were so busy wrestling with the steering wheel and gear shift, I managed to get my hands into your coat pocket. Oh. Yes, Junior. And now I've got the gun. And even with my hands tied, there's nothing to stop my finger from pulling the trigger. So now for a change, I'll call the shots. I 
don't know where they can be, Sergeant Leslie, and I'm worried. You say Tolliver asked Shane to go in the other room with them? Yes, Sergeant, and when they didn't come back, the professor went to look for them. Yes, I went all over the place, Sergeant. They must have gone out the back entrance. Oh, dear, you'd think they'd at least have said something. I couldn't, Phil. Michael! I don't talk in my sleep. Oh. Hello, Sergeant. Your man at the door let us in. What have you been, Michael? Well, Junior here took me for a ride, but it turned out to be a round trip. Uh, I suppose this ties in with the murder, Shane. Well, I'll let you figure that out, Sarge. I'm tired. All I want to do is get out of here, so I'll tell you what I know and leave the masterminding to you. That's not like a detective. I should think you'd want to see this through. When my head gets back to normal size, I'll try seeing things through. Right now, all I want is a place to lie down. Oh, darling, you've been hurt. Oh, no, baby, I'm all right. It's the room that keeps spinning. Oh, make it stop, will you? Well, Mr. Shane, is your head better this morning? Yeah, yeah. The little men who were running around inside of it have stopped. Now they're just jumping up and down. <laughs> well, at any rate, I'm glad to see you're not going to allow it to interfere with your thinking. Huh? Well, I have a hunch Junior was right. About what? Amy didn't get the poison in the coffee. Why? Because none of us could be sure which cup Amy would take, and that would... I'll take it. Hello, Shane speaking. Oh, morning, Sergeant. Huh? Are you sure? Well, there was, huh? How about the rest? Oh, I see. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, well, thanks for telling me. If I get any ideas, I'll let you know. Right. So long. Well... Leave us face it, baby. I am undoubtedly a great brain. What now? Have you solved the case? Didn't I just get through telling you why Amy couldn't have got the poison in the coffee? You did? Uh-huh. Well, that was Sergeant Leslie. He says they found out how she was given the poison. How? In the coffee. Oh. Yeah. Are they sure? Yes, yes. They analyzed what was left in the cup, and it was full of the stuff. But it, it doesn't make sense. Michael, maybe the sugar... The poison could have been in the sugar. Yeah, yeah, I thought about that. So did Sergeant Leslie, but he examined the sugar in the bowl. None of the other lumps were poison. Oh, well, if it was a strong poison, one lump would do it. Yes, but how could the murderer be sure that Amy would get the poison lump? Mm. Well, if she were served first... But she wasn't, honey. And Helen Watkins didn't know that you don't use sugar. Say, I wonder if she could have added a poison lump to the bowl after she served you. No, uh-uh, no, I'd have seen her. Besides, she was using both hands to hold the tray. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but at least we know she wanted to kill Amy. I wonder if anyone else wanted... Let's see. Um, there was you and me and George and the professor and that young Mr. Tolliver. Baby, that's it. What's it? What you just said. That's how somebody could have been sure Amy would get the poison. What? Sure. Now I know who killed her. You do? Uh-huh, unless there was a mistake. Unless the poison wasn't meant for Amy. Oh, well, but... Who else could it have been meant for? You, sweetheart. You. It's a tough case we have here, folks. But have you heard the case of the stubborn motor? The villain was Old Man Winter and the victim, an innocent automobile. One dark night while the car was parked at the curb, Winter came along and tied up the motor so it couldn't start. Next morning, the owner of the car was baffled. He blamed the motor for not starting, called it stubborn, and uh, several other things. And then a neighbor came to the rescue, told him about case sight. And now he always gets quick, sure starts no matter how cold the weather. Now, don't laugh, friends. That's a true case. It's happened millions of times. Even in sub-zero weather, cars start quickly and easily with case sight in the crankcase oil. Case sight retards congealing of oil. Let your motor spin over faster, saves your battery, saves your engine, saves your temper. K-Sight guarantees quick starting in winter weather or double your money back. Get K-Sight from your garage, service station, or car dealer. Only 65 cents a pint. Use it two ways, a pint through the air intake to tune up your motor, a pint in the crankcase to give you quick, sure starting. Remember this, no matter what motor oil you're using... You'll get better and smoother motor performance when you add k -Sight. We'll return to Wally Mayer as Michael Shane, detective, 
right after these messages. Dimension X. George Burns and Gracie Allen. Hop along, Cassidy. Edgar Bergen. The Shadow. John and Blanche Bickerson, The Whistler. Choose from among thousands of downloadable old-time radio shows and spoken word titles at MediaDay.com. The best voice on the net. Yeah. (laughs) And now let's rejoin Wally Mayer, starring as Michael Shane, detective, and the conclusion of The Party. Michael Shane thinks he knows who poisoned Amy. Unless the poison wasn't meant for Amy, it might have been meant for Phyllis. At least Shane considers that a possibility, a possibility that Phyllis doesn't quite like. Now, in Shane's office, she asks him, Oh, but Michael, why would anyone want to kill me? Oh, I don't think anyone would. Oh, well, thank you for those kind sentiments, but then why did you say that... I was just trying to cover every possibility... Well, after all, I'd never met the professor or his wife or Mr. Tolliver before, and well, I don't think Amy or George would have... So you're right. Amy was the intended victim, and that means only one person could have killed her. Come on. Wh- where are we going? To that one person. Oh, wait a minute, honey, wait a minute. I want to make a phone call. You get the car, will you, and I'll be right down. Yeah, all right, Michael, but don't you think... Yes, baby, sometimes I do. Sometimes. <laughs> This is Amy and George's apartment. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll ring. But uh, do do you mean George? Do you mean that he... We'll we'll see, honey. Oh, Michael, quit trying to keep me in suspense. You're not the type for dramatics. Oh, you should hear me quote Shakespeare. I don't hear anyone coming. Well, maybe he isn't home. Say, wait a minute. Look. What? The door is open. Uh Uh-oh. What's the matter? Don't you ever listen to the radio? What do you mean? Well, whenever anyone finds a door open, there's always a corpse inside. Well, let's go see. Um, you go first. Okay. Well, is there? Corpse? Well, I don't see any. Oh, good. Well, maybe in one of the other rooms. Oh, I don't think so. Hello, George. Oh, no answer. Funny that he went out and left the door open. Yeah. Well, what do we do now? I'll sit down and wait. He'll probably be back soon. All right. Strange. Hmm? What is? This place without Amy. Yeah. Remember the time when we were here and she was fluttering all over the place? Now it's so quiet. She was a sweet little nitwit. It's hard to think she's gone. How could anyone... Michael, was it George? Well, look, honey. We're agreed that the murderer's problem was to see that it was Amy who got the poison, right? All right. How could he be sure? After all, Helen offered me the tray first, and I could have picked any cup on... Good heavens. Suppose I... Oh, oh, Michael. No, sweetheart, no, you wouldn't have. That's just the point. The poison wasn't in the coffee. It was in the sugar. The murderer simply dropped a poison lump in the bowl sometime during the evening, right on top. Yeah, but even so, how would he know... How would he know Amy would get it? You said before that... Because, baby, you and Amy were the only two women guests. Oh, so we'd be served first, of course. Why, sure. You said yourself, Helen Watkins is very proper. And, And since I don't use sugar, no matter which of us she served first, that would leave the poison lump for Amy. Right, honey. But that means the murderer had to be someone who knows you don't use sugar. And that leaves George. Because you never met any of the others before. Then it was George. Well, it looks like... Yes, it was George. George! Now, don't move. I have a gun. So I see. I saw you drive up, so I left the door open and hid in the next room. I wondered how much you knew. I thought I might overhear something. I guess we gave you a near fool. You certainly did. Now what? What are you going to do? I don't know. This is very awkward. Uh, especially for us. However, I can't let you go, knowing what you do. I'm afraid I'll have to... You'll be... do nothing, Vickers. Drop that gun. Sergeant, 
Hello, Sergeant. I've been waiting for you. And am I glad I asked you to meet me here? Well, it's all wrapped up, baby. It seems he and uh, Amy were insured in each other's names, and he felt like cashing in. Oh, I see. Tell me something, Mr. Shane. All right, what? Did you know George was in the other room when you told me he was the murderer? Well, I thought he might be. I knew the sergeant was coming because I phoned him. And I figured it might be a chance to get George to tip his hand. I see. Clever, huh? Mm-hmm. Michael, you're brilliant. <laughs> Oh, it was nothing. Really, I mean, nothing at all. Oh, yes, it was. You figured the whole thing out and trapped the killer. You're really amazing. Absolutely a genius. <laughs> well, if you insist, uh, thank you, my pet. Uh, there, there's only one little thing you overlooked. Oh? What's that? Um, suppose the sergeant had been late. Uh-oh. Oh. <laughs> Michael Shane, Private Detective, stars Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. Tonight's story was written by Jerome Epstein and directed by Michael Raffetto and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and played by Len Salvo. This is Charles Arlington speaking. Your car ever sputter and cough like that? If so, you need K-Sight, for K-Sight cleans motors and keeps them clean, guarantees better and smoother performance or double your money back. Only 65 cents a pint. K-Sight makes a big difference you can notice immediately. And that's why we say, no matter what kind of motor oil you're using, you'll get better and smoother motor performance when you add K-Sight. <laughs> This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Mr. District Attorney, starring David Bryan. Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, Guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it shall be my duty as district attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. And now, here is our star, David Bryan, as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. District attorney knows that crime is no respecter of social position. It can strike in the slums of the city, or it can strike, as this case did, in the vast and wealthy estates in the suburbs. The time is 1.37 a.m., and Howard Morton, a wealthy industrialist, is awakened from his sleep by the sound of his daughter screaming. Daddy! Daddy, help me! Help me! Honey, honey, what's the matter? Bob, he's dead, Daddy. He's dead. Wow. Yes, what happened to him? <laughs> Connie, get hold of yourself. What happened? I'm frightened, Daddy. There was a man with a bandana over his face. Where, Connie? Where? At the old road near the lake. We were parked there listening to the music on the car radio. When all of a sudden... Oh, it was horrible. Oh, sit down. Sit down while I call the police. Then you'd better have a doctor. Get something for your nerves. He, he tried to hold us up. Bob had a gun in the car. They fought for it. Operator, get me the police. I, I want to report a murder. Oh, Daddy. Daddy. Connie. 
coming. Walters, me, wake up, somebody, wake up, wake up. The butler said we could wait here in the library, Chief. The doctor's still in with the girl. She had a mighty bad shock. She tell you where the killing took place, Harrington? Yeah, one of the old roads down by the lake, over in the state park. I've got uh, three squads beating around the lake roads now. They'll call us as soon as they find the body. Mm. Now, what time is it? Mm, almost 5 a.m. We're getting light in half an hour. If the girl can't talk to us soon, we'd better get over to the lake with the men. Oh, here's the girl's father now. How are you, Mr. Garrett? I'm sorry to keep you waiting. I understand, Mr. Morton. May we see your daughter now? I'm afraid not. The doctor put her under sedation. She must have absolute rest for a few hours. Well, we'd better come back later then. Well, thank you. I think that would be best. I'll walk out with you. Is there any way we can get to the lake from here without driving back to the highway? Yes, there is. Go around to the rear of the house, past the guest house and the stables. You'll find a road there that intersects several of the neighboring estates. We use it more or less as a bridle path, but it's suitable for a car. Fine. That'll save us a few minutes. What time was it when your daughter got home, Mr. Morton? Just uh, a minute or two before I made my call to the police. A little past 1.30. I'd only been in bed about an hour. The servants locked up at about 12.30. Remember, behind the house and past the stables. We'll find it. See you later. Well, oh, Harrington, Ma Brady must have been standing right beside his car when he was killed. Our tracks are pretty heavy where the car was parked. Yeah. I, uh... I only saw the Morton girl for a minute before the doctor got to the house. Couldn't make much out of what she was saying, but I gather that Brady was killed with his own gun. Well, how come? Well, one of the servants told me that Brady carried an automatic in the glove compartment of his car. I guess it was robbery, all right, though. Brady doesn't seem to have a cent on him. No wallet, no wristwatch, nothing. Yeah, no doubt about the motive. Well, I guess we can have the body moved into town. Somebody will have to notify his folks. Yeah. Keep a squad of men out here, though. What do you want them to do? Beat the brush and look for Brady's gun. While they're looking, we can follow this extra set of footprints. See where they lead. Yeah. Hey. Hey, you fellas. Calm this area. Find that gun. Okay. Tracks head this way. Well, whoever he is, Chief, he didn't make much of an attempt to cover up his tracks. No, unless he had a car parked along here someplace waiting for him. Oh, wait a minute. Hmm. Footprints leave the road here. This may be where the trouble starts. No, no, they just turn off to this footpath. What's down the path? In that clump of trees. Huh? Oh. Yeah, it looks like a small cottage. Well, this is State Park land, Chief. Can't be a private home. Well, it must be a caretaker's cottage. State Fire Warden. You think he could be our man? Well, the best way to find out is to ask him. Keep your eyes open. Shh. Come into the cottage. It isn't even 7 a.m. yet. He was out late last night. Might still be asleep. Take a look through the windows. Yeah, he's there all right, Chief. Yes. He may still have Brady's gun tucked under his pillow someplace. Let's see if we can take him before he wakes up. Easy. Door isn't locked. Good. You're in. Bedroom. There he is. Covered. Boots, right beside his bed. Huh. Yeah, they made the marks we've been following, all right. Wake him up. All right, you wake up. Wake up. 
What's the matter? Get up. Hey, what are you guys doing in here? Who are you? Well, my name is Garrett. I'm the district attorney. What is this? One of Charlie's gags? You friends of Charlie's? I told you who I am, and it's no gag. What's your name? Brennan. Mike Brennan. What's the Let matter? Let us ask the questions, huh, mister? Where were you last night, Brennan? In town, to a movie. Why? Anybody see you in there? Friend named Charlie Ridgway. We ate together. Anybody else? Clerk at Walton's Photo Supplies. I picked up a gallon of developing solution. I take a lot of pictures to my own developing. There's the solution on the table. You'll find the bill in that paper sack. What time did you start back from town, Brennan? Got the last bus out this way at midnight. Dropped me off out at the highway about 12.30. About a half hour walk from there to here. You see anybody after you left the bus at the highway? Why, yeah. Yeah, come to think of it, I did. I saw a fellow and a girl on the old road coming through the woods. I passed their car. Thought maybe somebody had had a breakdown. I looked inside, but there wasn't anybody in the car. Then I walked on a little further, and I met them, walking too. I asked them if they were having any trouble, and... Go ahead. He said no, so I left. Better get dressed, Brennan. You're coming with us. But why? What have I done? If you don't know, you'll find out later. If you do know, we don't have to tell you. Watch him, Harrington. I'm going to look around for that gun. A gun? You heard him, mister. A gun. Just like the one I'm pointing at you. So get dressed and no tricks. I hope the Morton girl can give us some more information, Chief. We sure can't hold that Brennan for long unless we get more on him. No, he didn't have Brady's gun or anything else. There's Mr. Morton now, out front waiting for us. Yeah. Uh, secretary told me you arrested somebody when I called to say Connie could see you now. I'm just a suspect, Mr. Morton. Nothing definite. May we go in? Oh, sure. She's upstairs in her room. She's still very nervous, though, gentlemen. Before you speak to her, I want you to know I'd consider it a personal favor if you try not to upset her any more than is necessary. We'll try not to, Mr. Morton, but a man has been murdered, and we must have all the information we can get. Of course. Mr. Garrett and his assistant have come back to talk to you, dear. Hello. Hello, Miss. Hello, Miss Morton. Miss Morton, would you mind telling us about last night? Well, there's... There's very little you don't already know. Bob and I hadn't dated for a long time. But last night he called. He said he wanted to see me. We drove around, then parked down on that lake road. Mm -hmm. We talked for quite a while. You see, Bob was planning to get married next month to a girl named Mildred Peters. She's a, a school teacher, I think he said. Go ahead, Connie. Tell him everything. While we were talking, a, a man came up to the car. It was dark. He had a bandana over his face. You couldn't identify him by his features, then? No. He, he held us up. Made us get out of the car. Did he have a gun? I'm not sure. He had something in his hand. I don't know what. I was too frightened. He took Bob's wallet and his wristwatch. And then he told us to stay right where we were. And he didn't take anything from you? Oh, yes. Yes, he took my purse. And then what happened? Well, all of a sudden, Bob made a dash for the car. He got his gun from the glove compartment. But the man was right after him. They fought. The other man got the gun... And then he shot Bob and ran away. Gentlemen, if you don't mind, I think... Just a minute, please, sir. Uh, Miss Morton, what were you wearing last night? Just a plain blue taffeta dress. It's right there on the chair. No top coat? It was a warm night. You were in bed when your daughter drove home, Mr. Morton. Yes, I, I told you. I turned in about 12.30. Servants go to bed, too? Same time I did. I watched them locking up. 
All right, Harrington. We'd better run along. We can find our way out. Goodbye. That girl can make our case against Brennan when she calms down. I don't know, Harrington. Somebody's lying around here. Mr. Morton claims the house was locked up tight when he and the servants went to bed. But they both admit that his daughter came tearing into the house and up to his bedroom. Well, what's wrong with that? How did she get into the house if Brennan stole her purse? Her keys would be in the purse. Well, not necessarily, Chief. She might have had her house key in the pocket of her dress. That's why I took a look at that dress, Harrington. And that's why I know she's lying. That dress didn't have any pockets. Now back to David Bryan, starring as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. A man had been murdered with his own gun in a lover's lane killing. Suspicion pointed strongly at a state park caretaker. I had the dead man's mother and his fiancée brought to my office for interrogation. I was with them when Harrington came back to the office with some vital evidence. Hi, Miss Miller. Chief in his office? Yes, Brady's mother's with him and um, Miss Mildred Peters. Peters? Oh, that must be the school teacher Brady was going to marry. Probably. She looked like she'd been doing a lot of crying. What's that you got? Well, fingerprints. Nice matching set. Lab crew lifted this set from the door of the death car. And we took this set on Brennan when we booked him. You're identical, all right. Yeah, Brennan's our boy. This ties it on him, but good. I wonder if the chief wants me in there. We don't want to see those. Go ahead. Yeah. The only boy I had left. Brother died six years ago. Oh, excuse me, Mrs. Brady. Come in, Harrington. Sit down. I, uh, I thought you might want to see these right away, chief. Please, Mother Brady, try to calm down. Mr. Garrett needs our help. Uh, I'm sorry. That's all right. This is Mr. Harrington, my assistant. Harrington, this is Mrs. Brady, and this is Miss Peters. How do you do? How do you do? do? Now, Miss Brady, how long did you say it had been since your son had been out with Connie Morton? Before last night, I mean. Six months. I thought it was all over between them. I thought she'd leave him alone when she knew that he and Mildred were going to be married. Didn't he brood about her much uh, during the time they stopped going out together? No. He knew it was for the best. She was spoiled. She never really wanted him until she found out he was planning to marry Mildred. Do either of you have any idea, then, as to why he called her and asked her to see him last night? He didn't call her. She called him. You're sure of that? I was there when he answered the phone. He didn't want to go. She must have been insisting, because after a while he'd said, all right, he'd meet her just once for the last time. It was the last time, all right. Well, thank you, ladies. That'll be all for now. You've helped a great deal. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Is it true what the newspaper reporters told us when we were coming in, that, that, that you've arrested the killer? Well, I wouldn't count on that just yet. You'll be informed. Thank you. I don't get you, Chief. Why did you say that? Those fingerprints on Brennan, you've got enough to get an indictment for a murder right now. I can get more than an indictment with them, Harrington. I can get a conviction. But I don't like convicting the wrong person. Now, let's go down to the lab. I want a set of the mug shots they made of Brennan when he was booked. Going to the lab, Miss Miller. Photo gallery. Yes, sir. Uh, what do you want Brennan's picture for, Chief? I want Connie Morton to look at them. See if she can make an identification. Well, she said the man who stuck him up had a bandana over his face. She said a lot of things. Basement, please, Marty. Was well, a bandana found in Brennan's clothing out at the cottage? Yeah. He says he wore it around his neck. Lots of guys who work outdoors do wear them, you know. 
I want to stop someplace and buy a different bandana. Different color and pattern. Oh? Huh? What for? You'll see tomorrow. I want to find out how many lies Connie Morton can tell. Because I won't be satisfied with the case against Brennan until we find Brady's gun. And the things that were supposed to be stolen. Miss Morton must be feeling a lot better this morning if she's out at the stables. Yeah, a lot better. There she is now, over in the ring. Hey, what's she doing? Working out a jumper. All right, Caesar. Now back again. Over. <laughs> Fork at a jump, will you? I'll teach you. <laughs> when I want you to jump, you'll jump. Take it easy with that horse. Oh. Mr. Garrett. Mr. Harrington. I didn't see you. Glad to see you recovered from your shock. I had to find something to occupy my mind. Jeffries, get Caesar out of the ring and unsaddle him. We can talk at the house. I thought working Caesar might relax me. I've got him entered in the garden show next Sunday. Be nice if the horse lives that long, the way you use a whip. It happens to be my horse and my business, Mr. Garrett. What do you want? A little help. We may have the man who killed Bob Brady. So the reporters told me. A park worker named Brennan. News gets around, doesn't it? Here's a photograph of him. Is he the man? He could be. He looks like the one. Well, what do you recognize? The scar on his chin? Yes. No, I, I mean no. His face was covered. Uh-huh. With a bandana. We found one on Brennan. Was this the bandana you saw? Well, it was dark. But it was just like that one. I see. Well, thank you. Come on, Harrington. Is that all you wanted to know? Yes. That's all for now. Well, she took the bait on that bandana, all right, Chief. It's nothing like the one Brennan was wearing. I know. Hey, isn't that a Central Division car coming up the drive? Yes. Well, that's Miss Miller with the driver. I wonder what's up to bring her out here. Oh, Mr. Garrett. I'm glad I got here before you left. What is it? This letter. Came in the morning mail about five minutes after you left the office. I thought you'd want it right away. Look at this, Harrington. Yeah. Hand printed on cheap stationery. Addressed to you. Look in crevice of oak tree, 50 yards behind Brennan's cottage. That's it. Yeah, looks like Brennan trusted a friend who decided to double cross him. What do you think it means? It means we're about to find a few stolen items, including Bob Brady's gun. You take a cab back, Miss Miller. Let the squad car follow us. Something else in here, if I can get my fingers on it. Uh, uh, I got it. Uh, yeah. Hey, you are, Chief. Look, look at the inscription on the back. Bob from Mildred. Brady's wristwatch, all right. Yeah, nice haul. Gun, girl's purse, Brady's wallet and wristwatch. All practically on Brennan's doorstep. And here are Connie Morton's keys. The key she let herself into the house with. They couldn't be in this tree and with her at the same time. Why would she kill Brady? Oldest motive in the world. Jealousy. Now we'll have to hold Brennan another 24 hours. That'll be long enough to get what we need. Then Connie Morton can take his place. Well, we still can't prove anything. I'll have enough when I send that anonymous note through the lab for handwriting analysis. But the note isn't written. It's hand-printed. There'll still be similarity in letter formations. We can compare them against Connie's printing. Where are you going to get your sample to compare? The registration blank she sent to the horse show to enter her mount for the jumps. 
Ever see one of those applications? No. They say, please print. Why do you have to see my daughter again, Mr. Garrett? You men have been seeing her every day. You've got to leave her alone. Well, don't worry, Mr. Morton. This is our last visit. Why can't I answer whatever it is you want to ask? Because you weren't there when Brady was killed. There she is, Chief. In by the stalls. Mind if we come in, Miss Morton? Or would you rather come out? What do you want this time? We thought you might like to know that we found Bob Brady's gun. An anonymous note told us where it was. A crevice in a tree right behind Brennan's place. Well, now you've got a good case. You can stop bothering me. Oh, we've well, got a good case, all right, but not against Brennan. Brennan didn't kill Bob Brady. Then... Then you still don't know who did it. Oh, yes, we know. You did it, Miss Morton. I oh, did it. dare you make such an accusation against my daughter. Get out of here. Get off my property. My attorneys will break you for this, Garrett. Get out! We'll go, but we'll take your daughter with us. What evidence do you have? A hand-printed anonymous letter that matches the printing on the registration blanks your daughter sent into the horse show. You better come along, Miss Morton. You're not going to be showing your horses this Sunday. You! Oh. Give me that quick! Oh. That's something else you won't be using again, Miss. We'll get the best legal talent in the country. We'll beat you on this, Garrett. It's your privilege to try. But be true to yourself, Mr. Morton. You began to suspect she was lying the same time I did. She... She's not lying. She didn't know anything about it. I did it. I shot Brady. No, that won't work either, Mr. Morton. We've got our pin down tight. Daddy, help me. Talk to them. Give them some money. What kind of a father are you if you can't help me? Shut up! You hit me. Yes. I should have started 20 years ago before I let you become what you are. Maybe I'm not legally guilty, Mr. Garrett, but I'm guilty of raising her the way I did. It's too bad you didn't think of that sooner. All right, Connie. Let's go into town. the star of Mr. District Attorney, David Bryan, with a word about the program you have just heard. When Connie Morton's attorneys saw that her protestations of innocence in the face of the evidence against her was not impressing the judge or jury, they persuaded her to enter a voluntary plea of guilty to murder in the second degree. She was sentenced to a prison term of 50 years. Now, this is David Bryan inviting you to join us when we present our next case based on the facts of crime from the file of Mr. District Attorney. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Phillips H. Lord. It's the case of the dictaphone murder. Another case for that most famous of all manhunters. The detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Nick, shut up. 
should be here any minute, Mr. Buckley. He told me on the phone that he'd be here at 9 o'clock. That's why I came so early. Well, it's only a few minutes after 9. Now it won't be long. You see, I've got a great... Oh. Good morning, Patsy. Hello, Nick. Any spe... Oh, good morning, Mr. Buckley, isn't it? Yes, Mr. Carter. When I met you after your lecture at the club the other evening, I said to myself, that's the man I'll go to when I need help. <laughs> and you need it now? Very much. I want you to thoroughly investigate Roger Denham, the man who's going to marry my daughter. Well, what's he done? I don't know that he's done anything. I simply want to be sure that he's the right kind of man to be my son-in-law. Well, really, Mr. Buckley, I don't go in for that sort of thing at all. Oh, that's not the only reason. The Buckley Corporation is going to build a large new office building, and Roger Denham has been awarded the contract for the work. I want to know that he can carry it out successfully. Mr. Buckley, I deal for the most part in crime. It interests me, and I've made it my life work. What you're asking me to do does not interest me. Furthermore, I don't have the time for it. I see. Well, perhaps this will interest you. It's an anonymous letter I received in the mail this morning. I don't put much stock in such things, but, well, here it is. Roger Denham is married, has been for six years. His wife is now on her way to the Royal Arms Hotel. Better warn your daughter. Does that interest you, Mr. Carter? Not very much. Information like that can be checked too easily to offer any problem as far as I'm concerned. Nothing very mysterious about this note. It's typed on a decent grade of paper by a fairly good typewriter. Half of the letter L is missing because of a defective type bar, and there's no threat in it. Except one fact. I'm sorry you won't act for me, Mr. Carter, but I suppose you have your reasons. Nick Carter's office, Patsy Bowen speaking. Oh, morning, Patsy. Nick there? Oh, yes, he is. Just a minute. See you, Nick. Sergeant Matheson. What got you down to your office early, Matty? What do you mean, office? I've been there, and now I'm up here at the Royal Arms. If you're not busy, you might take a run over here. What's up? Murder. Guy named Roger Denham. Did you say Roger Denham? I did. Why? Friend of yours? No, just a coincidence, that's all. What about Denham, Mr. Carter? What's the story, Matty? He's been strangled to death. If uh, you're not busy... I'll I... be right over. What room? 312. I'll wait for you, Nick, but make it snappy. I will. So long. Mr. Carter, has something happened to Denham? Buckley, when did you see him last? Mm, yesterday evening. I called on him at the hotel to see if I could find out something about him personally. Why? He's just been murdered. Murdered? Denham? Yes. Police are there in his room now. Let me have that letter again. Yes, of course. Here. Thanks. Uh, top of the morning to you, Patsy. Nick. Hello, Waldo. Don't bother to sit down, Walter. You and I are going out immediately. We're going to look into a murder. Hi, Matty. Well, Nick, you made good time. It's only 9.30. <clears throat> yep. Oh, hello, Buffalo Bill. Well, if it ain't the terror of the police force himself. Uh, stuck, are you? No, I'm not stuck. Just thought Nick might like to have a look-see. Right, Matty. What have you found so far? Well, there's the body, Nick, right on the floor where we found it. He was strangled by some guy with an enormous pair of hands. You can still see the marks on his throat. Mm. Must have been a struggle the way the room was upset, but it wasn't robbery. Nothing is missing, as far as we can tell. Any fingerprints? No, nope, not a one. Maid found the body when she came in to clean about 9 o'clock. Coroner says death occurred about 8.30 this morning. All night party or an early morning blowout? I checked with the room clerk, and he says he saw no visitors this morning. But the telephone operator says a guy named Johnny Casper called about 7.45 this morning. She said she knew his voice because he'd called so often before. If he came here, he'd know the way without asking at the desk. Yeah. Said she wasn't listening, but she uh, <laughs> gathered from what she just happened to hear that Casper wanted to see Denham right away. Well, we can look into that when we... Wait. Room 312. Is Mr. Denham there? Who's calling? Mr. Allen of the Buckley Corporation. I'd like to talk to Mr. Denham. What do you want to talk to Denham about? Uh, who are you, This Aunt? is Nick Carter. I'm sorry to say you can't talk to Denham. He's just been murdered. Uh, Denham? Murdered? Did you say murdered? I did. What do you want to talk to him about? Why, I'm the chairman of the board for the Buckley Corporation. We've just awarded a contract to Mr. Denham for the construction of the Buckley Building, and I wanted to make an appointment with him to settle a number of details. Uh, and you say he's... Unfortunately, yes, Mr. Allen. Uh, it's terribly unfortunate. Uh, well, goodbye. Goodbye. Uh, some friend of Denham's, Nick? Business acquaintance, apparently. Wanted to make a date with him. Uh, it's a little late for that, I'm thinking. Hey, Nick, here's something... Yes, what is it, Matty? It's a piece of silk. Pocket off a shirt, I'd say. Found it clenched in Denham's fist. Ah. Must have been ripped off in the struggle. A clue, by golly. Now we can start investigating, Nick. Looks like it. 
Matty, will you let me have this? Oh, now, look, Nick, that's the only real piece of evidence we got. I know it, and I'll take care of it. Just want to find out what mills made it, and what they did with it. Oh, but, Nick, look, why can't... Now, you... look, I can do it faster than you can, Matty, you know that? Oh, I suppose so, but I Thanks. still... Yeah. Waldo, suppose you dig around and find out what mills this piece of silk came from. It shouldn't be difficult because there's a flaw here in the weave. Should make identification easy. You better get going. Legwork. Always legwork for Waldo. A good detective like me, and I ain't allowed to detect. A good detective follows orders, too. Don't forget that. Oh, sure, Nick, sure. I was just... So long, Waldo. I'll see you at the office later. Okay, Nick, okay. Well, Nick, I guess there isn't much else here we can see. I'll just take a look around while I'm here. Yeah. Huh? The room looks as if somebody's been through it, looking for something. The way it's all upside down. Yeah, that's what I thought. What do you suppose he was looking for? I wouldn't know, Matty. I... Yeah. You see this? Huh? This piece of wire sticking out under the closet door? No, what is it? Let's see. Hey, it goes up the closet wall and through the ceiling. The maid's still here? Yeah, right outside. Hey, maid! Yes, sir? Who lives in the room over this? Nobody, sir. It's empty. Or it was yesterday afternoon when I cleaned it up about half past four. That sounds suspicious in itself, an empty hotel room these days. Roy Alarm. Desk clerk, please. Desk clerk. This is Nick Carter on the murder of Denham. Who has room 412? Uh, Mrs. Denham has it now, sir. Mrs. Denham? Yes, sir. When did she come in? Uh, just a few minutes ago. Denham reserved the room yesterday for friends, he said. When Mrs. Denham came in, I supposed he meant it for her, so I gave it to her. I called Denham to check, but got no answer. What time was that? Uh, about five minutes to nine. You know anything about a wire in the closet of 312? <laughs> a wire? No, Mr. Carter, I don't. That's all, thanks. Matty, I believe this wire is a part of the answer to this murder. Yeah? Let's go up and have a... Hey, that came from upstairs, Matty. Mrs. Denham, come on, Matty, hurry. No good, Nick. He disappeared somewhere. Went down the fire escape and either got to the bottom or slipped into a room on the way down. Mm, too bad. Now, Mrs. Denham, suppose you tell me the whole story right from the beginning. Well, I got here this morning just before 9 o'clock. The clerk said Roger had engaged this room for me, so I came up. I was too tired to unpack, so I just lay down on the bed for a few minutes. I didn't sleep because I had a queer feeling someone was watching me. Then about 15 minutes ago, I got up, washed, and started down to get some breakfast. But after I'd gone a few steps, I found I'd forgotten my lipstick, so I came back for it. As I opened the door, I saw a man in the room, just starting to climb out the window. I screamed, and he, he disappeared. Did you get a good look at him? No, I didn't. But he looked like a large man with, with big hands. I saw those. Mrs. Denham, how does it happen you arrived here just this time? Why, I got an anonymous letter yesterday. Here it is. Thank you. Your husband has been out of the army for six weeks. He is staying here at the Royal Arms. Pretends he's not married and is making big play for daughter of head of Buckley Corporation. And close his ticket from your town here. Better come if you want to avoid trouble. And the letter L, only half prints. Same typewriter on both notes. What was that, Mr. Carter? Oh, uh, nothing. Go on with your story, please. I didn't even know Roger was out of the army. The last I heard was two months ago... When he wrote that he and his buddy, Johnny Casper... Nick, Johnny Casper again. Yes. Go ahead, Mrs. Denham. He said they were getting out any minute, and he let me know as soon as they did. But when this letter came, I thought I... Yes, well... I know. And that's all? Well, yes, I think so. You mind if I have a look in your closet? My closet? Why, no, not at all. Anything here, Nick? There certainly is. A dictaphone machine. What? Uh... There's the wire that comes up from downstairs. This is what I rather expected, Matty. Denham was making a record of an interview we had with someone, but the record is gone. Uh -huh. That's what the guy Mrs. Denham saw was after. Maybe he got it, Nick. Mrs. Denham, how long were you out of this room? Just a few seconds, no longer. I went out and then came back almost at once. Then the man didn't get it, Matty. Wouldn't have had time. But someone got it. That's the clue we ought to have, Nick. I bet it would tell the whole story. Yes, there must have been something pretty incriminating on it to make him kill Denham. Kill? Did you say kill Denham? Oh, no. I'm sorry, Mrs. Denham. I didn't realize you heard me. I'm very sorry, but it's true. Oh. Your husband was killed about an hour ago. Roger, dead. Matty, better take this machine to headquarters. See if there are any prints on it that'll help. Okay. Get Mrs. Denham's, too, just in case. Well, Nick, you don't I have don't know. Machine. Better take no chances. 
Let me get the serial number on the machine so I can have Patsy check on it, and I'll be on my way. Get on your way where, Nick? To see Johnny Casper. He looks like a good starting point. You see, Mr. Carter, we were buddies in the service. I liked Roger, so when we got out, I brought him back here with me. He'd been a contractor in a small town about 100 miles north of here, and I thought perhaps we could go in business together. I'm a contractor, too, you know. No, I didn't. Oh, yes, I've done some pretty big things for a young fellow. Well, anyway, I introduced Roger to Mr. Allen, the chairman of the board of the Buckley Corporation, and to Buckley himself. Then I took him up to Olive's house one night. She's Buckley's daughter. I was engaged to her at the time... Well, I introduced him to her. <laughs> what a heel that guy turned out to be. Just how do you mean, Casper? Well, instead of bidding on the Buckley building with me as partners, he submitted a separate bid of his own. And he entertained Alan and every member of the board at parties. And he made a big play for my girl behind my back. Knifed me every way he could. My pal. You say you were engaged to Miss Buckley. You're not now? Oh, I'll say I'm not. Two days ago, when I called her to make a date, she told me we were through. She was now engaged to Denham. So you have little reason to like Denham. I've never hated anybody in my life the way I hated that man. Where were you this morning about 8 o'clock? This morning? My... Why, I was right here in bed. You're sure? You weren't at the Royal Arms talking to Denham. What in heaven's name makes you Answer think Answer my that question, I... Casper. Were you at the Royal Arms? I know I... Well, yes, I was, too. Why should I deny it? I went down to tell Roger to lay off my girl. I'd tell his wife what was going on. And what did he say to that? He told me to go as far as I liked. He was on top, and he was going to stay there in spite of the devil and me. Did you two have a fight? With words, yes, but that's all. Got so mad I left him and came back here to think. I see you have a typewriter. You mind if I try it? Why, no, go right ahead. Thanks. Ah. <sighs> It was you who wrote those anonymous letters to Buckley and to Mrs. Denham. Yes, I did. I'm not ashamed of doing it. I hated Denham. Enough to kill him? Yes, but I didn't. I saw too much killing in the war. Funny, isn't it? I bring my buddy back here to help him out, and he cheats me out of everything I want. Underbids me on the Buckley job and even steals my girl. <laughs> what a laugh. No, I didn't kill him, but I wish I had long ago. referred to you to... And am I glad you were. We don't get many in here like you, baby. I, I want to find out something about... I'm the boy that can tell you, baby. Anything you want to know. I have here the serial number. Now, a... look, let's not talk about numbers. Let's talk about you. You're the number I'm interested in right now. Well, look, will you please listen? Am I listening to every word you say, gorgeous? Go ahead, talk. I want to find out about Dictaphone Machine number 248749AY. Hey, look. What are you doing tonight, Slick Chick? Working. Number 248749AY, please. I bet you do a mean rumba. How's about giving me a whirl tonight, hmm? Oh, look. I want to find out about this. Yeah, baby. I'm trying to find out, too. How late are you working tonight? Huh? Uh, I don't know. No, nah, I bet you're not working at all. Just stalling me along to see how far I'll go. Uh, well, I'll go a long way for you, good looking. Oh, will you please? Listen, Reb, how's about letting me call you when I get through the night? <laughs> Maybe I can cut it out together. I know just the place. Uh, Come on, what do you say? All right, you win. Call me at Pennsylvania 68601. Ask for Patsy. a baby, now you're cooking on all four. Now, what do you want to know? Where this machine, 248749AY, has been for the last 48 hours. Well, leave me look. <laughs> 248749AY. Leased to a guy named Roger Denham yesterday afternoon. Not back yet. That make you happy, baby? Getting the information does. Thank you. Uh, hey, you can't go like this. It's almost my lunch hour. I was about putting on a pair of bibs together down at my place, hmm? You've got my phone number and my name, and that's all you're going to get from me. Goodbye. Oh, don't be like that, gorgeous. I just want... Uh, 
Oh, there you are, Patsy. We've been waiting for you. Find anything? Nick, do I look fascinating to you? Do hey, you look... Patsy, this is police headquarters, remember? Other men find me irresistible. Do you? Snap out of it, Patsy. Did you find out about the dictaphone? Huh? Oh, yes. Um, at least to Roger Denham yesterday afternoon for 48 hours. That checks, Matty. Huh? He expected a visitor and wanted the interview recorded. Oh, I wish I knew what was on that record. Oh, I was starting to tell you when Patsy came in, Nick. There were two sets of fingerprints on that dictaphone. Denham's and somebody else's. The others don't check with any we got. They must be the murderers when he got the record. Are they extra large? Uh, hey, they aren't, Nick. They're... They're small. So they couldn't have been his. Maybe they don't mean anything. Could have been on the machine when Denham got it. Anyway, hey. Oh, Waldo. Uh, How'd you make out? Uh, you asked me to find out about that there piece of silk now, didn't you? I did. Well, when you give old Dead Eye McGlynn a job, he does it. Yes, sir. And I had some job, too, believe me. But I came through... For the love of Mike, Waldo, stop talking and say something. I'm trying to, but you keep interrupting me. Waldo, what did you find out? Well, the silk was woven by the seasoned mills. Now, they made up about a dozen shirts out of it, and then they discovered there was a flaw in the stuff. So they junked the rest. And they sold them shirts to the Lionel Men's Shop right here in town. Did you go there? No, I didn't. I thought maybe you would like to do some of the detecting yourself. Okay, okay. That's my next visit. The Lionel Men's Shop. Come on, Patsy. Come on. This is Buckley speaking. This is Nick Carter, Mr. Buckley. I find that you bought a dozen white silk shirts from the Lionel Shop a few months ago. Yes, I did. They offered me a special price, I recall. Why? Did you keep them all yourself? Why, no, I didn't. I got them just before Christmas, and I gave several of them away as presents. Could you tell me to whom you gave them? Well, now, uh, let me see. Uh, I remember giving Alan three of them, and I kept five for myself, I think. And the others... Oh, oh yes, yes. Uh, my daughter, Olive, gave the rest to Johnny Casper so he'd have some when he got out of the Army. Uh, they were going around together at that time. Nobody else got any? I believe not. Couldn't swear to it, of course. All right, thanks. Sorry to bother you. Goodbye. What do you say, Nick? He kept some, gave some to Alan, and some to Casper. Casper? We keep coming back to him, don't we? Seems so. He certainly had a motive. But if he did it, where does the dictaphone come in? Yes, I, I see what you mean. But who else is there? Alan? Well, I suppose you better check on his whereabouts at the time of the killing this morning. Mustn't leave any stone unturned. Come on. No, Mr. Allen isn't at home just now, Mr. Carter. Can I do anything for you? Perhaps. What time did Mr. Allen get up this morning? At his usual hour, sir. About 9.30. Are you sure of that? Oh, absolutely, sir. He came downstairs in his pajamas and dressing gown to ask me about a suit he couldn't find. It was at the cleaners. What time were you up this morning? I start work at 8 o'clock regularly, sir. It's my habit. And you didn't see Mr. Allen until 9.30? Why, no, sir. Uh, may I inquire why you're asking all these questions? You may, but I'm not going to answer just now. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Come on, Patsy. Let's try something else. Maybe we'll have more luck there. <laughs> Well, Nick, you going to check up on Mr. Buckley? Buckley? Well, yes. You've investigated two of the three men who got the silk shirts. You can't omit Buckley, can you? I suppose you're right, Patsy. We can't afford to... Oh, I wish I had that record Denim made. Mm. That would probably tell us the motive. And just now, we are completely missing a motive. Well, Casper had one. But as you've said, that doesn't account for the record. No, it doesn't. I wonder... Huh? What is it, Nick? Wait. I want to call Maddie. I'm going in the drugstore here. Okay. I'll be right back. All right. <clears throat> Homicide, Sergeant Matheson. Oh, Maddie, Nick, tell me. When you examined the prints and the dictaphone, did you find any of the smaller prints lapping over Denham's prints? Uh, why, come to think of it, yeah, Nick. Some of the little prints were on Papa Denham's. Why? Thanks. I'll see you later. Bye. What's going on, Nick? I think I know now where the missing dictaphone record is, Patsy, and when I get that, I should have the motive. And the murderer. 
Let's go, Nick. For goodness sake, why did you ask to speak to the chambermaid? Because I think she has the answer. Well, what answer could she have? You'll see. You're the chambermaid who found Mr. Denham's body this morning in room 312? Yes, sir. I found him when I went in to clean the room. Did you go to room 412 this morning? Well, I did and I didn't. Just how do you mean? Well, you see, I clean the rooms that's vacant in the afternoon. The deadline's 5 o'clock, so I got to get them clean before then. So I cleaned up 412 yesterday, like always. That's a transient room. So this morning I opened 412 to see if somebody's been in. But when I seen it like I left it, I didn't go in. I see. You went to the room at all this morning. Like I told you. I just looked in and seen nobody's been in, so I locked it up again. You won't mind letting me take your fingerprints, will you? Fingerprints? What do you want them for? Just for the record. You're not scared, are you? Scared? Why should I be scared? Then you won't mind if I take your prints? No, I... I don't guess so. How, uh... How do you do it? Just press your fingers on this little ink pad. Like this. Yeah? Then press them on this pad. Like this. Yeah. Yeah. Do they match, Nick? Match? Match what? So you didn't go in room 412 this morning. I told you, I... I I know what you told me. Now tell me the truth. You went to the door and you went in. And you took a record off a dictaphone machine you found in the closet. Why? Golly, mister. Can you tell all that from my fingerprints? I can. So you better tell me the truth. All right. Well, here's what happened, and it's the gospel truth. I opened the door like I said. Then, just as I started to close it again, I heard a funny noise. I listened, and it came from the closet. I looked, and there was a funny machine there with one of them trick kind of records on it. And you took it? Yeah. I didn't think it was stealing. I just wanted to see what was on it. So I, I brought it down here, and when I got a chance, I was going to play it on one of the machines in the office. But I, I've been too busy. Do you know that Denham was killed for that record? Honest, mister. And if the murderer finds you've got it now, you're next. Gee, I wouldn't like that. I don't want to be killed. Then you better get me the record right now. Sure. Sure, mister. I, I got it hidden in one of the cleaning closets. I, I'll get it for you, honest. You wait right here. We'll wait. And then we'll play the record, Patsy. I've got to know what's on it. Buckley, Nick. Sorry to be late, Mr. Carter, but I got held up in traffic. It's quite all right, Mr. Buckley. Now that you're all here, Buckley, Alan Casper, and Sergeant Matheson, I'll tell you why I called you together. As you know, Roger Denham was murdered this morning in his hotel room, strangled. The only real clues we had were the prints of an unusually large hand on Denham's throat and a silk shirt pocket, evidently torn off during the struggle. We traced the shirts and found that each of you three men had one or more of those shirts. Casper has no alibi for the time of the killing. Alan, according to his butler, has. And Buckley, we don't know about. If you'd asked me, I could have told you where I was. I'm sure you could, Mr. Buckley, right to the very minute, no doubt. So any one of you might have owned the shirt with a torn pocket. We had to get at it another way. Motive. Which of you had the strongest motive to kill Denham? Buckley and Ellen don't seem to have any reason. But Casper did. Now look here, Carter. Are you trying to pin this on me? Sit down, Casper, and wait until I finish. I won't pin murder on anyone unless it belongs there. As I said, we needed a motive. But it was only late this afternoon that chance, plus the rational and logical elimination of other possibilities, gave me the answer. I now have the motive, and with it, the murderer. And what is it, Mr. Carter? Yes, don't keep us waiting this way. Here it is. Listen. All right, Patsy. Right. Hello, Alan. What brings you out so early in the morning? I think you know, Denham. You stop that machine. Oh, no. Give me that record. What's the trouble, Mr. Oh, Allen? I said stop that machine. Oh, I owe you Take that time. record and now. I want these gentlemen to hear what it says. Confound you, Carter. I'll put a bullet right in. Don't don't put a bullet that. nowhere, murderer. Give, Give me that gun. Come on. Get out of the way. That's better. All right, gentlemen. Now that Mr. Allen is quiet again, I'd like you to hear the rest of this record. Start it again, Patsy. All right. Hello, Allen. What brings you out so early in the morning? I think you know, Denham. Little matter of money. Money? What money? Do I owe you some? Hey, what is this? 
You trying to kid me? No, no, indeed. I uh, just don't understand. You know? You bid on the contract for the construction of the new Buckley building, remember? That's right. You are not the low bidder. You came in second. You were over $50,000 higher than the low bid. Right again. I reported to the board that I was convinced that the low bidder was not equipped to do this job and recommended giving it to you in spite of your price. That's very decent of you, Al. Decent? You promised me $10,000 if I got you that contract. That's why I'm here. I want half of that $10,000 now before the contract is signed. Hey, Al and I never promised to pay you to give me that contract. I don't do business that way. Why, you double-crossing gip artist! You'll pay me what you promised, or that contract will never be signed, I promise you. But the board awarded it to me. On my recommendation, and they'll award it to someone else if I don't get what's coming to me. I boss that board, and don't forget, they do what I say. And you're going to do what you said you would, or else. That's the end, Nick. That's the most incredible thing I ever heard. So Alan killed Mr. Allen, would you care to tell us what happened after the record was shut off? Nothing. I left at once. May I see your shirt? <laughs> No. Yes. Here, open your vest. <clears throat> That's a good boy. Dick, he hasn't changed his shirt. His pocket's missing. Very probably. Didn't even know it was gone in all the excitement of the murder. And if further proof is needed, I believe his hands will correspond to the marks on Denham's throat. I see you have unusually large hands, Mr. Allen. And Denham was a louse. He shut the machine off and told me he'd been making a record of our conversation. Said if I tried to collect what he'd promised me, he'd take the record to Buckley. I knew that would ruin me, and so I... You killed him, so you could find the record, so you could destroy it. I wouldn't have believed it possible. Well, you're right about one thing. You're through, finished, as far as I'm concerned. And as far as the state is concerned, too. The chair will finish him. That's the case, gentlemen. Oh, that's for me, Nick. For you, Patsy. Who is it, do you know? Oh, I'll say I do. Wait till he hears what I'm going to tell him. Oh, but I do wish somebody else would talk to me that way. Just once in a while. Hello! Well, Nick, isn't it about time for you to give us a glimpse into next week's story? Why, I shouldn't be surprised if you were right, Ken. Well, suppose you take over, then. Right. The ingredients of my story next week are, first... A man who died of heart failure, but who was really murdered. A will, which was the will the old man wrote, but which proved to be not the will he wrote. And a signature, which was forced by a person who wanted it known it had been forged. Sounds like a fine collection of contradictions to me. What do you call it, Nick? I call it the case of the clumsy forgeries. Nick Carter, Master Detective which is produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Pictured stories of Nick Carter appear in every issue of the Shadow Comics. In the broadcasts of Nick Carter, Master Detective, Lon Clark is starred as Nick, Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy, Matty is played by Ed Latimer, Waldo by Humphrey Davis. Original music is played by George Wright. Script is by Jock McGregor and Peggy Mayer. Any resemblance in these programs to actual persons, living or dead, or to actual places is purely coincidental. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented over most of these mutual stations each week at this same time. This is Ken Powell saying so long until next week. This program was heard in Canada through the facilities of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Night Beat. Hi, this is Randy Stone. I cover the night beat for the Chicago Star. Stories start in many different ways. This one began on an elevated train and ended in eternity. Night Beat, starring Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone.
The night is just about washed up. The sky is getting that tattletale gray around the edges. Another hour or so, three million alarm clocks will start yakking against the eardrums of Chicago's dear hearts and gentle people. A goodly number of said dear hearts and gentle people will stumble to the front door for their copy of the Morning Star. I'm wondering what they'll say when they read the opening sentence of the Night Beat story for today. The line that goes, This is a love story with the happiest ending I've ever heard. I guess they'll figure spring has got me in its perfume clutches, and more than likely I'll wind up around a bologna sandwich, and that'll be that. Only if they just keep reading, maybe they'll be in for a strange kind of surprise. It started a little after 10 o'clock last night. I just boarded an elevated train and was on my way to the loop. The train was pretty crowded, but I saw an empty seat up front and I hurried for it. I started sitting down without looking. Anton, where have you been? Hmm? I beg your pardon? Oh, I've waited so long, Anton. The girl sitting next to me. I noticed her for the first time. About 20, maybe. And so beautiful, so delicately beautiful, it was like your eyes had hit the jackpot and somehow the, the grinding elevator train suddenly sounded like a gypsy violin. Well, Tommy, you shouldn't have gone away. Look, I, I hate to tell you this, but I think you've got me mixed up oh, with... It's so good to hear you, to be near you, Anton. So good. Yeah, it's good to be near you too, kid. But... Won't, won't, won't ever go away again, will you? <laughs> I'd like to stay here forever. Oh, promise me, Anton. Promise me you'll never go away. Beautiful as she was, it started giving me the creeps. If I'd been Anton, I'd have enjoyed it immensely. But being as how I was two other guys, I didn't see it. And also, there was something about her eyes, a disturbing brightness. I didn't know what to do about it, and before I could decide... Lake Street Transfer. I reached my transfer station. Lake I started Street getting Transfer. up. Anton! No, don't go. Oh, lady, look, it's my station. Don't leave me again, Anton, please, no. Oh, now, take it easy. Let go of me. What's wrong with you? This is my station. Anton, I can't let you leave me again. I won't. Well, you'll just have to, kiddo, and I'll let go of my station. No. Huh? Oh, She folded up like a little rag doll into a dead faint. I bent over her, picked up her arm to massage her wrist. It was like touching a hot stove. She was burning up with fever. Passengers in the car were crowding around. The conductor still hadn't given the signal for the train to leave the station. I picked the girl up in my arms. It was like lifting a ten-year-old kid. She must have weighed a fast 90 pounds. I carried her out of the train onto the platform. Someone called for an ambulance. She was still unconscious when the ambulance came. She looked so small and so lost and so alone. And, well, according to her, I was Anton, so the least Anton could do would be to sit beside her on the long ride to the hospital. She was still out cold when we reached County Hospital. They found her name and address inside her purse. Mrs. Marisha Nowak, 612 Larrabee Street. I waited around to see what was wrong with her. After almost an hour, they said I could go upstairs and talk to the doctor. Oh, Mr. Stone? Oh, yes. Doctor, I, w I want to see you about that girl I brought in, Marisha Nowak. Yes. A relative of yours? Oh, no, no. I just met her tonight. Oh, I'm afraid we've got to contact some relative right away. There's nothing you can do for her, huh? Do for her? Poor kid's been sick for years and waits till she's dying before she comes to a hospital. Well, it takes money to go to a hospital, Doc. Not here. Why didn't she come here? wrong with these people? Are they proud or stupid? Three years ago, maybe we could have done something for her, but now... Well, yeah, I'm... I don't know, Mr. Stone. I don't know. It's, it's completely frustrating. You study medicine, what good does it do? Sometimes life doesn't seem to make any sense. Since when is it supposed to make sense? If I sound like this is my first patient. Not very professional, I'm afraid. <laughs> but don't worry about it. It's human. Now, this girl keeps talking about her husband, Anton... Well, she was talking that way when I met her. Yes, he's supposed to take her away someplace to Mexico. She says where it's warm and she'll get well. What do they expect? Miracles? No, oh, sure. Miracles. Maybe Mexico was going to be her miracle. Do you have any idea how to contact her husband? But, but doesn't the girl know where he is? Doesn't seem to, even when she's not delirious. Got an address from her purse, a place over on Larrabee Street, north of Chicago Avenue. Oh, yes, I know that neighborhood. Furnished rooms with kitchen privileges. Bring your own mousetraps. Lovely. No phone listing. 
I was thinking of calling the police. Yeah. Trouble is, there's so little time. Well, how much time? I don't know. Could happen five minutes from now. Five hours. Well, uh... I'll tell you what, I'll drop by her address and see what I can find out. Doctor, she's conscious again, rational. Oh. She wants to talk to you. All right, nurse. Uh, care to see you, Mr. Stone? Yeah. The doc turned and walked into the room, and I... Well, I followed him. That's a nice promising beginning for a love story with a happy ending, hmm? Only when we got inside Marisha Noack's room, the joke was on me. There was no hearts and flowers. She was even more beautiful than before. <laughs> Black hair spread out on the white pillow, her delicate face and the lovely eyes following us as we came into the room. No fear in those eyes. None at all. Just a sort of questioning. Doctor, have you found him yet? Not yet, Marisha. We're still trying. This is Mr. Stone. He's trying to help us locate your husband. Oh, I hope you find him. Poor Anton. He'll feel so bad if you don't find him in time. Well, of course he will. That's why the doctor would like you to tell me anything you can that might help us find him. But I told the doctor he went to find work, my Anton, so he could take me away where I could get well and could be a wife to him. Does it bother you to talk? Does it tire you? No. No, I like talking about him. And there's so little time. The doctor said you were planning on going to Mexico. To Las Flores little town of the flowers in Veracruz. My ring is from Mexico. See? Silver and turquoise. It's nice. We were married with two rings. Exactly alike. Silver and turquoise. You think Anton could have gone there to Mexico? No. No, he'd never have gone there without me. The little town of the flowers. Like we planned on our honeymoon. Just like it said in the travel folder. Thousands of blossoms on the water, perfuming the air. But we went to a real hotel here in Chicago on our honeymoon. Anton insisted on it, even though we couldn't afford it. It was in the winter, and it was cold in Chicago like now. Icicles hung from the trees, breaking the branches. But in the room, it was warm. And we had each other. <laughs> Look out the window, Marisha. You know, I've, I've never seen the lake from up high. Isn't it beautiful? Oh, Anton. I'm so happy, Anton. But wasn't it extravagant coming here to a hotel? I'd have been just as satisfied going straight to our room. On Larrabee Street? No, nah, Marisha, not on our honeymoon. We'll have time enough for that. How could you possibly imagine anything beautiful from a furnished room on Larrabee oh, Street? Darling. But here, this is different. It's more than a hotel room in Chicago overlooking the lake. This is what we've dreamed of. Imagine it's Las Flores. Oh, yes. The little town of the flowers. Look out there, Marisha. That isn't snow. It's thick tropical foliage. And those aren't icicles hanging from the trees. They're blossoms. And the wind is warm and soft outside. Oh, you'll get well, Marisha. We don't need money. We can live for practically nothing. Fresh fruit growing on trees. All we can oh, eat. Oh, we will go there, Anton. We will. And I'll get well there. I'll be a wife to you, Anton. Just you wait and see. But we didn't go to Mexico. And then Anton went away. And you haven't heard from him since? No. But I don't blame him. Why should a man stay with a wife who's sick? Oh, no, no, no. You, you said yourself he went away to earn money for your trip. Yes. Yes, that's it. But now if I could only see him once more, just once, to tell him not to feel badly, to be happy for what we had, if I could only tell him not to feel sorry, because it was the same as if we really had been to us, Flores. Well, you better rest now. I'll... I'll try to find him. It's tough when they know they're going to die. It's not that they're scared. But suddenly there's something they feel they've got to do when time is running out. That's how it was with Marisha Noack. She had to find her Anton to tell him it was okay about a little town of Mexico that neither one of them had ever seen or ever would see. 
How do you find a guy like that, and what was I doing looking for him? Oh, well. I took a cab back to the loop. I picked up my car and drove over to the Larrabee Street address. It was a rooming house, all right, and the poorest-looking one on the block. I rang the bell and I waited. A middle-aged woman came to the door. What is it? Are you the manager? If you're looking for a room, I got no vacancy. Oh, no, no, I don't want a room. You have someone living here by the name of Noack. Yes, but she ain't home. She ain't been here all day. I know that. Uh, she's in the hospital. The hospital? Oh, the poor thing. I was worried about her. She's never been out late like this. Is her husband here, Anton Noack? Oh, I know. Well, he ain't been here for a long time. Working someplace out of the city, I think. Well, do you have any idea where? I've got to find him. Mrs. Noack is... Well, they don't expect her to live. He's got to be notified. Oh, no. Oh, that poor little girl. For such a long time, she's been sick. Come on in, please. Maybe there's something in here written down. Or maybe Mr. Nowak's brother would know. His brother? Where does he live? Well, no, I don't know exactly. He's the one that's been sending Mrs. Nowak money to live on while her husband's been away. That was a beginning. We found an envelope from the brother in the girl's room, Paul Nowak. He lived on Clark Street in the Lincoln Park neighborhood. I drove over. There was a man coming down the steps as I got out of my car. I stopped him when he got to the sidewalk. I beg your pardon? Yes? I saw you coming out of that building. You wouldn't be Paul Nowak, would you? Why do you ask? Well, I'm from the Chicago Star. I'm trying to locate Anton Nowak. Well, I can't help you. I, I don't know anything about him. Excuse me, I'm late to work. Mr. Nowak! Huh. You are his brother, aren't you? Oh, yes, but I... Well, what's the matter with you? I, I don't know anything about him. He's He's gone away someplace to work. Look, fellow, I gotta find her. Marisha's very sick. Marisha? She's in the hospital. Oh, I, I didn't know. I gotta find your brother right away. I told you, I don't know where he is. My brother and I. Well, we don't see each other. I haven't seen him since he left. But he's written to you. He must have. You've been sending money to his wife. All right. It's none of your business, but I'll tell you. I had one letter from him. He asked me to do what I could for Marisha until he could send for her. Where was the letter from? Say where he was working? Some place in uh, Montreal. He, he didn't give any address. Uh, some uh, fur company like uh, Chicago Montreal Furs. Well, it doesn't sound like you're telling me the truth, Mr. Noack, but I can't see why you'd want a thing like that on your conscience. I'm telling you the truth. Well, okay, but don't take it so hard. Oh, Marisha. My poor kid. Uh, I'll see you the first thing tomorrow. Well, you better make it tonight. I can't. I just can't. We're right in the middle of our tax work. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I see your point. Only thing is that uh, tomorrow she'll be dead. It's not true. The do doctors are notorious for saying things like that. I I, I don't believe it for a uh, minute. Would you believe it if you weren't in the middle of your tax work, Mr. Noy? Now, you have no right to talk to me like that. No right at all. No, I'll not. see you tomorrow, I tell you. I'll see you tomorrow. I'll... You get out of my way. Get out of my way and, and, and stay out of my life. Stay out of my life or you'll regret it, Mr. Stone. Now, what was that for? NBC is presenting Nightbeat, starring Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. A love story with a happy ending. Yes, that's what the man said. Only right at the moment, if there was any happiness in the world, it was staying out of my sight. Almost midnight, and Marisha Nowak up at the hospital, hanging on to life by her fingernails until I could find her husband, Anton. Nothing to go on but the name Anton's brother had thrown at me, the Chicago Montreal Fur Company. I looked it up in the phone book. It was there, all right. I started dialing the number. I didn't imagine anybody be around this time of the night, but it was the only lead I had at the moment. There weren't too many moments left. All I could think about was what the doctor had said. Maybe she's got five hours. Five hours. No, oh, nobody's going to answer. Hello? Hello. Uh, this is a reporter on the Chicago Star. Oh, there's nobody here. All gone home. Uh, look, I'm trying to locate a man who's working for your company. There's nobody here. I'm cleaning woman. Uh, call tomorrow. No, 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 wait, please. Listen, I don't have any time. This is very important. Can you tell me how I can locate the manager of your company? The manager gone home at 5 o'clock. Uh, this is the 
cleaning woman. Oh, yes, yes, I understand that, but can you please tell me the manager's number? I've got to telephone him now. Oh, just a minute. I waited. Seemed like forever while she went for the number. Hello? Yeah, were you able to find it? Uh, George Svonson. Lakeview 42311. Lakeview 42311. Thank you, thank you very much. Oh, tell him I didn't give out the number only because... An emergency. Yes, all right. I'll tell him. Thank you. Goodbye. L A four two three one one. Hello, Mr. Swanson. Yes. I'm sorry to trouble you, Mr. Swanson, but it's very important. My name is Stone. I'm a reporter on the Star. I'm trying to locate a man who works for your company, an Anton Nowak. Uh, uh, we have no one by that name working for what? us. Uh, what, what was that name? Anton Nowak. Never have had since I've been with the company. Of course, we're an old firm. May have been away back. Oh, no. No, no. This would have been in the last year or so. No, sorry. Uh, would you have any way of knowing if he worked at your Montreal branch? We have no Montreal branch. Isn't your company the Chicago Montreal Fur Company? Yeah, that's right. We haven't had a branch in Montreal for years. That used to be our headquarters when the company first started, but we're strictly a Chicago firm now. Oh, I see. Well, thank you very much. I'm sorry to trouble you. Oh, not at all. Oh, uh, if it's going to be printed in the papers, don't forget to mention our name. No, no, I won't. Goodbye, Mr. Swanson. Something was beginning to smell, and it wasn't just the west wind out of the stockyards. I checked the vital statistics on deaths. No Anton Nowak since 44. Checked the police records for amnesia cases. In the central bonding company files, Paul Nowak was listed as a night auditor with the Great Lakes Bank Reserve over on State Street. I drove around to State Street and rang the night bell at the Great Lakes Reserve. The watchman wouldn't let me in, but in a couple of minutes, Nowak came out of the building alone. His face was white as he came toward me. Why did you come here? Well, your brother doesn't work for the Chicago Montreal Fur Company. I thought you'd want to know. No, I don't want to know. I don't want to know anything about him. Your own brother? You have no right to come here. No right, do you hear? This is my work. Well, sure, but I didn't think you'd mind. After all, you've got nothing to hide. Of course I have nothing to hide. They know me here. I'm, I'm respected. I have a position of trust. You, you have no right to come here and make trouble for me. It's taken me years to get where I am. All right, now, just take it easy. Nobody's interested in making trouble for you. But I am interested in finding Anton Nowak, and whether you like it or not, that's what I intend to do. Well, then find him. Find him, only stay away from me. Stay away from my work. I can't help you. I told you that. Now stay away from me. I didn't have time to twist his arm. As a last resort, I headed across town to police headquarters, Bureau of Missing Persons, and my old friend, Sergeant Adams. No, Randy, no, he's never been listed as a missing person. Somebody would have had to report him, his wife or a brother, you know, for us to have a record on him. Yes, yes, Adams, I know that, but the guy is missing. You say you checked the death records. That's right. How about hospital records? Well, there's nothing to go on and not enough time, Adams. I tell you, I've got to find the fellow tonight, tomorrow, the latest. Yeah, yeah, date of disappearance, May 10th, 1948. Did you check the arrest records for that date? Nothing under Noah. Uh-huh, how about John Doe's? John Doe's? No, I never thought of that. Yeah, well, come on, it won't take much time. You never can tell. Yeah, just might be something. Usually you find something on these John Doe's after you had them a while. FBI prints, pictures, or else they just break down and tell us who they are. Of course, if they're just John Doe drunks, <laughs> just a matter of sobering them up. Uh-huh. Right in here, Randy. Hi, Mac. Hello, Adams. Arrest records, 48 May 10th. Okay. You better make it May 11th, too. Uh, you the guy that phoned earlier? Yes, I phoned. Nothing under those names you asked about. Yeah, Mac, yeah, we want to have a look at the John Doe's. Yeah. Here you are. Yeah. May 10th. A's, B's, C's, D. Day. Dalton, Denver, Dill, Doe. Doe, John Doe, drunk. John Doe, drunk. John Doe, drunk. Must have been kind of drunk out there. Yeah, here's one. John Doe, armed robbery. Let me see the file on this one, Mac. 192701. All right. You think there'd be any information in the file? Uh, you never can tell, Randy. Personal property slip sometimes has the information you can use. Here you are. 192701. Mm. And, oh, age 23. Hair, dark eyes, brown. Height 5, 10, 3 quarters. No identifying scars. Well, that, uh, you know, that, mm. that age that age is right. It, it could be no What'd he do? Yeah. Hold up. Hmm. 
captured by the victim. Must have been new at the game. Let's look at what else you got, huh? Yeah, we'll have a look at the personal property list, stuff he had on him when he was booked. Ah, brown suit, white shirt, blue striped tie, no hat, white handkerchief. What is this under jewelry? One only hand ring Indian. Silver and turquoise. What else? Cash, eight cents. Identification? No, no. That's about all. It... Oh, here's a note. <laughs> I guess he was trying to get away. One only travel folder on Mexico. I'd found him. Anton Nowak was John Doe, arrested for robbery May 10th, 1948, convicted and sentenced to Joliet for two to five years, still under the name of John Doe. It was beginning to fit together, sure. He didn't want her to know. That's why he hadn't written. That was the reason for the lie about the job in Montreal. He was afraid it would hurt her. And the prison record, that's why his brother wouldn't tell where he was, afraid that somehow Anton's crime would reflect on his own bank job. I jumped into my car and headed out Ogden Avenue towards Joliet over 30 miles away. It was the middle of the night. I had no idea what I could do when I got there. All I knew was I had to get there fast. Maybe he'd been released. Maybe I could talk the warden into letting him out with me under guard. Maybe I could put a call through to the hospital. He could at least talk to her on the phone. I didn't know. When I got to Joliet, the place was lit up like soldiers feel. The guard took me inside to the warden. He was dressed. He seemed to have been expecting me. Now, you're a little late, Stone. Doesn't anybody go to bed around here? Yeah, the rest of the boys have been and gone. The rest of what boys? The other papers. You mean they got here ahead of me? Yeah, why, of course. The break happened a couple of hours ago. A break? I thought there was something funny about all those lights and everybody being up at this time of the night. Isn't that why you're here? No, no, I came up to see a fellow. What happened? One of the men suddenly decided he wanted out. Grabbed a gun away from a guard and started blasting away. Had to shoot him to stop him. Not an organized break? No, he was alone. Can't understand it. Model prisoner. Coming up for parole in a month. And tonight he just blows up. Poor fellow. Uh, his name wouldn't be John Doe, would it? One of many. How did you know? Well, he might be the fellow who's coming up to see. Chicago number... 192701. Yeah. So that's a shame. He's in a hospital cell down the hall. I see him pretty bad off. I'd like to see him, if you don't mind, Warden. Come on. Thank you. Funny about these John Doe's. Did you know him? No, no, I don't. I, I think I know his wife. Usually something pretty decent about them. Trying to protect their families, mostly. Can't hardly blame them, either. Oh, uh... Hello, Warden. A doctor. This is Mr. Stone. Mm -hmm. One of the Chicago papers. All right, if we go in and talk to him for a minute? Well, I'm afraid it won't make much difference, Warden. Go ahead, Stone. Thank you. Hello, fella. Hi. I don't want to bother you, but I I came up here tonight looking for a fellow named Anton Nowak. My name's John Doe. Yeah, this, uh, this Anton Nowak, I never met him, but from what I hear, he's quite a guy. I wouldn't know. I had it from a girl named Marisha, his wife, I believe. She loved him quite a lot. By the way, that ring you were wearing, where'd you get that? I stole it. Really? Why would anyone steal a cheap little bit of silver and turquoise? I happen to like it. Uh-huh. I saw one like that on a girl once. Uh, it was a wedding ring. The girl liked it, too. This fellow Noak gave it to her, but then he got into some sort of a jam. He had to go away for a while. He didn't tell her anything about what happened. He was afraid it might have hurt her. Would have killed her? No. Would have made her unhappy, maybe. But she would have understood. She loved him an awful lot. She would have been glad he was squaring things up. She, uh, she loved him an awful lot. What do you want, mister? Well, like I said, I was just looking for a fella. Uh, just one question for the paper. I'm sorry I have to ask you, but... How did you happen to pick tonight to break out? Why didn't you wait for your release? I don't know. Something made me. Something kept telling me she needed me. Doctor, quick. Marisha. Flowers on the water. How beautiful in the sunlight. He's gone. Instinctively, I looked down at my watch. 2.35 in the morning. A nice lonely time to make your curtain call. 2.35 a.m. 
Fine little night I've been having. I really felt low. I telephoned the story into the paper and went back to the hospital. I wasn't going to be much help to Marisha Noack, but I promised to come back. The doctor was in the hall working over some reports at the night desk. He looked up when I stepped out of the elevator. Hello, Mr. Stone. Hello, Doc. I found our Anton all right. Hmm? A little too late, though. Uh, dead. Really? Wouldn't have made any difference. She, uh... Yeah? I'm making out the report now. Oh, great. Wasn't so bad, Stone. Wasn't bad at all. She was happy. I've never seen anyone so happy. What did she have to be happy about? Oh, who knows? But right at the last, this, this wonderful smile came across her face. I guess it was delirium. And she kept saying something like, flowers on the water. But how beautiful in the sunlight? Yes, that's what she said. How, how, how did... That you... report that you're making out, Doc, oh. tell me. What was the time of death? Hmm? Tell me, Doc, please. Oh, it's uh, 2.35 a.m. Why? 2.35 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> So here I sit, watching the dawn creeping up on Chicago, tapping out 30 of my story for the night. A love story, no less. A very pessimistic fellow once wrote, When two people really love each other, there can never be a happy ending. Well, it could be. But then again, maybe that pessimistic fellow used one word too many. Maybe when two people really love each other, there can never be an ending. Oh, who knows? You pays your money, you takes your choice. Copy, boy. Night Beat, a new dramatic series stars Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. Night Beat is edited by Larry Miss and directed by Warren Lewis. Music is by Frank Worth. Others in tonight's cast were Joyce McCluskey, Vic Perrin, Jack Edwards, Jerry Hosner, Rena Craig, Larry Dobkin, and Charles Seal. Frank Lovejoy will next be seen in Milton Sperling's production, Rock Bottom, released by Warner Brothers. Listen next week at this same time and every week as Randy Stone searches through the city for the strange stories waiting for him in the darkness. The stories that come out of the shadows to find their way into Night Beat. more great action-packed entertainment for you throughout the week on NBC. Other mystery adventure programs include such popular shows as Dragnet, High Adventure, and Christopher London. And now, tonight's presentation of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Sus. Tonight, we bring you a story of the death of a postman and the search for a missing letter. We call it The Seventh Letter. So now, starring Stacey Harris, here is tonight's suspense play, The Seventh Letter. Seven L thirty two request detectives at corner Hatteras and Roblar streets. Notify the coroner. The place, a suburban residential area near a large city in Southern California. The time. 4.15 a.m. The body of a man had been found by a police patrol unit. The body was dressed in the blue-gray of the post office department, and a truck belonging to that department was at the curb. A letter box nearby had been unlocked and stood open. Six letters from that box were on the sidewalk near the body. The postman had been on a collection run. 
someone had stopped him from completing that run by placing a knife in his back. Ninety seconds after the police officer contacted communications, the message was relayed to a divisional detective bureau. Well, why don't you tell me once more, don't you? Yes. I've already told you. Yeah, I've got I it. I don't believe that, Larch. Hatteras and Roblar. The truth. Right. Now, come on, Larch. Tell me, what were you doing in that alley? I told you I couldn't sleep, so I took a walk. In an alley at 3.30 in the morning? I was on my way home when those officers... Now, don't lie to me, mister. You know what you were doing behind those houses, don't know why. I wasn't doing anything. Were the lights on in any of them? I... I didn't know. Now, come on, level with me, mister. I am. Lieutenant. In a minute. Large, how long have you been married? Two years. Practically a newlywed, huh? How's your wife going to feel about you now? Huh? Please, I've never been in any trouble. Say before. What? Before. Say it. Before. Okay, now you're learning. What is it, so? Hot one just came in. We'd better roll. All right, have Johnson book this peeping Tom. Oh, no, please, I've got a family. I've got Get responsibilities. Him out of here. Let's go, mister. Please. I'll meet you out in the hall. I was only taking a walk. You can explain it to the court in the morning. You don't believe me either, do you? Doesn't matter what I believe. The lieutenant said book you. Hey, Johnson? Yeah? I'll pray for him. What? The lieutenant. I'll pray for him. What's the charge, Saul? Bag, prowler. Empty your pockets, mister. Put your stuff on the counter. Everything? Everything. Saul, what do we got? 32, found a body. Mm -hmm. Lieutenant, you really think you should book that man? He wasn't on private property. No one called in a complaint. Tomorrow morning, he'll walk out of here congratulating himself. And tomorrow night, he'll be back on his window rod. What makes you so sure? Saul, you ever committed a felony? No. You ever want to do? Well, uh... everybody has. What stopped you? <laughs> I guess I was afraid I'd be caught. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what keeps most of them in line. The rest are too dumb to be afraid of the law. They got a wire crossed. Figure they can outsmart it. But nobody's completely honest, huh, Lieutenant? Nobody, so. Oh, come on. Now, you don't really... Look, when you've been here a while, you won't argue with me. Where's that body? Hatteras and Roblar. What? What's the matter? I live on Hatteras, just a block from that corner. <laughs> The time, 4.43 a.m. Lieutenant Joseph Carter and Sergeant Saul Morris arrived at the suburban intersection. A few minutes later, a unit from the department's crime lab arrived, followed by a postal inspector. By checking the collection times indicated on the mailbox, the time of death was set at 2.55 a.m. The uniformed officers searched the area, but the murder weapon was not found. The time, 5.07 a.m. You find out anything, Mac? Yeah, Lieutenant. Lots of sound sleepers in this neighborhood. Well, is that all? Well, that's it. Nobody heard nothing. Okay. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Saul? Uh, coming, Lieutenant. Yeah. Well, how about it? Where's his ID? The coroner got it off his driver's license. Here. Henry R. Gilligan, 1514 West Latham, age 52. Case of accident, notify Elizabeth Gilligan. Well, see, it's somebody does that, huh, so? Yes, sir. Oh, do you have anything else in his pockets? Mm, just the usual keys, cigarettes, matches, some money. Mm -hmm. How much? Seventeen dollars and some change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, Lieutenant. Yes, Inspector? The crime lab boys want to take those letters downtown. Well, that's your department. Oh, it's all right. But you can't hold up the mail, you know. I'll have to have them back this afternoon. You'll have them. How many letters did you find? Six. Any of them have a return address on the envelope? All but one. I made a list of the letters, who they were going to, and the five return addresses. Well, I'd appreciate a copy if it isn't too much trouble. Oh, no, no, no. No trouble at all. I'll do it right away. Okay to take the body in? Yeah, they can have him. All right, come on, you guys. Give me a hand. All right, here. Yeah. Sure doesn't look 52. I guess that's from being outside so much. Yeah. Neither snow, nor rain, nor heat, nor gloom of night stays these couriers. What's that? Something a Greek historian wrote. Oh. Starting to get light. Yeah. You 
want a cigar? No, thanks. You see that white picket fence down there? Yeah, I believe I do. At your place? Mm hmm. A boy and I painted that fence last Sunday. Sure seems funny. A murder in a section like this. Oh, how do you mean? Well, it's such a nice, quiet neighborhood. Well, that's what we're looking for. Hmm? Nice, quiet killer. <laughs> After a final word with the postal inspector, the two detectives drove slowly through the nearby streets. Another mailbox was located three blocks from the intersection of Hatteras and Roblar. At 5.52 a.m., they checked back into division headquarters. All right, Saul, let's get on that report, huh? Right. I sure can't figure out why anybody would want to kill a postman. No? You got an angle? Johnson? Yeah, Lieutenant? Who's the screamer? His name's Gillis. Narcotics picked him up a few minutes ago. The doc's looking him over. Hope they don't keep him down here all night. They won't. Sal. Hmm? Sal, suppose you'd mailed a letter down there last night. After the 8.30 pickup. Yeah? Long about midnight, you decided you wanted it back. What would you have done? Well, I'd have been there at 2.55 and asked Gilligan to return it to me. Yeah, except he wouldn't have given it back to you. Once a letter's mailed, it's against postal regulations to return it. Mm -hmm. Well, then I'd have forgotten about it. Would you? Or would you have killed to get it back? Ah, oh, now, Lieutenant. What could anybody write in a letter that'd be that important? I don't know, so. I don't know, but somebody does. You think that's what happened? Well, what else could it be? Seven letters were mailed, Sol. The person that mailed the seventh was waiting there when Gilligan arrived. Saw Gilligan take the mail out of the box, and he approached him, asked him for his letter. Gilligan refused to give it to him. They argued, and one thing led to another, and the knife ended the argument. The mail was rifled, the letter found. Whoever did it went home to bed. It sounds good. It is good. Look, we know six people mail letters in that box. We've got the letters, right? Yeah. Okay. We find the person that mailed that seventh letter. We got our killer. By checking the city directory, they made a list of the families living in the area nearest the mailbox at Hatteras and Roblar. The list was then sent to the records bureau where a make was run on every person on it between the ages of 14 and 70. After being relieved by the day watch, Carter reported to his superior and advanced his theory concerning the death of the postman. He was told to check it out. The time, 8.24 a.m. Joe? Yeah, Louise. We're in the kitchen. Clark, we heard all about it on the news. Oh, it's so. Yeah, boy, I'm murdered right in our own block. Are you going to catch him? I'm going to try. You know who did it? Bobby. Sit down and finish your breakfast. Oh, golly. You want to eat before you go to bed, Joe? Not going to bed this morning. You're not? Mm. Oh, when are you going to sleep? Tonight. I've been put on days a while. So you can catch the murderer, huh? Boy, I hope you get it before money so I can kill all the kids at school. Bobby, if you finish, go outside and play. Huh? Oh, Pop. Bobby, Jimmy's out in his backyard. Okay, Mom. If you promise, you'll look around for my scout knife. All right, dear, I'll look. See you later, Pop. Maybe Jimmy and me will go down to the corner and see the blood. Here's your coffee, Joe. Thanks. If you want anything besides the cereal, you'll have to fix it. Oh, what's the matter? Same old thing. Another one of your headaches? Mm-hmm. Did you call the doctor? Yeah, I have an appointment at nine. Margaret's taking me. Hmm. Margaret Richards? Yeah. Joe, if you're going to take off your coat, take that gun off, too, will you? Put it somewhere. All right. Now, what'd you do last night? Bobby and I went over to Mrs. Gaither's for a while. She was having one of those cooking ware parties. What time did you get to sleep? About three. I was reading. You better start getting more rest or you'll wind up back in that sanitarium. What do you want me to do, Joe? Just sit here every night with my hands folded? I'm tired of looking at okay. these walls. Okay. You're never okay. home except to sleep. Even when you are, you don't take me All out. All right. You... All right. Forget it, huh? 
Hand me the milk, will you? Thanks. Well, when you get back, I got a list I want you to take a look at. What list is that? Suspects. You know most of them. Well, let me see it now. Oh, yeah. John and Nancy Robinson, Bert and Margaret Rick. But, well, Joe, these are neighbors, friends of ours. Well, one of them killed that postman. Well, if you believe that, you shouldn't be on this case. Well, why not? Because of Bobby and me. We live here, too, you know. You can't make a friend one day and have your husband suspect him of being a, a criminal the next. One of them has done big time. I don't believe it. Well, ask your friend, Bert Richards. Bert? Margaret's husband? Mm hmm. He did two years for assault. Are you sure? Sure, I'm sure. I ran a make on all of them. When was he in? Four years ago. Well, then Margaret knows. She's never told me. I want you to ask Margaret if Bert mailed a letter after 8.30 last night. What if he did? Well, we found six letters down at the corner. I think seven were mailed. I've got to go. Will you ask her for me? I'm coming, Margaret. Louise? I, I don't know, Joe. I don't know. I'll have to think about it. Hi. Oh, well, Louise. You don't look sick. Well, I, I'm not really sick. Oh, well, I'm <laughs> In here, Bobby. Jimmy Claymore and me went down the corner. There wasn't no blood or nothing. I know. How do you figure you're going to catch that murderer, Pop? You got a plan? Yeah. Boy, I sure wish I could help you. Well, maybe you can, Bobby. If you really want to. If I want to? Pop! Okay, okay. Now, you got to promise not to talk about any of this to anybody. Well, I promise God's honor. Okay, that's fine, Bobby. What do you want me to do first? Well, I got to find out a few things about our neighbors, Bob. Like what? Well, like... Jimmy's father worked nights and days. Uh, days. He switched over a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. well, why don't you ask Jimmy if his father mailed a letter late last night, huh? A letter? Why? Because I got to know the name of every person who was near that corner between 8.30 last night and 2.55 this morning. Oh. In case somebody saw the killer, huh, Pop? That's right, son. Well, he... If somebody did, don't you think he'd come and tell you? Mm, might not. Might be afraid to. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'll ask him, only... Only what, Bobby? Well, I already know somebody who went down to that corner late last night. Oh? Who? Mom. Your mother? What'd you go down there for? To mail a letter. <laughs> Listening to the seventh letter, tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Wednesday night is your night for excitement with the FBI in Peace and War, and tomorrow night is no exception. Since the police chief is all set to use his information as the inside man to expose the bosses of a gambling ring. If you like your entertainment on the active side, don't miss the thrills when the FBI in peace and war declares war on a group of corrupt officials tomorrow night at this time. Remember, the FBI in peace and war is yours to hear every Wednesday night over most of these same stations. And now we bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Stacy Harris, starring in tonight's production, The Seventh Letter, a tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. The time, 8.47 a.m. 
After learning that his wife had left a house late the night before to mail a letter, Carter checked the list of the six letters found near the postman's body. Five of the letters held the return address. The sixth was addressed to a Mr. James Young in care of a local hotel. Carter had never heard of Mr. Young. Time, 9.57 a.m. Louise Carter and her friend Margaret Richards had left the doctor's office and entered a nearby drugstore. Want some cream in your coffee, Margaret? With this figure? No, thanks. <laughs> I wish I could gain a few pounds. Doctor does, too. What did he say? Are you all right? Oh, yes, yes. He says I worry too much. Yeah, don't we all? Yeah. Louise, is, um, is Joe investigating that murder? Yes. He's working with the homicide department on it. Well, Bert wanted me to ask you. He's, uh, he's got a crazy idea that he might be a suspect. Bert? Well, for heaven's sakes, why? Well, I... Look, Louise, I... I never told this to another soul in our neighborhood. And if you weren't my dearest friend, oh, I'd never... You can trust me. You know you can. Well, a few years ago, Bert got into a fight. When he was getting the worst of it, he picked up a bottle to defend himself. Of course, he didn't hurt anybody with it, but they arrested him just the same. How long was he in? Oh, just overnight. Just as soon as they knew all the circumstances, but they even apologized. Oh. <laughs> well, if it wasn't serious. Of course it wasn't. But try and convince Bert. See, he's afraid Joe will find out about that and, you know, get the wrong idea. Well, you tell Bert he hasn't a thing to worry about. Oh, thanks, honey. As a matter of fact, Joe's looking for someone who mailed a letter in that box last night. A letter? Mm-hmm. What is it? I sent Bert down to mail a letter just after midnight. Ten fifteen a.m. Carter checked with the homicide men assigned to the case. Mrs. Gilligan had been unable to furnish them with any possible motive for her husband's murder. And according to her, Gilligan had had no known enemies. The autopsy report showed that the wound had been made by a pocket or switchblade knife. 10.47 a.m., Carter arrived at the crime lab. He was joined there by the postal inspector. They were informed that none of the envelopes had held a clear set of fingerprints. 11.05 they examined the letter addressed to James Young. Certainly nothing distinctive about the envelope, is there? No. Inspector, could you open it, please? Oh, sure. Looks like a greeting card of some kind. I hope it's one of those funny ones. Here you are. Happy birthday from Uncle Bert and Aunt Margaret. Well, that isn't very original. Is it any help, Lieutenant? Lieutenant? No, no, it's not very original. Is it any help? Oh, no, no. Well, that's the way it goes. I might as well put these letters in my briefcase. I didn't know Gilligan, but some of the boys who did thought the best of him. They can't imagine why anyone would want to kill him. No. Neither can I. We're all hoping you catch the person that did it. Yeah. Now, you ready, Inspector? Yes, indeed. You call us any time. We'll always do our best to help. There was no doubt left in his mind now. He knew who had written the seventh letter. The time, 12.01 p.m. He arrived home. Boys? Hi, Pop. Oh, where's your mother? Is she back yet? No, she'll be home soon. She called a few minutes ago. What are you taking everything out of your dresser for? Well, I'll put it all back. Well, just don't forget. Hey, Pop. Yeah? Have you seen my scout knife? I seen your what? My scout knife. Mom promised to help me find it, but she never did. No, when would you lose it? Oh, I don't know. We have a troop meeting this afternoon, and I want... Hey, hey, is that Mom? Bobby, if it is your mother. Yeah, I'll ask Bobby, her. wait, come here. Yeah? Look, I've got something important to say to your mother. But this is important. 
important, too. Our meeting's at 1.30. Bobby. You want to help me catch that murderer, don't you? Well, sure. Then you stay here, son. Oh, Joe, I didn't know you were home. Where's Bobby? He's in his room. The doctor gave me another prescription. Some pills for my nerves. And you... You should have heard Margaret lying about Bert. According to her, he was only in jail overnight. You asked her about him, huh? Yes. She say anything about him mailing a letter last night? Yes. Well, did he? She said that he did, yes. Hmm. Looks like he killed that man, doesn't it? Does it? I, I won't change my dress. Did you fix Bobby any lunch? No. You want anything? Not now. Louise? Hmm? What could be written in a letter that would be worth a man's life? Oh, really, Joe, I haven't time to play games. This is no game. Well, I... I, I don't know. You lie. Joe. You mailed a letter last night. No. Don't lie to me, Louise. Bobby told me. Bobby you told you? You questioned Bobby about me? I was one of your suspects, but instead of coming to me, you questioned Bobby? Louise, tell me about the letter. All my life I've heard that a man had to have something wrong with him to want to be a cop, but I never believed it till now. <gasps> Now, this morning, this morning you knew what I was looking for, but you didn't open your mouth. Just now, you were going to let me believe Bert Richards killed that man, and we both know who did. No. You know something about it? Come on, Louise, what was in that letter? I didn't mail any letter. I'll get Bobby in here. I'll find out which one of you is lying. Joe, wait. I, I, I went out to mail it. I told Bobby I was going to, but I... I changed my mind before I got to the corner. Is that the truth? Well, if it isn't, you'd beat it out of me, wouldn't you? Where's the letter now? It's in my purse. Is this it? Yes. It's to your sister. And I wish I'd mailed it. Dear Belle, just a note to let you know I understand and appreciate your thoughts about Joe and me. But it's too late. Too many things have happened. I've made up my mind to leave him. You've what? Here. Come on. You finish reading it. No, please. Go on, read it. For a while just after I came out of the sanitarium, I... Oh, Joe. No, go on, Louise, go on. Joe was his old self. But that lasted only a few days. It's hard for me to tell you about Joe... And the way he treats me. But his only love is his job and the power that goes with it. He hasn't time for me or for Bobby. He's forgotten how to be a husband. Oh, Joe, I can't. I can't. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Are you sure? Okay. Thanks for calling. I found out who killed the postman. It's a man named Gillis, an addict. He decided to talk after being off the stuff all day. Last night he thought he was being tailed, so he... he he dropped some stuff he was holding into the mailbox, and when he went back to get it, the, the postman refused to give it to him. Louise? I, I don't suppose there's anything I can say? No. You sure it's too late? I mean, the, there's just no chance at all? Why didn't you mail that letter last night? 
told you, Joe, I changed my mind. Why? Why? What, what was the reason? Mom, aren't you going to help me find my knife? Don't you know, Joe? Or have you forgotten about him, too? Come on, Bobby, dear, I'll help you. Come on. Suspense. In which Stacy Harris starred in tonight's presentation of The Seventh Letter. Be sure to listen again next week when we bring you another presentation of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed in Hollywood by Anthony Ellis. Tonight's story was written by Charles B. Smith. The music was composed by Lucian Morawieck and directed by Wilbur Hatch. Featured in the cast were John Daner, Harley Fair, Victor Perrin, George Walsh, Vivi Janis, Richard Beals, Paula Winslow, and Jim Nusser. The life of an insurance investigator may be dangerous, but it's thrilling too, and you can hardly blame yours truly, Johnny Dollar, for pursuing his unusual career. Nor can anyone blame you for following Johnny Dollar as he moves around from clue to clue until every case of mayhem or fraud that he tackles is finally solved. Five nights a week, yours truly, Johnny Dollar, will keep you in a state of high suspense as he ferrets out the chiselers, the crooks, and even the killers who think they have executed a perfect crime. Don't miss a single exciting chapter of Johnny's current case. Listen for yours truly, Johnny Dollar, every Monday through Friday night over most of these same stations. Stay tuned for five minutes of CBS News to be followed on most of these same stations by My Son Jeep. America listens most to the CBS Radio Network. Adventures of the Saint, starring Vincent Price. The Saint, based on characters created by Leslie Charteris, and known to millions from books, magazines, and motion pictures. The Robin Hood of modern crime now comes to radio, starring Hollywood's brilliant and talented actor Vincent Price as The Saint. Taxi! Taxi! Uh, 4,500 Sutter, please. It's uh, kind of light, ain't it? Yes, it is. Uh, it comes this time of night, I figure a guy should order... Uh, 4,500 uh... Sutter, please. Yeah. Mind you, I, uh, I don't like to get personal. You Driver. Know, but, uh, yeah? Of all the cabs in San Francisco, most of them operated by drivers who mind their own business. Why did I have to get your cab? Well, I like... Who are you going to see at 4,500? My name is Simon Templer. I'm six foot one inches tall, and I have a birthmark on my right shoulder blade. My income for last That's year was... That's all right. Evading the question, huh? I give up. I'm going to visit a man named Clarence Quigley. Clarence Quigley? Clarence Quigley. Uh-huh. Uh, 
You're going to see this uh, alleged Clarence Quigley look, about... Look, he's got a collection of paintings. I like to look at paintings. Maybe that will seem odd to you, but... Oh, uh... come, come now. No temper. Now, if I was your wife, you'd have to do better than that, you know. Oh. So how much do I owe you? And go away. Well, would you think I was soaking you if I suggested three bucks? I would. As uh, one man of the world to another, let's uh, make it three bucks anyway. Let's just be yokels and make it 50 cents. Here you are. Well, I... Hey. Hey, is that blonde giving you the eye of me? Blonde? Yeah, the one coming down the street towards us. Oh, yeah. Best, uh, best foot forward. I never saw her before in my life. Ellsworth, dear. Oh, Ellsworth, dear. Uh, uh, I beg your pardon, but that's my neck you've got your arms around, Miss... Uh, a man named Clarence Quigley, huh? Driver, stop heckling. Look, Miss, whatever your name is, the way you're strangling me is a pleasant way to be strangled, oh, but... Uh, Ellsworth, dear, you... You sound so cool. I'm not Ellsworth, dear. I think I can honestly say I have never been Ellsworth, dear. You're not? No. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were. Or maybe I just hoped you were. Uh, don't you know Ellsworth, dear, when you see him? No, I don't, I guess. But, uh... I saw you and then the name came to me, so I just thought... Uh, who is Ellsworth? I don't know. Well, I suppose a certain amount of confusion about uh, who or what Ellsworth is is understandable, but... that but isn't the worst. It isn't? No, you... See, not only don't I know who Ellsworth is, but... Yes? I don't even know who I am. I want to know in a general sort of way is uh, how Mr. Clarence Quigley is going to feel. Driver, would you mind concentrating on your driving? Uh, you know, he's liable to be frustrated, like uh, I'm taking you and a lady right back to where you started. My apartment, yes, because Miss, uh, Miss X needs help. Oh, I feel as though I'm imposing on you, Mr. Tim. Nonsense. The hour's late. You couldn't very well go wandering about the streets indefinitely. Especially in that hat. Anything wrong with my head? Not a thing. No, it's very charming and immaculate. Yeah, also, it resembles a bird's home away from home. Well, mister, we have returned from where we went away. Good. Miss X? Thank you. Huh? You're going to keep on being a yokel, huh? Here. Mm-hmm. This time only half a yokel. Well, goodbye. You know where I'm going? No. I'm going to lurk outside of Clarence Quigley's. I think tonight he's a fellow who needs a friend. <laughs> I need one, too. Oh, come along now. There you go. Now, take your hat off and make yourself comfortable. All right. Oh, I'm so afraid. And oh, lost. quiet now. Now, let's take a look at your back. Here. Mm-hmm. Usual odds and ends. And they're compact, initialed, dm DM, does that suggest anything? DM? Mm. No. No, it doesn't. Nothing means anything. All I remember is being outside an art gallery on Sutter. Hey, you're well dressed. Compact's gold, no latch key, which means you probably don't live alone, which could also mean you've been missed. You're phoning? Yes, the police. Missing Persons Bureau. They, uh, uh, hello? Oh, get me Inspector Murray, hmm? Thanks. I'll hold on. I hope maybe they know about me. Oh. What's the matter? Oh, I just touched the back of my head. It's terribly painful. Come here. Huh. Yeah, bruise the size of what I wish my bank account was. And there's the cause of your amnesia. Uh, hello, Inspector. Uh, Simon Templer. Hmm? Hmm? <laughs> Inspector, your language is deplorable. Inspector, I'm looking for someone, a blonde. Uh, Inspector, no. No, well... Maybe, but not tonight. At any rate, the girl I'm looking for is around 22 years old, blonde hair, blue eyes, height five foot three inches and thereabouts, wearing a street suit, brown, white blouse with ruffles at the neck and... What? Oh, oh you're looking for her too. Her name's Dorothy Moore. Uh, why do you want her? Oh, I see. <laughs> I, I guess you've got priority. <laughs> Goodbye. They want me. Yes, yeah, so it seems. Because I've been reported missing? Partially that. What else do they want me for? Murder. Now, 
try another cup of coffee. Dorothy, I, well, I guess we'll call you that unless we get evidence to the contrary. Dorothy Moore would fit the initials on your compact. What am I going to do? You stay here and wait for me. Where are you going? Well, from the information I've been able to get on the phone, your guardian, a man named Matthew Schreiber, was shot and killed earlier this evening. You disappeared. That's all the information in the public domain at the moment. I'm going to look for more. At my house? Yes. Oh, shouldn't you turn me over to the police? Well, actually, I don't really know that you are, Dorothy Moore. I'd like to know a little more about the murder itself before coming to any decisions. You mean you want to help me? Yes. And I need help, so, because... You see, what's so terrible about it all is that... I don't remember anything at all, so... I can't even say I didn't murder anyone. <laughs> Hello. Well, it's been fun meeting you. Goodbye. Now, wait a minute. Don't shut the door. Why not? I'm coming in. Oh. Uh, all right. I uh, hate to seem prying, but uh, who are you? Uh, Simon Templer. Yeah, an attractive name. Much more distinguished than mine. Oh, what's your name? Walters. Not the most glamorous name in the world, but I'm a butler, so I bear up. Good. Where is everybody? In the library. They're so well-bred. Oh, uh, who is in the library? Mrs. Atkins, the housekeeper, the Cassandra of our day. A gloomy lady prophesying disaster, hmm? Yes. And, of course, there's Mr. Tinsley. Mr. Tinsley? A strange fellow who spends a good deal of his time sitting on small horses and hitting a large ball with a long wooden stick. A polo player. Doesn't matter what you call it, it's no job for a grown man. Uh, what's his relationship to Miss Moore? Oh, well, let's not start prying, shall we? Expound. Well, to breach your confidence, he's engaged to marry Miss Moore. If and when she's found, and if she happens to be innocent of our guardian's assassination. Oh. Anyone else in the library? No, no, no. Mr. Schreiber, dear departed soul, is detained elsewhere at the morgue. He was shot in the library. Oh, that's a bad place to be shot. Usually fatal. Uh, suppose you take me to the library. Tell me, why did the police suspect Miss Moore? Because of me. You see, I told them that I heard shots in the house. I left my quarters on the gallop, ran towards the library. Just before I got there, the door opened and Miss Dorothy ran out. Ran down the hall and out the front door. Is that true? My dear Mr. Templer, if not, would I have told the police otherwise? I don't know. Besides, it, <laughs> it isn't good form to suspect the butler. The library, sir. Okay. Mrs. Atkins, Mr. Tinsley, Mr. Templer. What do you want? I'm looking for Miss Moore. So, young man, are the police. Why? Her guardian was murdered. All his money goes to her, and she's disappeared. Perhaps she didn't murder Mr. Schreiber. But you wouldn't bet on it. <laughs> Perhaps I did. I hated him. Perhaps Mr. Tinsley there did. Now, now, look here. Isn't he priceless? Now, look here. Such a typical phrase. So typical, I wonder if he can really be so stupid. I love Dorothy and... No there's... one has questioned that. But what is it about her that you love? The money she was to get when Mr. Shriver died? The money you wouldn't have got if you'd married Dorothy? Against Mr. Schreiber's wishes? Mr. Schreiber didn't approve of the marriage? He, uh, well, he hesitated about it, but uh, we were working on it. And then became impatient. Now, look here, there you have... Again. I resent that. Good. It is now on record that you resent it. Uh, how about Walters? Walters? Yes, what motive would he have? What makes you think he has one? Oh, I'm the hopeful type. Walters is a man with a criminal past. Whether or not he got tired of his upright life here, I cannot say. But it wouldn't surprise you. What may surprise both of you, however, is an odd fact. Dorothy Moore is suffering from total amnesia. Amnesia? What do you mean? She remembers nothing of her past, herself, neither name nor habitation. How horrible. How convenient. Wait a minute. How do you know that? Why oh, get around? Well, then you must know where she is. You've got to tell me. Mr. I... Tinsley is now being the ardent lover. I can't tell you. Why? Well, whoever shot Schreiber, there's very little doubt that Dorothy saw the killer, but Dorothy doesn't remember. The killer, therefore, would have an urgent interest in getting hold of Dorothy before she did remember. 
and making sure that she would never remember anything again. Well, uh, good night, you lovely people. Dorothy. Dorothy? Dorothy? Dorothy! It's me again. Did you like the place so much the first time? Where's Dorothy? Miss Moore? Yes, did she come back here? Back? From where? She was at my apartment. When I got there, she was gone. She did come back here. She didn't ring. Let's find out. Tinsley and Mrs. Atkins still around? Mrs. Atkins has gone up to bed, I think. As for Mr. Tinsley, I imagine he's sampling the whiskey. We'll find out. Uh, Tinsley, uh... Uh, Oh, it's you. Yes, where's Dorothy? You're the one who knows. I'm the one who knew. Did she come back here? I haven't seen her. Walters, where's Mrs. Atkins' room? This way, sir. Now, come along, Tinsley. I'd like both of you in sight. Sir, if you insist. Mrs. Atkins will not be pleased at having her sleep interrupted. I'm not pleased either. Uh, this is her room, sir. Oh, thanks. girl must be asleep. Yeah, then we must wake her up. Oh, she's a very sound sleeper. Yeah, then we'll go in and wake her. Oh. Wow. Well, how do you like that? Mrs. Atkins. Strung up to a beam. Anyone got a knife? Yes. Yes, here you are. Now, we'll cut the rope and get her down. The bed's over there. Uh-huh. Oh. Well, that's that. Is she dead? She's dead. Poor old girl. Although, you know something? What? She must have killed the old man. Shriver, I mean. Then she committed suicide. In in remorse, I mean. For heaven's sakes, Templar, stop playing with that rope. This is a very interesting rope. Is it? Why? Because it proves, you see, that she didn't commit suicide. She was murdered. Yes, Inspector Murray. I understand you don't think that Mrs. Atkins committed suicide. I know she didn't. Well, while the boys are playing with fingerprints and stuff, uh, would you mind explaining to a poor benighted member of the lower intellectual classes, uh, I mean, uh, a cop like me... Oh, Murray, now stop pulling my leg. You're one of the brainiest men I know. Then why do you always beat me to a case? Oh, I'm prettier. Uh Uh-huh. Now, about this alleged phony suicide... Well, take a look at the rope with which Mrs. Atkins is supposed to have hanged herself. Now, let's see. The rope was thrown over the beam there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid you're right, Templer. Yeah, it wasn't hard to spot. Her weight would have pulled the rope sharply down over the beam. The fibers of the rope, therefore, should have slanted upward. Uh, Instead of which, they slant down, indicating that somebody put the rope around Mrs. Atkins' neck and then hauled her up. We were supposed to think that Mrs. Atkins committed suicide as a confession of guilt. Which leaves us where? In the Schreiber home. I'm more interested in where the girl is. Dorothy Moore? Uh Uh-huh. Why? Because I have... Hey, Mary. Look, coming through the door. I'm not sure. Simon. Oh, hello, Dorothy. I don't know exactly how I got here, but I don't recognize the place at all. Yet I should, shouldn't I? Yes, you should, Miss Moore. Because this is where you live. But I'm afraid you're not going to stay very long. What do you mean? I'm placing you under arrest on suspicion of murder. You know, I love police headquarters. They're so romantic. Uh Uh-huh. Mary... How are you going to prove anything against that girl if she's suffering total amnesia? By proving that her amnesia is a fake. Oh, how? I have an alienist coming over here to look at one of our guests. I'll have him see Miss Moore, too. He's due any minute. I'll go get the girl now. 
<laughs> I wonder. Through the other door. Come in. Hello. Well, you're not Murray. I was supposed... Who are you? Doll, of course. Now, what's the matter with you? What are you complaining oh, about? But I'm not oh, the one... Oh, come, that... come. We've got to get to the bottom of these things, don't we? I suppose so. Now, when you were a little boy, what did you want most of all? To be a big boy. Mm-hmm. Are you afraid of the dark? No. No? You are not afraid because uh, you have little friends who come to you in the dark, perhaps, eh? No. Now, why are you afraid of the dark? Oh, it's a long, long story. And, uh... You know, um, you don't look at all well. Well, I don't feel so good either. No, you should see a doctor. Thank you, thank you. I think I will. <laughs> uh, goodbye. Oh, uh, Templar. Yeah, uh, your alienist was here, Murray, but he he left. Alienist? Mm. Well, I just phoned him and told him not to come. The district attorney wouldn't hold the girl. Insufficient evidence and ballistics and ran a paraffin test. No proof that she'd fired a gun. But uh, the man who was just in here, Dahl, I think his name was? Dahl? Uh -huh. He's not the alienist. He's the guy the alienist was coming to examine. He's nuts. Oh, dear. Hmm. Well, I guess you're happy now that we can't hold the girl. No, no, because while you were holding her, things were safe. Now, Murray, let's go visit. Go visit where? The Schreiber house. A house where two people have died. A house very convenient for murder. Yes? Uh... Ah, it's no ours, Walters. We're coming in. Yes, sir. Dorothy's home? Yes, sir. She got here when? Ten minutes ago, perhaps. Well, we'll go to the library. Yes, sir. She got here ten minutes ago, and... And then? She sat in this room for a few minutes, uh -huh. made a phone call, and went up to bed. She uh, tried to phone you, Mr. Templer. I'll wake her up and get her down here. Uh, hold on. Uh, Tinsley around? In the guest room, playing solitaire, I think. Get him down here, too. That I will, sir. And Walters. Yes? You come back, too. Sure. Having fun, Temper? I don't care very much for this stage of any case, but I... What are you doing with that telephone? Hiding it under the couch here. Are you being subtle again? Again? Oh, you flatter me. Simon. Uh, hello, Dorothy. Sorry to have had you wake, oh, but... Oh, I... I wasn't asleep. I was trying to remember. Uh, you will if you get the chance. Tinsley's here in the house, isn't he? Yes, he is. For uh, heaven's sakes, is a man never to get any peace? Uh, you know Inspector Murray, Mr. Tinsley? Oh, yes. The policeman. Oh, look, now get off your polo pony and... Where's Walters? By now, on his way to Canada, I imagine. Dorothy, get on the phone right away. The phone? Yes, mm -hmm. of course. Oh, well, there doesn't seem to be one in here. Perhaps in the next room. Why do you want me to phone? I don't. But you just said... Dorothy, didn't there used to be a phone in this room? Well, I don't know. I don't remember. Oh, yes, yes, you're amnesia. But you remember everything that happened since the blow on your head, don't you? Well, of course. But then equally, of course, since you were in this room a very little while ago, and since you you used a phone in here, you should have remembered that. Why didn't you? Well, I don't know. It slipped my mind. No, Dorothy, it didn't slip your mind. You were merely being over-careful. What does that mean? It means that you are not now, nor ever were, suffering from amnesia. Why should I pretend to have amnesia? Because you killed your uncle. You knew you'd need something to help you out in court, so you wandered about until you found someone on whom you could try out your amnesia. That happened to be me. Oh, you're just saying those things without proof. Besides, there was a paraffin test. It indicates merely that you wore gloves when you shot your uncle. It indicates I might have worn them if I'd shot him. You can't prove I did. I can prove your amnesia was phony, that along with some other things. How can you prove it? Very simple. Your hat. What? When you arrived at my apartment, you took your hat off discovered a large bruise on the back of your head. That was to supply a plausible reason for your amnesia. But, Dorothy, as I remarked to the cab driver at the time, your hat was immaculate, untouched. <laughs> You're asking us to believe that the killer knocked you out and then carefully put your hat back on your head again? I'm not asking you to believe anything. I'm going. Oh, what a charming revolver. The one you used on your uncle? It still has bullets in it, so don't try to stop me. Dorothy, you didn't ask me how I could be so sure the killer hadn't done that business with your hat. I don't care. 
I'm so sure because of Walter's statement. Remember, he saw you rush out immediately after the shot? All right, you're smart, but you'll never stop me. Perhaps not, but Walter's, who's right behind you, oh, will. Oh, no, you can't fool me with He that. wasn't trying to, Miss Dorothy. <laughs> I think I... I'd better... What? You know, gentlemen, you knocked Miss Moore out with a bottle. Yes, sir, but... But you said you were going to Canada. You misunderstood me, sir. I merely said I was going to get some Canada drive. Uh, now the bottle's ruined. That's too bad. Oh, never mind, Walters. No harm done. Inspector Murray, you'll take Miss Moore, and I'll take an old-fashioned. You have been listening to another adventure of The Saint. The Robin Hood of Modern Crime. And now here is our star, Vincent Price. Ladies and gentlemen, next week most of you will be enjoying a wonderful Thanksgiving dinner. And while you're eating your Thanksgiving turkey and counting your blessings of the past year, think. Think for a moment of the millions of people who don't get enough to eat. Think, and then send your subscription right away for a food package to be delivered to some needy family in Europe. Send your contribution to CARE, C-A-R-E, New York. This is Vincent Price inviting you to join us again next week at this same time for another exciting adventure of the saint. Good night. script of The Saint was written by Lou Vitties. Our cast included Peggy Weber, Ted Von Els, Jerry Hausner, Tom Brown, and Dan O'Hurley. The music was composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman. The Saint, based on characters created by Leslie Charteris, is a James L. Safier production and is directed by Thomas A. McEvity. Vincent Price is soon to be seen in Robert Lippert's production of The Baron of Arizona. All you Saint fans will be glad to know that The Saint comic books are on sale at all newsstands. Your announcer, Merrill Ross. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Yes, this is the Falcon speaking. Oh, Nina. I'm glad you called. Now, you'll have to count me out tonight, Angel. I'm in the middle of a hot deal. Mm -hmm. Some boys I know are interested in the big money, and they figure if we put all our capital in the gun, we ought to make a killing. The Kraft Foods Company brings you The Adventures of the Falcon, starring Les Damon. You met the Falcon first in his best-selling novels. Then you saw him in his thrilling motion picture series. Now join him on the air when the Falcon solves... The Case of the Quarrelsome Quartet. Before the Falcon starts on tonight's case, I'd like to say just a word about something extra delicious. Kraft Mayonnaise. Here's really true mayonnaise at its finest. One taste will tell you that. Just one taste of delicate, exquisitely flavored Kraft mayonnaise will tell you that here is mayonnaise to delight even the fussiest cook. Try it. Try it and see for yourself. Tomorrow when you shop, get a jar of wonderful tasting Kraft mayonnaise. <laughs> And now, the case of the quarrelsome quartet. It's late evening in New York, and in a shabby apartment on Manhattan's west side, a short, heavy-set boy named Dixie Taylor watches his companion, Georgie Reynolds, attack an age-old problem, how to dispose of an empty bottle. But George is equal to the occasion, for spying the fireplace, he comes up with a practical solution. Well, I guess that's one way to get rid of your empties. Anybody ask you, Taylor? 
No. All right, then shut your face. Hazel? Hazel! You want me, George? No, I was just rehearsing. I'm going in for hard calling. Oh, I'm sorry, sweetie. I was busy. Well, I hope I wasn't interrupting anything important. No, honey. Give me another bottle. Well, darling, don't Didn't you Didn't think... I tell you something? All right, George. It's one of my bedroom closets. Well, what are you staring at, Dixie? I was just wondering about Hazel. Well, don't. If you're going to do any wondering, think about Martinez. Although he'll be here. Yeah, when? He was due an hour ago. Or well, maybe he had some trouble finding Saunders. Oh, that's just ducky. What goes on with you guys? Anyway, do I have to well, tell you... That's probably Martinez and Saunders now. Hazel? Yes, George? Didn't you hear that? Well, I was trying to get... Never mind the alibis, that's... Hello, Hazel. Hello, Mr. Martinez. Your boyfriend here? Yeah, we're in the kitchen. Come on in, bring your friend with you. Hi, Georgie. Hello, Taylor. Hello, Louis. Well, you took your own sweet time getting here, Martinez. Well, I have a little bit trouble finding Mr. Saunders here. Gentlemen. Bring in a couple of chairs, Hazel. Yes, dear. All right, now go on, go on, beat it. But, darling... I said beat it. These fellows and I have some business to discuss. Yeah. Well, Martinez, did you tell Saunders what I lined up? No, I think was maybe better I leave that for you. It's a snatch, Saunders. A what? A snatch. That's what I thought you said. Well, it's been nice knowing you, gentlemen. Sit down, Saunders. No, thanks, I'm not interested. Cost you something to listen? All right. Ever hear of Big Joe Gallagher? Well, enough to know that if he's the party you got in mind, you can include me out, as the saying goes. Now, don't be a jerk, Saunders. Sure, Gallagher's a big rackets boy, but that's just why we can get away with this. You're crazy. Now, look, Martinez, why didn't you tell Let me that... Georgie finish. Dixie and I used to work for Gallagher. We know what makes him tick. A guy in his position would never yell copper. Yes, but there's one thing you're overlooking. From what I know of Mr. Gallagher, he never goes anywhere without two or three of his boys. How are you going to separate the wheat... From the chaff. I got it all figured out. Gallagher's a ladies' man, see? Now, if a babe were to call him up and arrange a blind date, it's dollars to donuts he'd go for it. I doubt it. Don't tell me. I've seen it work a dozen times. You got the girl? Yeah. Yeah, Hazel, the one who let you in. I suppose she talks. She wouldn't dare. Besides, she doesn't have to know what's going on. I'll tell her the whole thing's a gag. Where do I come in? Hazel will arrange to meet Gallagher at the 49 Club. You and Martinez will pick him up. What about you and Taylor? Oh, we can't take a chance. He knows us. Well, what do you say, Saunders? You think this will work, Martinez? Why not? Georgie's got all the angles figured out. <laughs> so it would seem. Okay, gentlemen. Deal me in. <laughs> Gallagher, please. Uh, who wants him? Well, he wouldn't know me, but you can tell him I'm a friend of Gloria Wilson. Uh, I never heard of her. Are you, Mr. Gallagher? Yeah, that's right. Well, Gloria made me promise to look you up when I got to New York. I'm uh, sorry, sister. I don't know anybody by that handle. She was a chorus girl at Pirandello's. Hey, wait a minute, baby. What's your name? Hazel Wall. Ah, uh, you look anything like you sound, Hazel? Oh, now, really, Mr. No, Gallagher. kidding, because if you do, I I'd like to see you. Uh, I'm afraid that's out of the question, Mr. Gallagher. I'm flying to the coast tonight. Ah, uh -huh. what time? Quarter after one. Well, that still gives us three hours to get acquainted. What do you say, baby? Mm, all right. But uh, you will have to meet me here. You see, I'm expecting friends. Oh, that's okay. Where are you? It's a little place called the 49 Club. Do you know it? No, but I'll manage. Uh, uh, what color dress you wearing? Blue. <laughs> My favorite color. Okay, Hazel, I'll see you in 20 minutes. <laughs> Say, buddy. Uh, who, me? Yeah, you wouldn't happen to have no seen a blonde around, huh? Uh, blue dress? Yeah, that's right. I'm glad to know you, Mr. Gallagher. Oh, uh, who are you? Hazel's cousin. Didn't she tell you we're having a little farewell party in her honor? Well, she said something about friends. Oh, now, don't get frightened. We'll be pushing off in a few minutes, and that'll give you enough time to talk to Hazel alone. Uh, where is she? She's in the back room with the rest of the family. Well, let's go. Uh, right down here. Uh, by the way, fella, I don't believe I caught your name. 
Well, it's the same as Hazel's. <laughs> Related on your father's side. Yes, that's right. Oh, uh, here we are. Hi, fellas. Hello, Louie. This is uh, Hazel's friend. Pleasure to know you, Mr. Gallagher. Where's Hazel? Oh, she just stepped out for a minute. Well, well where's the rest of the crowd? Crowd? Yeah, her cousin told me she had a flock of relatives down here. <laughs> Never believe Saunders. He's a big joker. Saunders? I thought his name was Walsh. What goes on here, anyway? Watch him, Saunders. Just keep those hands where they are, Mr. Gallagher. Frisky Martinez. Get your hands ah, off me. Don't get excited, Mr. Gallagher. He's bad for your blood pressure. Is he clean? He is now. Good. Would you be kind enough to accompany us, Mr. Gallagher? Oh, no, no. You're not getting me to walk out of here. Well, as long as you feel... Let me... Well, you have to hand it to him, Martinez. He said he wasn't walking out of here, and, uh... He was right. <laughs> Guys, anyway, got the time, Dixie. You asked me that just five minutes ago, George. Now don't get smart. Think anything could have gone wrong? Not a chance. What'd you tell Galga's wife? Just what you told me. I said we had a husband, and if she wanted him back, she was to dig up a hundred grand. Yeah, maybe I should have gone for it myself instead of sending Saunders a Martinez. What are you worried about, Georgie? They managed the snatch, all right. Yeah, but how do I know that they're George. able... George, I'll get it. Hello, George. You got it, Saunders? What does this bag look like? All right, let me have it. How'd it go off? Oh, the clock works. As soon as Mrs. Gallagher gives us the money, I give her the key and took her away to find her husband. Oh, nice work, Louie. Yes, I guess congratulations are in order all around. One hundred thousand dollars. Just just think of it. You think of it, Saunders. Because that's as close as you're getting to it. What do you mean, George? Well, I tell you, friend, it's like this. The boys and I had a little talk. And you decided why split four ways, huh? Well, you catch on fast. But didn't you think I'd have anything to say about that? Sure, I put away that gun, Saunders. Uh, yeah, Georgie was only clowning. Yes, I'll bet. You know, I'm a little surprised at you, Dixie. Uh, look, if, if we were going to double-cross you, you think we'd send you for the dough? Sure, that doesn't make sense, does it? But... No, don't move, Palsy. Just drop the gun. Nice going, Martinez. Well, Mr. Smart Guy, what do you say? No. <laughs> That's enough, Georgie. Go on, Saunders. Beat it. All right. Gentlemen, if this little get-together hasn't been pleasant, it, it has been informative. Well, I'll be very glad to show you what I learned next time we meet. <laughs> I'm looking for a Michael Waring, private detective called the Falcon. Well, you picked the right place. Oh, are you... Mm -hmm. Come on in, Angel. And... Thank you. Sit down. I suppose I should introduce myself. It's customary. Uh, well, my name is Hazel Walsh. Hazel Walsh? Ah, oh, that's right. Who recommended me? Well, I remembered hearing about the Falcon years ago. And you filed the information away for this more convenient date, hmm? Uh, yes. <laughs> Are you available for a case? At $50 a day and expenses, I am. What's your problem? Well, it's really not my problem, Mr. Waring. A, a girlfriend of mine is engaged to some man, and she believes that he's done something... Uh... Crooked? Of course not. All right, let's call it unethical. Go on. Well, uh, if the man ever was caught, could they force my friend to be a witness against him? They certainly could, even though she found out about it by accident? Doesn't make any difference, Miss Walsh. Well, isn't there anything she can do? Nope. Only if she were married to him could she refuse to testify. Well, if we got married... I mean, if they got married, I... <laughs> Let's use the first example, Hazel. It'll be easier on us both. Now, look here, Mr. Waring. No, you look, Hazel. You're obviously in some sort of a jam. Now, what is it? I tell you, you're wrong. What did your boyfriend do? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. All right. I suppose you tell me his name. It's uh, Harry Prescott. Come on, Hazel. What's his name? Well, you have no right to question me like this. No, but the police have. But you're, you're not going to call him. No? Well, it, it's George Reynolds. 
Be the same Georgie Reynolds who used to run with the Gallagher mob? No. Uh, no, it's not that one at all. Uh-huh. Well, suppose you introduce us and let me see for myself. Hmm? I'm an easy man to convince. <laughs> Sounds as though Mike follows that good old theory that seeing is believing. Of course, that's a pretty smart idea, I think. And it's a good one for everyone to follow when it comes to food. For example, I can tell you how satiny smooth Kraft mayonnaise is. What an amazing, creamy, rich texture it has because of the special way Kraft blends it. But to really appreciate just how smooth Kraft Kitchen Fresh mayonnaise is, get a jar and see for yourself. That way you can taste for yourself, too. You won't have to take my word for it that Kraft mayonnaise is especially good, with a delicate, delightful flavor, the result of careful blending of only the finest oils and eggs, the most fragrant vinegars and spices. Yes, the best way to tell is to taste Kraft mayonnaise yourself. Try it on a cool and colorful salad of hollowed-out tomatoes topped with spicy deviled eggs and garnished with fresh and tangy watercress. It's really delicious. So tomorrow when you shop, Get a jar of Kraft Kitchen Fresh Mayonnaise. Whether you're serving a simple, everyday kind of salad or a fancy company special, you'll enjoy it more with true mayonnaise at its finest. Kraft Mayonnaise. Now back to the adventures of the Falcon. Fifteen minutes have passed since Hazel Walsh introduced herself to Mike Waring. And now the two are on their way to Georgie Reynolds' apartment. And strangely enough, Miss Walsh doesn't seem too delighted by the trip. I don't know why I let you talk me into this, Mr. Waring. Simple, Hazel. You're the kind of girl who's taken such a licking you could be talked into anything. That's a lie. All right, then why did you bring me here? Because I thought you could help George. Well, if it's the same George I think it is, you'll have to get yourself another boy. Whatever made you tie up with a guy like that? I don't think that concerns you. This the place? Yes. Can I help? No, thanks. Where's the light switch? Uh, a little over to your right. Have you got it? Yep. George! Stop that. <laughs> I saw him. Now you stay where you are. Is he? Yes, he's nothing else but. Oh, no. Someone gave it to him right through the temple. George! George! Look, you get a grip on yourself. How can you talk to me like that when my fiancé's been murdered? I can talk to you like that because it's not your fiancé. What? This is a boy named Dixie Taylor. Now will you behave? I can't believe it, Mr. Wang. There must be some mistake. What's the matter, Hazel? You disappointed it isn't, George? Of course not. Did you know Taylor? Uh, well, he was a friend of George's. I saw him around here once or twice. Who else was a member of this fraternity? Uh, just a man named Louis Martinez. Oh. Well, that's some select group. I've heard of all of them. Did they blackball anyone recently? I don't know what you mean. Did your boyfriend of the Martinez cross anyone lately? I don't think so. Hazel, you better stop lying. You don't do it very well. Well, there was a Nick Saunders. Good-looking boy, around 35? Yes. What did they fight about? I don't know. You think Saunders might have killed Dixie? I suppose so. How about George? No. Oh, Hazel, don't be a sucker. You think he'll appreciate your loyalty? Why don't you ask him, Worry? Oh, Georgie. All right, I will. Isn't it nice of her not to suspect you, George? Not to suspect me of what? Take a look under that blanket. Oh. Who did it? That's just what I was asking. You got any suggestions? Larry or what? Say, who invited you here anyway? She didn't. Oh, is that so? Darling, I was only thinking of you. Now, that's the truth, George. Never have I seen a woman show so much concern. All right, Waring, beat it. I don't need you. How about Hazel? She don't need you either. Go on, Hazel. Tell him. Uh, I made a mistake, Mr. Waring. I'm sorry. You mean that? Yes. Okay. So be it. Oh, when the police show up, tell them I have to leave. It'll huh? be a pleasure. But... Listen, Georgie, I, I know what you're going to say. Do you? Oh, darling, I was only thinking of you. I, I, I know what you, Dixie Martinez, did to Saunders. That's why I went to Waring. Well, that was smart. But I was worried about Saunders. And I'm worried about you, Hazel. You think you'll ever learn to keep your mouth shut? Or do I have to... Oh! You? 
Hello, Corbett. This is Mike Waring. Ah, what's on your mind, Mike? Listen, what kind of caper has Georgie Reynolds pulled recently? Well, there's some talk going around that Big Joe Gallagher was snatched last week. Well, that's crazy, Sergeant. I saw him on 48th Street yesterday. I know, but that's the story we got. According to one of my pet stoolies, his missus laid out a hundred grand to get him back. You think Georgie Reynolds was behind it? Wouldn't be at all surprised. Well, can't you do anything? You tell me how when we got no proof. Mrs. Gallagher hasn't seen fit to make a complaint. Was Nick Saunders in on it? You seem to know more about it than I do. What do you know about Saunders? Not quite enough, Sergeant. I'll let you know the minute I learn more. Oh, by the way, uh, there is a body over at Georgie Reynolds' apartment. Go over and pick it up like a good fellow, will you? Yes? Hello, Saunders. Remember me? Oh, sure, sure. You're the uh, Falcon, aren't you? Mm Mm-hmm. Can I come in? Why not? Sorry I can't offer you anything. Well, you never know unless you try. All right, Waring, what's on your mind? I heard you and George Reynolds had a little trouble last night. You must be thinking of two other guys. What gets me is why you took it out on Taylor. Taylor? Yeah, haven't you heard? He's dead. Not my old pal Dixie. Well, 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 what do you know? I know you'd better have a pretty good alibi handy. Come on, Saunders, get your coat. We're going to headquarters. Uh, just brief me on one thing, Waring. You're a private detective, aren't you? That's right. Now, where do you get off pushing people around? It's my hobby. You're going to get your coat, or will you go like that? Oh, act your age. Put away the gun, Saunders. Put it away. Wait, before I... Cut it out. Go on, drop it. No, I... Drop it. <laughs> All right, now, what do you say, friend? Do we take that little ride I mentioned? Okay, Waring. But don't be surprised if someday I return the favor. Is there a guy named Mike Waring here? That's me, Inspector. Come in here. I want to talk to you. Okay. See you later, Sergeant. You bet. Sit down, Waring. Oh, thanks. Sergeant Corbett tells me you're the boy who brought in Saunders. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Well, I'm glad you got a kick out of it, because I just talked to headquarters about you. What for? To see how they feel about attempted blackmail. What are you talking about? Didn't you try to shake down Saunders? Is that what he claimed? No, I can put two and two together myself. And you ought to go back to school, Inspector. There's something wrong with your arithmetic. I doubt it. When you start shoving a guy around just because he's got a record, there's only one answer. Oh, you're crazy. I tell you, Saunders killed Dixie Taylor. How? He shot him, that's how. From Philadelphia? Oh, what are you talking about? Going to the coroner, Dixie Taylor died at 8.30 p.m. So what? Well, at 8.25, Saunders was picked up by the Pennsylvania State Police for carrying a rod without a license. And he wasn't released until two hours later. Now, who doesn't know his arithmetic? Huh? Hazel. How did you get in here? The superintendent let me in. I've got to talk to you. Now, that makes us even, Angel, because I want to talk to you. Look, you've got to drop the case. Now, that raises a problem. How can I drop something I've never been paid for in the first place? I don't understand. I mean, if I'm going to work for free, I might as well do it for myself. You can't do that. I'd like to see someone stop me. What's Georgie's phone number? Why? Because I want to talk to him. What about? The murder of Dixie Taylor. He doesn't know anything about it. Are you kidding? Now, what's the number? Come on, Hazel, I'm not clowning. It's Raleigh 4099. Now, cheer up, baby. When I get through with Mr. Reynolds, he won't ever lay a hand on you again. You don't hear me complain. (laughs) Next, you'll be telling me you love the guy. I do. Hello. Uh, Is that you, Reynolds? No, this is Luis Martinez. Who are you? Mike Waring. Let me talk to George. I'm afraid that is out of the question. Listen, Martinez, if I have to come over there... It still won't do you any good. He's dead. He's what? Yeah. Someone fed him a dose of strychnine about an hour ago. And somehow we didn't seem to agree with him. <laughs> Not 
true, Mike. I, I don't believe it. Martinez was lying. I don't suppose we go over and check. Oh, but George, it's dead. Oh, come on, Hazel. Get a grip on yourself. You're better off without him. Oh, how can you talk that way? Because it's the truth. He was no good. That's a lie. Oh, don't give me that. You knew he was the brain behind the big Joe Gallagher snatch. No, you're wrong. Who are you kidding? Well, so incidentally, what happened to the loot? The loot? The ransom money Mrs. Gallagher paid off. How would I know? Well, you would if anybody would. You can't keep it, Angel. I didn't intend to. Then where is it? Well, they, they didn't tell me, but I, I watched them through the keyhole. Where did they put it? Under the middle cushion of the sofa in George's apartment. Okay, let's get it before someone else gets the same idea. I wouldn't be surprised if we're a little late now. <laughs> You know what Mike said just now about getting there first? Sounds like the race that usually goes on at my house for the last piece of cold chicken in the refrigerator. But a chicken sandwich sure makes a swell snack, especially when you put lots of Kraft mayonnaise on the bread. Mmm, the delicate flavor of Kraft mayonnaise is just exactly what you want. And Kraft mayonnaise is so creamy, rich, and smooth. Just try it. For a grand sandwich spread, as well as for fine salads, there's nothing like True mayonnaise at its finest. Kraft Kitchen Fresh Mayonnaise. Now back to the adventures of the Falcon. A half hour has passed since Mike Waring learned that with the recent death of Georgie Reynolds and the earlier demise of Dixie Taylor, the original quartet was now working as a duo on $100,000 worth of loose notes. And now as we rejoin the team of Mark and Hazel, they're making their entrance at Georgie Reynolds' apartment. But Hazel seems to be suffering with a bad case of stage fright. What's the matter, Angel? Having trouble? I guess I'm a little nervous. Oh, here, let me try. Ah, come in, folks. Louis. What do you expect? Shut the door, Waring. Look, Martin. I said shut the door. Now raise them high. All right, you don't have to worry. I'm clean. I don't believe in taking chances. What's the matter? No sporting blood? Yeah, I guess I'm yellow. Too bad Georgie didn't have as much sense. Where is he? Move the club chair. What? Yeah, go on. He's behind it. George! That George! won't bring him back. You killed him? Well, while we're on this subject, where were you at 11.30? She was waiting for me in my apartment. Mm, nice. Look, you better watch that mouth. And you better watch yours. All right, Hazel, where is it? Where is what? The dough we got from Gallagher. I don't know. Don't give me that. I want it, honey bunch, and nothing's going to keep me from it, understand? I wouldn't count on that, Louis. What? No, no, no. Don't bother turning around, Martinez. It's only me. Listen, Saunders. Don't mind if I do, Martinez, but first drop the gun. That's a sweetheart. You want me to pick it up? No, no, no. Don't trouble yourself, Waring. I can manage. Oh, what happened to Georgie? The same thing that happened to Dixie Taylor and... He was such a sweet guy, wasn't he? Oh, by the way, when I walked in here, Martinez was asking you a question. I don't remember your answering it. Would you like to now? You'll never see a penny of that money. Come on, come on, Hazel. We're wasting time. Where is it? You better tell him, Angel. I think he means business. I do, and make no mistake about it. Uh, it's under the middle cushion of the sofa. What? Stay where you are, Martinez. I'll do my own checking. Oh, now, isn't that pretty? Listen, Saunders. I'm afraid I haven't the time, Louis. You have to find it, Saunders. What? Get down, Hazel! Oh. Hey! Had enough, Saunders? Yes, he has. Oh, uh, hello, Sergeant. Hi, Mike. The inspector sent me around to apologize. Oh, what happened? Twenty minutes ago, a call came through from Philly that that Saunders they picked up there was this guy's cousin. I thought there was something screwy playing. Well, if you fellas don't mind. Uh, just a minute. Where are you going, Martinez? Well, I just figure it's no point of my hanging around just now. Well, you better get used to it, Louie. You're going to do quite a bit of it from now on. What are you talking about? You killed Dixie Taylor and George Reynolds. You're crazy. Well, maybe you're right. Here I've got you hanging when any kid knows that in New York they burn you. All right, Sergeant, prove it to him. Mike. Oh, don't say it, Angel. But I was just going to ask... Ask me to explain things, hmm? Well, yes. Well, I guess you're entitled to it. You see, this was a modern version of thieves falling out. When Louis Martinez saw how George double-crossed Saunders, it didn't take him long to figure that he was next. So he decided to beat your boyfriend to the punch. First he killed Dixie, which made it look bad for Saunders. And then to ensure his bet, he killed George. Then why did he wait at the house for us? Well, he had to. You were the only one who knew where the money was stashed. And until he got it, 
He committed two murders for nothing. Well, couldn't have Saunders have done that? Mm-mm. I knew Martinez was the killer long before Saunders ever showed up. How? Well, Martinez told us he hadn't called the police, so obviously there was no autopsy performed. Yet he knew exactly what poison killed George and the time he got it. Remember he told me over the phone that George had been fed a dose of strychnine an hour before I called? Mm -hmm. Well, now, how would he know that unless he was right there feeding it to him? Um, shall I tell you something? I wish you would. I lied to you about loving George, you see. Otherwise, I was afraid you might suspect me. Oh, I couldn't afford to, Angel. Uh, why not? Well, you're much prettier than Martinez and Saunders. Oh, I, I don't understand. Well, you see, I figured to wrap up this case around midnight. And if you were guilty, what would I do for a date? <laughs> Folks, here's sure, pure enjoyment for the whole family. Real, honest-to-goodness malteds made with Kraft chocolate-flavored malted milk. Easy to fix, too. You just make a tasty paste of Kraft malted milk in the bottom of a tall glass. Then fill the glass brimful of milk and stir it. Enjoy the best malted you ever put to your lips. Include Kraft malted milk on your shopping list for Tuesday. Enjoy a Kraft malted for snacks, with meals, or before bedtime. But be sure it's Kraft malted milk at your food store now. The Case of the Worried Champion. The Case of the Worried Champion. That's the title of next week's Adventure of the Falcon. When Mike Waring learns that a boxing title is something a number of people are willing to shoot for. So be sure to listen next week at this same time to another exciting Adventure of the Falcon. Brought to you by the Kraft Foods Company. The Adventures of the Falcon are based on the famous character created by Drexel Drake. Produced by Bernard L. Schubert. Written today by Gene Wang and directed by Richard Lewis. Music was by Arlo. Les Damon was starred as the Falcon with Amzie Strickland as Hazel. This is Jay Jackson speaking. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. It's your swan song, sweetheart, so you better start singing. Don't try stand over tactics, catch, or I'll make a hot curry for you. Does she talk to me or to the cops? Take your pick. It's all the same to me. You T-men are all the same. Think you're wonderful, great big heroes. Don't think I don't know. <laughs> Glamour boy. She's the one I want to hear from, not you. What's it to be, sugar? I've got nothing to say unless my lawyer says so. And her lawyer doesn't say so. When I get through with her lawyer, Buster, he's going to need a lawyer. Now, why did you both be sensible and admit it was a frame-up? Prove it. Dare me? I defy you. Okay. Mr. Ketch, wait. Pipe down, you pinheaded little... Oh! Why, you... Good for you, sugar. I've been dying to take a poke at him, too. Okay, Mr. Ketch. Now I'm ready. Now I'll talk. T-Men. The true-to-life adventures of the men whose job it is to discover and bring to account those citizens who, by concealment, deception, or fraud, evade their lawful taxes. T-Men, with Gordon Glenwright as Jack Ketch. Here is Jack Ketch, one of this nation's T-Men, to tell you... The case of the subtle approach. This is a great country. It takes a lot of money to run and keep running. That's why we have taxes. Taxes are scaled so that everyone pays a fair share of the cost according to his or her true income or profit. Malarkey. Hmm? I said that's a lot of malarkey. Taxes are scaled so that characters like you can squat in safe jobs. By the way, my name's Cromer, Public Relations. Oh, sweet. 
You'll have sorrowing relations if you come busting into private offices that way, friend. Your apology is accepted. Well, hey, now, just we... a minute, Elephant Hyde. I know you're now going to tell me that you're a busy man and you don't need whatever it is I'm selling anyway, but that's just where I'm going to fool you, Mr. Ketch. Oh, yes, I saw your name on the door, by the way. Yes, that's precisely where I'm going to fool you, because I have nothing to sell. No. No, Mr. Ketch. I have something to give. I have a pair of them, and they're heavy brogues. Mr. Ketch, how would you like to wake up in the morning and feel worth 10,000? 10,000 what? Usually, I feel like a two-cent cigar butt. However, I mustn't keep you chit-chattering like this. Beat it, buster! 10,000 of these. Money? Now, why should you give me that dough? It's quite simple. It's yours. As a bribe. <laughs> I slugged him. Yes, against all the rules, I slugged him. And then had him tossed out on his ear. What did he think I was, anyway? Well, I'd satisfied my lust for violence, but what about my curiosity? I'd flattened the clot before he'd told me what he wanted me to... Do. Murray Burke thought he could make a shrewd guess. He was a thousand miles off. Well, I just don't get it. I've gone through Cromer's file and he's clean. Not a query. Not a mark. Pays up his assessed tax on the dot every year. Hey, he's a public relations man, remember? Perhaps he was acting on behalf of a client. Aren't they all... But what a dope to go at it bald-headed. Why, it was almost as if he wanted you to toss him out a window. Next time, I will. Is there going to be a next time? Sure there is. And if Cromer doesn't make it, I will. And soon. Watch it, friend. Curiosity killed the cat, remember? Nine times. <laughs> there it was. A goon comes at me in a bare-faced way with a bribe. To do what? So we're both guessing. Actually, I didn't need to worry about Cromer's next approach, or to wait. It came at 10.30 that night. Pat Frude had a date with her cousin, she said. So I was home. All right, take your foot off that. Oh, so it's you again, Mr. Ketch. I come do... in <laughs> and sit down. <laughs> That's the one you ducked out on this morning. You'll be sorry for this slasher. I come to do you a good turn, all you do is beat me up. Cromer, you surely haven't come to renew your offer, have you? I hope so, because I'm very interested. I thought you would be. But the price has gone down. A thousand a punch. Lovely. I've still got eight for free. Tell me, what do I have to do to stop spending your money on athletics? I want you to get me a certain file. I thought so. Cromer, as an up-and-coming public relations man, you ought to know that stealing taxation files from the record section went out of fashion with button-up boots. At the price I'm offering. Whose file do you want? Do I get it? Tell me. Glove plastics. Did you say glove plastics? Bring me their file and you get the money. Glove plastics, eh? Fine. I'll turn them over in the morning and see why they wanted their file removed. In for plenty, I'd say. Well, we'll make them sorry they started this. Oh, so you're crossing me up, are you? Yes, sweetheart, I am. And starting with a right... <laughs> the stairs to my apartment have brass edging strips to save the carpet. The blushing bribe didn't miss one of them. I got to the office next morning with a happy smile on my face and a song in my heart. 
I like bribers like I like death adders. And you can see me dating a death adder, can't you? Gaily, I buzzed records and asked them to slip a yellow jack in the filing cabinet and shoot glove plastics file over to me. There were complications. I couldn't call you back sooner, Mr. Cash, because... Never I... mind about that. Where's that file? I've been waiting nearly 20 minutes. But I'm telling you, Mr. Kitch, you've got that file already. Do you think I'm a dope and don't see straight? There's nothing on my desk but varnish. Well, there should be, because you got that file yesterday, according to the... What do you mean, yesterday? I didn't even know glove plastics existed until last night. Look at the right card, sugar. I have the right card, and it's got your signature on it. Say that again? It's got okay, your... Okay, okay, I'll come over. This is getting funny peculiar. Marty. Now what's wrong? That file on glove plastics that Cromer wanted me to swipe, it's gone already and marked out to me. Uh-uh. The bells are ringing, Johnny. Watch it. You can say that again. Let's go across to records and inspect Exhibit A. Wrong. Exhibit B. Hmm? I've got a feeling that Exhibit A is your hide. <laughs> This started to look very interesting. My hair started to stand up at the back of my neck and little chilly tingles played tag up and down my spine. It was my next move. I made it. I don't care if Cromer's as busy as a one-armed paper hanger with a seven years itch. Get him on this phone. What? Well, tell him it's government business. Yes. Well, it's about time. Yes? Cromer? Speaking. Who is this? Ketch. Taxation and revenue. Yes, Mr. Ketch. What can I do for you? You can grab a cab and be here in five minutes. That's what you can do. If you're a split second late, so help me, I'll take you apart. Steady on, Johnny. Now, what sort of a fool gag is this? Who's this calling? Ketch. The boy that money couldn't buy. You drunk. Talk sense, whoever you are. I'll sense, have... is it? I'll give you a sense. What about that little job you wanted me to do on glove plastics? What happened? Did you get yourself another boy? Oh, go and jump. Hey, Marty. He hung up on me. How do you like that? I don't like it at all, Jack. You've got to do some fast thinking. Some fast action, you mean. Why does this character have his office? I was turning him up while I... Uh, here we are. Pioneer's building, 10th floor. I'm on my way. The tenth, huh? Hey, Marty, ten minutes from now, if you listen intently, you're going to hear a dull thud. And guess what it'll be? I made it in eight minutes flat. Surprise, surprise. I'd never seen Cromer before in my life, or he me. My Mr. Cromer was a phony. Why? What was the racket? Why offer me ten grand to swipe a file that wasn't there? When I got back to my office, I knew why. Look, I tell you to keep your story until you hear mine. Your bank's been on the phone. They want you there right away. My bank? Hey, I'm not overdrawn, am I? I hardly think so, Mr. Ketch. They want you to sign the pay-in slip attached to the 10,000 smackers you banked in their night safe last night. This was it. This was the last side of the frame being nailed on. File gone, the dough in my bank account. I was as good as behind bars already. <laughs> We'll return to Jack Ketch and the case of the subtle approach in just a minute. Meanwhile... We return you to Team M, with Jack Ketch continuing the case... Of the subtle approach. (laughs) 
Here at the Special Investigation Branch of the Federal Department of Taxation and Revenue, you should never be surprised at anything that happens, even to yourself. I've had people pull guns on me. I've had blondes say, I think you're cute. I've had husbands say, hey, mister, that's my wife. In fact, I once had a character come in and say, you haven't charged me enough tax. We had him locked up right away. But this is the first time I've ever been framed for bribery and corruption without my permission. The sad point is, how do I convince anyone that I am an innocent party? Look, Jack, don't get me wrong. I'm on your side. I believe everything you tell me. You say this character pretended to be a public relations counselor named Cromer, and he's not. Okay, I accept that. I've just seen Cromer. They're two different men. Now, about this dough... Skip the money for a moment, boy, and get back to that missing file. Your Cromer offered to pay you 10000 to swipe the complete taxation file of glove plastics. You say you refused. Refused? I flattened him twice, didn't now, I? Now, take it easy. Here's the way I see it, and the way the DG upstairs will see it, too. The DG is not going to hear about this until I've thrown our friend into the can. Are you crazy? Look, the longer you hold off telling the top brass about this, the more suspicious they'll be. Twice in one day, you're offered 10000 to hand over Glove Plastic's file. You say you refuse. Why? Now, wait a minute. Yet next day, Glove Plastic's file is gone, and someone has mysteriously paid 10000 into your bank. What are they going to think? It's what they're going to do if I tell them now that's got me bouncing. I'd better get round to the bank and see what I can find out about that pay-in. Do that. And when you get back, take my advice and go up top and see the Director General before it's too late. Why? Is he ill? All the bank could tell me would fit on the head of a pin. The dough had been paid in through their automatic time-recording night safe at 8.10 the previous night. That was a couple of hours before the phony Cromer visited me. They showed me the deposit slip made out to my credit, but with a space for the signature of the person paying in left blank. So was I. I told them to hold the dough in suspense pending further instructions and gumshoot back to the office. Only two messages here on your desk. Oh, and Pat Frude wants you to ring through about lunch. Doesn't that dame ever do anything but eat? How'd you make out? So-so. You'd better try to clean up this mess you're in on glove plastics pretty smartly, Johnny. I just had the tip from the top that Henderson Grant Building Cooperative is folding. It looks like being a big smell with us in the middle. Meeting of the stockholders tomorrow. Suckers, the lot of them, from what I heard. Yeah, they've got their worries. I've got mine. I'm not kidding. Hey, while you were out, I had an idea. Johnny, if you didn't swipe that file... What do you mean, if? Okay, you didn't. But someone did. And that someone must be employed in records right this minute. They swiped that file and forged your signature to the Yellow Jack check card. Marty, really? Is that what happened? Now, who on earth do you think could have done that? I'm only trying to help you... Listen, why can't we put the finger on the culprit through the handwriting? A swell idea, Marty. The only catch is, by the time a handwriting expert gets through testing 300 clerks in records, I'll have served half my sentence anyway. For Pete's sake, we've got to do something, haven't we? Listen, Marty, that file was stolen for one reason, but I was framed for another. I've a hunch I'm going to be told why very soon. When I know that, maybe I'll know who knocked the file off. Right now, I'm going out to lunch with Pat. In my day, it was always a hearty breakfast. Luncheon was a bright, happy little event, with Pat and me snarling at each other as though we'd been married ten years. I got up, tossed some money at the desk, and walked out on my heart's desire. Some picnic I was having. I hoofed back to the federal building in a murderous mood, which reached flashpoint as I went in through the doorway. And who should I meet but himself, himself? Hey, Catch. Hmm? Why? What a pleasant uh, surprise. Uh, uh, throwing punches is beginning to get a habit of yours. I've got something here in my pocket to break that habit. Get the money. 
<laughs> Get the file? Hey, how about that? What was the big idea of paying me off to swipe a file that was already swiped by someone else? Was it? How confusing. I've got you over a barrel catch. How do you like it, huh? How do you think you'll like ten years in the can? You can't prove a thing. And other people can. Meaning your bosses. A file's gone. You're ten thousand richer. <laughs> it adds up, Mr. Kedge. What are you really after, Buster? After? Look, I'm not such a dope that I can't put two and two together. You frame me. Okay. Either I get out of it or I don't. But where do you come in? Where's the payoff? Are you squaring accounts or what? The payoff rent occurs right now, upstairs in your private office. Mm -hmm. We're going upstairs, Ketch. And you're going to swipe me another file. Are you in the wholesale business? Whose file? You'll get me the file, Ketch. Or oh, this bear trap you're in is going to snap your fat head off. You know what you're told, see? Suppose I don't. I'll tip off your boss about the glove plastic deal. As I said, I've got you over a barrel. Well. Come upstairs. By the way, whose file do I have to swipe this time? Mine. <laughs> got to my office. It was empty. Marty Burke's never around what he's wanted. Now I really was in a spot. Well, now what, Buster? Give me the file. You won't get away with this, you know. The moment you try to leave the building with a file under your arm, bells will start ringing and guards... I'm will... not going to try and take it out. No? No. You're going to get that file from wherever it's kept, and then you're going to sit at your desk, and you're going to tear it to bits. After that, you'll burn the bits in that metal waste bin you got over there. So that you and all your records will vanish in the ashes, hmm? Well, if you feel confident, let's try it. You'll be sorry. Let me worry about that. Just get the file. Okay. And the name? Henderson Grant Building Cooperative. I'm Grant. Anderson Grant. Hey, wait on. Marty said... Yeah. You are folding. You've got into the stockholders' funds, haven't you, Mr. Grant? Plenty. Why didn't you offer your bribe for this file in the first place instead of... Uh... Uh, would you have got it for me for ten or a hundred thousand? No. This way you will. So my way seems to have been best. Now send for it. Okay. Records, Miss Grant. Oh, Sugar, I'd like you to... get me... Oh, yes, Mr. Ketch? You'd like me to get you what? Grant. Um, don't bother, Sugar. Just come along to my office, pronto. Yes, Mr. Ketch. Now, wait a minute, Ketch. I want that file, and I want it now. There's not going to be any file, mister, because now I can bust you wide open. Now I know who swiped the glove plastic file and who forged my signature to the card. <laughs> What's so funny? <laughs> That's the pity of it. I can't tell you, you boob. <laughs> you wanted me, Mr. Miss... Harry. You don't know me. You don't know a thing. <laughs> yeah, I was right. Brother and sister, I'd say. Um, come in. Come in, sugar, and tell us everything. I don't know what you're talking about. No? Not much. I ought to break your sweet little neck. Oh, stop talking like a B-grade movie hero. By the way, sugar, what's your real name? I'll want it for the warrant. It's later. The swan? Well, it's your swan song, sweetheart, so you'd better start singing. Don't try any stand over Texas catch. Or I'll make a hot curry for you. Does he talk to me or to the cops? Take your pick. It's all the same to me. You team men are all the same. Think you're wonderful, great big heroes. Don't think I don't know. Glamour, boys. She's the one I want to hear from, not you. What's it to be, sugar? I've got nothing to say unless my lawyer says so. And her lawyer doesn't say so. When I get through with her lawyer, Buster, he's going to need a lawyer. 
Now, why don't you both be sensible and admit it was a frame-up? Prove it. Dare me? I defy you. Okay. Mr. Ketch, wait. Pipe down, you pinheaded little... Oh, you... Why? Good for you, sugar. I've been dying to take a poke at him, too. Okay, Mr. Ketch. Now I'm ready. Now I'll talk. He made me do it. Said he was in too deep to get out. He wanted me to steal the Henderson Grant file, but I wouldn't. Then he asked me if I'd help him if it didn't involve stealing. And so I did. I made out that card on the glove plastic file and copied your signature. Well, there wasn't much harm in that, was there? Oh, no. But why pick and choose? You wouldn't steal his file, but just swipe glove plastics. I don't get it. <laughs> he doesn't get it, he says. <laughs> I didn't take the glove plastics file, Mr. Ketch, because there wasn't any such file to take. What do you mean, no such file? Didn't he offer me ten grand to swipe it? Wasn't there a card showing my signature for it? Part of an elaborate plan to make you jump through the hoop. I invented the name glove plastic and the file and the card to make you think you were in a jam. So you'd swipe the file I really wanted. Well, it nearly worked. Well, I'll be... What's going to happen to us, Mr. Ketch? Not a thing. Is that right, Ketch? Right, as far as the girl's concerned. But uh, how about this? For you! <laughs> well, what could we do? What could we prove, apart from sugar forging my signature? If I hadn't been such a double-dyed dope as not to check up on Glove Plastic's existence in the register, they wouldn't have got to first base with the scheme. We let them both go. Punch bag got his reward next day when irate stockholders had him arrested for appropriating their funds. Sugar? I couldn't care less. And the 10,000? Well, as there was no glove plastic file to steal, there was no bribe. So what else could it be but a gift? I gave it back to grand stockholders. Honest character, aren't I? This is a great country. It costs a lot of money to run and to keep running. That's why we have taxes. Taxes are scaled so that everyone pays a fair share of the cost according to his or her. been listening to T-Men, the true-to-life adventures of those men whose job it is to discover and bring to account those citizens who, by concealment, deception, or fraud, evade their lawful taxes. T-Men features Gordon Glenwright as Jack Ketch. The case of the subtle approach was written and directed by Donovan Joyce. All names used in this broadcast were fictitious and bore no relation to any living person. T-Men is a Donovan Joyce production. This is Harp McGuire speaking. <laughs> Inspector Faraday, you got a report from every paper in town in your office. Now start talking. Yeah, Faraday, what's the big news? My editor says I'm supposed to pick up the hottest story in years. What gives? This is your moment of glory, Faraday. Better stretch it out. Shut up, Blanky. All right, you guys. Quiet down. Quiet! You've been giving it to me long enough. Now I'll give it to you. What do you mean, we've been giving it to you? You know what I mean. Every time I pick up a paper, I read how Boston Blanky has outsmarted me on every case. You've made me sound like a... A flat foot with a flat head. Well, we just report facts, Inspector. Uh, <laughs> that'll be enough of that. <laughs> now listen, and get this. Did you get what he just said to you, Faraday? Quiet, Blanky. You can have your say when I'm through with mine. 
All right, you guys. Here's your story. You better be good, Faraday. Oh, we'll forget how to spell your name. Oh, you'll spell my name right this time and put it in capital letters, too. I've recovered that $100,000 worth of diamonds stolen from Gotham's. Wow. Is this on the level, Faraday? Yes, I recovered them last night. And what's more, I got the guy who stole them, too. Hey, this is all right, Faraday, if it's true. It's true, all right. Here are the diamonds wrapped in this cloth on my desk. Take a look at them. Hey, the diamonds are terrific. I'd like to get a look at the guy who stole them. Would you? Well, here's the real story on this case. I've got the guy right here. Boston Blackie. What? I don't believe it. Ah, this is a gag, Faraday. You've never pinned anything on Blackie yet. Yeah, well, I've got something pinned on him this time. I caught him trying to get rid of the rocks. Of course, he tried to duck out on me, but I got him. Hey, Blackie, what about this? You'll pull down a stiff sentence if Faraday really has the goods on you, Blackie. So they tell me. Why aren't you worried about it? You've got a defense, haven't you? You've got an alibi. I'll beat this, boys. Haven't missed yet, have I? So far, I've been able to get out of everything but my skin. That's right, Blackie. But if you don't beat this thing at the trial, the only thing you'll have to get out of is jail in 20 years. And now, back to Dick Calmer as Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy. Friend to those who have no friend. Order! Order in the court! Will the defendant please rise? Good luck, Blackie. I'll keep my fingers crossed. Thanks, Mary. But it's a little late for that now. Boston Blackie, the evidence for and against you has been heard by this court. And after due deliberation, you have been found guilty as charged. Have you anything to say before I pass sentence on you? No, Your Honor, I haven't. At least not anything you'd care to hear. Very well, then. But before I pass sentence, I want to say this to you. There's no question but that you've done a great deal of good in this community. And there's no one in this court who is not familiar with the able assistance you've given the police of this city. But we cannot let gratitude stand in the way of justice. By the evidence presented in this court... You have been found guilty of a grave crime. Therefore, there remains nothing for this court to do but to punish you to the full limit of the law and sentence you to not less than 10 nor more than 20 years in the state penitentiary. How can you do this, Inspector Faraday? How can you do this to Blackie? I did the only thing I could, Miss Wesley. You didn't do anything. You just stood by and let them send Blackie to prison. I thought you were his friend. I gave him every chance in the world to defend himself. But he didn't. And why? Because he couldn't. But you could have helped him. You could have tried to prove it was someone else who stole those jewels. I just don't believe that Blackie did it. I didn't believe it either at first. It was a real shock when the evidence piled up against him. And, and even when I found him trying to sell the jewels... I still didn't believe it. I begged Blackie to tell me who really stole them, or... But you know that he didn't steal them. Uh, yeah, but... Even if he did, he had a reason. He's always been able to explain everything he's done, and you know that. Why didn't you give him the benefit of the doubt this time? Because this time it was different, Miss Wesley. Oh, I... Sure, sure, I've always said how anxious I was to send Blackie to jail. But I never really meant it. I was trying to keep him from interfering with the police. I don't believe it. You're jealous of Blackie. Maybe you even Miss framed Wesley, him so that... Miss Wesley, you have to believe me. Ask Rollins. Ask the commissioner of police. Ask anyone who had anything to do with the case. I gave Blackie every chance in the world to clear himself, oh, I... but he couldn't. This is one time he slipped up. It's impossible. It, 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 it's just not true. I must be having a bad dream. I wish it were just a bad dream, Miss Wesley. Blackie's my friend, too. Yes, yes, he's your friend. But are you his? Of course I am. But I'm also a policeman. What should I have done when I found out Blackie was guilty? Resign and let someone else arrest him? Would that have been helping any? No, that wouldn't have helped. And I guess you're not going to be any help now, either. And what can I do, Miss Wesley? How can I help? You can prove who really did steal those jewels, but you won't. So I'll do it myself. I don't know how, but I will. You just wait and see. Your visitors in booth three, Blackie. You got five minutes. 
Don't let it try to pass anything to you through the screen. You'll be watched. Thanks for the warning, pal. I'll tell her to keep a shotgun in her purse. Blackie. Oh, Blackie, they are letting me see you. Oh, yes, they're very big that way up here. I can have visitors once a week. How are you, Mary? Miserable. Just miserable. Don't make it any tougher, Mary. I'm going to be a good boy while I'm here, and I'll be out before you know it. Especially if you brought me a cake with a saw in it. Oh, Blackie, how can you joke? <laughs> Why shouldn't I, Mary? Yes, but how can you in this awful place? Oh, it's not so terrible. The company I keep isn't exactly inspiring, but I'm getting to bed early now and getting my beauty sleep. Blackie, I'm going to get you out of here. I'm going to prove that you didn't steal those jewels, or if you did, that you had a reason. Don't, Mary. You don't think I wanted to be sent to prison, do you? Of course I didn't. I just thought I was smarter than I am. I had an idea that because I'd outfoxed Faraday so many other times, I could do it this time, too. It was not a very good idea. Well, you're not guilty. You can't be. I just don't believe it. Thanks for having so much faith in me, Mary. But you know I wouldn't be here if I could have prevented it. I don't care. I'm not going to stop trying to prove that you didn't. Okay, Jackson. I'll tell Time's you... Time's up. You'll make five minutes short up here, huh, Garth? Okay. So long, baby. I'll see you next week, huh? You too, Blackie. Your time's up, too. Just a minute. Well, Mary, Blackie, I... Come on, Jake. Who's that terrible-looking prisoner the guard just spoke to? I've seen him somewhere before. You've seen his picture, Mary. He's Bill Jackson. And, incidentally, he happens to be my cellmate. Oh, no. That's the only thing wrong with this place, the inspiring company. Blackie, time's up. Oh. Come on. Coming. Goodbye, Mary. See me again as soon as you can, will I'll you? I'll be here just as often as they'll allow it, Blackie. Goodbye. Bye. All right, come on, you two. Back to your cell. Blackie, you and Jackson walk ahead of me. In step. Yeah. Hey, Blackie. That's some babe you got. Some class. How would you know, Jackson? Still think you're too good for me, huh, Blackie? Much too good. So, they even get you smart guys sooner or later, don't they? After they've finished with all you dumb ones. Come on, Blackie. Thaw out. You and me as roommates. I give you the chill because I thought you was a stool. Now I know you ain't. Okay, so you know that. So you know this, too. I'm a little antisocial, Jackson. Maybe we share the same cell, but as far as having anything to do with you is concerned, I'm in solitary. Come on, you guys. Get those towels out of those sterilizers and into those wash tubs. Come on, snap it up. Someday I'm going to hit that guard with a lead pipe. And no talking, Jackson. Just work. Sure, sure. Hey, you, Blackie. Get over by that row of tubs there and ring out those uniforms. Yes, sir. All right, you guys. Move over and let the new guy have a hand ringing out those clothes. Come here, Blackie. You can stand here. Thanks, Lawrence. Yeah. No talking. It's almost all set, Harry. And you're in. Everything's fixed, huh? Yeah. Great. About. Great. Count me in, too. Uh, don't worry. Hey, what are you guys talking about? Huh? Uh, nothing. Come on, what is it? Uh, nothing. Get to work over there. Cut the talk. Boy, these uniforms are heavy when they're wet. You're telling me. What are they made of, sponge? Hey, uh, look, what are you guys talking about? Go ahead and tell him, Toms. He's one of us. Yeah, so I hear. So I hear. Well, then, what's up? Uh, break. Yeah? No kidding. I want in. That won't be easy. No, why not? Well, Jackson's leading the break. He says who's in. And you and him ain't been hitting it off so good. But I want out of here, so maybe I'll try to get in with Jackson. Yeah, I've had enough of this slop they call food. Me too, Toms. I'm not eating any more of it. Quiet there! Quiet, huh? I'll show him. Are you with me, Jackson? Sure. Thank you, cup. Quiet! Quiet, you guys! Come on, start banging your cups, everybody. Start banging. Quiet! You too, Blackie, come on. Okay. Quiet! Quiet, you guys, you don't eat. Keep it up, you guys. We can't eat this stuff anyhow. Cut that out, all of you! Quit that noise! Cut it out! Ah, you bunch of bumps. 
What's the matter? You afraid of the guards? Keep it up like me. You better stop it, Jackson. Here comes one of the guards. You ain't stopping, Blackie. What are you trying to do? Trying to prove you're tougher than me? That's not hard. All right, Jackson. Blackie, cut that out or you're both wind up in solitary. What? Just for buying a cup of rhyme? I like music. Look, wise guy, just because you're Boston Black, you don't mean you can Go do it. Go ahead, Blackie. Pick a fight with this guard and see where it gets you. He's really tough. Look how I'm shaking. Hey, guard, do everybody a favor. Get lost. <laughs> All right, Blackie, you better come with me. I'm staying here. Oh, no, you're not. Hey, take your hands off me. No, you won't. No, what do you call it? Look him again, Blackie. All he's got to fight you with is a club. <laughs> okay, Blackie, you're practically big for this. Oh, oh. Don't any of you guys move. Not funny. What did you do, God? Kill him, maybe, huh? Shut up, Jackson. Got to pick this guy Blackie up. If he's alive, I take him to Ward. If he's dead, I take him to Moore. And now, back to Boston Blackie. Incredible as it seems, Boston Blackie, who has always done everything in his power to help the police in their fight against crime, has himself stepped outside the law and is now in prison, serving a 10 to 20 year sentence for robbery. In the prison dining room, Blackie has a battle with a prison guard and is knocked unconscious. As we return to our story, Blackie has been revived and is in the warden's office. He's come oh. out of it now, Warden. Well, it's about time, guard. Oh. Can you hear what I'm saying, Blackie? Uh, yeah. But I'll hear better when the buzzing goes out of my head. Well, listen to me. You're not a privileged character here, Blackie. Looks as if we're going to have to teach you a few things while you're here. I, uh, I think I've learned something already, Warden. I've learned my head isn't very hard. Well, you're going to learn a whole lot more before we get through with you. We'll give him special lessons, Warden. You'll want him in solitary, won't you? I don't know yet, God. Maybe I better teach him something personally. Uh, wait outside a few minutes. I get you, Warden. Okay, make it good. Now, you listen to me, Blackie. Just because you were a name on the outside is no reason to think that you're... It's all right now, Blackie. The guards can't hear us. You weren't badly hurt, were you? <laughs> Well, that club of his isn't made of feathers. Well, I'm sorry about that, Blackie, but this was all your idea, not mine. You might have ended up with a concussion. Maybe I have one now. I have the nicest headache I've had in years. How long was I unconscious? About a half hour. Oh, I was pretty worried. But the prison doctor said you'd be all right. As soon as they brought you in here, I called the city for... Oh, here he is now, I guess. Come in. Hello, Warden. I got here as soon as I could. Is he all right? I think so, Inspector Faraday. Yes, Faraday, I'm all right. For the first time in my life, I have a headache that you didn't give me. Blackie, I told you this was a fool way to try to contact me. But how else could I do it, Faraday? It had to be the real thing. When that guard hit me, a Jackson might have gotten wise. It took almost a week for me to convince him I wasn't put there as a plant. He believes you're a real prisoner now, though, doesn't he? Sure. I've been playing hard to get so long. I have him trying to break me down. Good. But you still haven't been close enough to him to get what you came for, huh? No, not yet, Faraday. But I'll get it soon. It may not be soon, Blackie. It may take you a long time. It can't be a long time, Warden. We've got to find Jim Baker right away. Baker's a killer. Sure, he's been quiet since he killed those two policemen in Wisconsin and murdered that bank teller in Oklahoma, but he's not going to be quiet much longer. You're convinced he's in the city, are you, Farney? Positive, Blanky. And unless we get him, and get him quick, there'll be a lot more innocent people dead from his gun. Why, he's killed crazy. Well, I'll find Baker for you, Farney. In fact, I'm going to let Jackson lead me right to him. He'll never crack, Blackie. He has 25 years to go before he gets out of here. Make him tell you where Baker is hiding out and we'll do the rest. It's going to be easier to let Jackson lead me to him. You see, there's going to be a prison break pretty soon. A break? When, Blackie? I don't know when, but I hear it soon, and I'm in on it. Better be prepared for it any minute. Then you're getting out of here right now. I'm getting out all right, Faraday, but I'm getting out with Jackson in that break. No, no, Blackie, you can't. It's too dangerous. We can't let this go as far as a break. But it's the only way I can get Jackson to tell me about Baker. No, Blackie, we'll have to let the whole thing drop. Or try something else. A break is out of the question. Especially with you in it. Well, there'll be shooting. Maybe somebody will be killed. And that somebody might be you. I can take care of myself. Not against prison guards with machine guns, Blackie. And we can't let any of the guards in on what we're doing. 
Word may get back to the prisoners, and then they'll kill you. I know that. So don't tip off the guards. Be prepared for a break, and let it get as far as the main gate before you stop it. If Jackson thinks we're really getting out, he'll tell me where I can find Baker. But, Blanky, we will stop the break. And you may get stopped while we're doing it. I know that, Faraday, but it's the only way I'll ever get Jackson to tell me where Baker is. And if I don't find out where Baker is, we can't stop him from going on a killing rampage. Blanky, I can't let you do it. Sorry, Faraday. It's just as good as done. Plans for the jailbreak are already made. I heard about it in the laundry this morning. We'll just have to let everything come out in the wash. Hey, Jackson. When are we busting out of here? Shut up, Thompson. Keep walking around like you're enjoying your exercise. Exercise? Yeah. I'm saving my strength for when we get past these walls. Get away from me, Thompson. The guard up on top of that wall is watching me, so scram. You'll know when it's time. Okay, okay. Hello, Jackson. Scram, Blackie, and get some exercise. I've had enough for now. I've walked around this yard three times. Come on out into the center of the place. I want to talk to you. Okay, I got something to say to you, too. We're busting out of here. Yeah, I know. You know? Walk over this way, away from the wall. I'll tell you all about it. How did you find out, Blackie? Skip that. The important thing is I went in. How do I know I can trust you? Look, when the guard knocked me out, they took me to the warden, didn't they? I could have told the warden about the break then, couldn't I? Oh, you knew about the break, huh? Sure. I heard about it from Toms and Harry in the laundry. If I'd wanted to tell a warden, I could have. Come on now. Watch it. I God's w- looking at us. Oh, let him look. We're talking about the weather. How about it, Jackson? I want in on that break. Well, you didn't tip off the warden. I guess you're okay. I didn't ask you what you thought of me. I told you I wanted in. Sure. You're in, Blackie. Good. How about a gun? I got one for you in the drain pipe of our cell. Swell. And the break's tonight. Just after lights out. I'll go over the plans with you when we get... All right. Exercise is over. Hold it. You see that guard there, Blackie? That's the baby I'm going to get. First, you get him. All right, in line. Get the one that I want, too. In you go, you guys. What? What time is it, Jackson? Almost lights out, Blackie. Don't you think it's time that I knew what was going on? Sure. It's like this. Only the guys in this block are making the break, see? The switch that unlocks all the cells here is down at the end of the hall. But how do we get there? I've been working on that a long time. I got the lock on my cell fixed so it won't close. Got a piece of tinfoil jammed into the catch so it clicks shut, but not all the way. Good. Yeah, that's taken care of, then. But after we get out of here, then what? Then we beat it down to the end of the hall. You and me. Throw the switch that unlocks the cells. That'll set off an alarm. The guard will open the door to find out what's going on. Uh-huh. We get him, grab his keys, get through the outside door and out in the yard. And then? And then it's every man for himself till we get to the main gate. Well, how do we get through the main gate? I got that fixed, too. Help from the outside. Everybody knows you were Jim Baker's number one man. Who's going to open a gate, Baker? No, some of Baker's men. Great. We get through the main gate, and then what? Then we head for Baker's. But what if we're separated? Does everybody know the way to Baker's? No, only me. It's going to stay that way till we get to the main gate. Anybody caught before that might squeal to the cops about where Baker's hiding. And I don't want that. This is going to be... Uh-oh. That's lights out. Yeah, and there they go, too. You know your way up the hall in the dark? Yeah, I think so. Uh, there goes the no-talking bell. Shh. The guard's at the door at the end of the hall. I know. I can see him. But he won't be there long. Hey, Baker! You better be quiet for a few minutes, Jackson. He'll go out in a minute. Yeah. There. He's gone. Sure this door of yours is unlocked? Here. I'll show you. Shh. There. That's enough. We can slip out now, huh? Easy. Which side of the hall is that switch on? I'll show you. You pull the switch that opens all the cells. I'll wait by the hall door for the guard to come in. Good. Just tap him on the head. A shot will ruin everything. Don't worry. He's not the one I want. You got your gun ready? Right here. Good. Here's the switch. Stand here and pull it as soon as I give you the word. Okay. I want to get right up here by this door, and when that guard comes running in... Now, Blackie. Now! Come on, boys. We're on our way out. Let's go. Get away from the hall door, Tom. The guard's plug you first thing. I'm out of the way, Harry. Come on, everybody. Over here, by the way. Come on. Look out, fellas. Here comes that guard. Hey, what's going on in there? Listen to what one of you guys gave Blackie. Get in. Keith, Jackson, let's go. Come on. Come on, all of you, let's go. Hey, wait, Jackson. 
I'm going to stick with you. Well, come on, then. This court will be full of guards in a minute. Yeah, it's still clear all the way out to the door into the courtyard, Jackson. Yeah, but it won't be clear out there. Run ahead, Tom. Quick. You got the keys? Yeah. Get that door open fast. We'll be piled up behind yeah, it. Okay, I'm doing it. Look, Jackson. They've got the floodlights on in the courtyard. I told you this was going to be tough, Blackie, but you're in it now. I know. Hurry, Tom. Open that door. I'm going in as fast as I can. There it is. Come on, let's go. Stick close to the wall, Blackie. They'll get you. Maybe. Jackson, you all right? Yeah, we got to duck the searchlights. Come over here. This way. Looks like a blind spot. Shoot out that searchlight, Blackie. Shoot it out. I'll try. Good way, Blackie. You got it. Yeah, nice shooting, Blackie. First shot. Glad I came along with you, huh? Yeah, but I won't be real glad till we're across the yard, not the main gate. We can run along this wall here for a few feet. Come on. Yeah, but make it quick. I made it. Me too. I just did. But they got a couple of more. Where's Harry? He's one of the guys they got. But he's just wounded. He's crawled back into the cell block. Let him go. They can't get nothing out of him. Let's try for the gate, Blackie. When we get there, they can't touch us. Yeah, but can we get there? Maybe if we zigzag. Let's go. Okay. Fast now. We made it, Jackson. We made it. You mean we almost made it? There's still the guardhouse between us and the gate. But we're under cover of the wall now, Jackson. Short dash around the guardhouse and we're at the gate. Yeah, and it's open, too. I got a quick look at it. Then we're as good as out. You bet. Oh, those bullets are too close for company. Look, just in case something happens, you'd better tell me where Baker is. I said I'll tell you when we get out. Well, we're as good as out now. Yeah, I guess we are. Okay, I'll tell you in case we have to separate. Baker's working in Begley's grocery store on Chester Street under the name of Ken Welch. Got it. Uh, well... Let's try and make that gate, huh? Yeah, come on. Let's go, you guys. Fast now. We'll be on the good side of these walls. Let's go. Around the guardhouse, quick. Come on, Blackie. I'm right with you, Jackson. And the rest of the guys are right behind. Hey, look. They got machine guns lined up across the gate. Get back. Get back. Well, looks as if we're not getting out of here after all. We better... Tr- hey, Blackie, you did this. You tipped off the warden. Okay, this gun will get me even. Here's where you get it, Blackie. Jackson's dead and all of us will be if we don't give up. What do you say? All right. We quit. Okay, we quit. That's what I thought they'd say. (laughs) All right, all right. You two can laugh about it now. But I didn't think it was so funny at the time. I'm sorry, Miss Wesley, but we were afraid to let you in on the secret. But why? <laughs> well, I'll tell you why, Mary. It was for your own protection. We were afraid Jackson would be suspicious of the whole trick, and maybe Baker's gang would have made you talk. Faraday is a big man on account of me. What? I found out where Baker was, and he grabbed him. All right, I'll forgive both of you this time, but next time it's going to be different. There won't be any next time, Mary. This was all a little too real to suit me. Gosh, when that judge sentenced me, I could have sworn he meant every word of it. Well, that's what you get for fooling judges. Oh, uh, he was in on the deal, Miss Wesley. And so was the prosecuting attorney. That's right. The fix was in, Mary. They sent me up, and I fixed up Mr. Baker when they did.
Calling all detectives. One thief at a time is bad enough. But when a detective finds himself at a convention of criminals, then he's really in trouble. That is the situation on this page from my casebook. The casebook of Jerry Browning, private detective. The most important thing a private detective like me, Jerry Browning, learns is to be in control of any situation. I was in one of the convention rooms of the Fowler Hotel because an hour earlier, somebody who didn't tell me his name phoned and hired me to keep a protective eye on the people attending the flour miller's convention. Pardon me, sir, is this your watch? I glanced at the watch a benevolent-looking gray-haired man was holding out. It certainly was my watch. Uh, yeah, thanks. I took the watch, shoved it back into my pocket, and melted into the crowd. Fine thing. A detective hired to protect a convention and getting his own pocket pick. Uh, excuse me, did you lose this? I blinked as another man offered my watch to me. Uh, yeah, I guess I did lose it. Where'd you find it? A man smiled, patted my shoulder. Don't give it a thought, my friend. I grinned ruefully, took the watch. This time, put it carefully into my trouser pocket. No two ways about it, I had to find somebody in charge. I stopped a portly little man ambling by. Uh, can you point out to me who's in charge of this convention? <laughs> Sorry, son. I, I just got here myself. He started to walk off, then turned back to me. <laughs> by the way, isn't this your wallet? I snatched the wallet, closed my fingers over his wrist. Yes, it is. And what's more, I think you just lifted it. Why, of course I did. And if I may say so, I don't think you have much future in the profession. I shook off my hand and stalked off. I leaned against the wall and mopped my brow. Obviously, I'd come to the wrong meeting room and stumbled on a convention of pickpockets. Hired to guard a convention, I entered the wrong meeting room and found myself in the midst of 50 pickpockets. My first impulse was to get out of there and yell for cops. Then I thought better of it. These men weren't bothering anybody. The cops could have no reason for arresting them. But even if there was nothing I could do about it, I did have the chance of a lifetime to watch pickpockets practice on each other. Just then, a soberly dressed man came up to me. Pardon me, I'm Arthur Warner. Astralis is my society name. Do you know where I might find the house detective? I gave him a suspicious look. The house, Dick? What for? I uh, hesitate to say this, but I'm afraid there's a thief among our number. I'm a diamond dealer. A packet of stones has been taken from my pocket. Very funny. Very, very funny, Mr. Astralis. But don't think you can distract my attention. Go work on somebody else. I leered at him, turned him around, and pushed him back into the crowd. Then I took my watch and my keys, put them into my inside jacket pocket along with my wallet, and started across the room. A tall, bearded man clutched at my sleeve. May I give you a demonstration of a new device that is absolutely detection-proof? You certainly can. A bearded man took a handkerchief from his pocket. Now watch this. Notice that my fingers are wide apart and motionless. He held the handkerchief lightly between thumb and forefinger. No! Couldn't believe my eyes. The handkerchief had vanished into thin air. The bearded man pulled up his coat sleeves. Not up my sleeves, you notice. This device makes use of none of the usual methods. I'll uh, sell it to you for one hundred dollars. I glanced up, noticed that a group of men had surrounded it. One of them was Arthur Warner, who'd given me the line about being a jeweler. He stepped forward and pointed at me. That's the man. I looked around at the circle of angry faces. One private detective among fifty pickpockets. Not so good. An elderly man stepped forward. Sir... Nobody here knows you. If you are one of us, a, a recent member, perhaps, kindly tell us your society name. I glanced in the direction of the door a good 30 feet off. The door is locked, young man. I jammed my hand under my jacket and grabbed for the revolver I always carry in my arm holster. Behind me, a voice said, I have your gun. I shrugged, dropped my hand. Okay, so you got me. But the room clerk downstairs knows me. He saw me come in. And if he doesn't get a report from me pretty soon, he'll figure out I'm in trouble, and you know what that means. The old man looked perplexed. You work with the room clerk? I saw that I was getting control of the situation. Not only the room clerk, but the house stick as well. Warner looked shocked, then incredulous. 
This is preposterous. The man is a thief and a liar. And I suggest we call the police at once. I couldn't believe my ears. The police? You're going to call the police? Certainly. Why shouldn't we call them? But, but you're all pickpockets. How dare you? Certainly our members demonstrate manual dexterity by extracting small objects from one another's pockets. But they return them instantly. I will have you know, sir, that not in 40 years has there been any actual theft at a meeting of the Merlin Magician Society. Magicians? The thing would have been funny if it hadn't been so serious. Gentlemen, I, I can explain everything. I'm a private detective. The voice behind me said, So he is. Here's his badge and his license. In his wallet. I ignore that. Never mind about me. The fact still remains that there's a thief in the room. Somebody who has Mr. Warner's packet of gems. If you'll permit me, I'll try to recover them. Very well, Mr. Uh, Browning. We will be grateful for your aid. I let my gaze wander from face to face. No two ways about it. I was in command of the situation. But what was I going to do about it? Is there uh, any other stranger in this room? The old man shook his head. Only you, Mr. Browning. I nodded. Fine. And Mr. Warner's jewels are still in the room because the thief wouldn't risk calling attention to himself by leaving. Not if he's a society member. Nobody has left the room, Mr. Browning. I did some of the fastest thinking of my life. The thief, whoever he was, would be prepared for a general search and was not worried about it. These men were all magicians. They knew tricks. They had device... devices. Of course, it had to be that. I suddenly turned and grabbed the bearded man. You offered to sell me a disappearing gimmick. You called attention to it because everybody here must know you've been working on it. Would think it funny if you didn't demonstrate it. I say Mr. Warner's missing jewels are hidden in this whatever it is. Trot it out and show it to us. There was a long pause. Then the bearded man slowly unbuttoned his jacket, folded back the lining to reveal a leather-lined pocket and an arrangement of wires and a small packet. I, uh, I only took them for a dramatic opportunity to demonstrate my wonderful illusion. Mr. Warner, your jewels! Well, that was his story, and he stuck to it. Maybe it was the truth. Maybe not. I've got my own opinion on the subject. Anyway, they let him go rather than expose the Merlin Society to scandal. As for me, I got $50 as a reward from Arthur Warner, plus a life membership in the Merlin Magician Society. Brownie is my society name, in case you're interested. Like I said, it's important for a detective to be in control of the situation. But when he's working with magicians... He's got to be careful he doesn't wind up losing everything else. Listen next time to Calling All Detectives, Mystery Drama, Mystery Quiz, and a chance for you to match wits with yours truly, Jerry Browning, Private Detective. Shadow, mysterious character who furthers the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. The Shadow uses his hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the unseen voice of the Shadow belongs. Today's story, Murder in the Ballpark. Fans, here we are back at Eagle Field. There's been no score in this game so far, you know. Whitey Brooks, the pitcher, is at that right-hand batter. Now it's two and two on Whitey. Two balls and two strikes. Here's the pitch. And Whitey hits one out into right field. It's a base hit. He's on his way now. And... Wait. Wait. Brooks is staggering on the baseline. 
blood is running down his cheek. He's fallen. Whitey Brooks, Ace Hiller, murdered in ballpark. Extra, extra, Brooks murdered in ballpark. Extra, eat all the money. Hey, Andy, what are you doing here in that clubhouse? You're supposed to be out warming up. You pitched today. Look at him. He falls asleep ten minutes before the game time. Come on, wake up, Andy. 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 Here, come here, somebody, quick. Andy. And he's dead. Extra, extra, second murder at Eagles Field. Crossman found murdered in clubhouse. Extra, read all about it. Our seat's at the foot of this aisle, Margot. Right on the third baseline. Okay. Oh, do you mind if we stand here a second, Lamont? I've never seen anything like this. A nice baseball game. Why, those big arc lights make the field as bright as day. That's right, Mongo. It's very impressive. Keep moving, will you, lady? You're blocking the view. Oh, sorry. Lead on, Lamont. All right. Say, you know, I'm very curious to know why we've come to this game tonight. You promised you'd tell me when we got here. Well, Mongo, my interest happens to be professional. Oh, you know that two killings have taken place at this ballpark within the last two weeks? Yes, I remember reading that two noted pitchers were mysteriously slain. And it happened in this very stadium. One was a good little ball player, too. He always clowns for the customers during practice. Lamont, it says here in the program that Joe Roberts caught more flies than any other shortstop. What's a shortstop, and what's he want to catch flies for? Well, Margo, a shortstop's one of the players, and, uh... Fly is, oh, I know uh, what a little fly is, silly, but why do they call him a shortstop? Well, because it... I'll tell you later, Margaret. the game started. Who are the players in blue? Those are the umpires, darling. Oh, I won't say another word. The batteries for tonight's game for the Eagles, Scraggy pitching, and Provis catching. Who did he say? <laughs> I don't know, Margaret. That's, uh, that's part of the game. You're never supposed to understand the announcer. For the Terriers, Marson pitching and Foisbun catching. Label. Well, I guess it's a thing to do. <laughs> Lamont, are you sure they can see to play under these lights? Well, they have all season. Now, uh, what do you say, Margot? Let's watch the ball game, shall we, huh? Who's the man in the center position? My darling, he's affectionately known as the pitcher. And one of the best pitchers in the baseball game, I might add, Ed Marson. What's he twisting all around for? He's winding up for the first pitch. And here it comes. Well, the lights have gone out. Come on, what's wrong? I don't know, but I don't like it. Sit tight, Margo. It's so dark. And I don't understand it. Oh, there, the light's back on again. I wonder what... Margo, look. Out in the center of the diamond. Marson, the pitcher. He's stretched out on the ground. Where are you going, Lamont? Out on the field to see what's happened to Marson. You wait there. What happened to Ed? I couldn't see nothing. Now, wait a minute. What's the matter? What? Don't move him until we find out what's happened. Ed. Ed. You all right? He's out cold. What? He's more than out cold, gentlemen. He's dead. Well, coroner, what's your verdict? Commissioner Weston... This man was electrocuted. Murphy, we'll start looking around out here in the infield. Uh, can I be of any help, Commissioner Weston? Huh? Oh, it's you, Cranston. I thought I ordered this park empty. Well, we knew that rule didn't apply to us, Mr. Weston. Hmm. Good evening, Miss Lane. Did the coroner reach any verdict? Yes, yes. Well, may I ask what it was? The department is not at liberty to divulge that information at present, Mr. Cranston. Oh, I see. It uh, wouldn't have been electrocution, huh? would it? Well, what makes you think that? This little steel plate here beside the pitcher's rubber. Uh, where? Right here. Uh, oh, so that's... Uh, wait, what... Commissioner. I wouldn't touch it if I were you until the wire is traced to its source. Well, that's how it was done. His steel plates on his spike shoes made the contact necessary for the shock. Wasn't that clever of Lamont to find it, Commissioner? Yes, yes. Who do you suppose did it? Well, the department is... Not at liberty to divulge that information at present. In other words, you don't know, isn't that it? Uh, not at all. I'd like to point out a few things to you, Weston. What's that? Have you noticed that all the deaths have occurred on the teams that are playing the Eagles? Yes. And all the victims were pitchers? Very excellent pitchers, I might add? Yes, but what does that prove? Nothing conclusive. 
Just a lead, that's all. Oh. I have a favor to ask of you people, Cranston. And what's that? I don't want anyone to know that we were aware of how the victim died, so please keep it quiet, will you? Certainly. And now, I have a favor to ask you. Well? I'd like to be present at headquarters tomorrow when you conduct your investigation. It's a deal. May I intrude? Oh, yes. Come in, Margot. The commissioner will be delighted to have you here. Right, Commissioner Weston? Uh, by all means, come in, Miss Lane. Thank you, Commissioner. Well, have you found out anything? No, I'm afraid not. Any more of them out there, Murphy? Uh, just two. Pixie Parker, the pitcher, and old Hilton, the groundkeeper. Uh, send Parker in. Yes, sir. Well, this will be very educational, Margot. Mr. Pixie Parker is uh, the original Daffiness boy. <laughs> sort of a fugitive from one of those stories Ring Lardner used to write. Oh, wonderful, Lamont. How do you do? Come right in, Parker. This is Miss Lane and Mr. Cranston. Oh, I'm very pleased to make your acquaintance. Thanks, Pard. Same here. Margo. Can you shed any light on our mystery, Pixie? Well, Commissioner, I am thinking while I am waiting outside that what happens last night is very much the same as happened to me when I'm having a 20-game win streak in Jersey City. Well, how's that? Well, as I am the sensation of the league, they are saving me for pitching night games exclusive. On account of I am such a gate attraction. Yes, but what's that to do with Marson's death? Well, I am reaching that point. Now, go on. One night I am pitching for Jersey City, steaming them in in my usual baffled style, when all of a sudden the lights is out. Yes, yes, go ahead. There is much nervousness and confusion. All right, all right. It's... And then all of a sudden the lights is on again. Listen, what then? We went on with the game, that's all. <laughs> I see. Thank you, Pixie. You've been a big help. Oh, that's okay. Uh, send Pop Hilton in, will you, Pixie? Sure, sure. I, uh, I am very happy to have made both your acquaintances. Likewise. Well, that was very informative, and this old Hilton guy would be worse. Well, who is he, Commissioner? The groundkeeper. He used to be a great pitcher years ago till he stopped a baseball at the top of his head. Oh. Been a little balmy ever since. I see. Come in. Uh, you sent for me. Uh, yes, sir. Now, this is Miss Lane and Mr. Cranston. How do you do? How do you do? Uh, you probably like me to tell you about the murders, wouldn't you? Can you shed any light on them? Light? Light? In darkness, there is light. And in light, darkness. Hmm, Gertrude Stein. Come on, Pop. Stop talking riddles. Do you or don't you know anything? Have you ever uh, read uh, uh, Shelley, Commissioner Weston? I don't read the sport pages. Uh, Shelley was a poet, Commissioner. Oh, a very fine poet. Shelley once wrote the... Uh, awful shadow of some unseen power floats, though uh, unseen amongst us. Now, that's what you're dealing with, Commissioner. I'm dealing with a murder case, and I've wasted enough time on you. That'll be all, Pop. Oh, well, as you wish, Commissioner. Good day. Well, an afternoon wasted. Not entirely. Oh, what do you mean, Cranston? Nothing. We'll be running along, too. Come on, Margo. Right. Goodbye, Commissioner. I'll send you over a copy of Shelley, if you like. I mean the poet, not the sports writer. Oh, uh, that's mighty nice. Thanks. Goodbye. What do you mean, Lamont, that the afternoon was not entirely wasted? That old man, Pop Hilton, he knows something. Do you think so? I'm sure of it. And the shadow will pay a call on the old boy at the baseball park tonight. that this ballpark is the same place that was full of cheering spectators last night. Yes. It is rather eerie, isn't it, Margo? Those rows and rows of empty seats. Deserted. Completely empty. Oh, it gives me the creeps. It seems almost haunted. Maybe it is haunted, Margo. Haunted by the ghosts of great players and the games they've played. Lamont, look. Out there on the playing field. Where? You can see it in the moonlight. Oh, what is it? I, I don't know. It's moving. It's a man. It wouldn't be one of your ghosts. No. It's old man Hilton, the groundkeeper. He seems to be very interested in something on the ground by the pitcher's mound. The steel plate that killed Marson. Yes. You wait here, Margot. I think the shadow should know what Hilton's up to. You won't be frightened here alone, will you? No. No, go ahead, Lamont. I'll just sit down in one of these empty seats. Was clever. Fiendishly clever. <laughs> I quite agree with you, Mr. Hilton. 
Hey, did I hear someone speak? I spoke. Well, who are you? I am known as the Shadow. Shadow? Shadow? Well, well, come out where I can see you. I'm standing right beside you, Hilton. Beside me? Oh, oh no, there, there, there's no one beside me. <laughs> oh, it's my mind playing tricks on me again. Your mind is not deceiving you, Hilton. I have merely clouded it so that you cannot see me. What do you want? I was interested in your examination of that steel plate. Oh. Rather ingenious killing device, wouldn't you say? Oh, yes, yes. Do you know anything about these deaths, Hilton? Of course. We all must know something about death. Death has a thousand doors from life. Yes, of course. And you know through which door Marson traveled, don't you? Yeah, that's right. I do. Can you tell me who opened that door for him? Well, I think I could. I think I could. Come now, Mr. Hilton. I think it was... Uh, uh. You'll never find out now, Mr. Shadow. Come back. Come back. Lamont. Lamont, are you all right? Yes, Margot. But the old man, Hilton, is he... Oh, my Lord. He's dead. The bullet pierced his head before he could reveal what he knew. Then you didn't learn anything. Oh, yes, I did, Margot. And our murderer will learn something, too. What do you mean? The killer, Margot, heard my shadow. But I saw his. What are you doing here? Oh, you think I'd have missed this, Lamont? Say, isn't that uniform a little large for you? All right, now, no ribs. Well, just what's the idea of you putting on that uniform and becoming a member of the Eagles baseball team? It's all in the line of duty, my sweet. I wanted to find out what goes on when they play a game, and the best way I could think of was to join the team. Are you going to be in the game? <laughs> Hardly. Oh, what a pity. I had trouble enough getting permission to sit on the bench. Well, why are they playing in this park today? What's the matter with the stadium we went to before? They haven't used Eagle Field since the murders. Now, will you excuse me, dear? I'm going down to the bench and sit with the players. Okay. Oh, Lamont. Yes? If there's a tailor down there, have him take in those trousers. Oh. Uh, come on, I'll knock out a few to you. Okay, put some uh, Pardon me, uh, didn't I meet you at the police headquarters? Yes, that's right. You're Pixie Parker, aren't you? Uh-huh. Are you maybe becoming a member of this team, uh, sitting on the bench like this? <laughs> no, Pixie. With your manager's permission, I'm visiting here today. Oh, you're like a visitor, huh? Yes, that's right. I get it. Hey, Bogo! Yes? Come here. I want you to meet Mr. Uh, Cranston. Uh, Mr. Cranston. Uh, he's like a visitor here today. How do you do, Mr. Cranston? Hello, Bogo. Bogo is our bat boy. Oh, yes. I've seen him on the field. You're a good little ball player, too, Bogo. Thanks. Yeah, he would be an even better ball player if it wasn't on account of his hunchback. Got it, Pitsy. Golly, you'd never know that me and Boko is pals the way he gets sore at me sometimes, would you? I'm sure you're pals. Hey, Pix. Yeah? Get out there and warm up. You're pitching today. No good. What do you mean, no good? I am not working today. I am not in the mood. Now listen, Pixie. I have spoken. Well, I'm still the manager of this team, and I see Let you get out. Let me talk to him, Mr. Stewart. What? He'll work today. I'll have him out there in a few minutes. Now listen, Shut Boko. Up. He'll pitch, Mr. Stewart. Uh, he'd better. Fine ball club where the manager has to get the bat boy to convince a player to pitch. Bogo, I don't care what you say. I you can't... listen to me. Look at me. Now, who's the greatest pitcher in baseball? Who is? Answer me. Answer me. I am. You see all those people there in the stands? They're here for just one reason. To see the great Parker pitch. That's right. You're not going to disappoint pitch. him, are you? You're going to give them their money's worth, aren't you? Yeah, their money's worth. Good. Come on, let's go out and warm up. Whatever you say, Boko. Whatever you say. Mr. Stewart. Yes? Does this Bogo always influence Parker like that? Yeah. He's the only one who can do anything with him. Bogo's like a little god to him. That's strange. There's a lot of strange things in baseball, Mr. Cranston. Would you excuse me a second, please? Sure, sure. Thanks. Margo. Oh, I 
know. They want you to play after all. No, no, be serious. I wish you'd do something for me right away. What? Go up to the front office and find out the home address of Pixie Parker. Why? What's up? He's going to receive a visit this evening from the shadow. Mr. Parker. Mr. Parker. What? Mr. Parker, I'd like to talk to you. Where are you? I don't see nobody. I'm right here in this room with you. No, don't look around for me. I'm invisible to your eyes. What is this, spooks or something? I'm not a spook, Pixie. I'm a flesh and blood human. But I control your mind so that you can't see me. Who are you? Men call me the Shadow. Well, but what do you want from me? I'm seeking information. Information about your little friend, Bogo. Bogo? What's the matter with Bogo? He ain't done nothing. You're wrong, Parker. Bogo has done plenty. Well, what do you mean? I mean that I have reason to believe that Bogo is responsible for the murders in the ballpark. Ah, uh, yuck, you're crazy. Bogo wouldn't hurt nobody. That's where you're wrong, Parker. Now tell me, what is this influence that he exerts over you? Influence? Yes, this power to make you do just what he wants you to. Well, he, he ain't got no power over me. He, he just thinks I'm the greatest pitcher that ever was. And the only time he ever gets sore is when nobody agrees with that. I see. He's my pal. Why, why, just the other day, he said he'd kill any pitcher that people thought was better than me. He's... Kill anybody? No. Oh, no. No, he didn't mean nothing by that, though, honest. You're wrong, Parker. No, he wouldn't hurt nobody. He, he's just rooting for me, that's all. Why, why, if anything was to happen to me, I, I think he'd die. We'll give him a chance to prove that tonight, Parker. What do you mean? You'll see, Parker. You'll see... <laughs> Commissioner Weston speaking. Commissioner, this is the shadow. What? You again? Yes, I'm sorry to bother you, but I believe that I have a solution to your baseball murders. What? You have? Or who did them? I can't say for sure yet. Oh, now look, Shadow, I'm a busy man. Weston, have... you must believe me. Now, here's what I want you to do. Get every player that was in the game the other night up to Eagle Field right away. Why? I want you to restage the game and the murder just as it occurred before. But I have I been... happen to know about that electric plate that killed Marson. Well, uh, how did you find that out? Never mind. Now, here's an important detail. Don't allow Pixie Parker to talk to anyone until I arrive. Say, who's supposed to be the police commissioner around here anyway? You are, of course, Commissioner. See you at the ballpark. Well, a ball that... Murphy! Murphy! Uh, yes, sir. I uh, just got an idea. Yes, Commissioner. Call all the players that were in that game the other night. Get them up to the park. Yes, sir. I think I figured out a solution to the murders. Uh, good work, Chief. Oh, thank you, Murphy. Ah, wonder where that shadow is. Wonder what he expects to find out here. Good evening, Commissioner Weston. Stand right where you are. Sorry to be late for the ball game. All right, Shadow, what do you want? What's this, one of your gay little pranks? No, Commissioner. This is a very serious matter. No one knows I'm here but you. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Now, look. Here's what I want you to do. Now, look, here's what I want you to do, men. Listen to the Commissioner there, We're fellas. going to replay the events leading up to the crime exactly as they happened the other night. Everyone take his position in the field, please. Follow that now. You'll have a complete team out there, Commissioner Weston. That is, except for a pitcher. And we'll want someone to stand in for the late Mr. Marson, too. Uh, get Pixie Parker. Okay. Hey, Pixie! Yep, I'll be right with you. Well, good evening, Commissioner Weston. What? Why didn't you tell me you were going to have this party? Margo and I wouldn't want to miss this for the world. Here again, eh, Cranston? Good evening, Miss Lane. Not a very cordial reception, Commissioner. What are you doing, giving up your job in the police force and becoming a baseball player? And look here, you two. I'll let you hear you can stay, but keep quiet. This is a very serious job. All right, we won't say a word. Pixie Parker? Yes, sir. I'd like you to reenact Marson's role in the game the other night. Well, you mean I, I should be standing in for a dead guy? There's no danger, Pixie. Of course, if you're afraid... Who's afraid? Wait a minute. Don't do it, Pixie. Why, Boko, do you want him to think maybe I'm scared? I don't care what they think. Let him use someone else. But I want Parker to do it, Boko. Well, he ain't doing it, see? Now, wait a minute, Shorty. I said he's doing it, and that goes. I uh, guess that settles it, huh, Boko? Uh, 
You want I should go out there now? Yes, Pixie, now. Okay. Where are you going, Bogo? Well, I, I'm going back to the clubhouse. I'm not going to watch my pal play a dead man. You'd better stay here. What for? Stay here, Bogo. Stick with him, Murphy. Yes, sir. What is this? You guys can't kick me around. Mr. Stewart, did you uh, tell the man to put out the floodlights just as it did the other night? Yes, Commissioner. Get out there on the pitcher's mound, Pixie. Okay. I uh, want you to wind up just the way Marson did. Then we'll put the lights out. No. No, don't do it, Pixie. Shut up, you. Ready, Parker? All right. Pixie! Pixie, no, you'll be electrocuted. How did you know he'd be electrocuted, Bogo? Why, uh, why you fellas were talking about it. No one knew how Marson died except myself and you, Bogo. I don't know what made me say it. Honest, I don't. I know what made you say it. You said it because you murdered Ed Marson. Oh, that's a lie. Then why didn't you want Parker to get out in the pitcher's mound? And why did you want to leave here? Because you wanted to turn off the current so that Parker wouldn't be electrocuted like Marson. No, no. And why? Why? Perhaps I can tell you why, Commissioner. Because in Bogo's own mind, he is Parker. Are you crazy? No, all your life you've wanted to be a great ball player. But you couldn't be, Bogo. You couldn't be because of your handicap. When Parker came along, at last you'd found someone to whom you could transfer that desire. Someone with a mind sufficiently childish to obey your wishes. You began to imagine that you were Parker. You were pitching those great games. Isn't that right, Bogo? Sure, sure, I am Parker. Then your ego took hold. You became jealous of anyone whose fame might outdo yours. Yours and Parker. And that jealousy made you murder Whitey Brooks, Andy Crossman, and Ed Marshall. <laughs> yeah, I did it. I killed all of them. Oh, uh, God, that ain't true. Uh, sure, it's true, you simpleton. I was the one who made you great. I was you, Parker. Without me, you're not. He don't mean that. Weston, there's your confession. Well, Mont, you were wonderful. You sounded just like a real detective. <laughs> I'm sorry, Commissioner. I didn't mean to take over your job. The, the excitement must have gotten me. That's all right. Uh, put the cuffs on him, Murphy. Let go of me. Look out. He's got a gun. Don't move any of you. I'm getting out of this park, see? None of you can touch me. <laughs> I can fuck him without hitting one of the players. Wait, put that gun away, Commissioner. I'll have to shoot him. He's getting away. He's not getting away. Give me that baseball. Here. Yeah. So I ain't no pitcher without him, huh? I'll show him something. Uh, hit him. Good Lord. That's the best strike I ever threw. Go out and pick him up, Mr. Commissioner. Compliments to the great Pixie Parker. <laughs> Today's program is based on a story copyrighted by The Shadow Magazine. All the characters and all the places named are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. The Shadow Magazine is on sale at your local newsstand. The weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The Shadow knows. <laughs> And now, Gangbusters! Gangbusters, presented in cooperation with police and federal law enforcement departments throughout the United States. The only national program that brings you authentic police case histories. Gangbusters has asked the Honorable John J. Sullivan, former Deputy Commissioner and Chief of Detectives of the Police Department of the City of New York, to narrate the case of the Metropolitan Motor Mob. Commissioner Sullivan. Thank you, and good evening, Gangbusters listeners. I'd like to begin tonight's case in the Williamsburg section of Brooklyn. Early one evening, just about a year ago, in a small, unkempt neighborhood candy and stationery store... An attractive but overpainted blonde sat at a tiny fountain, drinking a soda and reading a magazine. A few steps away, the proprietor stood counting some of the small change, which made up a good part of the store's receipts. George. What? You made the soda too sweet. Will you put in a little vichy? Put it in yourself. I'm busy. I don't know the Vichy from the plain water. 
Oh, for crying out loud, I'm trying to count up some money. <laughs> Nickels and dimes. Ten years you got a candy store, you don't know how to make a soda yet. Hey, try that. And leave me alone. George. Water. What? Why don't we sell a joint? There's a lot of other things we could be doing nights, you know. Listen, Belle, it's always a good policy to have a nice little business to fall back on. Yeah, but a lousy candy... Hi, Belle. Hi. How you doing? Hey, George. Call your mother, Cookie. She's at your Aunt Carrie. Oh, is that so? When did she phone? About an hour ago. George, give me two nickels, will you? Listen, your old lady can wait a minute. What'd you do with the car? What do you think I did with it? I parked it around the corner. You want to get it stolen? Well, how's somebody going to steal it? Just like you did. Nobody can steal it. I took the jumper off the ignition. Well, get it in the garage. You ought to open and let a hot car lay on the street. Some cops liable to trip over it. All right, give me a chance. Give him a chance. It takes him three hours to go out to Bensonhurst and lift the car and bring it back. He wants me to give him a chance. Get in the garage, Cookie. I want to get it registered in the morning and move it for a fast sale. Oh, George, just let me call my mother. Give me a couple of nickels for a dime, will you? Here. Call your mother and get the car in the garage. All right. A few minutes, George. What's with his mother all the time, anyway? Oh, it's psycho... whatever they call it. It's got something to do with Freud. What's Cookie and his mother got to do with anybody like Freud? I read it once in the paper, The Mirror, on Sunday morning. A big article in the magazine section. You think a guy who was long past the 30 mark and has already had one or two bits and Sing Sing behind him could send his old lady a buck or two once in a while and forget about it? Well, according to Freud, you get attached to something. It's a proven fact. Because it was in a mirror? In Cookie's case, it's his mother. With you, it's this lousy candy store. You're a big-time operator in hot cars. You've got to set up with forged registrations and special keys and a whole crew of guys. The money's pouring in from all sides. So what's that prove? It proves you've got no business spending 12, 15 hours a day in a joint like this. Three-cent newspapers and five-cent candies. Your ego's attached to it. It's plain psychological. What do you want me to do? Check in at Bellevue for observation? I want you to get rid of this chicken feed business and start enjoying the money we've been making. Listen, Bell, if I told you once, I told you a thousand times. It... <laughs> How do you like that? How do we like what? My mother wants to know if it'll be all right if she stays overnight at my Aunt Carrie. I don't see what's wrong with it if your Aunt Carrie's got an extra bed. She's worried there won't be somebody to fix me breakfast in the morning. <laughs> Ain't she sweet? Yeah, like sugar candy. Listen, Cookie, get the car put up, will you? Okay, okay, I'm going. Have patience. Patience. You know, you got a lot of nerve, Bell. Making a comparison between this candy store and Cookie's mother. Adler, Lieutenant. Sergeant Ryan is out here with one happy Harry Harris. Is that the used car dealer? Yeah, that's right, Lieutenant. All right. Tell Ryan to bring him in. Yeah. Lieutenant says step right in. Okay, Abby, in there. I want the lieutenant to meet one of the prized chumps of our day and age. Go ahead. Listen, Sergeant, it was a perfectly honest mistake. Boss, this is Happy Harry Harris. Happy Harry, Lieutenant Hanson. It's a pleasure. Sit down, Happy. Thanks. If I can't stay long, I've got to get back to the lot, you understand? Uh, what did his records show, Ryan? Oh, his records are all right, boss. He just got stung like the rest of them. Sure, he got stung. These two guys drive the car up on the lot, you understand? They say, you want to buy it? I say, sure, I want to buy it. That's what I'm in business for. Registration is perfectly okay with a stamp on it. But to me, it's perfectly legitimate deal. Nothing illegitimate, you understand? What am I supposed to do? Pass it up and let him go down the block to see my competition? You should be more careful, Harry. The dealer's gotten plenty of warning as bunches operating all over New York and Brooklyn. Listen, Lieutenant, I'm plenty careful, you understand? Who's out the $1,600 in this deal? Me, that's who. I check every angle. Look, when all a bunch of thieves need is a rubber stamp with the numbers, being careful ain't enough. Well, there's one consolation, Harry. You're not the only one who's been hit. Yeah, thanks. It's going to make me sleep nights. But it ain't going to get me back to $1,600, I'm out. That's gone, you understand? Uh, what did you remember about this pair, Ryan? Uh, not much, Lieutenant. Just while they were making out the papers, the little one asked to use the telephone. Who'd he call, Happy? Uh, the guy, you mean? Yeah. Well, uh, sounds to me like he's talking to his mother. But I can't hear very well. I'm here, he's there, I'm making out the papers, you understand? I'm not paying particular attention. But he calls a ma, all over the telephone, that is. I've been over this angle with him, Lieutenant. Get everything we need on him. Okay, Harry. 
If we want you any more, we'll be in touch. Yeah, thanks. And you'll be more careful from now on, huh? Careful? <laughs> from now on, I investigate every deal from top to bottom, you understand? Every customer's got to bring his birth certificate. So long. <sighs> what number was that, Ryan? 22, boss. And there's no telling how many more we haven't heard about yet. Don't you think that's just about enough? Yeah, I'd say so. Then suppose you start getting a line on those thieves. Listen, boss, I got Adler and Mackey and myself, all of us, working overtime. We can't even get a smell. These people jump from Brooklyn to New York to the Bronx and back to Queens. They pick up a car here, they sell it to a dealer there. Okay, to come in, Lieutenant? Yeah, Adler, come ahead. Well, was Happy Harry any help? Yeah, a lot of help, Adler. One of the thieves has got a mother. No kidding. You fellas better start making some progress on this. Chief's beginning to put the pressure on me, and I'm passing it right along to you. I want those thieves. Brian, uh, how did Happy Harry know that one of them had a mother? Called her on the telephone from the shack on the used car lot. Huh? Come to think of it, that's sort of a strange thing for a thief to do. All the thieves I know are strange people, boss. You know, I once handled a guy five or six years ago. We talked to him about car thefts, burglaries. He talked to us about his mother. What was his name? Uh, Cut the plea. Got two to five years out of it, I think. God, oh, couldn't be the same guy. You could check him. Dallas. Cookie Dallas. Yeah, Cookie Dallas. Well, come on, Adler. Let's see what we can dig up on Mr. Cookie Dallas. What are you doing with my car? Oh, me? Yeah, you. What are you doing? Now, look, pal, don't get excited. I was just admiring... I know what you're up to. I'm going to call the police. Oh, no, you're not. <laughs> what do you think I was doing? Hey, what's going on there? Holy... Hello, police officer. Hello, you... <laughs> Hello, candy store. Hello, George. This is Cookie. Did my mother call? No, she didn't. No, huh? But if she does, will you tell her I won't be home to sleep tonight? What's the matter? Listen, George, I had a little trouble. What kind of trouble? Well, I was working on a brand new Roadmaster seat net, like off the floor. So? So the owner walks up out of the dark. I had to bounce him one on the head. Then a cop walks around the corner. Did you get away okay? Well, I ain't talking for no police station. You know, he shot at me a couple of times. Lucky it was dark enough, I ducked down the subway station. All right, now listen, we're laying off for a while. Get in touch with the boys. All of you stay away from here and stay away from the garage till I give the word. Well, George, it ain't necessary. Nobody could identify me. It was too dark. I said we're laying off for a while. Now, go on home to Mama. I'll call you when I want you. Who was it, George? It's Cookie. He had a narrow squeak. You know, I've been looking for something like this, Bill. Good excuse to keep Cookie and the boys from coming around. We're stopping the operation. So what happens to the business? Well, the business goes on. The store stays open as usual. I don't mean that lousy pennies worth of this, pennies worth of that business. I mean the automobile business. Well, baby, there is now something like 50 grand in the kitty. Right or wrong? Right, but the kitty ain't all yours, you know. Half belongs to Cookie and the boys as well, and me. I decided it's all going to be mine and yours. So? What made you decide that? It stands to reason. The man with the brains is entitled, don't you think? Maybe. Maybe you're right, George. We could get rid of this candy store even if we have to give it away and travel. In luxury, we'll travel. Oh, Belle, baby, how can I get rid of the candy store or go on business? You sell it or you give it away or count me out of the deal. I'm tired of going through life with a candy store around my neck like, like a milestone. Okay, Belle, I'll get rid of the candy store. But I gotta get my price. So, gangbusters listeners, detectives of the New York City Police Department were getting their first lead in their investigation of a annoying auto theft ring. The leader of the gang, who was planning to cut other members out of their share of the loot, anticipated trouble, but they didn't know just how much. And now, here again is tonight's narrator, Commissioner John J. Sullivan. Well, New York detectives were just getting a start. 
on their investigation into this auto theft ring. It was the next afternoon when Sergeant Ryan walked from a restaurant toward a car parked on Union Avenue in Brooklyn. Cookie's coming out, Lieutenant. Good. Just paying his check. All right, Happy. I'll point out this man when he passes. His name's Cookie Dallas. He's an ex-convict with a record for auto theft. We think he may also be the one at whom a patrolman fired two shots last night. We don't know. I want you to take a good look at him and tell me if he's one of the men. The one that used the phone. Yeah, Lieutenant. I'll take a look. But uh, I don't have much recollection for the guy, you understand? The other one does all the transacting. The little one is just along for the ride. Here he comes, boss. Look him over, Happy. That one. Now, you'll bet. I'm looking. Well? Uh, when he gets a little closer, my uh, eyes aren't so good, you understand? I need glasses, but I kind of feel it print my personality, you know what I mean? He's plenty close now. Yeah, yeah. Is he the guy? Uh, he looks familiar, that much I'll say. But is he the guy? Well, I can't say definitely one way or the other, but he looks familiar, you understand? Like I know him from someplace. <sighs> That's not enough, Happy. There goes Adler and Mackey right behind us. And keep him there. Yeah. Boy, I wish we'd picked up his trail last night. We might have had him already. I'm sorry, Lieutenant, but if I could identify him, I would. You know me. But the little guy I don't pay much attention to, you understand? But I, I know I recognize the other guy. Okay, Happy. If he's one of them, sooner or later he'll lead us to the man you can recognize. George. Shut that thing off. Shut it off. Please. Okay. It's off, Bell. Six o'clock on a Sunday morning. I gotta get the store. Customers will be down wanting the Sunday papers. Let them get them elsewhere. Who cares? Ah, oh, Bell, honey, I'm sorry. It, it ain't in my heart to tell the story. Yeah, well, it's in my heart. Like you said, it must be psychology. The same as Cookie's mother. A man with brains enough to work out a perfect racket stealing cars don't have to peddle newspapers at 6 o'clock Sunday morning. I'm sorry, Bell. I can't sell the store. If I got to give up the car stealing racket and keep the store, I'll give up the racket. And what if you got to give up your wife? Oh, now, Bell, don't force me to make such a choice. Oh, look at him. The big martyr standing there expecting somebody to shed tears for him. Bell, I can't. If you stick around the store, how long do you think it'll be before Cookie and the others will want their dough? How long can you stall? I'll think of something to tell him. Okay, George. You keep the still. Oh, honey, baby, I'm glad you can see it my I way. I can't see it your way, George. I just got plans of my own, and they don't include any candy store with newspapers at 6 o'clock Sunday morning. Sergeant Ryan. Hello, Ryan. Adler. The lieutenant around? Not right now, Adler. What's doing? Well, Mackie and I are still behind Cookie. Yeah? Anything? Well, he took his mother out for an evening. We left home about 8 o'clock. He took her right to the Paramount. You go in? Yeah, we sat a couple of rows behind him. How's the picture? Well, I've seen better. One of those high-class westerns. Uh, where's Cookie now? He's buying his mama an ice cream soda. Well, what flavor? Listen, Ryan, how about talking to the lieutenant? I think we ought to give up on Cookie. Been with him since last Thursday, and all we've seen is his mother. Your idea, Adler. Uh, I regret opening my mouth. Boss says stick with Cookie, so you stick with him. Uh, maybe his mother will steal a car. Hello, pal. Oh, we ain't too late. Oh, uh, don't let it bother you, Cookie. There's nothing I like better than waiting in a saloon all alone. Sam. Yeah, thanks. What do you want to drink? Oh, no, not a thing, Bell. I just finished an ice cream soda not a half hour ago. What flavor? Strawberry. And you keep me waiting because of an ice cream soda. Well, it wasn't the ice cream soda. It was a long picture. Can't expect somebody to take his mother out without buying an ice cream soda or something after, can you? No, 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 Cookie. I, I guess you can't. Well, what's the deal? George ready to start operating again? It's about time. No, George ain't ready. Well, listen, what's the matter? I don't see you getting so hot with cops. We got a good thing. We got to milk it. Boys are getting impatient. Not to mention me. George says no. All right, George says no. What about the dough I got coming? 
What's holding that up? I can use it. Listen, Hucky. If George is so stubborn, we could start right up operating again without you. Well, sure we could. Without you? Yeah. You get the boys to lift the cars. I'll take care of making up the registrations and the license plates. Now, wait a minute, Beth. I know how it's done. I've seen him do every one of them. There's no trick to it. Yeah, but George ain't going to be very happy. Oh, he'll be happy enough with his candy store. Ben, you of... want dough, don't you, Cookie? If George would give me what I got coming, I'd be okay. He won't give you what you got coming. Who says he won't? I do. Well, that ain't no way to do. He won't give it to you unless you and the rest of the boys get together and get tough. Awful tough. Whose side are you on, anyway? I've had enough of George and that lousy candy store. I want to live, Cookie. Yeah? Oh, you dreams of nickels and dimes. Well? well? Give me some time to think it over. I'm anxious to get started. Start thinking right now. Yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking. Lieutenant? Yeah? Mackey just called. Where is he? He and Adler were behind Cookie. Cookie took his mother home, then went to this bar in Flatbush. There was a woman waiting there. He went right over to a table and sat down. Who was the woman? Mackey didn't know, boss. They talked for a half hour or so, and then Cookie left alone, apparently went home to bed. Mackey followed him there, and Adler stayed in the bar with intentions of following the woman. But then... Uh, stay here, Ryan. All right, Lieutenant. Lieutenant Hanson. Hello, Lieutenant Adler. Yes, Adler. Did Maggie call in? Yes, we know all about the woman. Who is she? Well, she left the bar right after Cookie did. She took a cab, went right to this apartment house on the bay. She used the key on the street door, went upstairs on the self-service elevator. Stopped on the fourth floor, and that's where she apparently got out. Any idea who she is? Yeah, I think so. I woke the superintendent, and he said the only woman of that description living on the fourth floor is a Mrs. George Rossi. Husband operates a small candy store in Williamsburg. All right, Adler. Go on home and get some sleep. We'll start checking up on this couple in the meantime. Good morning, George. Good morning, Belle. How's every little thing? Where were you till nearly two o'clock this morning? I told you, George, if your heart's all in this candy store, we're through. I'll make my own arrangements. And from a good source, I understand you started making such arrangements. What do you mean, a good source? How do you like that, George? Cookie, what? what? Hello, Belle. George, whatever he told you is a lie. It's a plain lie. Cookie, watch the store a minute. Belle and I are going in back and talk this over. Yeah, George. Now, listen, George. In back. Go on. Watch who you're shoving. In back, I said. In back. All right. Now, go on. Now, listen, George. Who are you going to believe, me or a party like Cookie? You should have known Cookie would come running back to me. George, I would have gotten you away with it. Now i got to give the boys the money. i got to start operating all over again. Yeah, but that's good, George. All because you're too high class for a candy store, huh? Let's see if this is too high class for you. Yeah. I'll show you too high class, <laughs> huh? Too high class. <laughs> Now, sit down here. Sit down and think it over. From now on, maybe you'll act like a good wife should. A good wife should stay out of her husband's business affairs. Now, Cookie, I think everything is now straightened out. Yeah, well, let's hope so, George. One of the boys and me get our money. Tonight, Cookie. Tonight we start operating again. I'm now convinced the cops got no line from your little incident. Good, I'm glad to hear it. Like I said, Cookie, uh, sometimes women get like that. She's what's called a, a psychological liar. She can't help it, you know. Makes up these stories out of thin air. I read about such a case in the Sunday Mirror. Big article in a magazine section. All right, Happy. We'll walk by the store again. Take a good look in the window. I've got to know definitely whether that's the man. Yeah, Lieutenant. If I can identify him, I will. I want to help the lawyer understand. Okay. Take your look. Well? That's him, Lieutenant. The one behind the soda fountain is him. I know him anyway. He's got that peculiar look, you understand? Okay. Hold it here. Yeah. Ryan, come here. 
Well, you know, I've been in the automobile business since Plymouth was a rock. But from where I sit, you never think cops work this hard. Yeah, Lieutenant. How's it go? Happy sure George is the guy. Well, positive. Good, good. I want men on both Cookie and George 24 hours a day. If and when they grab another car, we got them right. And that's the way I want them. Right. George. How's it look, Cookie? It's a new Cadillac sedan. Doors and windows? And locked. There won't be no trouble. Where's the owner? I'm in that bar for a drink. We got time? Can he have his drink in 20 seconds? What are you so nervous about? Well, it's a long time since I worked on the street. Well, so what? You never forget. All right, let's go. Lean on the no-draft ventilator and I'll slip the loop through. Okay, okay, I know. All right, lean on it. Yeah. That's it. That's it. How you doing? Hold it. Hurry it up, will you? There she is. All right, get it. See? I'm an expert. Now, why are you on the ignition? Now, just let me handle it, George. Don't get nervous. All right, then, handle it. You know, George, I'm surprised that you... Considering you taught me this business. <laughs> just goes to show you how rusty you can get. Cut out the conversation, will you? There it is. All right, get going. Oh, what a sweet motor. Yeah. You know, George, someday I'm going to lift one of these caddies for my own personal use. Yeah, it looks like we're okay. There's nothing to worry about, George. It was like lightning. Yeah. I guess I was just a little upset about Belle. Who'd ever think a wife of seven years standing would suddenly lose her head like that? You know, for a while I believed her. Ah, Cookie, I wouldn't do a thing like that, not me. Yeah, and then I got to thinking. George wouldn't do a thing like that. Don't waste any time. Get this thing into the garage. Yeah, I want to get home. I promised my mother I'd hang some pictures. You know, I got a mother that just... Cookie. They're right in back of us. Gun it. We can leave them in this boat. Coming up on us. Drive. It's down to the floor now. Take the corner. Hold on. Watch it. I can't hold it. Cookie! Maybe they're faking. Oh, that ain't faking. Adler, get an ambulance. Yeah, it's a call box on the corner. Well, boys, I guess we got them. I guess so, Ryan. Boy, look at that mess. You mean the thieves or the car? The car. The thieves can be patched up. Yeah, and they'll have a long time to mend. Well, gangbusters listeners, these car thieves were taken to the hospital and eventually recovered from their injuries. The whole gang was arrested, tried, and convicted. Its principal members are now serving their terms in Sing Sing. Thank you, Commissioner John J. Sullivan, for this most interesting case history. And congratulations to all the New York detectives who participated in this difficult investigation. Tonight's case was dramatized by Stanley Ness and directed by George Zachary with Vandal Kramer and Eileen Palmer in leading roles. Olin Tai speaking. Gangbusters is a Phillips H. Lord production. The National Broadcasting Company wishes to call your attention to a program regularly heard on Monday evenings at 10 p.m. New York time over most of these stations. We invite you now to listen, evaluate, and perhaps become a fan of this regularly scheduled Monday night program. Here then, for your approval, is... This is Randy Stone. I cover the night beat for the Chicago Star. Stories start in many different ways. Tonight's story began when one man tried to destroy another with the strangest weapon of all, darkness. Night Beat, starring Frank Lovejoy and Randy Stone.
When your job is to walk into the darkness and discover what makes a city tick, you pick up some mighty strange friends. The winos dreaming of a muscatel paradise and cold, dark doorways. The petty larceny boys with their fast deals. The painted little dames defying the world with their brassy laughter. The homeless and the hopeless. In the city, the night is for the lost. Sometimes you feel a hunger to be with someone of the everyday world. Some nice, well-adjusted soul who's got a reason for waking up tomorrow morning. I guess that's why I dropped in to see Bessie Chatfield tonight. Bessie, a little gray-haired librarian who has charge of a small storefront library on Huron Street. No one around this time of night but Bessie and a young fellow in a gray raincoat alone at a reading table. We haven't seen you, oh, in such a long time. <laughs> well, since Forever Amber, you haven't had the kind of high-type literature that interests me. <laughs> <laughs> and when you finally do drop in, look what time you get here. Ten o'clock. Right when I have to go over and start turning off the light. Oh, I timed it that way so I could get you behind these bookcases away from that fellow at the reading desk. <laughs> I'm afraid your timing is about 35 years off, Mr. Stone. Oh, these light switches. Why do they always put them so high up? Aren't you going to tell that fellow it's time to go home? <laughs> this is the way we tell them. We flick off the lights and then flick them on again. First, off like this. No! Don't do that! No! What? Turn the lights on quick. Let me handle this. What is the idea of doing that, mister? Is that supposed to be smart or something? Oh, now, take it easy, fella. Take or did it he easy. pay you to do it? Is that the deal? Hmm? You tell George Brewster that the game doesn't amuse me anymore. You tell him if he keeps it up, I'll... I'll kill him. I turned the lights out. It's closing time. What? Closing time? Oh. Yes, of course. What's wrong with you, buddy? Are you sick or sick? Some... Yeah, that's me. Sick. Only mine is a... It's a childhood disease. Childhood. Childhood. Now. What in the world was that? Ever seen him before? He's come in a couple of times this week. Spent all his time reading some reference books at the table. Seemed to be such a nice, polite young man. Considerate, kindly. Hmm, let's, let's take a look at those books. Oh, my heavens. My heart is beating a mile a minute. It, 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 did you see his face? It frightened me. He was even more scared than we were. Of what? These are the books he was reading? Yes. The Mind in Limbo, Abnormal Psychology, Modern Psychiatry. Why would he want books like this? Maybe he was looking for somebody in these books. Who? Himself, Bessie. Probably himself. <laughs> Bessie was pretty upset, so after she locked up for the night, I started walking her to the elevated station over on Lake Street. We'd walked a couple of blocks through the dark, empty streets when suddenly Bessie grabbed my arm. Mr. Stone, what? that man down the street, looking into that store window, hmm? that's him. Oh, yes, same gray raincoat, same lad. And look, Mr. Stone, what's that in his hand? It's a piece of pipe or something. He's breaking that store window. Yes, you wait right here, honey. Oh, be careful, Mr. Stone, be careful. The fellow was reaching through the broken window glass for whatever it was that had struck his fancy. He heard me coming and he turned toward me. The wan streetlight did something to his face. It seemed twisted and torn. Blood was running down his hand where the glass had cut him. Then I saw what he'd taken from the window. A gun. What's the idea, pal? He spun around and he started running for the elevated station down the block. And in the best tradition of the Rover boys, I stayed right on his tail. He turned back to see how I was doing and stumbled over a trash can near the curb. I caught up with him, grabbing his arm. Let go of me. Leave me alone. Uh -uh. Let go of me. He slashed the gun across my face and began running again. I stopped long enough to take a quick inventory of my teeth. Up above, I heard the elevator train coming into the station. The young fellow had reached the station steps and was going up fast, trying to make that train. I reached for one of his legs. He turned and gave it to me right in the stomach. <laughs> I folded up, and I just sat there, listening to the train pull away with a fellow on it, and remembering what Bessie had said about him being such a nice, polite young man. After a while, I began to feel somewhat human again. 
I notified the police what had happened, and they sent a squad car out. After they left, I remembered something. A name this nice, polite young man had been throwing around. George Brewster. I found a phone book in a cigar store. There were three George Brewsters. The first number didn't answer. I tried the second. Hello? I'd like to speak to George Brewster. Oh, he's not in right now. Is there any message? Uh, who is this? I'm his sister. Well, if this is the right George Brewster, something is wrong. Is there any reason why a young fellow would want to kill your brother? Oh, that would be Morrison. Oh, I warned you. Morrison, huh? Tom Morrison. Where does he live? Uh, our old apartment, 612 Hamlin Avenue. What makes you think he wants to kill George? Well, this character broke into a store tonight and stole a gun. I sort of think he had your brother in mind when he did it. Oh, no. Well, lady, I know what I'm going to do. As fast as I hang up and can get another nickel into this phone, I'm going to call the police. Oh, I feel so bad. It's not really Morrison's fault, poor man. Oh, no, no. He's just a prince of a fellow. Goodbye, lady. I've got to make that call. But then it turned out I didn't have a nickel. And on the way to the counter for change, I started wondering why the sister of the man he was going to kill felt sorry for Morrison. And why Bessie thought he was such a sweet character. And well, the night was young. 612 Hamlin Avenue couldn't wait, and I could call the cops later. 612 North Hamlin Avenue was a second floor flat on the north side. I got there a few minutes after 11. All the windows were lit up. I rang the bell and waited. I felt a little bead of sweat zigzagging down my face like it didn't have any place to go. Yes? Oh, it's you. No, let's not close the door just yet. In fact, let's push it open all the way. What do you want? My two front teeth and a few ribs. Get out of here. Now, look, pal, don't tempt me. Wait a minute. Now, look. I came against my better judgment to listen to what you've got to say. If I leave now, the only place I'm going is the nearest police station. Police station. I guess maybe that would be the best. Hmm? Otherwise, I don't know what's going to happen. Yes, I get it. I guess you better call the police, mister. What do you think you're doing? Calling my bluff? The phone's right behind you. Okay, buddy. You asked for it. You're sure this is the way you want it? Yeah, it's better this way. I'm at the end of my rope. I don't want to kill him. George Brewster? Yes, George Brewster. I know how it'll end if he doesn't stop. Stop what? You call the police, mister. You'll be doing me a favor. Since when have I got to do you favors? Why aren't you calling? I'm an Eagle Scout in good standing, and I haven't done my good deed for today. Well, you can't help me, whoever you are. Stone is the name. What makes you so sure that I can't? Thanks for even wanting to. After the bad time I gave you. Bad time? That's the understatement of a year. Well, I was panic-stricken. He's got me half crazy. What have you got to lose if you tell me about it? No. Okay. Oh, wait, wait. I don't know. I... I'm like a drowning man grasping at straws. Look... Maybe if you talked to Brewster, told him what he's doing to me, maybe maybe then he'd leave me alone. Well, you never can tell, but I'd have to know what I'm talking about. Quite a story, mister. These lights. Look at them. Bright as the sun, aren't they? Lamps. Overhead chandeliers. Just look at them. I'd hate to see your light bills. Well, like some men need drugs. That's how I need these lights. Come again? My sanity depends on it. On these My... lights? Yes. You see, it's a sickness. They've even got a name for it. Noctophobia, it's called. It's fear of darkness. Fear of darkness? But that's for kids. It... I'm sorry. Don't be. I quite agree. Kids or neurotic women. But in a man of my age, it's quite ridiculous. Only when the day starts drawing to a close. When the night starts crowding in. Have you been to doctors? Sure, I've been to doctors. They tell me I shouldn't feel too badly. Plenty of people with my trouble. Hangover from childhood. An illness like heart trouble is an illness. I'll take the heart trouble. Maybe you haven't gone to the right kind of doctor. Maybe psychiatry could help you. Nothing's going to help me. George Brewster's going to see to that. What about this Brewster? He's trying to destroy me. <laughs> with the strangest weapon of all. The strangest weapon of all? Yes. His weapon is the night.
NBC is bringing you an encore performance of Night Beat, starring Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. Before continuing with our story, here is the star of another NBC program, Brian Donlevy. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be listening here with you to Night Beat. This encore performance is NBC's way of introducing you to one of its regularly scheduled Monday night broadcasts. If you're enjoying Night Beat today, why not make it a habit to listen to the series each week in its regular time period? You'll find Night Beat just ahead of my own adventure series, Dangerous Assignment, every Monday. So, if you enjoy adventure and mystery, give a listen to Night Beat and Dangerous Assignment tomorrow night and every Monday night on most of these NBC stations. But now, let's listen again to Randy Stone. It was a weird feeling standing in Morrison's brilliantly lighted parlor listening to him tell me about his terror of darkness. A sturdy, healthy-looking man trapped by a childhood nightmare. I felt guilty listening to him, like I was eavesdropping into a dark corner of his mind that was nobody's business but his own. And yet he had to tell me because he needed help. Because George Brewster was using Morrison's fear to destroy him. I was sent to Chicago by our company to replace Brewster. Until he found out why I was here, he couldn't do enough for me. He even got me this apartment. Oh, greater love hath no man. Then he found out what the setup was, and he changed fast enough. How did he find out about this fear of yours? I'm trying to tell you how. The other night, the two of us were working alone in the big vault down at the office. Working on some old account. And the overhead light blew out. Mm -hmm. Well, it was so sudden, I couldn't help myself. I tried to keep calm, but like something tearing me to pieces inside. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't... Finally, I had to run. So he found out about it. No, no, I wasn't sure. But it started him thinking. Yeah? The next afternoon, he came over to my desk. He was jovial, friendly, like he'd been in the beginning. Saying we'd been at each other's throats long enough. Inviting me to have dinner with him that night. Right from work, we went to his favorite spot on the north side. It was a place called the Catacombs. I began feeling uneasy the moment I entered. How do you like this place, Tom? That's okay. It's mine. It's been a favorite of mine for years. One spot in particular, the wine cellar. Uh, how do you feel about wine? I like it all right. Come on with me. I'm a wine man from way back. Oh, I say, George, I uh, wanted to talk to you about that little outburst last night. They have a different wine cellar with a different temperature for each type of wine. I haven't been sleeping very well, you me? see. Me? I prefer reasoning myself. Here we are. Huh? Uh, the white wine cellar. We'll select our own brand for our supper. Here, I'll open the doors. This is a privilege only an old customer like me can get away with. Come on. Dark down there. That's why they've got this candle here on the ledge. Got a match? I... A match, Tom? Mm. Yeah. Here. Okay. Get this candle going. Good. Now, let's go downstairs. George, you think we should do this on our own? Mm, done it hundreds of times. Been coming here for the last ten years. Now, let's go down these stairs. Careful. Uh... I was explaining about last night. Candle casts funny shadows, doesn't it? Notice how cool it is? Twenty feet below street level. Look, I want to talk to you about last night, George. I uh, don't want any misunderstanding. Hmm? It's just that I've been working pretty hard Look, to see... Look, Tom. Would it make you feel any better if you showed me you're not afraid of the dark? Okay. I'll blow out the candle. Just what are you trying to prove, Brewster? Nothing at all. It's your idea. Where are those matches I gave you? You gave me some matches? I must have lost them. It's not going to work, Brewster. I'm not insane, you know. I can stay down here until you're quite Funny, satisfied. Funny, isn't it? About the darkness. The way it seems to close in on you. The way you start thinking you can't breathe. I can see how someone could... What's the matter? This is ridiculous. Something so suffocating about a dark room. Stop it. Stop it. Only the heavy, smothering blackness. Stop it. Where are you going, Tom? Anything wrong? <laughs> Anything wrong? Anything wrong? Anything wrong? Anything wrong? 
I ran out of that cellar like a scared kid. That was a rotten thing for him to do. Like a kid playing Halloween jokes. He's fighting for his job, Stone. He's not so young anymore. He can't start all over again. So he'll do anything. Great. I'm sure he's told the people down at work. I'm sure they're all laughing at me behind my back. You don't know what that does to me. I can imagine. Today, I found a new desk lamp on my desk, courtesy of George Brewster. Every day, something like that. Did you ask him why he's doing it? He won't admit he's doing anything. Says it's all my imagination that maybe I ought to see a doctor, or better still, maybe a change of climate would help. Well, I'd leave town in a minute. Only my future's at stake, too. And before I let him drive me crazy, I'll kill him. Well, I'm going now. I'm going to talk to this bird. Where does he live? Out in the suburbs, Lake Forest. Lives with his sister. All right, I'll give you a ring as soon as I've seen him. I hope you can do some good, Mr. Stone. Yeah. Oh, say. I almost forgot something. What? That gun you made off with. I... Maybe if we're lucky, we can talk the store owner out of pressing charges. I'll try. <laughs> it was a crazy thing to do. I, I was so desperate. Wouldn't I... have done you much good. When they put them in the window, they never loaded. I'll let you in on a secret. If I hadn't known that, I wouldn't have been such a hero coming here tonight. I'll let you in on a secret, Mrs. Stone. You can get bullets without a license. The gun's loaded now. <laughs> oh, great. Go and get it for me. All right. Yes, I want to give it to you. It's in my bedroom. He started for the bedroom. It was almost like a comedy routine where after the big build-up, the punchline comes out right on cue. The moment he entered the other room, every light in the house suddenly went out. What happened to the lights? Take it easy. Now, where's the fuse box? I don't know. I've never had occasion to use it. Besides, if it was the fuse, all the lights wouldn't go out. It wasn't you. Use your head. How could I do it? I'm getting out of here. The hall light's out, too. Stone. Maybe something went wrong with the central wiring. But why should it happen exactly now? Wait. Huh? The downstairs apartment. Their lights are on. If it was the wire. All right, all right. Let's ask them where the fuse box is. Yes? Oh, Mr. Morrison. Uh, my lights went out. It might be a fuse. Where are the fuse boxes for these apartments, do you know? Uh, out in the back. I'll get a flashlight and show you. Oh, here we are. The fuse box is right here below our meters. Whenever the people from the light company come out, they have a dickens of a time finding it. Will you hold the flashlight steady. Let me take a look. Wait a minute, Stone. Lower the flashlight just a little. Huh? It's not the fuse. Look at the master switch on my meter. And look at the one of Mrs. Graham's. Why, somebody pulled your switch down to off. Yes. Yes, someone surely did. Oh, here, let me push it up. There. And look upstairs. All your lights are on again. Probably some kids playing a joke. How do you suppose the rascals ever found it? It's so well hidden. Well, I, I have a theory all kids come equipped with special radar for finding things like this. Mrs. Graham, tell this gentleman who used to live in my apartment before I did. Why? Tell him. Why, you know. He even got the apartment for you. Your friend, Mr. Brewster. But what is Tom, that, that doesn't prove he did it. For me, it does, Stone. For me, it does. Morrison went around to the front of his house and up the stairs to his flat. I waited in the hallway until he came down again. He looked different. His face was hard and set. His eyes were like chunks of glass punched into the flesh. What are you waiting for, Stone? Well, when we were so rudely interrupted, you were going for the gun. I've got it now. Oh, yeah. Well, hand it over and I'll bring it back. No, thanks. Now, where are you going, and what are you going to do? I'm fighting for my sanity and my life. He's never going to do this to me again. Never. I can't let you do that. You're going to have to. The minute you leave here, I'm going to call every cop in the book. Yes, that's what you do, isn't it? Yeah. And I'd better give you the gun. <laughs> this could become habit for me. I dropped to my knees in the hallway, and then the hallway subdivided like something under a microscope, and there were two hallways, and then there were four. And then everywhere I looked, there were hallways. Morrison tried to push me aside to get by me, only it was a whole circle of Morrison's. I grabbed at his legs to hold him back. It was like grabbing at a centipede. 
And then all the Morrisons and all the hallways brought all their guns down on my one poor head. And that was it, brothers and sisters, that was it. Feeling better, Mr. Stone? Oh, if I felt any better, I'd call the embalmer. Oh, what a business. I heard a commotion and I came out and you were lying here. Is this a head or a cantaloupe? Oh, how did it happen and where's Mr. Morrison? Oh, Morrison, yeah. How long ago did you hear this commotion? Just a couple of minutes ago. Oh, you came out of it real fast. Yeah, an iron constitution. Have you got a phone? Yes, but don't you think you better... Come on, lady, grab my head, put it back on nice and neat, and let's get to that phone. Hello? This is the fellow who called you before, Miss Brewster, about Morrison and your brother. Oh, yes. He's not there yet, huh? I don't mean your brother. I mean Morrison. What? No. Is yes, he... yes, he sure is. Now, give me your address. The minute you hang up, get away from your house as fast as you can. Morrison's got a gun. He's half crazy. Maybe we should call the police. Maybe we should, but I'm not going to. They'd throw the book at him ten years for attempted murder. I think I can stop him before he does anything. I can't tell you how sorry I am about this. Lady, you and your brother should be. <laughs> The cab got me out to the Lake Forest house in less than 20 minutes. The house was on a hill, and the flagstone path wound round and round for a city block until it reached the front porch. As I ran up the walk, my head started rattling like a handful of pennies in a tin cup. I felt weak and tired. All the time, I tried not to think about what I might find when I reached the house. And now I was at the end of the path, walking toward the front porch. A nerve deep in my throat started jangling like a burglar alarm. The house was in darkness. And Morrison was standing beneath a little porch light, his gun pointed right at me. You won't quit, will you, Stone? What have you done with him, Tom? He hasn't done anything with him yet, Mr. Stone. Huh? Who... I'm sitting over here at the end of the porch. I'm George's assistant. Oh. I didn't see you in the dark. Why didn't you get away like I told you? See, I won't hurt her. It's him. He'll be coming along soon. George should never have done what he did. I begged him not to. To take advantage of a man's weakness. Well, Mr. Brewster is coming home. What? His car is stopping at the bottom of the hill. Now he's starting the long climb. Morrison, listen you to just me. just sit there, the both of you. And I must insist that you be very quiet. Please listen to me. Please. Please. I keep coming up that path, Brewster. It's a long, long way. You must listen to me. Morrison, you waiting near the porch doing. light, the gun in his hand. George hurt you. We shouldn't have done Far that. below the small figure what of George Brewster, so making the long, you. slow climb. You're going to kill George because he found out about your fear. But don't you see? George is afraid, too, of being 53. Brewster had stopped at the first landing to catch his breath. That's now he was climbing he up the you. path again. His back was Maybe a hundred steps from his death. He was death. fighting for his life. Just I found you myself counting the steps. Closer. Why? Why are Closer. you afraid of the dark, Mr. Morrison? Don't you see? If you weren't afraid, George couldn't hurt you anymore. Please, listen to me. Keep your voice down. If you try to warn him, you both die, too. Keep coming, Brewster. What yes, is there to yes, fear you kept about coming. the doctor? No more than the 70 steps now. Itself. All it does the is hide the world up for a little while. And Brewster getting closer. If you believe Less than in 50 God, steps now. If you believe in your own steps. soul, how can you fear the night? 25. What is there in the darkness that can hurt you? There's such peace in the darkness. After the heat of day is gone, the rush, the tumult, the struggle, you can breathe easy again. You can let the tightness inside unwind. He's almost close enough. Listen to me. Please listen. It's not going to work, Miss Brewster. I'm going to try and watch Miss Brewster, stay where you are, Miss. No. You must see me in the light. I tell you, stay where you are. Tom. Look at her. I didn't realize. I'm not afraid. What right have you to fear? Julie, is that you on the porch? What right have you to fear, Mr. Mark? What right? Whew, what a long climb. I must be getting old. What are you doing here, Morrison? 
And who's this? Oh, don't mind me. I just came along for the ride. What's this all about? I... I just came to... to say goodbye, Brewster. You leaving? Yes. I'm going back and tell them you've done a good job here. But it's not fair to replace you after so many years. You sure nobody scared you away, Morrison? Well, look at him, Brewster. Does he look like he's afraid? I don't know if Julie cured Morrison of his fear of darkness. Cure is a pretty strong word. But maybe she helped. I kind of think so. I do know this. It's going to be mighty hard for Tom to fear the darkness knowing Julie is not afraid. But neither Tom nor I will ever forget what we saw as that porch light lit up her face. Julie Brewster, who did not fear the darkness, was blind. <laughs> And now that part of the story they always print in heavy type, the moral. And don't smile so indulgently. Morals are very nice things. Some of my best friends have morals. <laughs> Seriously, Julie's whole life is a moral in itself. And trying to top it is like trying to follow Al Jolson with a mammy song. The best you can do is tip your hat to the fellow who wrote, Out of the night that covers me, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. He must have had someone like Julie in mind. Four o'clock in the morning, a stale cup of coffee, a tired sandwich, a story to dictate, and I worry about my unconquerable soul. Honey. Copy, boy. Night Beat, the new dramatic series, stars Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. Night Beat is written by Larry Marcus and directed by Warren Lewis. Music by Frank Worth. David Ellis played Tom, Lorene Tuttle was Ruth. Others in the cast were Charles Seal, Margaret Brayton, and Ruth Ferret. Frank Lovejoy will next be seen in Milton Sperling's production, Rock Bottom, released by Warner Brothers. NBC has presented for your approval a special edition of Night Beat to acquaint you with this regularly scheduled Monday evening program. If you have enjoyed this repeat broadcast, join the millions of listeners who each Monday tune for adventure and mystery on the regular Night Beat series. Listen then tomorrow night when again you will hear Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone in another great action-packed story on Night Beat. Music today, hear Harvest of Stars and American Album on NBC. And now, the case of the larcenous lark. It's late Wednesday night in New York. And in Arnie Kessler's very private gambling club on East 69th Street, tall, handsome, gray-haired George Watkins stands at the end of the dice table shaking the dice cup in his manicured hand and makes his roll. Five's your number. Righto. Once again, Watkins shakes the cup. Come on, little five. And makes his roll. Seven. Watkins smiles wryly, shrugs lightly, puts down the cup and pushes through the crowd. He finds the door to Kessler's private office open and walks in. Kessler is seated at the desk. Oh, Watkins. Sit down. Thanks. How'd it go tonight? Well, for you, fine. I'm clean. Tough luck. I'm bound to change. Uh, how's my credit? Strain to the limit. I'm afraid I'll have to close the book on you. That's all I wanted to know. Good evening, Kessler. Uh, you're down for 35 grand, Watkins. That's a lot of groceries. I understand. I, I'm a realist, Kessler. Don't fool myself. No false pride, so I have to face the fact. The moment I'm no big shot, I'm flat. 
bum investment. I'm surprised you carried me this far. Oh, you'll pay off. I'm glad you're so sure. It's my business to be sure. In that case, a uh, little more credit? Now, let's not overdo a good thing, chum. Got to draw the line somewhere, you know. You just pay that 35 and you can have all the credit you like. All right. I'll get it. You bet you will, Watkins. You bet. All right, Rex, here you are. Just sign these papers and I'll run along. Yeah, just a minute, Watkins. Rita, get this. How do you like this phrase? Da da dee, da da da. Uh-uh. Uh, you're right, it's corny. Uh, maybe it's better like this. No, it was better before. Rex, please, I've, I've got to be going. Okay, Watkins, give me the papers. Here you are. Here's the pen. Okay. You know, it's funny, I had it the right way in my head, but it's gone. Dee, da, dee, da, dee. No. I tell you, if I could remember, it's terrific. All right, Rex, but look what you're doing. Sign of my name. i got to look for that. Don't you even read what you're signing? I can't be bothered. That's what I pay Watkins for, my business manager, huh, Watkins? <laughs> That's right. Now, now these checks... Right. I think you'd be interested. Interested? In whereases and double entries and capital gains? I say it's spinach and to Watkins with it. Okay, Watkins, there you are. Right, Al. Now you can get back to your work. So long, Rex. Goodbye, Miss Long. Yeah, I'll be seeing you. Bye. catch it. It's a natural, believe me. What do you know about him? Who? Watkins. Oh, great. Saved me nearly ten grand in income taxes last year. Well, if you don't even check on him, I... Rita, Rita, I know what I'm doing. I make the moolah. Watkins sees that I don't spend it faster than I make it. That's Who's all. to see he doesn't spend it? Oh, for the love of Pete, Rita. I mean it. If you expect me to marry you, you've got to have some sense of responsibility. Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> Baby. Baby, there it is. Da, 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 dum, dum, dum. I know I'd get it. You like? Not bad. Not bad. It's great. What are you doing? Call him I no good of an agent. Rex, I'm trying to tell. Yeah, not now, honey, not now. Hello? Uh, Halloran, Halloran, listen, I've got a number. Even you'll be able to sell it. Who is it? Who is it? The Cole Porter of the 50s. I'm telling you, I've got something that'll make you. Rex? Who else? Look, Rex, before you get all... Now, will you up... shut up? You haven't even heard it yet. Goes with those lyrics I showed you yesterday. Now, listen. Did you hear? Yes. Well? It's a nice tune, Rex, but you know that you No can't. buts, Halloran. This is it. How soon can you get it to Sinatra? Be reasonable, Rex. We can't... Now, look, I don't want any argument. All the time I bang out songs that sell themselves, you try to sit on them. If it wasn't for that contract, believe me, brother, you'd be out, but fair. Listen to the cornball. Where were you before I took you over? Strictly minor leagues. Now it's the big leagues and you're beating them, huh? You got a nice tune. I'll do what I can Now, for look, you. shut up. I want you over here this afternoon, understand? Uh, that creep always got to give me conversation. You think a guy'd get some encouragement once in a while, but no, nice tune, he says. And you won't even listen. Got a yap about what? I listen, Rex. It's just that I'm worried. Do you have to turn everything over to Watkins? All right, look. Look, I'll take it once more, slow. Now try to dig it this time, baby, will you? When you get in the chips, you hire yourself a business manager. Everybody does it. I'm not the only one. Thanks so much for telling me. But everybody doesn't just sign papers and checks without even knowing what they are. All right, let's not get in a hassle about it, huh? Well, if we're going to get married... Who says we're going to get married? Rex! Well, if it's going to be nag, nag, nag all the You're time... You're not serious. Maybe I am. I don't know. Well, I was only trying to be helpful. I don't see why you have... Why you have... Oh, have for to... Pete's sake. <laughs> Look, baby, I got a great idea banging around in my head. I want to get it on paper. Do you have to pitch a hissy now? I'm sorry, Rex. I just... Now, will you cut it out? <laughs> Honey, honey, look. Doggone it, listen, will you? All right, I'll call Watkins. I'll get an appointment, see. He'll explain just how I stand financially, black and white. Get it all figured out, see. Now, will you please turn off the Niagara and let me get to work? Oh, oh, Kessler. Hello, Watkins. Mind if I come in? No, of course not. Thanks. As a matter of fact, I... I have something for you. Glad to hear it. Yes. Here you are. Hmm. One, two, three, four, five grand. Mm. Good. 
That leaves an even 30. It uh, may take a little time. Oh, that's all right. Just so long as you settle up before you leave town. Leave town? What makes you, you think... You bought a ticket for Chicago this morning. How do you know? Have you been having me followed? Let's just say I have a very sensitive Ouija board, hmm? You see, Watkins, when I have money outstanding, I like to keep in touch. That's why I don't want you going away until the account is closed. I should have expected this. Very well, Kessler, you, you've got me. No use denying, there's the ticket. I, I was leaving. As a matter of fact, I'm on a bit of a spot. Let's, let's face it, I, I'm trapped. How so? Well, I'll tell you, always was one for cards on the table. It, it's like this. That 5000 I just paid you came from Rex Elber. Only, Elber doesn't know it. Mm-hmm. I had counted on him for considerably more from time to time, you understand. You can't rush these things or they show up. Well? Well, Elber called a few minutes ago, wants to go over the account. I don't know what's gotten into him all of a sudden, but there it is. Have to face it. He wants an accounting, and I can't possibly explain the check I cashed. It... Well, if it hadn't happened so fast... So you were going to run out. Well, what can I do? Uh, perhaps if you give me back that 5000 and I return it to Rex, he he may not press the charges. Sure. I blow five grand, and if Elba decides not to play ball, you're in the soup anyhow. Well, it was a thought. I don't call that thinking. Well, what can I do? Elba isn't your only client. You have others. That's why I gave you credit. Oh, they watch closer. Still, I... I suppose over a period of time, I could raise the rest. I... Take your time. I won't rush things so long as I get payments on account like this every so often. But I don't have time. That's just it. Elber wants a showdown today. Well, can't you stall him? No, not for long. If only I could keep him from asking about that check. That There must be something I can do. Not only there must be Watkins. There better be. <laughs> Okay, now what can I do? Hey, wait a minute. Hey, what's the idea? <laughs> where Mike Waring lives, the Falcon? Yeah. You him? I'm he. Well, Halloran's my name, Vic Halloran, Rex Elba's agent. Uh, congratulations. On what? Being Elba's agent. He must be a gold mine. Golden goose, more like. Somebody killed him. Oh. Yeah, that's why I'm here. I need a detective. Heard a lot about you. Always figure anybody has a reputation, he must have something on the wall. Well, I'll concede the point. Shall we go inside and talk business? No need. I'll only be a minute. I discovered the body, see? So I'm on the spot. Cops just put me through the ringer. Any reason you should be suspected, other than discovering the body? They suspect everybody. Oh, and well, you've got nothing to worry about. No more than anybody else. All right. It's like this, see? Who likes his agent? All the time gripes, how come you aren't doing more for me? Rex and me had words often. Loud words. Uh -huh. But he's my meal ticket. I'm going to knock off my own meal ticket? Ah, oh, yes, the golden goose. Get out of it, will you, Waring? Okay, Halloran. Try Rita Vaughan, warbler at the Zigzag Club. You think she did it? She's mixed up in it. How do you know? She's a dame. Rex is current. And believe me, in a thing like this, always include the dame in. I'll make a note of it. Dames are trouble. You can count it. Nothing but trouble. Halloran, you're speaking of the women I love. Take it from me, Waring. Nothing but trouble. <laughs> Spoken like a confirmed bachelor. Bachelor? I'm paying alimony three ways. Now get on it, Waring, will you? <laughs> Mike Waring has been in Vic Halloran's employ for 20 minutes, just long enough to get from his own place to the Zigzag Club, where Rita Vaughn has just admitted him to her dressing room. All right, Mr. Waring, now what is it? Well, there's no question about it. You're a dame. What a detective. And dames are trouble. Oh? Mm-hmm. I have it on the authority of a three-time loser. And you're looking for trouble? For Rex Elba's trouble. Were you it? I was his dame. Mm-hmm. But I had nothing to do with his death. Uh-huh. So if that's all you want, you might as well run along. Who said it's all I want? I can tell you who killed Rex, if that's what you want. 
Well, I'd like to get around with that angel, but uh, I'm in no hurry. His business manager, George Watkins. Why do you say that? Rex had an appointment with Watkins today to check on Watkins' handling of Rex's affairs. The murder was a little too opportune to be a coincidence. All right, Rita, I'll check on it. Well, you can't check on it in here. Hey, you seem in a hurry to get rid of me. I'm on in a few minutes. I'd like to get ready. And the show must go on. You said it, Mr. Waring. Maybe you think I'm taking Rex's death too... Maybe you think it doesn't mean anything. But I... Oh, get out of here, will you? Hello, is George Watkins around? Who wants to know? Mike Waring. Well, well, the Falcon. This is an unexpected pleasure. Uh, you must be Arnie Kessler. I must be. Can I offer you a drink? No, thanks. You uh, get around a lot. 33. How come you got around here? Could be I like roulette. Oh, you know better than the buck the house percentage wearing? <laughs> That's no way to encourage business. Some kinds of business I can do without. So you're uh, looking for George Watkins, huh? Yeah, I understand he's a regular patron here. I wanted to confirm it. You expect an answer from me? No, I guess not. Is that all you wanted? Well, I'd like to know how Watkins was doing. <laughs> da, da, de, da, de, yeah, well, I didn't think you'd tell me. Da, da. I'm not crazy. I start talking about my client's affairs, I'd be out of business fast. Well, in that case, I guess I'm just wasting my time around here. I'm glad you realize it. Might as well be running. Oh, no need to run, Waring. You can walk. As long as it's to the nearest exit. Hello? Hello, Watkins. This is Arnie Kessler. Yes, Kessler. What is it? Who knew that Rex Elba wanted an accounting with you today? Well, I didn't know anyone did, except you. Why? Mike Waring was just here, the Falcon. He guessed you'd been losing at the tables. Oh, dear. Relax. Guessing. I didn't give him anything. But if he's checking... I don't think he can prove anything. But I thought you ought to know. Yes, yes. Thanks, Kessler. But, but who could have put him on to... Of course. That girl. What girl? Rita Vaughn. Never did care for her style of singing. Maybe I can figure a way to make her change her tune. <laughs> Catch the last show. But as long as you're table hopping, uh, how about perching at mine for a while? Well, I only have a minute. I'll settle for that. All right. I've been checking on Watkins. Find out anything? Uh huh. He likes to gamble. Oh, well, that could explain. Uh uh. What's wrong? Speak of the devil. Hello, Mr. Watkins. Hello, Rita. Am I interrupting anything? Yes, you certainly are. But sit down, you old devil. I beg your pardon? Uh, Mr. Watkins, this is Michael Waring. Waring? Oh, yes. Yes, I've heard of you. From Arnie Kessler? Why do you ask that? Why don't you answer it? Uh, I want to talk to Rita. <laughs> Get in line. I was here first. I'm afraid I'll have to disappoint both of you. Time for my number. See you later. Has Rita been talking about me, Waring? Ask Rita. I intend to. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Now, here she is. The little lady you've all been waiting for to play and sing for you, Rita Vaughn. Oh. Thank you, Harry. Thank you. Right Folks, I have something that I hope will be a treat for you. It's a brand new number that I wrote myself. And here it is for the first time anywhere. I hope you like it. She didn't come back to the table, Waring. She said she... something scared her. Didn't you see her face when she left the floor, Watkins? No, I didn't notice. That's why I wanted to get back here to the dressing room. Don't there it is. Hey, somebody's in there. Yeah. Look out, Watkins. Let's see if this door's unlocked. Yeah, it is. Mr. Waring. Yes, Rita. Come to take you in my arms. No, let's go. Not while let's you're waving go. shooting irons. Sorry, Waring. She missed. Yeah, so I see, Halloran. But let's not give her another shot at you. 
What are you doing here, anyway? Telling her off. She's a crook. She hit me. That's why I grabbed the gun. It was self-defense. She's a crook, a grave robber. Did you hit her? We were arguing. Did you hit her? What difference did it... you hit her, Halloran? Well, maybe I did. Then the gunplay really was self-defense. I told you. Uh huh. But I want Halloran to tell me. Well, yes, it was. All right. Then I can let her go. As much as I enjoy holding you in my arms, Rita, I like it under different circumstances. Now, what went on in here? Well, when I heard her singing that song, did I... you hear? I didn't see you in the club. I was over at the side, near the door. All right, you heard the song. Yeah. She said it was her song. She made it up. I did. Rex called me this morning. All hopped up. Here's a new number. He plays it for me over the phone. It's this very song wearing. This very song. I played it for Rex. That's where he got it. He said it was his. We were going to publish it under his name. We thought it would be more popular. Look, I know Rex's style. You can't I know me... his style, too. I was influenced by it, I admit that. But I wrote that song. That's a lie. Well, even if it is, Halloran, is that any call to slug the girl? Or did you just toss that in because you don't like Dane? I couldn't help blowing my lid, Waring. I'm, I'm sorry, but this crooked Dane All right, here... all right, hold it. Rita, you say you made up this song? Yes. When? This morning. Rex was working on a tune. It was something like this one, but not the same. Watkins, you were there, you remember. Yes. Well, then Watkins left, and Rex and I were talking, and all of a sudden it came to me. And you played it for Rex? Yes. And he played it for Halloran? Yes, and he told me that... I the... know what he told you. Did you play it for anyone else, Rita, until tonight? No. And it's just your word against Halloran's. Well, yes, but I... I don't know I... what you hope to prove, Waring. Each one will stick to his own story. Oh, I think I've proved plenty, Watkins. What? Who killed Rex Elber? You what? I've proved who killed Rex Elber. Maybe that isn't as important as who wrote the music, but it should determine who's going to have to face it. Who, Waring? Well, considering that Watkins is in deep to Kessler... Where'd you get that idea? Maybe from Kessler himself. You couldn't. Why not? Because I... Because I don't owe him. That's not what Kessler told me, Watkins. He didn't tell you anything. What makes you so sure? He told me he didn't. And there must be something he could... Rita, look out! Oh, oh, don't. Too late, Waring. Oh. I've got the gun from her. Now, what good do you think it's going to do you? Well, there's one sure thing. Won't do you any good if you make a move. So stay where you are, all of you. I'm getting out of here. <laughs> Fifteen minutes have passed since George Watkins grabbed Rita's gun and beat a hasty retreat from the zigzag club. Mike has used that time to hurry to Arnie Kessler's apartment, where Kessler's thug Rocky has just ushered him in. Here he is, Mr. Kessler. Yeah. All right, Waring. What is it this time? Well, I put you on kind of a spot, Kessler. I figured I ought to tell you. What kind of a spot? I told George Watkins you tipped me about his owing you. He grabbed a gun and cleared out. I thought he might come here. Thanks for the warning. I can take care of myself. Yeah, sure. Still, I thought you ought to know. All right. But uh, how come he fell for your bluff? Oh, I guess he's out of his element. I imagine that until today, except for weakness for gambling, Watkins stuck pretty close to the straight and narrow. Yeah. And since he really is in the hock to you... Is he? ...his running out ought to clinch it. How do I know he ran out? Just because you say so? <laughs> well, I see you're not as green as Watkins. Disappointed? No, I expected it. Well, that could be the answer to if I'm bluffing. Yeah. Araki. Okay, Mr. Kessler. And just in case Waring isn't bluffing you, that's Watkins. Check him for artillery. Right. I want to see Kessler. Sure. Turn around. Why? So far, you're right, Waring. It's Watkins. And when you get to know me better, Kessler, you'll never doubt me. Oh, Brad. All right, Mr. Kessler. Here he is. And here's his heater. Waring. Hello, Watkins. I've been expecting you. I should have known. You are on his side, That's Kessler. what he wants you to think. But if you shut up and let me do the talking... Well, certainly, certainly. Uh, might as well face it. I, I've i bungled again played right into his hands. Maybe, but now we have him on our home ground. Oh, please, Kessler, no violence. That's not I... what I had in mind. At least for now. But as long as we're both here together, he can't play one off against the other like he's been doing. No, that's not necessary. I've proved my point. I wouldn't say so. You rattled Watkins. He lost his head. And came running to you. Why? To check on what you told him. He thought I might have lied about him. You mean he wanted to see if you told the truth about him? <laughs> it's no use, Kessler. I know he's in hock to you. Now that I know who the murderer is, it's the only thing that makes sense. Oh, you know that? To? Yeah, sure. Waring, I know how it looks. Out but... of the talking, Watkins. Are you uh, suggesting that Watkins killed Elba, Waring? Oh, I haven't said that. But I thought... You he... shouldn't jump to conclusions, Watkins. Well, but then it... 
I, I don't understand. Unless you think I'm the murderer, what difference does it make if I owe Kessler money? My relation with him doesn't affect anyone else. It affects Kessler. And... But surely you can't think he killed Rex. Why, why, they didn't even know each other. I know they didn't. Well, then... Now, wait. Albert demanded an accounting with you today, didn't he, Watkins? Never mind, don't answer, but you know he did. And you've been juggling the account to pay off Kessler, so you got panicked. Well, well... Shut up, Watkins. Yes. All right, you told Kessler about the spot you were in. You paid off part of what you owed him, but there was still a heavy balance. Now, if Elba sent you to jail, Kessler would never get his balance. So he killed Elba to protect his investment in you. So that's it. How many times do I have to tell you to shut up, Watkins? Well, I'm the one you'll have to shut up, Kessler. But before you decide on the rough play you so thoughtfully postponed before, you ought to know the police know I came up here. Yeah? You think I'd have stuck my neck out like this otherwise? Let's face it, Kessler, the jig is up. One thing I don't understand, Waring. What's that, Halloran? You said my argument with Rita about the song is what tipped you to the murderer. Yes, it did. But if Kessler's the murderer, he had nothing to do with the song. That's just the point. What? He didn't know Elba. Had nothing to do with him. Then how could now, he... look, look, Halloran. Regardless of who really wrote the song, either way, we know that until last night, only you and Rita and Elba had ever heard the song, right? Yes. But when I was at Kessler's before Rita played it at the club, Kessler was humming the song. He was? He was. So I knew he must have been at Elba's. Remember Elba was at the piano when he was murdered? He must have been playing the tune when Kessler killed him. I see. Uh -huh. So that takes care of the murder. Now everything is settled except who really wrote the song. Oh, oh, that, that's settled too. Oh, it is? Yeah, yes, I was wrong. Rita wrote it all right. We had a long talk and she convinced me. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, quite a dame, Waring. Quite a dame. <laughs> but you didn't like dames. Who, me? Oh, all I said was anybody who falls for a dame must be nuts. Uh-huh. Well, Waring, shake hands with Napoleon Bonaparte. <laughs> You see how simple it is, Mrs. Willoughby? Uh-huh. You make your own money, just exactly the way the government does. <laughs> now, you put this blank piece of paper in the machine. Uh-huh. You turn the crank. And out comes a brand new $1 bill. <laughs> it certainly does. Yeah? Now, those $1 bills I made up yesterday with this machine, you uh, took them to the bank? Yes, and they said it was real money. Oh, you see what I mean? And you saw me make them. I made them right in front of your eyes with this machine. You sure did. Now, you give me 10,000 bucks and it's yours. You can make as much money as you want, whenever you want. $10,000? That's right. Mm, tell me, Mr. Crane, why are you so anxious to sell this machine? All you would have to do is turn the crank and out would come real bills. Lady, I've got a lot of machines. I want to sell them and quit. That's simple, isn't it? Mm-hmm. You've got plenty of dough, but there's enough larceny in what you. What did you say? Uh, don't let it bother you, lady. There's larceny in everybody. Proof that it's in you is that you asked me to come back today. Mr. Crane, I'll give you $10,000 for your machine. Good. Providing I'm sure that the paper you insert in the machine is actually the one that comes out as a dollar bill. Oh. That ought to be simple. Yeah. I'll put my initials on the blank paper. If my initials appear on the bill when it comes out, I'll buy the machine. Now, wait, I've got a pen and ink right here. All right. Now, hand me one of your blank pieces of paper. Uh... All right. There you are. Thank you. My initials, E.W. There we are. All right, Mr. Crane. Okay. I'll take the paper, put it in the machine. <laughs> take out a brand new dollar bill. There you are. Take a look at it, Mrs. Willoughby. A oh. brand new buck with the initials E.W. on it. Just as you put them on the blank piece of paper a second ago. It's the same piece of paper, and those are my initials, all right. Mm -hmm, like I said. Now, what about the ten grand? 
What's to stop me from turning that crank handle 10,000 times, getting your $10,000, and paying you with that? Uh, nothing. Except I don't deliver you the paper you need till I get your money. Mm. I have it here in my safe. I'll get it. Mm -hmm. And I've got the paper all cut out to dollar bill size right here, too. You get the money, Mrs. Willoughby. And from now on, you can manufacture your own. The best kind. Handmade. Markham speaking. Is this the district attorney? Yes, it is. Well, it better be. And you'd better do something about me. I'd like very much to. Don't be cute. I'm Emily Willoughby, and I've been swindled. I'm the district attorney, and I'm very sorry. Mrs. Willoughby, tell me exactly what happened, and I'll do what I can. Well, somebody sold me a money-making machine, and it doesn't work. And I paid $10,000 for it yesterday. Aren't you calling me 24 hours too late? Well, never mind when I'm calling you. I want to do something. I want you to do something. I paid the man ten. I know, $10,000. He demonstrated a machine and took blank paper and converted it into $5 bills. $1 bills. Oh. But how did you know what he did? It's a very old racket, Mrs. Willoughby. And it wouldn't work except that people such as yourself are looking for something for nothing. Well, well really? Have you any idea who the man is? He said his name was Crane. Joe Crane. Do you know him? No, I don't. Well, do you know where you can get him so you can arrest him? No, but I'll have a man put on it right away. You shouldn't have had anything to do with Crane, Mrs. Willoughby. Look, don't talk to me like that. He's the criminal. I'm not. The only reason you aren't, Mrs. Willoughby, is because the machine didn't work. Come on in. The door ain't locked. Hi, Joe. Oh, hiya, Sniffy. How's Chicks? So-so. What's with you? Oak, get the money? What money? Oh, gonna be like that, huh? Joe, I'll give you a money-making machine and a gimmick that makes it foolproof. You had a sucker. Give me my cut of the dough you got, or the machine. I couldn't get rid of it. The sucker got smart. Yeah, so I'll take the machine. Well... Uh, where is it? I can get a front man get rid of it easy. Come on, let's have it and I'll blow. I don't have it here. Oh... So that's the way it is, huh? Come on, train, stop stalling. Give me that machine or I'll break you in a dime spot. Where, where is it? Where is it? Let go of me. Give me my machine. Give it or I'll choke it out. Uh, double crossing her. Use the knife on me, did you? Jeannie. Oh, well, what's this? Get out of here. Uh uh. So you killed Sniffy, huh, Joe? Now, look, don't scream. Don't do nothing. Just get out of here fast. He was choking me. I had to do it. You wouldn't want me dead, would you? You killed him, Joe. Yeah, I killed him. Now, get out of here before you get wild and start yelling so somebody will hear you and get the cops. Go on, beat it. I don't want you getting hysterical. Hmm. Seems to me you're the one getting hysterical, Joe. No, I'm not. Now, take it easy. I won't blow. All I'm going to do is help you get rid of that knife you're holding and this body. <laughs> Well, Vance, there's the body, lying just where a farmer found it. Mm. It obviously had been knifed somewhere else and thrown from a car. You know who the victim is, Markham? Sergeant Heath identified him. A larcenous individual named Sniffy Edwards. I don't suppose this is any case that will intrigue you, but you were in my office when the call came. And, and I insisted on going with you. I know. Notice anything peculiar about Sniffy, Markham? No. He has a knife wound in his chest, and he's dead, which certainly is normal enough. Look at his shoes. The soles are very thick. Well, yes, I suppose they are. But this isn't a case for you, Vance. It's undoubtedly an underworld murder, and Sergeant Heath will get whoever killed this man. Mind if I look at the soles a minute? Go ahead. Uh, your penknife, Vance, you need that to look with? You never can tell what it will help me see. What you're doing is a little illegal, Vance. Oh, my friend, is there such a thing as a little illegal? <laughs> I stand corrected. <laughs> you find anything? Yes. There was a piece of paper in the sole of the shoe... Take a look. It's a diagram of some kind of machine. Uh, arrow indicates where blank paper is inserted. 
Another arrow where money comes... Vance, I know what this is. It's the diagram for a money-making machine. Undoubtedly. I got a complaint this morning from a Mrs. Willoughby that she had been swindled by a Joe Crane who sold her a money-making machine. This couldn't be a coincidence. In all probability, it isn't. I had a man trace Joe Crane. He called in his address just before we left. I think perhaps we ought to see Crane. What about it? I'm with you. Let's go call on Joe Crane and see if this plan for a money-making machine was the instigation of his plan to murder Sniffy Edwards. <laughs> Come on, Jeannie, hurry it up. Okay, okay, Joe, but this valise is heavy. It's the last one, though. We're all packed and ready to move. You got plenty of gas in the car? Yeah, it's loaded up to the top. I got a 15-gallon can in the back so we don't have to stop for at least 500 miles. Oh, good. Here, I'll put that bag in the back here. Close the back up. Now, ah, come on. Let's get in and get going. Uh-huh. You think it's smart to blow town right after you knocked off Sniffy? You think it's smarter to wait around here to get picked up? Oh, maybe. Nobody's got anything on you. Yeah, nobody's gonna have either. That's the reason we're blowing. Wait a minute. I'll make it in first. Okay. Hop in. Close the door and we'll get going. It's okay with me. I don't even care where we're going. As long as I'm with you. Yeah, we're off. We won't speed. We won't do nothing to attract attention. In a little while, we're in the clear with ten grand of Mrs. Willoughby's dough. And nobody to finger me for Sniffy's killing. Oh, sounds swell to me, Joe. Mm, gee, I like being with you. Move away, honey. Hmm? Got to keep my mind on driving. I... Jeannie. Huh? There's a car following us. Where? How do you know it's following us, Joe? Take it easy. Oh, no. I'm going to step on it and see if it is. The other car's picking up speed, too. There are two guys in it, Joe. Cops, I guarantee. Well, they won't grab me. This car of mine can get away from anything on the road. You got my gun? Yeah, sure. Here, Joe. Take and shoot it out with them if they get close. Throw the gun out the window, quick. Throw it out the window? Sure, you dope. You want to get caught with it on you? Throw it when we go around this bend. Uh Uh-oh. Oh, they're getting closer, Joe. And you made me throw your gun away. Oh, Joey. I can't lose them, Jeannie, so keep quiet and let me do the talking. I'm going to stop it. You made me throw your gun away, Joe. Why did you make me do it? You could have killed them when they drove up. Shut up and don't move. Well, what'll they do to us, Joe? What do you I think don't know. Do? I don't think they got a thing on us. Not a minute now. Here come the two guys. I know. I see them. Remember what I told you. Shut up. Well, you two certainly led us a chase. I'm District Attorney Markham. You're Joe Crane. That's right. Who's the young lady with you, Crane? Who are you to be asking questions? He's Philo Vance. Who is she? Well, I... My girl. What do you want with me, D.A.? That remains to be seen. Right now, I want you to come back to my office with me. Then I'm going to call on Emily Willoughby and see if she can identify you as the man who sold her a money-making machine. That's the rap, huh? Part of it, Crane. There's a possibility we might be able to prove you killed a man named Sniffy Edwards, too. Edwards? Edwards? Never heard of him. Me either. I suppose you never heard of a money-making machine. That's right. The things these people don't know, Markham. Yes. Well, let's get going back to your office. I'm not half as concerned over what they don't know as they will be over what we do. Yes, that's him. That's definitely the man who sold me the money-making machine. A dame's off her beam. I never saw her before. You're positive, Mrs. Willoughby. Yes, of course I am. Well, you have him right here? You have the machine your men picked up at my house right here? Well, Markham? We'll take care of him. Markham. Yes, Vance? Suppose you take Mrs. Willoughby into the next office and get her to sign a complaint against Crane. I want to talk to him. Certainly. Mrs. Willoughby? I'll be glad to sign a complaint. I'll sign anything just to make sure he's arrested. Well, Vance, what do we talk about? The weather? Baseball? Pick a subject. Don't be cute, Crane. You're on the spot. Mrs. Willoughby's identification is all Markham needs to send you away. Oh, really? So she identified me. So what? So I sold her a machine. So what? 
It's a legitimate business transaction. There's nothing wrong with that machine. Except that it doesn't make money, as you claim. Although, even if it did, that, of course, would be illegal. That would be the government's worry, not the district attorney's or yours. That's partially true, but the fact remains that the machine doesn't work. No? No. Look, here's some of the paper that came with it. This hunk here. Just the size of a dollar bill. Put your initials on it. Put anything you want on it. What for? I'll show you it does work. Go ahead, write something on the paper. Well... What's the matter, can't you write? I think I will test you, Crane. I'll take my fountain pen and draw a little design on this paper. There. Okay. I take the paper, put it in the machine, turn the handle, and look what comes out. A brand new one dollar bill. Where's the design I put on the blank paper? On the bill, here it is. Take a look. And that dough is good dough. You can take it to any bank. I'm quite certain it is really money. And that is the design I put on the blank paper. Look, I don't sell the money, just the machine. I'm not responsible for what people use it for. I ain't in competition with the government. Now, I think it'd be an idea if you talked to the district attorney and saw to it that the three of us get out of here. The three of you? Sure. Jeannie and me and this machine, which... Has you stopped so good you haven't the slightest idea how it works? This is District Attorney Markham. The money machine murder case is an unusual one. Philo Vance is quite certain that Snippy Edwards, an underworld character was killed because he'd invented a money-making machine. And we are equally certain that a man named Joe Crane, whom we have had in custody, is the killer. Although we have a larceny case against Crane, Vance is more interested in proving murder against him. We have let him and his girl out on bail. We don't know where they are. Scared? Of course I wasn't scared. It was wonderful. The D.A. chasing me in his car, and then Vance and him questioning Joe and me. (laughs) Joe thinking I was his girl and not yours. Gee, it was swell. I'm glad. Oh, sure it was swell, Frankie. Only thing is, it's going to keep me from getting that money-making machine from Joe. He doesn't know what I'm playing along with him for. Sometimes I ain't sure either. Huh? You'd double-cross anybody in a minute if there was some excitement in it, Jeannie. You're double-crossing Joe Crane, you'd do it to me, too, if you got a chance. To you, Frankie. Oh, never. Never, she says. You have a lot on me, Jeannie, and I'm not sure whether I like that or not. Well, look, Frankie, I got to get over to see Joe. We got to stay in town because the cops told us to. I better see him so I can make plans to get that machine away from him. Sit down, Jeannie. But I got to... Sit down! Oh, why? What for? What's going on? As I said, you know too much about me. So I have a little present for you. This. Hey... Hey, now, wait a minute, Frankie. What's a gun for? You, you aren't going to kill me. I, I didn't do anything, Frankie. I, I wouldn't... said anything about killing you. I said I have a present for you. This gun. Here, take it. Oh. You're going to need it if you keep trying to outsmart a guy like Joe Crane. Markham, you don't have to tell me that it's all very irregular and very illegal. I know it. I'm rapidly becoming convinced that it was a mistake to let Crane and his girl out of custody, Vance. You only allowed them to leave because I asked you to. And believe me, Markham, you can pick him up on the larceny charge at any time. Well, that's so. But I want him free so I can prove murder against him. So you said yesterday. All right, Vance, I'll go along with this a little while longer. By the way, how does that money-making machine work? I think I have an idea. The design you put on a blank piece of paper actually came out on the dollar bill. It was on it when Crane gave me the bill, and it was a good bill, Mark. Perhaps there was a camera in the machine. It took a picture of the design, then stamped it on the... No, no, that's preposterous. It couldn't possibly be done that way. It wasn't. Don't tell me that machine actually makes money from blank pieces of paper, Vance. No, I won't tell you that either, because that isn't true. But Markham, talking to you just now has given me an idea. Yes? What details of the death of Sniffy Edwards have you released? None. Except that we found his body. That's all anybody knows. Good. Now, Markham, if I'm right about how that machine works, I think I can promise to bring Joe Crane into your office again, only this time with a very solid murder charge against him. (laughs) 
You sure you go for me, Jeannie? You positive? I'm positive. I'm superlative. I'm everything, Joe. I just don't want to do a thing except hang around you. Good. Don't that prove something? Maybe. Ah, Joe. What about Frank Lacey? Used to be pretty sweet on him. Sure, I used to be. I didn't give you any guarantee I'm going to be in love with you forever, Joey. Yeah, I know, but I hope so. <laughs> All I know is right now, you're for me. Mm. Uh, Maybe. Joey, show me the money-making machine. It's over there in the corner. Go look at it. Oh, I don't mean that. I mean, show me how it works. I know that machine is nothing but a roller with two slits and a phony bottom. You feed blank paper in one slit, turn the roller, and it picks up a legit dollar bill from the bottom and slips it out the other side. Only, how do the initials get on the bill? I'll write you a letter about it sometime. Oh, come on, Joey. Tell me. I want to... Okay, Joey. What? On your feet. Frank. Sure, Frank. Frank Lacey. And I'm getting a little tired of playing games. Come here, Joey. Hey, leave him alone, Frank. Shut up. Okay, Frank, what's with you? What's going on? What do you want? That machine over in the corner. The one Sniffy Edwards invented. And I want the monogram gimmick. Jeannie here was supposed to get it for me, but I've been waiting too long. Let's have the story, Joey. How do you do the monogram thing? Oh, that. Well... You see, Frank, you... Wait! Uh, you... Oh, Gee, Gee, help, help me! Oh, Jimmy. Oh, sure, I'll help you. <laughs> Thanks, Jeannie. He was killing me. Thanks for shooting him. Oh, that's all right, Joey. Pleasure was all mine. That's a funny thing, though. Frank gave me the gun this morning, and I kill him with it this afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> that's life. I'd thank you a little more, Jeannie, if I was awful sure who you was aiming at when you shot. Joey! Don't Joey me. Let you and I... Wait a minute. We'll talk about you and me in a little while. Yeah? It's Joe Crane. Who's this? Friend of Sniffy Edwards. So? So, I got all of Sniffy's machines, and I thought maybe you'd like to buy them cheap. How cheap? A hundred bucks a piece. I got ten of them. You can get a fortune from them. Why don't you sell them? I'm hot. Gotta leave the country. Hmm. Uh. How do I know this is on the level? Nobody knows Sniffy's gimmick on how them monograms go from the blank paper to the good dough, do they? Nobody except you and Sniffy. And you. That's right, and me. I got the whole gimmick right under my thumb. That tell you enough for you to meet me? You know it is. Where are you? In a joint called Molly's in the waterfront. Walk right through and into the back room. I'll be there. Only don't be too long, Joey. I'm hot like I told you. The only thing that'll cool me off is cold cash. Vance, you look like a professional panhandler if I ever saw one. Where did you get such ugly-looking clothes? Bought them, Markham. These overalls, this jacket, this cap, and these shoes cost me $7. <laughs> Think I got cheated? Well, I don't know now. You've been doing some cheating yourself, I think. Cheating the barber, that is. When did you shave last? Yesterday morning. Pretty bad, eh? Not for what you're trying to do. If you can get what you think you can on Joe Crane, what's the difference how you look? That's exactly the... Uh -oh. Who is it? Crane. Joe Crane. That's your cue, Markham. Go out the back door there and don't come in until I call you. Right. Good luck, man. Thanks. What's going on in there? I'm coming. Come on in, Crane. Where are the machines? You don't think I keep them here, do you? I ain't sure you keep them anywhere. Then what are you doing here? Look, bud, you know how Sniffy's monogram gimmick worked. You knew he let me have one of his machines to pedal. What else do you know? That you knocked him off. Oh, so that's the story, huh? Yeah. So long, bud. Don't take care of yourself. Wait a minute. Well? I'm still hot and I still need dough, like I said, to get away so I can cool off. And I still got those machines, ten of them. I'll give you a hundred bucks for him. Take it or leave it. I'll take it. Now you give me a thousand bucks extra for keeping my mouth shut about you shooting Sniffy. Shooting Sniffy? <laughs> you don't know too much, do you? Sniffy was knife dope. Go ahead. Talk all you want to. 
You get the hundred for the machines and you get moving out of town. I don't think I will. I think you will be doing the moving crane right into jail. Hey, you're no bum. What goes with that talk? Who are you? We've met, Crane. I'm Philo Vance. And you've told me all I wanted to know about you. Only one person would know how Sniffy Edwards was killed. And that was the man who killed him. What you know won't do you any good. I'm good at... Oh, <coughs> All right, Markham, you can come in now. I heard you two fighting, but I didn't want to spoil your fun, Vance. I'm glad you didn't. Well, there's your larcenist, Markham. Yes. Only now he's your murderer, too. You'll have no trouble getting a conviction. And after we take him downtown, I'll tell you the details of the traveling monogram, which was the initial step in making Joe Crane show his hand. <laughs> begin with, Markham, as soon as Crane was convinced that I knew how a monogram on a blank piece of paper could be transferred to a real dollar bill, he had no hesitancy about coming down to the waterfront and talking to me. And in talking to you, Vance, he gave himself away. I know that. And I know we found Frank Lacey's body in the Crane's apartment, so we actually have him for two murders. But I don't understand how the device worked. I'll show you. Here's the machine Crane used, and some of the paper that comes with it. Yes? Write something on the paper. Here. Here's my pen. All right. I'll put down my initials. F, X, M. There we are. Very well. I take the paper. Yes. And slip it into the machine. But before I do, I cover what you wrote with my thumb so the ink gets on my thumb. The ink gets on. Then I turn the handle of the machine and out comes a new dollar bill. Well. I take it out of the machine and as I do, I press my thumb still with the wet ink on it on the bill and your initials are transferred to it. Oh, brother, no, it can't be that simple. Oh, but it was. <laughs> I see the dollar bill with my initials on it, but I'd never have known how they got there. Oh, really? I would have sworn that dollar bill actually was the blank piece of paper I saw you put in the machine. Well, Markham, the secret of the device was in its simplicity. It certainly was. Well, we don't have to worry about it now. Nor about Sniffy Edwards' murder, nor about any of the people concerned with it. That's right. Let's cart this machine down to the river and throw it overboard. That will be the end of it. The end of it, and thanks to you, the end of the money machine murder case. 